9. Adjoining the prison which Evan had recently vacated, and not far from the British consulate, are two narrow streets, Via del Purgatorio and Via dell'Inferno, which intersect in a T whose long side parallels the Arno. Victoria stood in this intersection, the night gloomy about her, a tiny erect figure in white dimity. She was trembling as if she waited for some lover. They had been considerate at the consulate. More than that, she had seen the dull pounding of some knowledge heavy behind their eyes, and known all at once that old Godolphin had indeed been wrung by a terrible need, and that her intuition had once more been correct. Her pride in this faculty was an athlete's pride in his strength or skill. It had once told her, for example, that Goodfellow was a spy and not a casual tourist. More had revealed to her all at once a latent talent of her own for espionage. Her decision to help Godolphin came not out of any romantic illusion about spying. In that business she saw mostly ugliness, little glamour. But rather because she felt that skill, or any virtu, was a desirable and lovely thing purely for its own sake, and it became more effective the further divorced it was from moral intention. Though she would have denied it, she was one with Ferrante, with the Gaucho, with Signor Montisa. Like them, she would act, when occasion arose, on the strength of a unique and private gloss on the prince. She overrated Virtu, individual agency, in much the same way Signor Montisa overrated the fox. Perhaps one day one of them might ask, what was the tag end of an age if not that sort of imbalance that tilt toward the more devious, the less forceful. She wondered, standing stone still at the crossroads, whether the old man had trusted her and waited after all. She prayed that he had, less perhaps from concern for him than from some obvoluted breed of self-aggrandizement which read the conforming of events to the channels she'd set out for them as glorious testimony to her own skill. One thing she had avoided, probably because of the supernatural tinge men acquired in her perception, was the schoolgirlish tendency to describe every male over the age of fifty as sweet, dear, or nice. Dormant in every aged man, she saw rather his image regressed twenty or thirty years like a wraith which nearly merged outlines with its counterpart, young, potent, possessing mighty sinews and sensitive hands so that in Captain Hugh it had been the young version she wished to help and make a part of the vast system of channels, locks, and basins she had dug for the rampant river fortune. If there were, as some doctors of the mind were beginning to suspect, an ancestral memory, an inherited reservoir of primordial knowledge which shapes certain of our actions and casual desires, then not only her presence here and now between purgatory and hell, but also her entire commitment to Roman Catholicism as needful and plausible stemmed from and depended on an article of the primitive faith which glimmered shiny and supreme in that reservoir like a crucial valve handle, the notion of the wraith or spiritual double happening on rare occasions by multiplication but more often by fission, and the natural corollary which says the son is doppelganger to the father. Having once accepted duality, Victoria had found it only a single step to Trinity, and having seen the halo of a second and more virile self flickering about old Godolphin, she waited now outside the prison while somewhere to her right a girl sang lonely, telling a tale of hesitation between a rich man who was old and a young man who was fair. At length she heard the prison door open, heard his footsteps begin to approach down a narrow alleyway, heard the door slam to again. She dug the point of her parasol into the ground beside one tiny foot and gazed down at it. He was upon her before she realized it, nearly colliding with her. I say, he exclaimed. She looked up. His face was indistinct. He peered closer at her. 
I saw you this afternoon, he said. The girl in the tram, isn't it? She murmured assent. And you sang Mozart to me. He did not look at all like his father. A bit of a lark, Evan bumbled. Didn't mean to embarrass you. You did. Evan hung his head sheepish. But what are you doing out here at this time of night? He forced a laugh. Not waiting for me, surely. Yes, she said quietly. Waiting for you. That's terribly flattering. But if I may say so, you aren't the sort of young lady who... I mean, are you? I mean, dash it. Why should you be waiting for me? Not because you liked my singing voice. Because you are his son, she said. He did not, he realized, have to ask for explanation. Wouldn't have to stammer, how did you meet my father? How did you know I was here? That I would be released. It was as if what he'd said to the gaucho back in their cell had been like confession, an acknowledgment of weakness, as if the gaucho's silence in turn had served as absolution, redeeming the weakness, propelling him suddenly into the trembling plains of a new kind of manhood. He felt that belief in Vesu gave him no right any more to doubt as arrogantly as he had before, that perhaps wherever he went from now on he would perform like penance a ready acceptance of miracles or visions such as this meeting at the crossroads seemed to him to be. They began to walk. She tucked her hands around his bicep. From his slight elevation he noted an ornate ivory comb sunk to the armpits in her hair. Faces, helmets, arms linked. Crucified? He blinked closer at the faces. All looked drawn down by the weight of the bodies beneath, but seemed to grimace more by convention with an Eastern idea of patience than with any more explicit or Caucasian pain. What a curious girl it was beside him. He was about to use the comb for a conversational opening when she spoke. How strange tonight, this city. As if something trembled below its surface, waiting to burst through. Ah, oh, I felt it. I think to myself, we are not any of us in the Renaissance at all. Despite the Fra Angelicos, the Titians, Botticellis, Brunelleschi Church, Ghosts of the Medici, it is another time, like radium, I expect. They say radium changes bit by bit over unimaginable spaces of time to lead. A glow about old Firenze seems to be missing, seems more a leaden grey. Perhaps the only radiance left is in Vesu. He looked down at her. How odd you are, he said. I almost feel you know more than I about the place. She pursed her lips. Do you know how I felt when I spoke with him? As if he'd told me the same stories he told you when you were a boy, and I had forgotten them, but needed only to see him, hear his voice, for all the memories to come rushing back undecayed. He smiled. That would make us brother and sister. She didn't answer. They turned into Via Porta Rossa. Terrorists were thick in the streets, Three rambling musicians, guitar, violin, and kazoo, stood on a corner playing sentimental airs. Perhaps we are in limbo, he said, or like the place we met, some still point between hell and purgatory. Strange, there's no Via del Paradiso anywhere in Florence. Perhaps nowhere in the world. For that moment, at least, they seemed to give up external plans, theories, and codes, even the inescapable romantic curiosity about one another, to indulge in being simply and purely young, to share that sense of the world's affliction, that outgoing sorrow at the spectacle of our human condition, which anyone this age regards as reward or gratuity for having survived adolescence. For them, the music was sweet and painful, the strolling chains of tourists like a dance of death. They stood on the curb, gazing at one another, jostled against by hawkers and sightseers, lost as much, perhaps, in that bond of youth as in the depths of the eyes each contemplated. He broke it first. You haven't told me your name, she told him. Victoria, he said. She felt a kind of triumph, 
It was the way he'd said it. He patted her hand. Come, he said, feeling protective, almost fatherly. I am to meet him at Scheisvogel's. Of course, she said. They turned left away from the Arno toward Piazza Vittorio Emanuele. The figli di Machiavelli had taken over for their garrison an abandoned tobacco warehouse off Via Cavour. It was deserted at the moment except for an aristocratic-looking man named Boraccio, who was performing his nightly duty of checking the rifles. There was a sudden pounding at the door. Digame, yelled Boraccio. The lion and the fox, came the answer. Boraccio unlatched the door and was nearly bowled over by a thick-set mestizo called Tito, who earned his living selling obscene photographs to the Fourth Army Corps. He appeared highly excited. They're marching, he began to babble. Tonight, half a battalion. They have rifles and fixed bayonets. What in God's name is this, Boraccio growled. Has Italy declared war? Que pasa? The consulate. The consulate of Venezuela. They are to guard it. They expect us. Someone has betrayed the figli di Machiavelli. Calm down, Boraccio said. Perhaps the moment which the gaucho promised us has arrived at last. We must expect him, then. Quickly, alert the others. Put them on standby. Send a messenger into town to find Cuerna Cabron. He will likely be at the beer garden. Tito saluted, wheeled, ran to the door on the double, unlocked it. A thought occurred to him. Perhaps, he said, perhaps the gaucho himself is the traitor. He opened the door. The gaucho stood there, glowering. Tito gaped. Without a word, the gaucho brought his closed fist down on the mestizo's head. Tito toppled and crashed to the floor. Idiot, the gaucho said. What's happened? Is everyone insane? Boraccio told him about the army. The gaucho rubbed his hands. Bravissimo, a major action, and yet we've not heard from Caracas. No matter, we move tonight. Alert the troops, we must be there at midnight. Not much time, Commendatore. We will be there at midnight, Vara. Si, Commendatore. Boraccio saluted and left, stepping carefully over Tito on his way out. The gaucho took a deep breath, crossed his arms, flung them wide, crossed them again. So, he cried to the empty warehouse, the night of the lion has come again to Florence. 10. Scheisvogel's Biergarten und Ratzkeller was a nighttime favorite not only with the German travelers in Florence, but also, it seemed, with those of the other touring nations. An Italian café, it was conceded, being fine for the afternoon, when the city lazed in contemplation of its art treasures. But the hours after sundown demanded a conviviality, a boisterousness which the easy-going, perhaps even a bit cliquish, cafés did not supply. English, American, Dutch, Spanish... They seemed to seek some Hofbrauhaus of the spirit like a grail, hold a crook of Munich beer like a chalice. Here at Scheisvogel's were all the desired elements, blonde barmaids with thick braids wound round the back of the head who could carry eight foaming Kruger at a time, a pavilion with a small brass band out in the garden, an accordionist inside. Confidences roared across a table, much smoke, group singing. Old Godolphin and Raphael Montisa sat out and back in the garden at a small table while the wind from the river played chilly about their mouths and the wheeze of the band frolicked about their ears, more absolutely alone, it seemed to them, than anyone else in the city. Am I not your friend? Signor Montisa pleaded. You must tell me, perhaps, as you say, you have wandered outside the world's communion, but haven't I as well? Have I not been ripped up by the roots, screaming like the mandrake, transplanted from country to country, only to find the soil arid or the sun unfriendly, the air tainted? Whom should you tell this terrible secret to, if not to your brother? Perhaps to my son, said Godolphin. I never had a son. But isn't it true that we spend our lives seeking for something valuable, some truth to tell to a son, to give to him with love? Most of us aren't as lucky as you. 
Perhaps we have to be torn away from the rest of men before we can have such words to give to a son. But it has been all these years. You can wait a few minutes more. He will take your gift and use it for himself, for his own life. I do not malign him. It is the way a younger generation acts. That simply. You, as a boy, probably bore away some such gift from your own father, not realizing that it was still as valuable to him as it would be to you. But when the English speak of passing down something from one generation to another, it is only that. The son passes nothing back up. Perhaps this is a sad thing and not Christian, but it has been that way since time out of mind and will never change. Giving and giving back can be only between you and one of your own generation, between you and Montisa, your dear friend. The old man shook his head, half smiling. It isn't so much, Ralph. I've grown used to it. Perhaps you will find it not so much. Perhaps. It is difficult to understand how an English explorer thinks. Was it the Antarctic? What sends the English into these terrible places? Godolphin stared at nothing. I think it is the opposite of what sends English reeling all over the globe in the mad dances called Cook's Tours. They want only the skin of a place. The explorer wants its heart. It is perhaps a little like being in love. I had never penetrated to the heart of any of those wild places, Ruff, until they sue. It was not till the southern expedition last year that I saw what was beneath her skin. What did you see? asked Signor Montisa, leaning forward. Nothing, Godolphin whispered. It was nothing I saw. Signor Montisa reached out a hand to the old man's shoulder. Understand, Godolphin said, bowed and motionless. I had been tortured by Vesu for fifteen years. I dreamed of it. Half the time I lived in it. It wouldn't leave me. Colors, music, fragrances. No matter where I got assigned, I was pursued by memories. Now I am pursued by agents. That feral and lunatic dominion cannot afford to let me escape. Raf, you will be ridden by it longer than I. I haven't much time left. You must never tell anyone. I won't ask for your promise. I take that for granted. I have done what no man has done. I have been at the Pole. The Pole, my friend. Then why have we not seen it in the press? Because I made it that way. They found me, you remember, at the last depot half dead and snowed in by a blizzard. Everyone assumed I had tried for the pole and failed. But I was on my way back. I let them tell it their way. Do you see? I had thrown away a sure knighthood, rejected glory for the first time in my career, something my son has been doing since he was born. Evan is rebellious. His was no sudden decision, but mine was, sudden and necessary, because of what I found waiting for me at the pole. Two carabinieri and their girls arose from a table and weaved arm in arm out of the garden. The band began to play a sad waltz. Sounds of carousing in the beer hall floated out to the two men. The wind blew steady. There was no moon. The leaves of trees whipped to and fro like tiny automata. It was a foolish thing, Godolphin said, what I did. There was nearly a mutiny. After all, one man trying for the pole in the dead of winter, they thought I was insane. Possibly I was, by that time. But I had to reach it. I had begun to think that there, at one of the only two motionless places on this gyrating world, I might have peace to solve Vesu's riddle. Do you understand? I wanted to stand in the dead center of the carousel, if only for a moment, try to catch my bearings, and sure enough, Waiting for me was my answer. I'd begun to dig a cache nearby after planting the flag. The barrenness of that place howled around me like a country the demiurge had forgotten. There could have been no more entirely lifeless and empty place anywhere on earth. Two or three feet down I struck clear ice. A strange light, which seemed to move inside it, caught my attention. I cleared a space away. Staring up at me through the ice, perfectly preserved, 
its fur still rainbow-colored, was the corpse of one of their spider monkeys. It was quite real, not like the vague hints they had given me before. I say they had given. I think they left it there for me. Why? Perhaps for some alien, not quite human reason that I can never comprehend. Perhaps only to see what I would do. A mockery, you see. A mockery of life, planted where everything but Hugh Godolphin was inanimate. With, of course, the implication. It did tell me the truth about them. If Eden was the creation of God, God only knows what evil created Vesu. The skin which had wrinkled through my nightmares was all there had ever been. Vesu itself, a gaudy dream of what the Antarctic in this world is closest to, a dream of annihilation. Signor Montisa looked disappointed. Are you sure, Hugh? I have heard that in the polar regions men, after long exposure, see things which... Does it make any difference? Godolphin said. If it were only a hallucination, it was not what I saw or believed I saw that in the end is important. It is what I thought, what truth I came to. Signor Montesa shrugged helplessly. And now? Those who are after you? Think I will tell. No, I have guessed the meaning of their clue, and fear I will try to publish it. But, dear Christ, how could I? Am I mistaken, Roth? I think it must send the world mad. Your eyes are puzzled. I know. You can't see it yet, but you will. You are strong. It will hurt you no more, he laughed, than it has hurt me. He looked up over Signor Montisa's shoulder. Here's my son. The girl is with him. Evan stood over them. Father, he said. Son. They shook hands. Signor Montisa yelled for Cesare and drew up a chair for Victoria. Could you all excuse me for a moment? I must deliver a message for a Signor Cuerna Cabron. He is a friend of the gaucho, Cesare said, coming up behind them. Have you seen the gaucho? asked Signor Montisa. Half an hour ago. Where is he? Out at Via Cavour. He's coming here later. He said he had to meet friends on another matter. Aha! Signor Montisa glanced at his watch. We haven't much time. Cesare, go and inform the barge of our rendezvous. Then to the Ponte Vecchio for the trees. The cabman can help. Hurry. Cesare ambled off. Signor Montisa waylaid a waitress who set down four liters of beer on the table. To our enterprise, he said. Three tables away, Moffat watched, smiling. Eleven. That march from Via Cavour was the most splendid the gaucho could remember. Somehow, miraculously, Boracho, Tito, and a few friends had managed in a surprise raid to make off with a hundred horses from the cavalry. The theft was discovered quickly, but not before Figli di Machiavelli, hollering and singing, were mounted and galloping toward the center of town. The gaucho rode in front, wearing a red shirt and a wide grin. Avanti, mei fratelli, they sang. Figli di Machiavelli, avanti alla donna libertà. Close behind came the army, pursuing in ragged, furious files, half of them on foot, a few in carriages. Halfway into town, the renegades met Cuerna Cabron in a gig. The gaucho wheeled, swooped, gathered him up bodily, turned again to rejoin the filly. My comrade, he roared to his bewildered second-in-command, isn't it a glorious evening? They reached the consulate at a few minutes to midnight and dismounted, still singing and yelling, those who worked at the Mercato Centrale had provided enough rotten fruit and vegetables to set up a heavy and sustained barrage against the consulate. The army arrived. Salazar and Raton watched cringing from the second-floor window. Fist fights broke out. So far no shots had been fired. The square had erupted suddenly into a great, whirling confusion. Passers-by fled bawling to what shelter they could find. The gaucho caught sight of Cesare and Signor Montisa with two Judas trees, shuffling impatiently near the post of Centrale. Good God, he said. Two trees? 
Guana Cabron, I have to leave for a while. You are now Commendatore. Take charge. Guana Cabron saluted and dived into the melee. The gaucho, making his way over to Signor Montisa, saw Evan, the father, and the girl waiting nearby. Buona sera once again, Gadrulfi, he called, flipping a salute in Evan's direction. Montisa, are we ready? He unclipped a large grenade from one of the ammunition belts crisscrossing his chest. Signor Montisa and Cesare picked up the hollow tree. Guard the other one, Signor Montisa called back to Godolphin. Don't let anyone know it's there until we return. Evan, the girl whispered, moving closer to him. Will there be shooting? He did not hear her eagerness, only her fear. Don't be afraid, he said, aching to shelter her. Old Godolphin had been looking at them, shuffling his feet, embarrassed. Son, he finally began, conscious of being a fool, I suppose this is hardly the time to mention it, but I must leave Florence tonight. I would... I wish you would come with me. He couldn't look at his son. The boy smiled wistfully, his arm round Victoria's shoulders. But, Papa, he said, I would be leaving my only true love behind. Victoria stood on tiptoe to kiss his neck. We will meet again she whispered sadly, playing the game. The old man turned away from them, trembling, not understanding, feeling betrayed once again. I am terribly sorry, he said. Evan released Victoria, moved to Godolphin. Father, he said, Father, it's our way only. It's my fault, the joke. A trivial oaf's joke. You know I'll come with you. My fault, the father said. My oversight, I dare say, for not keeping up with the younger people. Imagine something so simple as a way of speaking. Evan let his hand rest, splayed on Godolphin's back. Neither moved for a moment. On the barge, Evan said, there we'll be able to talk. The old man turned at last. Time we got round to it. We will, Evan said, trying to smile. After all, here we've been so many years biffing about at opposite ends of the world. The old man did not answer, but burrowed his face against Evan's shoulder. Both felt slightly embarrassed. Victoria watched them for a moment, then turned away to gaze, placid at the rioting. Shots began to ring out. Blood began to stain the pavements, screams to punctuate the singing of the Filii di Machiavelli. She saw a rioter in a shirt of motley sprawled over the limb of a tree being bayoneted again and again by two soldiers. She stood as still as she had at the crossroads, waiting for Evan. Her face betrayed no emotion. It was as if she saw herself embodying a feminine principle, acting as complement to all this bursting, explosive male energy. In violet and calm, she watched the spasms of wounded bodies, the fair of violent death framed and staged, it seemed, for her alone in that tiny square. From her hair, the heads of five crucified also looked on, no more expressive than she. Lugging the tree, Signor Montisa and Cesare staggered through the Ritrati diversi, while the gaucho guarded their rear. He'd already had to fire at two guards. Hurry, he said. We must be out of here soon. They won't be diverted for long. Inside the Sala di Lorenzo Monaco, Cesare unsheathed a razor-edged dagger and prepared to slice the Botticelli from its frame. Signor Montisa gazed at her, at the asymmetric eyes, tilt of the frail head, streaming gold hair. He could not move, as if he were any gentle libertine before a lady he had writhed for years to possess. And now that the dream was about to be consummated, he had been struck suddenly impotent. Cesare dug the knife into the canvas, began to saw downward. Light, shining in from the street, reflected from the blade, flickering from the lantern they had brought, danced over the painting's gorgeous surface. Signor Montisa watched its movement, a slow horror growing in him. In that instant, he was reminded of Hugh Godolphin's spider monkey, still shimmering through crystal ice at the bottom of the world. The whole surface of the painting now seemed to move, to be flooded with color and motion. He thought, for the first time in years, 
of the blonde seamstress in Lyon. She would drink absinthe at night and torture herself for it in the afternoon. God hated her, she said. At the same time, she was finding it more difficult to believe in him. She wanted to go to Paris. She had a pleasant voice, did she not? She would go on the stage. It had been her dream since girlhood. Countless mornings in the hours when passion's inertia of motion had carried them along faster than sleep could overtake them, she had poured out to him schemes, despairs, all tiny, relevant loves. What sort of mistress, then, would Venus be? What outlying worlds would he conquer in their headlong, three-in-the-morning excursions away from the cities of sleep? What of her god, her voice, her dreams? She was already a goddess. She had no voice he could ever hear, and she herself, perhaps even her native demean, was only a gaudy dream, a dream of annihilation. Was that what Godolphin had met? Yet she was no less Raphael Montese's entire love. Aspeti, he shouted, leaping forward to grab Cesare's hand. Se pazzo? Cesare snarled. Guards coming this way, the gaucho announced from the entrance to the gallery. An army of them, for God's sake, hurry. You have come all this way, Cesare protested, and now you will leave her? Yes. The gaucho raised his head, suddenly alert. The rattle of gunfire came to him faintly. With an angry motion, he flung the grenade down the corridor. The approaching guards scattered, and it went off with a roar in the Ricciati Diversi. Signor Montisa and Cesare, empty-handed, were at his back. We must run for our lives, the gaucho said. Have you got your lady with you? No, Cesare said, disgusted. Not even the damned tree. They dashed down a corridor smelling of burnt cordite. Signor Montisa noticed that paintings in the Ricciati Diversi had all been taken down for the redecorating. The grenade had harmed nothing except the walls and a few guards. It was a mad, all-out sprint with the gaucho taking pot shots at guards. Cesare waving his knife, Signor Montisa flapping his arms wildly. Miraculously, they reached the entrance and half ran, half tumbled down 126 steps to the Piazza della Signoria. Evan and Godolphin joined them. I must return to the battle, the gaucho said breathless. He stood for a moment watching the carnage. But don't they look like apes now, fighting over a female, even if the female is named Liberty? He drew a long pistol, checked the action. There are nights, he mused, nights alone, when I think we are apes in a circus, mocking the ways of men. Perhaps it is all a mockery, and the only condition we can ever bring to men a mockery of liberty, of dignity. But that cannot be, or else I have lived. Signor Montisa grasped his hand. Thank you, he said. The gaucho shook his head. Per niente, he muttered, then abruptly turned and made his way toward the riot in the square. Signor Montisa watched him briefly. Come, he said at last. Evan looked over to where Victoria was standing and chanted. He seemed about to move or call to her. Then he shrugged and turned away to follow the others. Perhaps he didn't want to disturb her. Moffat, Knocked sprawling by a not-so-rotten turnip, saw them. They're getting away, he said. They got to his feet and began clawing his way through the rioters, expecting to be shot at any minute. In the name of the Queen, he cried, halt! Someone careened into him. I say, said Moffat, it's Sydney. I've been looking all over for you, Stencil said. Not a mo' too soon, they're getting away. Forget it. Down that alley, hurry. He tugged at Stencil's sleeve. Forget it, Moffat. It's off. The whole show. Why? Don't ask why. It's over. But there was just a communique from London, from the chief. He knows more than I do. He called it off. How should I know? No one ever tells me anything. Oh, my God. They edged into a doorway. Stencil pulled out his pipe and lit it. The sounds of firing rose in a crescendo, which it seemed would never stop. Moffat, Stencil said after a while, puffing meditatively, if there is ever a plot to assassinate the foreign minister, 
I pray I never get assigned to the job of preventing it. Conflict of interest, you know. They scurried down a narrow street to the Longarno. There, after Cesare had removed two middle-aged ladies and a cab driver, they took possession of a fiacre and clattered off pell-mell for the Ponte San Cinita. The barge was waiting for them, dim amid the river's shadows. The captain jumped to the quay. Three of you, he bellowed. Our bargain included only one. Signor Montisa flew into a rage, leaped from the carriage, picked up the captain bodily, and before anyone had time to register amazement, flung him into the Arno. On board, he cried. Evan and Godolphin jumped onto a cargo of crated Chianti flasks. Cesare moaned, thinking of how that trip would be. Can anyone pilot a barge? Signor Montisa wondered. It is like a man of war, Godolphin smiled, only smaller and no sails. Son, would you cast off? Aye, aye, sir. In a moment they were free of the quay. Soon the barge was drifting off into the current which flows strong and steady toward Pisa and the sea. Cesare, they called, in what were already ghosts' voices. Addio. Arrivederla. Cesare waved. Arrivederci. Soon they had disappeared, dissolved in the darkness. Cesare put his hands in his pockets and started to stroll. He found a stone in the street and began to kick it aimlessly along the Longarno. Soon, he thought, I will go and buy a liter fiasco of Chianti. As he passed the Palazzo Corsini, towering nebulous and fair above him, he thought, what an amusing world it still is where things and people can be found in places where they do not belong. For example, out there on the river now with a thousand liters of wine are a man in love with Venus and a sea captain and his fat son. And back in the Uffizi, he roared aloud. In the room of Lorenzo Monaco, he remembered amazed, before Botticelli's birth of Venus, still blooming purple and gay. There is a hollow Judas tree. Chapter 8 In which Rachel gets her yo-yo back, Rooney sings a song, and Stencil calls on bloody chicklets. V. 1. Profane, sweating in April's heat, sat on a bench in the little park behind the public library, swatting at flies with rolled-up pages of the Times Classified. From mental cross-plotting, he'd decided where he sat now was the geographical center of the Midtown Employment Agency belt. A weird area it was. For a week now, he'd sat patient in a dozen offices, filling out forms, having interviews, and watching other people, especially girls. He had an interesting daydream all built up, which went, You're jobless, I'm jobless, here we both are, out of work, let's screw. He was horny. What little money he'd saved from the sewer job had almost run out, and here he was, considering seduction. It kept the time moving right along. So far, no agency he'd been to had sent him anywhere for a job interview. He had to agree with them. To amuse himself, he'd looked in Help Wanted under S. Nobody wanted a Schlemiel. Laborers were far out of the city. Profane wanted to stay in Manhattan. He'd had enough of wandering out in the suburbs. He wanted a single point, a base of operations, some place to screw in private. It was difficult when you brought a girl to a flop house. A young kid with a beard and old dungarees had tried that a few nights ago down where Profane was staying. The audience, winos and bums, had decided to serenade them after a few minutes of just watching. Let me call you sweetheart, they sang, all somehow on key. A few had fine voices. Some sang harmony. It may have been like the bartender on Upper Broadway, who was nice to the girls and their customers. There is a way we behave around young people excited with each other, even if we haven't been getting any for a while and aren't likely to very soon. It is a little cynical, a little self-pitying, a little withdrawn. But at the same time, a genuine desire to see young people get together. Though it springs from a self-centered concern, 
It is often as much as a young man like Profane ever does go out of himself and take an interest in human strangers, which is better, one would suppose, than nothing at all. Profane sighed. The eyes of New York women do not see the wandering bombs or the boys with no place to go. Material wealth and getting laid strolled arm in arm the midway of Profane's mind. If he'd been the type who evolves theories of history for his own amusement, he might have said all political events, wars, governments, and uprisings, have the desire to get laid as their roots. Because history unfolds according to economic forces, and the only reason anybody wants to get rich is so he can get laid steadily with whomever he chooses. All he believed at this point, on the bench behind the library, was that anybody who worked for inanimate money so he could buy more inanimate objects was out of his head. Inanimate money was to get animate warmth. Dead fingernails in the living shoulder blades, quick cries against the pillow, tangled hair, lidded eyes, twisting loins. He'd thought himself into an erection. They covered it with the Times Classified and waited for it to subside. A few pigeons watched him, curious. It was shortly afternoon, and the sun was hot. I have to keep looking, he thought. The day isn't over. What was he going to do? He was, they told him, unspecialized. Everybody else was at peace with some machine or other. Not even a pick and shovel had been safe for profane. He happened to look down. His erection had produced in the newspaper a crosswise fold, which moved line by line down the page as the swelling gradually diminished. It was a list of employment agencies. Okay, thought Profane, just for the heck of it, I will close my eyes, count three, and open them. And whatever agency listing that fold is on, I will go to them. It will be like flipping a coin. Inanimate schmuck, inanimate paper, pure chance. He opened his eyes on Space-Time Employment Agency down on Lower Broadway near Fulton Street. Bad choice, he thought. It meant fifteen cents for the subway. But a deal was a deal. On the Lexington Avenue downtown, he saw a bomb lying across the aisle, diagonal on the seat. Nobody would sit near him. He was king of the subway. He must have been there all night, yo-yoing out to Brooklyn and back, tons of water swirling over his head, and he perhaps dreaming his own submarine country, peopled by mermaids and deep-sea creatures, all at peace among the rocks and sunken galleons. Must have slept through rush hour, with all sorts of suit-wearers and high-heeled dolls glaring at him because he was taking up three sitting spaces, but none of them daring to wake him. If under the street and under the sea are the same, then he was king of both. Profane remembered himself on the shuttle back in February, wondered how he'd look to Coop, to Fina. Not like a king, he figured. More like a schlemiel, a follower. Having sunk into self-pity, he nearly missed the Fulton Street stop, got the bottom edge of his suede jacket caught in the doors when they closed, was nearly carried that way out to Brooklyn. He found space-time employment down the street and ten floors up, the waiting area was crowded when he got there. A quick check revealed no girls worth looking at. Nobody, in fact, but a family who might have stepped through time's hanging arras directly out of the Great Depression. Journeyed to this city in an old Plymouth pickup from their land of dust. Husband, wife, and one mother-in-law, all yelling at each other. None but the old lady really caring about a job, so that she stood legs braced in the middle of the waiting area, telling them both how to make out their applications, a cigarette dangling from and about to burn her lipstick. Profane made out his application, dropped it on the receptionist's desk, and sat down to wait. Soon there came the hurried and sexy tap of high heels in the corridor outside. As if magnetized, his head swiveled around, and he saw coming in the door a tiny girl, lifted up to all of five feet one inches by her heels. Oh, boy, oh, boy, he thought. Good stuff. She was not, however, an applicant. She belonged on the other side of the rail. 
Smiling and waving hello to everyone in her country, she clickety-clacked gracefully over to her desk. He could hear the quiet brush of her thighs kissing each other in their nylon. Oh, oh, he thought. Look at what I seem to be getting again. Go down, you bastard. Obstinate, it would not. The back of his neck began to grow heated and rosy. The receptionist, a slim girl who seemed to be all tight, tight underwear, stockings, ligaments, tendons, mouth, a true wind-up woman, moved precisely among the desks, depositing applications like an automatic card-dealing machine. Six interviewers, he counted, Six to one odds she drew me, like Russian roulette. Why like that? Would she destroy him, she so frail-looking, such gentle, well-bred legs? She had her head down, studying the application in her hand. She looked up. He saw the eyes, both slanted the same way. Profane, she called, looking at him with a little frown. Oh, God, he thought, the loaded chamber— the luck of a schlemiel who by common sense should lose at the game. Russian roulette is only one of its names, he groaned inside. And look, me with this heart on. She called his name again. He stumbled up from the chair and proceeded with the times over his groin, and he bent at a 120-degree angle behind the rail and into her own desk. The sign said, Rachel Owlglass. He sat down quickly. She lit a cigarette and cased the upper half of his body. That's about time, she said. He fumbled for a cigarette, nervous. She flicked over a pack of matches with a fingernail he could feel already gliding across his back, poised to dig in, frenzied when she should come. And would she ever? Already they were in bed. He could see nothing but a new, extemporized daydream, in which no other face but this sad one with its brimming slash-slash of eyes tightened slowly in his own shadow, pale under him. God, she had him. Strangely, then, the tumescence began to subside, the flesh at his neck to pale. Any sovereign or broken yo-yo must feel like this after a short time of lying inert, rolling, falling suddenly to have its own umbilical string reconnected, and know the other end is in hands it cannot escape. Hands it doesn't want to escape. Know that the simple clockwork of itself has no more need for symptoms of inutility, lonesomeness, directionlessness, because now it has a path marked out for it over which it has no control. That's what the feeling would be if there were such things as animate yo-yos. Pending any such warp in the world, Profane felt like the closest thing to one, and above her eyes began to doubt his own animateness. How about a night watchman, she said at last. Over you, he wondered. Where, he said. She mentioned an address nearby in Maiden Lane. Anthro Research Associates. He knew he couldn't say it as fast. On the back of a card she scribbled the address and a name. Oli Bergamask. He hires. Handed it to him, a quick touch of fingernails. Come back as soon as you find out. Bergamask will tell you right away. He doesn't waste time. If it doesn't work out, we'll see what else we have. At the door he looked back. Was she blowing a kiss or yawning? Two. Winsome had left work early. When he got back to the apartment, he found his wife, Mafia, sitting on the floor with Pig Bodine. They were drinking beer and discussing her theory. Mafia was sitting cross-legged and wearing very tight Bermuda shorts. Pig stared captivated at her crutch. That fella irritates me, Winsom thought. He got beer and sat down next to them. He wondered idly if Pig were getting any off of his wife but it was hard to say who was getting what off Mafia. There is a curious sea story about Pig Bodine, which Winsome had heard from Pig himself. Winsome was aware that Pig wanted to make a career someday of playing male leads in pornographic movies. He'd get this evil smile on his face, as if he were viewing or 
possibly committing reel on reel of depravities. The bilges of the radio shock of USS Scaffold, Pig's ship, were jammed solid with Pig's lending library, amassed during the ship's Mediterranean travels, and rented out to the crew at ten cents per book. The collection was foul enough to make Pig Bodine a byword of decadence throughout the squadron. But no one suspected that Pig might have creative as well as custodial talents. One night, Task Force 60, made up of two carriers, some other heavies, and a circular screen of twelve destroyers, including the scaffold, was steaming a few hundred miles east of Gibraltar. It was maybe two in the morning, visibility unlimited, stars blooming fat and sultry over a tar-colored Mediterranean. No closing contacts on the radars. Everybody on after steering watch asleep. Forward lookouts telling themselves sea stories to keep awake. That sort of night. All at once, every teletype machine in the task force started clanging away. Ding, 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 ding. Five bells or flash. Initial contact with enemy forces. It being fifty-five and more or less peacetime... Captains were routed out of bed, general quarters called, dispersal plans executed. Nobody knew what was happening. By the time the teletypes started up again, the formation was scattered out over a few hundred square miles of ocean, and most radio shacks were crowded to capacity. The machines started to type. Message follows. Teletype operators, comm officers, leaned forward, tense, thinking of Russian torpedoes, evil and barracuda-like. Flash. Yes, yes, they thought. Five bells. Flash. Go ahead. Pause. Finally, the keys started clattering again. The Green Door. One night, Dolores, Veronica, Justine, Sharon, Cindy Lou, Geraldine, and Irving decided to hold an orgy. Followed, on four and a half feet of teletype paper, the functional implications of their decision, told from Irving's point of view. For some reason, Pig never got caught, possibly because half the scaffold's radio gang, also the communications officer, an Annapolis graduate named Knoop, were in on it and had locked the door to radio as soon as GQ was called. It caught on as a sort of fad. The next night, precedence operational immediate came a dog story involving a St. Bernard named Fido and two waves. Pig was on watch when it came over and admitted to his henchman, Knoop, that it showed a certain flair. It was followed by other high-priority efforts. The first time I got laid, why our XO is queer, Lucky Pierre runs amok. By the time the scaffold reached Naples, its first port of call, there were an even dozen all carefully filed away by Pig under F. But initial sin entails eventual retribution. Later, somewhere between Barcelona and Cannes, evil days fell on Pig. One night, routing the message board, he went to sleep in the doorway of the executive officer's stateroom. The ship chose that moment to roll ten degrees to port. Pig toppled onto the terrified lieutenant commander like a corpse. Bodine, the XO shouted aghast. Were you sleeping? Pig snored away among a litter of special request chits. He was sent down on mess cooking. The first day he fell asleep in the serving line, rendering inedible a gunboat full of mashed potatoes. So the next meal he was stationed in front of the soup, which was made by Potamos, the cook, and which nobody ate anyway. Apparently, Pig's knees had developed this odd way of locking, which, if the scaffold were on an even keel, would enable him to sleep standing up. He was a medical curiosity. When the ship got back to the States, he went under observation at Portsmouth Naval Hospital. When he returned to the scaffold, he was put on the deck force of one Pappy Hod, a bosun's mate. In two days, Pappy had driven him, for the first of what were to be many occasions, over the hill. Now on the radio at the moment was a song about Davy Crockett, which upset Winsome considerably. This was 56, height of the coonskin hat craze. Millions of kids everywhere you looked were running around with these 
bushy, Freudian, hermaphrodite symbols on their heads. Nonsensical legends were being propagated about Crockett, all in direct contradiction to what Winsome had heard as a boy across the mountains from Tennessee. This man, a foul-mouthed, louse-ridden booze-hound, a corrupt legislator and an indifferent pioneer, was being set up for the nation's youth as a towering and clean-limbed example of Anglo-Saxon superiority. He had swelled into a hero such as Mafia might have created after waking from a particularly loony and erotic dream. The song invited parody. Winsome had even cast his own autobiography into AAAA rhyme and that simple-minded combination of three, count them, chord changes. Born in Durham in 23 by a pappy who was absentee, was took to a lynching at the neighborhood tree, whopped him a nigger when he was only three. Rooney, Rooney Winsome, king of the decky dance. Pretty soon he started to grow. Everyone knew he'd be a loving beau, cause down by the tracks he would frequently go to change his luck at a dollar a throw. While well, he hit Winston-Salem with a rebel yell, found himself a pretty southern belle, was doing fine till her pappy raised hell when he noticed her belly was beginning to swell. Luckily the war up and came along. He joined the army feeling brave and strong, his patriotism didn't last for long. They put him in a foxhole where he didn't belong. He worked him a hustle with his first CO, got transferred back to a PIO, sat out the war in a fancy chateau, egging on the troops toward Tokyo. When the war was over, his fighting done, he hung up his khakis and his garand gun, came along to New York to have some fun, but couldn't find a job till fifty-one. Started writing copy for MCA. It wasn't any fun, but it was steady pay. Sneaking out of work one lovely day, he met him a dolly called Mafia. Mafia thought he had a future ahead and looked like she knew how to bounce a bed. Old Rooney must have been sick in the head, cause pretty soon they up and they wed. Now he's got a record company, a third of the profits plus salary. A beautiful wife who wants to be free so she can practice her theory. Rooney, Rooney Winsome, king of the decky dance. Pig Bodine had fallen asleep. Mafia was in the next room watching herself undress in the mirror. And Paola, Rooney thought, where are you? She'd taken to disappearing, sometimes for two or three day stretches and nobody ever knew where she went. Maybe Rachel would put in a word for him with Paola. He had, he knew, certain nineteenth-century ideas of what was proper. The girl herself was an enigma. She hardly spoke. She went to the rusty spoon now only rarely when she knew Pig would be somewhere else. Pig coveted her. Concealing himself behind a code which only did officers dirty. And executives? Winsome wondered. Pig, he was sure, envisioned Paola playing opposite him in each frame of his stag movie fantasies. It was naturally supposed. The girl had the passive look of an object of sadism, something to be attired in various inanimate costumes and fetishes, tortured, subjected to the weird indignities of Pig's catalog, have her smooth and, of course, virginal-looking limbs twisted into attitudes to inflame a decadent taste. Rachel was right. Pig and even perhaps Paola, could only be products of a decky dance. Winsome, self-proclaimed king of it, felt only sorry it should ever have happened. How it had happened, how anybody, himself included, had contributed to it, he didn't know. He entered the room as Mafia was bent, stripping off a knee sock. College girl attire, he thought. He slapped her hard on the nearest buttock. She straightened, turned, and he slapped her across the face. What? she said. Something new, said Winsome, for variety's sake. One hand at her crotch, one twisted in her hair. He lifted her like the victim she wasn't, half carried, half tossed her to the bed where she lay in a sprawl of white skin, black pubic hair, and socks, all confused. He unzipped his fly. Aren't you forgetting something, she said, coy and half scared flipping her hair toward the dresser drawer. No, said Winsome. 
Not that I can think of. Three. Profane returned to the space-time agency, convinced that if nothing else, Rachel was luck. Bergamask had given him the job. Wonderful, she said. He's paying the fee. You don't owe us anything. It was near quitting time. She started straightening things on her desk. Come home with me, she said quietly. Wait out by the elevator. But he remembered, leaning against the wall out in the corridor, with Fina it had been like that too. She'd taken him home like a rosary found in the street and convinced herself he was magic. Fina had been devoutly R.C. like his father. Rachel was Jewish, he recalled, like his mother. Maybe all she wanted to do was to feed him, be a Jewish mother. They rode down in the elevator, crowded together and quiet, she wrapped serenely in a grey raincoat. At the turnstile in the subway, she put in two tokens for them. Hey, said Profane. You're broke, she told him. I feel like a gigolo. He did. There'd always be some fifteen cents, maybe half a salami in the refrigerator, whatever she'd feed him. Rachel decided to lodge Profane at Winsome's place and feed him at her own. Winsome's was known to the crew as the West Side Flophouse. There was floor space there for all of them at once, and Winsome didn't mind who slept on it. The next night, Pig Bodine showed up at Rachel's at supper time, drunk and in search of Paola, who was away God knew where. Hey, Pig addressed Profane. Buddy, Profane said. They opened beer. Soon Pig had dragged them down to the V-note to hear McClintic's sphere. Rachel sat and concentrated on the music while Pig and Profane remembered sea stories at each other. During one of the breaks, she drifted over to Sphere's table and found out he'd picked up a contract with Winsome to do two LPs for Outlandish. They talked for a while. Break ended. The quartet drifted back to the stand, fiddled around, started off with a Sphere composition called Fugue Your Buddy. Rachel returned to Pig and Profane. They were discussing Pappy Hod and Paola. Damn, damn, to herself. What have I brought him to? What have I brought him back to? She woke up the next morning, Sunday, mildly hungover. Winsome was outside, pounding at the door. It is a day of rest, she growled. What the hell? Dear Father Confessor, he said, looking as if he'd not slept all night. Don't be angry. Tell it the eigenvalue. She stopped to the kitchen, put coffee on. Now, she said, what is your problem? What else? Mafia. Now, this was all deliberate. He had put on the day before yesterday's shirt and neglected to comb his hair that morning to put Rachel in the mood. If you wanted a girl to go pimping for her roommate, you didn't come right out and say so. And there were subtleties to be gone through. Wanting to talk about Mafia was only an excuse. Rachel wanted to know, naturally enough, if he'd spoken to the dentist at all, and Winsome said no. Eigenvalue had been busy, lately, holding bull sessions with Stencil. Rooney wanted a woman's point of view. She poured coffee and told him the two roommates were gone. He closed his eyes and jumped in. I think she's been slipping around, Rachel. So? Find out and divorce her. They drained the coffee pot twice. Rooney drained himself. At three, Paola came in, smiled at them briefly, disappeared into her room. Did he blush a little? His heartbeat had speeded up. Dingy damn, he was acting like a young blood. He rose. Can we keep talking about this? He said. Even small talk. If it helps, she smiled, not believing it for a minute. And what's this about a contract with McClintock? Don't tell me Outlandish is putting out normal records now. What are you getting, religion? If I am, Rooney told her, it's all I'm getting. He walked back to his apartment through Riverside Park, wondering if he'd done right. Maybe, it occurred to him, Rachel might think it was herself he wanted, not her roommate. Back at the apartment, he found Profane talking with Mafia. Dear God, he thought, all I want to do is sleep. He went into the bed assumed the fetal position, and soon, oddly enough, did drift off. You tell me you are half Jewish and half Italian, Mafia was saying in the other room. What a terribly amusing role, like Shylock, non è vero, ha-ha. 
There is a young actor down at the Rusty Spoon who claims to be an Irish-Armenian Jew you two must meet. Profane decided not to argue, so all he said was, It is probably a nice place, that Rusty Spoon, but out of my class. Rot, she said. Class. Aristocracy is in the soul. You may be a descendant of kings, who knows? I know, Profane thought. I am a descendant of Schlemiel's. Job founded my line. Mafia wore a knit dress of some fabric that could be seen through. She sat with her chin on her knees so that the lower part of the skirt fell away. Profane rolled over on his stomach. Now this would be interesting, he thought. Yesterday Rachel had led him in by the hand to find Charisma, Fu, and Mafia playing Australian tag teams minus one on the living room floor. Mafia had squirmed to a prone position parallel to Profane. Apparently she had some idea of touching noses. Boy, I'll bet she thinks that's cute, he thought. But Fang the cat came tearing in and jumped between them. Mafia lay on her back and started scratching and dandling the cat. Profane padded to the icebox for more beer. In came Pig Bodine and Charisma, singing a drinking song. There are sick bars in every town in America, where sick people can pass the time of day. You can screw on the floor in Baltimore, make Freudian scenes in New Orleans, talk Zen and Beckett in Keokuk, Iowa. There's espresso machines in Terre Haute, Indiana, which is a cultural void if ever a void there be. But though I've dragged my ass from Boston, Mass., to the wide Pacific Sea, a rusty spoon is still the bar for me. A rusty spoon is the only place for me. It was like bringing a little bit of that gathering place in among the proper facades of Riverside Drive. Soon, without anyone realizing it, there was a party. Fu wandered in, got on the phone, and started calling people. Girls appeared miraculously at the front door, which had been left open. Someone turned on the FM, someone else went out for beer... Cigarette smoke began to hang from the low ceiling in murky strata. Two or three members got Profane off in a corner and began to indoctrinate him in the ways of the crew. He let them lecture and drank beer. Soon he was drunk, and it was night. He remembered to set the alarm clock, found an unoccupied corner of a room, and went to sleep. 4. That night... April 15th, David Ben-Gurion warned his country in an Independence Day speech that Egypt planned to slaughter Israel. A Mideast crisis had been growing since winter. April 19th, a ceasefire between the two countries went into effect. Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier III of Monaco the same day. The spring thus wore on, large currents and small eddies alike resulting in headlines. People read what news they wanted to, and each accordingly built his own rat house of history's rags and straws. In the city of New York alone, there were, at a rough estimate, five million different rat houses. God knew what was going on in the minds of cabinet ministers, heads of state and civil servants in the capitals of the world. Doubtless, their private versions of history showed up in action. If a normal distribution of types prevailed, they did. Stencil fell outside the pattern. Civil servant without rating. Architect by necessity of intrigues and breathings together. He should have been, like his father, inclined toward action, but spent his days instead at a certain vegetation, talking with eigenvalue, waiting for Paola to reveal how she fitted into this grand, gothic pile of inferences he was hard at work creating. Of course, too, there were his leads, which he hunted down, now lackadaisical and only half-interested, as if there were, after all, something more important he ought to be doing. What this mission was, however, came no clearer to him than the ultimate shape of his V-structure, no clearer, indeed, than why he should have begun pursuit of V in the first place. He only felt, he said by instinct, when a bit of information was useful, when not when a lead ought to be abandoned, when hounded to the inevitable looped trail. Naturally, about drives as intellectualized as stencils, there can be no question of instinct. 
The obsession was acquired, surely, but where along the line? How in the world? Unless he was, as he insisted, purely the centuries man, something which does not exist in nature, it would be simple in rusty spoon talk to call him contemporary man in search of an identity. Many of them had already decided this was his problem. The only trouble was that Stencil had all the identities he could cope with conveniently right at the moment. It was quite purely he who looks for thee, and whatever impersonations that might involve. And she was no more his own identity than I can value the sole dentist or any other member of the crew. It did bring up, however, an interesting note of sexual ambiguity. What a joke if at the end of this hunt he came face to face with himself afflicted by a kind of soul transvestism. How the crew would laugh and laugh. Truthfully, he didn't know what sex V might be, nor even what genus and species. To go along assuming that Victoria, the girl tourist, and Veronica, the sewer rat, were one and the same V, was not at all to bring up any metempsychosis, only to affirm that his quarry fitted in with the big one, the century's master cabal, in the same way Victoria had with the Vesu plot and Veronica with the new rat order. If she was a historical fact, then she continued active today and at the moment, because the ultimate plot, which has no name, was as yet unrealized, though V might be no more a she than a sailing vessel or a nation. Early in May, Eigenvalue introduced Stencil to Bloody Chicklets, president of Yoyodyne Incorporated, a company with factories scattered careless about the country and more government contracts than it really knew what to do with. In the late 1940s, Yo-Yo Dine had been breezing along comfortably as the Chicklets Toy Company, with one tiny independent-making shop on the outskirts of Nutley, New Jersey. For some reason, the children of America conceived around this time a simultaneous and psychopathic craving for simple gyroscopes, the kind which are set in motion by a string wound around the rotating shaft, something like a top. Chicklets, recognizing a market potential there, decided to expand. He was well on the way to cornering the toy gyroscope market when along came a group of school kids on tour to point out that these toys worked on the same principle as a gyro compass. As well, said Chicklets. They explained gyro compasses to him, also rate and free gyros. Chicklets remembered vaguely from a trade magazine that the government was always in the market for these. They used them on ships, airplanes, more lately missiles. Well, figured Chicklets, why not? Small business opportunities in the field at the time were being described as abundant. Chicklets started making gyros for the government. Before he knew it, he was also in telemeter instrumentation, test set components, small communications equipment. He kept expanding, buying, merging. Now, less than ten years later, he had built up an interlocking kingdom responsible for systems management, airframes, propulsion, command systems, Ground support equipment. Dine, one newly hired engineer had told him, was a unit of force. So to symbolize the humble beginnings of the Chicklets Empire, and to get the idea of force, enterprise, engineering skill, and rugged individualism in there too, Chicklets christened the company Yo-Yo Dine. Stencil toured one plant out on Long Island. Among instruments of war, he reasoned, some clue to the cabal might show up. It did. He'd wandered into a region of offices, drafting boards, blueprint files. Soon, Stencil discovered, sitting half-hidden in a forest of file cabinets, and sipping occasionally at the coffee in a paper cup, which for today's engineer is practically uniform of the day, a balding and porcine gentleman in a suit of European cut. The engineer's name was Kurt Mondogan, and he worked, yes, at Penemunde, developing Vergeltungswaffe, Eins and Zwei, the magic initial. Soon the afternoon had gone, 
and Stencil had made an appointment to renew the conversation. A week or so later, in one of the secluded side rooms of the Rusty Spoon, Mondogan yarned over an abominable imitation of Munich beer about youthful days in southwest Africa. Stencil listened attentively. The tale proper and the questioning after took no more than thirty minutes. Yet the next Wednesday afternoon at Eigenvalue's office, when Stencil retold it, the yarn had undergone considerable change, had become, as Eigenvalue put it, stencilized. Chapter 9. Mondoggin's Story V. 1. One May morning in 1922, meaning nearly winter here in the Varmbat district, a young engineering student named Kurt Mondoggin, late of the Technical University in Munich, arrived at a white outpost near the village of Kalkfontein South. More voluptuous than fat, with fair hair, long eyelashes, and a shy smile that enchanted older women, Mondoggin sat in an aged cape cart, idly picking his nose, waiting for the sun to come up and contemplating the Pontoc or grass hut of Willem van Wyck, a minor extremity of the administration in Windhoek. His horse drowsed and collected dew while Mondoggin squirmed on the seat, trying to control anger, confusion, petulance. And below the farthest verge of the Kalahari, that vast death, the tardy sun mocked him. Originally a native of Leipzig, Mondoggin exhibited at least two aberrations peculiar to the region. One, minor, he had the Saxon habit of attaching diminutive endings to nouns, animate or inanimate, at apparent random. Two, major, he shared with his fellow citizen Karl Baedeker a basic distrust of the South, however relative a region that might be. Imagine, then, the irony with which he viewed his present condition, and the horrid perversity he fancied had driven him first to Munich for advanced study, then, as if like melancholy, this South sickness were progressive and incurable, finally, to leave depression time in Munich, journey into this other hemisphere, and enter mirror time in the Southwest Protectorate. Mondoggin was here as part of a program having to do with atmospheric radio disturbances, spherics for short. During the Great War, one H. Barkhausen, listening in on telephone messages among the Allied forces, heard a series of falling tones, much like a slide whistle descending in pitch. Each of these whistlers, as Barkhausen named them, lasted only about a second and seemed to be in the lower audio frequency range. As it turned out, the whistler was only the first of a family of spherics whose taxonomy was to include clicks, hooks, risers, nose whistlers, and one like a warbling of birds called the dawn chorus. No one knew exactly what caused any of them. Some said sunspots, others lightning bursts. But everyone agreed that in there someplace was the Earth's magnetic field. So a plan evolved to keep a record of spherics received at different latitudes. Mondoggin, near the bottom of the list, drew southwest Africa and was ordered to set up his equipment as close to 28 degrees south as he conveniently could. It had disturbed him at first, having to live in what had once been a German colony. Like most violent young men, and not a few stuffy old ones, he found the idea of defeat hateful. But he soon discovered that many Germans who'd been landowners before the war had simply continued on, allowed by the government of the Cape to keep their citizenship, property, and native workers. A kind of expatriate social life had indeed developed at the farm of one Foppel, in the northern part of the district between the Karas Range and the marches of the Kalahari, and within a day's journey of Mondoggin's recovery station. Boisterous were the parties, 
lively the music, jolly the girls that had filled Farple's Baroque plantation house nearly every night since Mondorgin's arrival, in a seemingly eternal fashion. But now what well-being he'd found in this godforsaken region seemed about to evaporate. The sun rose, and Van Vyck appeared in his doorway like a two-dimensional figure jerked suddenly on stage by hidden pulleys. A vulture lit in front of the hut and stared at Van Vyck. Mondorgin himself acquired motion, jumped down off the cart, moved toward the hut. Van Vyck waved a bottle of homemade beer at him. I know, he shouted across the parched earth between them. I know. I've been up all night with it. You think I don't have more to worry about? My antennas, Mondorgin cried. Your antennas, my Varmbot district, the boar said. He was half drunk. Do you know what happened yesterday? Get worried. Abraham Morris has crossed the orange. Which, as had been intended, shook Mondorgin. He managed. Only Morris? Six men, some women and children, rifles, stock. It isn't that. Morris isn't a man. He's a messiah. Mondorgin's annoyance had given way all at once to fear. Fear began to bud from his intestinal walls. They threatened to rip down your antennas, didn't they? But he'd done nothing. Van Vyck snorted. You contributed. You told me you'd listen for disturbances and record certain data. You didn't say you'd blast them out all over my bush country and become a disturbance yourself. The Bondelschwarz believe in ghosts. The spherics frighten them. Frightened, they're dangerous. Mondagen admitted he'd been using an audio amplifier and loudspeaker. I fall asleep, he explained. Different sorts come in at different times of day. I'm a one-man research team. I have to sleep sometime. The little loudspeaker is set up at the head of my cot. I've conditioned myself to awake instantaneously, so no more than the first few of any group are lost. When you return to your station, Fenvike cut in, those antennas will be down and your equipment smashed. A moment... As the young man turned red-faced and snuffling, before you dash off screaming revenge, one word, just one, an unpleasant word, rebellion. Every time a bundle talks back to you people, it's rebellion. Mondaugan looked as if he might cry. Abraham Morris has joined forces by now with Jacobus Christian and Tim Boykis. They're trekking north. You saw for yourself that they'd heard about it already in your own neighborhood. It wouldn't surprise me if every Bondelschwarz in the district were under arms within the week. Not to mention a number of homicidally disposed Feldschoendrachers and Wittboers from up north. Wittboers are always looking for a fight. Inside the hut, a telephone began to ring. Van Weyck saw the look on Mondagen's face. Yes, he said. Wait here. It may be interesting news. He vanished inside. From a nearby hut came the sound of a Bondelschwarz penny whistle, insubstantial as wind, monotonous as sunlight in a dry season. Mondagen listened as if it had something to say to him. It didn't. Van Vyck appeared in the doorway. Now listen to me, Junker. If I were you, I would go to Varmbot and stay there until this blows over. What's happened? That was the location, Superintendent, at Teruchas. Apparently they caught up with Morris, and a Sergeant van Niekirk tried an hour ago to get him to come into Farmbot peacefully. Morris refused. Van Niekirk placed his hand on Morris's shoulder in token of arrest. According to the Bondel version, which you may be sure has already spread to the Portuguese frontier, the sergeant then proclaimed, Dilute van de gouvernement... Sal now up you la smelt. The lead of the government shall now melt upon you. Poetic, wouldn't you say? The bundles with Morris took it as a declaration of war, so the balloon's gone up, Mundagen. Go to Varmbot, better yet keep going and get safely across the orange. That's my best advice. No. No, Mundagen said. I am something of a coward, you know that. But tell me your second best advice, because you see, there are my antennas. You worry about your antennas as if they sprouted from your forehead. Go ahead. Return, if you have the courage, which I certainly don't. Return up country and tell them at Fopples what you've heard here. Hole up in that fortress of his. If you want my own opinion, it will be a bloodbath. You weren't here in 1904, but ask Fopple. He remembers. 
telling the days of Fanchota are back again. You could have prevented this, Mondagan cried. Isn't that what you're all here for, to keep them happy? To remove any need for rebellion? Van Vyck exploded in a bitter fit of laughing. You seem, he finally drawled, to be under certain delusions about the civil service. History, the proverb says, is made at night. The European civil servant normally sleeps at night. What waits in his inn basket to confront him at nine in the morning is history. He doesn't fight it. He tries to coexist with it. The loot van die government, indeed. We are perhaps the lead weights of a fantastic clock, necessary to keep it in motion, to keep an ordered sense of history and time prevailing against chaos. Very well. Let a few of them melt. Let the clock tell false time for a while, but the weights will be reforged and rehung, and if there doesn't happen to be one there in the shape or name of Willem van Wyck to make it run right again, so much the worse for me. To this curious soliloquy, Kurt Mondalgen flipped a desperate farewell salute, climbed into his cape cart, and headed back up country. The trip was uneventful. Once in a great while, an ox cart would materialize out of the scrubland, or a jet black kite would come to hang in the sky, studying something small and quick among the cactus and thorn trees. The sun was hot. Mondagan leaked at every orifice, fell asleep, was jolted awake, once dreamed gunshots and human screams. He arrived at the recovery station in the afternoon found the Bondle village nearby quiet and his equipment undisturbed. Working as quickly as he could, he dismantled the antennas and packed them and the receiving equipment in the Cape Cart. Half a dozen Bondelschwarz stood around watching. By the time he was ready to leave, the sun was nearly down. From time to time at the edges of his field of vision, Mondaugen would see small scurrying bands of Bondles, seeming almost to merge with the twilight, moving in and out of the small settlement in every direction. Somewhere to the west, a dogfight had started. As he tightened the last half-hitch, a penny whistle began to play nearby, and it took him only a moment to realize that the player was imitating Spherix. Bondles, who were watching, started to giggle. The laughter swelled until it sounded like a jungle full of small exotic animals fleeing some basic danger but Mondagan knew well enough who was fleeing what. The sun set. He climbed on the cart. No one said anything in farewell. All he heard at his back were the whistle and the laughter. It was several more hours to Fopples. The only incident en route was a flurry of gunfire, real this time, off to his left behind a hill. At last... Quite early in the morning, the lights of Fopples burst on him suddenly out of the scrublands' absolute blackness. He crossed a small ravine on a plank bridge and drew up before the door. As usual, a party was in progress. A hundred windows blazed. The gargoyles, arabesques, pargeting, and fretwork of Fopples' villa vibrated in the African night. A cluster of girls and Fopple himself stood at the door while the farm's bundles offloaded the Cape Cart and Mondagan reported the situation. The news alarmed certain of Fopple's neighbors who owned farms and stock nearby. But it would be best, Fopple announced to the party, if we all stayed here. If there's to be burning and destruction, it will happen whether or not you're there to defend your own. If we disperse our strength, they can destroy us as well as our farms. This house is the best fortress in the region, strong, easily defended. House and grounds are protected on all sides by deep ravines. There is more than enough food, good wine, music, and, winking lewdly, beautiful women. To hell with them out there. Let them have their war. In here we shall hold fashing. Bolt the doors, seal the windows, tear down the plank bridges, and distribute arms. Tonight we enter a state of siege. Two. Thus began Fopple's siege party. Mondagan left after two and a half months. In that time, no one had ventured outside or received any news from the rest of the district. By the time Mondagan departed, a dozen bottles of wine still lay cobwebbed in the cellar. A dozen cattle remained to be slaughtered. The vegetable garden behind the house was still abundant with tomatoes, yams, chard, herbs. So affluent was the farmer Fopple. 
The day after Mondagin's arrival, the house and grounds were sealed off from the outside world. Up went an inner palisade of strong logs pointed at the top, and down went the bridges. A watch list was made up, a general staff appointed, all in the spirit of a new party game. A curious crew were thus thrown together. Many, of course, were German. Rich neighbors, visitors from Windhoek and Svakopmund. But there were also Dutch and English from the Union, Italians, Austrians, Belgians from the diamond fields near the coast, French, Russian, Spanish, and one Pole from various corners of the earth, all creating the appearance of a tiny European conclave or League of Nations assembled here while political chaos howled outside. Early on the morning after his arrival, Mondagin was up on the roof stringing his antennas along the iron fancy work that topped the villa's highest gable. He had an uninspiring view of ravines, grass, dry pans, dust, scrub, all repeating, undulating east to the eventual wastes of the Kalahari, north to a distant yellow exhalation that rose from far under the horizon and seemed to hang eternally over the Tropic of Capricorn. Back here, Mondagin could also see down into a kind of inner courtyard. Sunlight, filtered through a great sandstorm far away in the desert, bounced off an open bay window and down, too bright as if amplified into the courtyard to illuminate a patch or pool of deep red. Twin tendrils of it extended to a nearby doorway. Mondagin shivered and stared. The reflected sunlight vanished up a wall and into the sky. He looked up, saw the window opposite complete its swing open, and a woman of indeterminate age, in a negligee of peacock blues and greens, squint into the sun. Her left hand rose to her left eye, fumbled there as if positioning a monocle. Mondagin crouched behind curlicues of wrought iron, astonished not so much at anything in her appearance as at his own latent desire to see and not be seen. He waited for the sun or her chance movement to show him nipples, navel, pubic hair. But she had seen him. Come out, come out, gargoyle, she called playfully. Mondagin lurched vertical, lost his balance, nearly fell off the roof, grabbed hold of a lightning rod, slid to a forty-five degree angle, and began to laugh. My little antennas, he gurgled. Come to the roof garden, she invited, and disappeared then back into a white room turned to blinding enigma by a sun finally free of its Kalahari. He completed his job of setting up the antennas, then made his way round cupolas and chimney pots, up and down slopes and slates, till at length he vaulted clumsily over a low wall, and it seemed some tropic as well, for the life there he found too lavish, spectral, probably carnivorous, not in good taste. How pretty he is! The woman, dressed now in jodhpurs and an army shirt, leaned against the wall, smoking a cigarette. All at once, as he'd been half expecting, cries of pain lanced a morning quiet that had known only visiting kites and wind, and the dry rustling of the exterior veldt. Mondaugan knew, without having to run to see, that the cries had come from the courtyard where he'd seen the crimson stain. Neither he nor the woman moved. It somehow, having become part of a mutual constraint, that neither of them show curiosity. Voila! Conspiracy already, without a dozen words having passed between them. Her name proved to be Vera Moroving, her companion a Lieutenant Weissmann, her city, Munich. Perhaps we even met one Fasching, she said, masked and strangers. Mundagen doubted, but had they met, were there any least basis for that conspiracy a moment ago, it would surely have been somewhere like Munich, a city dying of abandon, finality, a mark swollen with fiscal cancer. As the distance between them gradually diminished, Mondagen saw that her left eye was artificial. She, noticing his curiosity, obligingly removed the eye and held it out to him in the hollow of her hand. A bubble-blown translucent, 
its white would show up when in the socket as a half-lit sea-green. A fine network of nearly microscopic fractures covered its surface. Inside were the delicate wrought wheels, springs, ratchets of a watch, wound by a gold key which Fräulein Moroving wore on a slender chain round her neck. Darker green and flecks of gold had been fused into twelve vaguely zodiacal shapes, placed annular on the surface of the bubble to represent the iris and also the face of the watch. What was it like outside? He told her the little he knew. Her hands had begun to tremble. He noticed it when she went to replace the eye. He could scarcely hear her when she said, It could be 1904 again. Curious. Van Weyck had said that. What was 1904 to these people? He was about to ask her when Lieutenant Weissmann appeared in Mufti from behind an unwholesome-looking palm and pulled her by the hand back into the depths of the house. Two things made Farples a fortunate place to be carrying on spheric research. First, the farmer had given Mondagan a room to himself in a turret at one corner of the house, a little enclave of scientific endeavor, buffered by a number of empty storage rooms and with access to the roof through a stained-glass window, portraying an early Christian martyr being devoured by wild beasts. Second, modest though their demands were, there was an auxiliary source of electric power for his receivers in the small generator Foppel kept to light the giant chandelier in the dining hall. Rather than rely, as he had been doing, on a number of bulky batteries, Mundagan was sure it wouldn't be too difficult simply to tap off and devise circuitry to modify what power he needed, either to operate the equipment directly or to recharge the batteries. Accordingly, that afternoon, after arranging his effects, equipment, and the attendant paperwork into an imitation of professional disorder, Mundaugen set off into the house and down in search of this generator. Soon, padding down a narrow, sloping corridor, he was brought to attention by a mirror hung some twenty feet ahead, angled to reflect the interior of a room around the next corner. Framed for him there were Vera Moroving and her lieutenant in profile, she striking at his chest with what appeared to be a small riding crop, he twisting a gloved hand into her hair and talking to her all the while, so precisely that the voyeur Mondagen could lip-read each obscenity. The geometry of the corridors somehow baffled all sound. Mondagen, with the queer excitement he'd felt watching her at her window that morning, expected captions explaining it all to flash onto the mirror. But she finally released Weissmann. He reached out with the curiously gloved hand and closed the door. And it was as if Mondagen had dreamed them. Presently he began to hear music, which grew louder the deeper he descended into this house. Accordion? Fiddle and guitar were playing a tango full of minor chords and an eerie flatting of certain notes which to German ears should have remained natural. A young girl's voice was singing sweetly. Love's a lash, kisses gall the tongue, harrow the heart, caresses tease cankered tissue apart. Liebchen, come be my hot and thought bondsman tonight. The Schambach's kiss is unending delight. Love, my little slave, is colorblind, for white and black are only states of mind. So at my feet nod and genuflect, whimper for me. Though tears are dried, their pain is yet to be. Enchanted, Mondagen peered round the door jamb and found the singer to be a child of not more than sixteen, with white blonde hip-length hair and breasts perhaps too large for her slender frame. I am Hedwig Vogelsang, she informed him, and my purpose on earth is to tantalize and send raving the race of man. Whereupon the musicians, hidden from them in an alcove behind a hanging arras, struck up a kind of shottish. Mondaugen, overcome by the sudden scent of musk, brought in a puff to his nostrils by interior winds which could not have arisen by accident, seized her round the waist, and wheeled with her across the room and out, and through a bedroom lined with mirrors, round a canopied four-poster and into a long gallery, 
stabbed at ten-yard intervals down its length by yellow daggers of African sun, hung with nostalgic landscapes of a Rhine valley that never existed, portraits of Prussian officers who died long before Caprivi, some even before Bismarck, and their blonde, untender ladies who'd nothing now but dust to bloom in. Past rhythmic gusts of blonde sun that crazed the eyeballs with vain images. Out of the gallery and into a tiny unfurnished room hung all in black velvet, high as the house, narrowing into a chimney and open at the top so that one could see the stars in the daytime. Finally, down three or four steps to Foppel's own planetarium, a circular room with a great wooden sun overlaid with gold leaf, burning cold in the very center, and round it the nine planets and their moons suspended from tracks in the ceiling, actuated by a coarse cobweb of chains, pulleys, belts, racks, pinions, and worms, all receiving their prime impulse from a treadmill in the corner, usually operated for the amusement of the guests by a Bandelschwarz, now unoccupied. Having long fled all vestiges of music, Mundagen released her here, skipped to the treadmill, and began a jog trot that set the solar system in motion, creaking and whining in a way that raised a prickling in the teeth. Rattling, shuddering, the wooden planets began to rotate and spin. Saturn's rings to whirl, moons their precessions, our own Earth its nutational wobble, all picking up speed as the girl continued to dance, having chosen the planet Venus for her partner. As Mundagen dashed along his own geodesic, following in the footsteps of a generation of slaves. When at length he tired, slowed and stopped, she'd gone, vanished into the wooden reaches of what remained, after all, a parody of space. Mondagan, breathing heavily, staggered off the treadmill to carry on his descent and search for the generator. Soon he stumbled into a basement room where gardening implements were stored. As if the entire day had come into being only to prepare him for this, he discovered a bundle mail, face down and naked, the back and buttocks showing scar tissue from old shambockings, as well as more recent wounds, laid open across the flesh like so many toothless smiles. Hardening himself, the weakling Mondagan approached the man and stooped to listen for breathing or a heartbeat, trying not to see the white vertebra that winked at him from one long opening. "'Don't touch him!' Foppel stood holding a shambok, or cattle whip of giraffe hide, tapping the handle against his leg in a steady, syncopated figure. He doesn't want you to help, even to sympathize. He doesn't want anything but the shambok. Raising his voice till it found the hysterical bitch level Foppel always affected with bundles. You like the shambok, don't you, Andreas? Andreas moved his head feebly and whispered, Boss, your people have defied the government. Foppel continued. They've rebelled. They have sinned. General von Trotter will have to come back to punish you all. He'll have to bring his soldiers with the beards and the bright eyes and his artillery that speaks with a loud voice. How you will enjoy it, Andreas. Like Jesus returning to earth, von Trotter is coming to deliver you. Be joyful. Sing hymns of thanks. And until then, love me as your parent, because I am von Trotter's arm and the agent of his will. As van Weyck had bade him to do, Mundagen remembered to ask Foppel about 1904 and the days of von Trotter. If Foppel's response was sick, it was sick of more than simple enthusiasm. Not only did he yarn about the past, first there in the cellar, as both stood watching a Bondelschwartz, whose face Mundagen was never to see, continue to die. Later, at riotous feasting, on watch or patrol, to ragtime accompaniment in the grand ballroom, even up in the turret as deliberate interruption to the experiment. But he also seemed under compulsion somehow to recreate the Deutsch Südwest Africa of nearly twenty years ago, 
in word and perhaps in deed. Perhaps, because as the siege party progressed, it became more and more difficult to make the distinction. One midnight, Mondagan stood on a small balcony just under the eaves, officially on watch, though little could be seen in the uncertain illumination. The moon, or half of it, had risen above the house, his antennas cut like rigging dead black across its face. As he swung his rifle idly by its shoulder strap, gazing out across the ravine at nothing in particular, someone stepped onto the balcony beside him. It was an old Englishman named Godolphin, tiny in the moonlight. Small scrubland noises now and again rose to them from the outside. I hope I don't disturb you, Godolphin said. Mondagan shrugged, keeping his eyes in a constant sweep over what he guessed to be the horizon. I enjoy it on watch, the Englishman continued. It's the only peace there is to this eternal celebration. He was a retired sea captain. In his seventies, Mundagan would guess. I was in Cape Town, trying to raise a crew for the pole. Mundagan's eyebrows went up. Embarrassed, he began to pick at his nose. The South Pole? Of course. Rather awkward, if it were the other. Ha, oh, oh. ha. And I'd heard of a stout boat in Svakopmund. But, of course, she was too small. Hardly due for the pack ice. Foppel was in town and invited me out for a weekend. I imagine I needed the rest. You sound cheerful, in the face of what must be frequent disappointment. They leave the sting out. Treat the doddering old fool with sympathy. He's living in the past. Of course I'm living in the past. I was there. At the pole? Certainly. Now I have to go back. It's that simple. I'm beginning to think that if I get through our siege party, I shall be quite ready for anything the Antarctic has for me. Mondagan was inclined to agree. Though I don't plan on any little Antarctic. The old sea dog chuckled. Oh, there will be. You wait. Everyone has an Antarctic. Which, it occurred to Mondagan, was as far south as one could get. At first he'd plunged eagerly into the social life that jittered all over the sprawling plantation house, usually leaving his scientific duties until the early afternoon, when everyone but the watch was asleep. He had even begun a dogged pursuit of Hedwig Vogelsang, but somehow kept running into Vera Moroving instead. South sickness in its tertiary stage, whispered that adenoidal Saxon youth who was Mundagen's double-ganger. Beware! Beware! The woman, twice as old as he, exerted a sexual fascination he found impossible to explain away. He'd meet her head-on in corridors, or rounding some salient of cabinet work, or on the roof, or simply in the night, always unlooked for. He would make no advances— she, no response, but despite all efforts to hold it in check, their conspiracy grew. As if it were a real affair, Lieutenant Weissmann cornered him in the billiard room. Mundagen quivered and prepared to flee, but it proved to be something else entirely. You're from Munich, Weissmann established. Ever been around the Schwabing Quarter? On occasion. The Brennissel Cabaret? Never. Ever heard of D'Annunzio? Then Mussolini? Fiume? Italia Irredenta? Fascisti? National Socialist German Workers' Party? Adolf Hitler? Kautsky's Independence? So many capital letters, Mundagen protested. From Munich, and never heard of Hitler, said Weissmann, as if Hitler were the name of an avant-garde play. What the hell's wrong with young people? Light from the green overhead lamp turned his spectacles to twin, tender leaves, giving him a gentle look. I'm an engineer, you see. Politics isn't my line. Some day we'll need you, Weissmann told him, for something or other, I'm sure. Specialized and limited as you are, you fellows will be valuable. I didn't mean to get angry. Politics is a kind of engineering, isn't it? With people as your raw material. I don't know, Weissman said. Tell me, how long are you staying in this part of the world? No longer than I have to. Six months? It's indefinite. 
If I could put you in the way of something, oh, with a little authority to it, not really involving much of your time. Organizing, you'd call it? Yes, you're sharp. You knew right away, didn't you? Yes, you are my man. The young people especially, Mundagin, because you see, I know this won't be repeated, we could be getting it back. The Protectorate? But it's under the League of Nations. Weissmann threw back his head and began to laugh and would say no more. Mondagan shrugged, took down a cue, dumped the three balls from their velvet bag and practiced draw shots till well into the morning. He emerged from the billiard room to hot jazz from somewhere overhead. Blinking, he made his way up marble steps to the grand ballroom and found the dance floor empty. Clothing of both sexes was littered about. The music, which came from a gramophone in the corner, roared gay and hollow under the electric chandelier. But no one was there. No one at all. He plodded up to his turret room with its ludicrous circular bed and found that a typhoon of spherics had been bombarding the earth. He fell asleep and dreamed, for the first time since he'd left it, of Munich. In the dream it was Fasching, the mad German carnival or Mardi Gras that ends the day before Lent begins. The season in Munich, under the Weimar Republic and the inflation, had followed since the war a constantly rising curve, taking human depravity as ordinate. Chief reason being that no one in the city knew if he'd be alive or well come next Fasching. Any windfall, food, firewood, coal, was consumed as quickly as possible. Why hoard? Why ration? Depression hung in the gray strata of clouds, looked at you out of faces waiting in bread queues and dehumanized by the bitter cold. Depression stalked the Liebigstrasse, where Mondagen had had an attic room in a mansard. A figure with an old woman's face bent against the wind off the Izar and wrapped tightly in a frayed black coat, who might, like some angel of death, mark in pink spittle the doorsteps of those who'd starve tomorrow. It was dark. He was in an old cloth jacket, a stocking cap tugged down over his ears, arms linked with a number of young people he didn't know, but suspected were students, all singing a death song and weaving side to side in a chain, broadside to the street's center line. He could hear bands of other rollickers, drunk and singing lustily in other streets, Beneath a tree near one of the infrequent streetlights, he came upon a boy and girl, coupled, one of the girl's fat and aging thighs exposed to the still winter wind. He stooped and covered them with his old jacket. His tears fell and froze in midair and rattled like sleet on the couple who'd turned to stone. He was in a beer hall, young, old, students, workmen, grandfathers, adolescent girls drank, sang, cried— fondled blindly after same and different sex alike. Someone had set a blaze in the fireplace and was roasting a cat he'd found in the street. The black oak clock above the fireplace ticked terribly loud in strange waves of silence that swept regularly over the company. Girls appeared out of the confusion of moving faces, sat on his lap while he squeezed breasts and thighs and tweaked noses. Beer spilled at the far end of the table and swept the table's length in a great foam cascade. The fire that had been roasting the cat spread to a number of tables and had to be doused with more beer. Fat and charred black, the cat itself was snatched from the hands of its unfortunate cook and tossed about the room like a football, blistering the hands that passed it on till it disintegrated among roars of laughter. Smoke hung like winter fog in the beer hall, changing the massed weaving of bodies to more a writhing, perhaps, of damned in some underworld. Faces all had the same curious whiteness, concave cheeks, highlighted temples, bone of the starved corpse there just under the skin. Vera Moroving appeared. Why, Vera? Her black mask covered the entire head, in black sweater and black dancer's tights. Come, she whispered, led him by the hand through narrow streets, hardly lit but thronged with celebrants who sang and cheered in tubercular voices. 
white faces like diseased blooms bobbed along in the dark as if moved by other forces towards some graveyard to pay homage at an important burial. At dawn she came in through the stained-glass window to tell him that another bundle had been executed, this time by hanging. Come and see, she urged him, in the garden. No, no. It had been a popular form of killing during the Great Rebellion of 1904-07, when the Herreros and Hottentots, who usually fought one another, staged a simultaneous but uncoordinated rising against an incompetent German administration. General Lothar von Trotter, having demonstrated to Berlin during his Chinese and East African campaigns a certain expertise at suppressing pigmented populations, was brought in to deal with the Herreros. In August 1904, von Trotter issued his Fernichtungsbefehl, whereby the German forces were ordered to exterminate systematically every Herrero man woman, and child they could find. He was about eighty percent successful. Out of the estimated eighty thousand Herreros living in the territory in 1904, an official German census taken seven years later set the Herrero population at only 15,130, this being a decrease of 64,870. Similarly, the Hottentots were reduced in the same period by about 10,000. The Berg Damaras by 17,000. Allowing for natural causes during those unnatural years, von Trotter, who stayed for only one of them, is reckoned to have done away with about 60,000 people. This is only one percent of six million, but still pretty good. Fapo had first come to Sudwest Africa as a young army recruit. It didn't take him long to find out how much he enjoyed it all. He'd ridden out with von Trotter that August, that inverted spring. You'd find them wounded or sick by the side of the road, he told Mundagen, but you didn't want to waste ammunition. Logistics at the time were sluggish. Some you bayoneted, others you hanged. The procedure was simple. One led the fellow or woman to the nearest tree, stood him on an ammunition box, fashioned a noose of rope, failing that telegraph or fencing wire, slipped it round his neck, ran the rope through a fork in the tree, and secured it to the trunk, kicked the box away. It was slow strangulation, but then these were summary courts-martial. Field expedients had to be used when you couldn't put up a scaffold each time. Of course not, said Mondalgan in his nitpicking engineer's way, but with so much telegraph wire and so many ammunition boxes lying around, logistics couldn't have been all that sluggish. Oh, Popple said, well, you're busy. As it happened, Mundagan was, though it may have been only because of bodily exhaustion from too much partying, he'd begun to notice something unusual in the spheric signals. Having dexterously scavenged a motor from one of Farple's phonographs, a pen and rollers and several long sheets of paper, a resourceful Mundagen had fashioned a crude sort of oscillograph to record signals in his absence. The project hadn't seen fit to provide him with one, and he'd had nowhere to go at his former station, making one up till now unnecessary. As he looked now at the cryptic pen scrawls, he detected a regularity or patterning which might almost have been a kind of code, but it took him weeks even to decide that the only way to see if it were a code was to try to break it. His room became littered with tables, equations, graphs. He appeared to labor to the accompaniment of twitterings, hisses, clicks, and carolings, but in reality he dawdled. Something kept him off. Events intimidated him. One night during another typhoon, the oscillograph broke, chattering and scratching away madly. The difficulty was minor, and Mondagen was able to fix it, but he wondered if the malfunction had been quite an accident. He took to roaming the house at odd hours, at loose ends. Like the eye in his dream of fashing, he now found he had a gift of visual serendipity, a sense of timing, a perverse certainty about not whether but when to play the voyeur. A taming, possibly, of the original heat with which he'd watched Vera Moroving in the earlier days of the siege party. For example, 
Leaning in bleak winter sunlight against a Corinthian column, Mondalgan could hear her voice not far away. No, non-military it may be, but a false siege it is not. Mondalgan lit a cigarette and peered around the column. She was sitting in the rockery with old Godolphin beside a goldfish pool. Do you remember, she began, but then noticed perhaps the pain of a return home choking him more than any noose of memory she could provide because she let him interrupt. I have done believing in siege as anything more than military technic. That was well over with twenty years ago, before even your beloved 1904. Condescending, she explained that she'd been off in another country in 1904, and that a year and place don't have to include the physical person for there to be a certain ownership. It was beyond Godolphin. I was advising the Russian fleet in 1904, he remembered. They didn't take my advice. The Japanese, you'll remember, bottled us up in Port Arthur. Good God! It was a siege in the great tradition. It lasted a year. I remember frozen hillsides and the ghastly nagging of those field mortars coughing away day in and day out, and white spotlights moving over the positions at night, blinding you. A devout junior officer with an arm gone and the empty sleeve pinned across like a sash said they looked like the fingers of God seeking soft throats to strangle. Lieutenant Weissmann and Herr Fappel have given me my 1904, she told him, like a schoolgirl enumerating birthday gifts, just as you were given your vesu. Hardly any time at all passed before he cried, No, no, I was there. Then, his head moving with difficulty to face her, I didn't tell you about vesu. Did I? Of course you did. I hardly remember Vesu myself. I do. I have remembered for us. Have remembered, with a sudden canny tilt to one eye. But it relaxed, and he rambled off. If anything gave me my Vesu, it was the time, the pole, the service. But it's all been taken away. I mean the leisure and the sympathy. It's fashionable to say the war did it. Whatever you choose, but Vesu is gone and impossible to bring back, along with so many other old jokes, songs, rages, and the sort of beauty one had in Cleo de Merode or Eleonora Duse. And the way those eyes turned down at the corners, the incredible expanse of eyelid above, like old vellum. But you're too young, you wouldn't remember. I'm past forty, smiled Vera Moroving. And, of course, I remember. I was given the Duzet, too, by the man, in fact, who gave her to Europe over twenty years ago in Il Fuoco. We were in Fiume, another siege, but Christmas before last. He called it the Christmas of Blood. He gave her to me as memories in his palace while the Andrea Doria dropped shells on us. They'd go to the Adriatic on holiday, Godolphin said with a foolish smile, as if the memory were his own. He, naked, rode his sorrel into the sea while she waited on the strand. No. Suddenly, and only for the moment, vicious. Nor selling her jewels to suppress the novel about her, nor using a virgin's skull for a loving cup. None of that's true. She was past forty and in love, and he hurt her. Went out of his way to hurt her. That's all there was to it. Weren't we both in Florence, then? While he was writing the novel about their affair, how could we have avoided them? Yet it seemed always that I was just missing him, first in Florence, then in Paris just before the war, as if I'd been condemned to wait until he reached his supreme moment, his peak of virtu. Fiume. In Florence we... Quizzical, weak. She leaned forward as if hinting she'd like to be kissed. Don't you see? This siege. It's Vesu. It's finally happened. Abruptly, then occurred one of those ironic reversals in which the weakling for a short while gains the upper hand, and the attacker is forced at best into a holding operation. Mondalgan, watching, credited this less to any internal logic in their discussion 
than to a latent virility in the old man hidden against contingencies like this from the cormorant graspings of age. Godolphin laughed at her. There's been a war, Fräulein. Vesu was a luxury, an indulgence. We can no longer afford the likes of Vesu. But the need, she protested, it's void. What can fill that? He cocked his head and grinned at her. What is already filling it, the real thing, unfortunately. Take your friend Denunzio. Whether we like it or not, that war destroyed a kind of privacy, perhaps the privacy of dream. Committed us, like him, to work out three o'clock anxieties, excesses of character, political hallucinations on a live mass, a real human population. The discretion, the sense of comedy about the Vesu affair are with us no more. Our Vesus are no longer our own or even confined to a circle of friends. Their public property, God knows how much of it the world will see or what lengths it will be taken to. It's a pity, and I'm only glad I don't have to live in it too much longer. You're remarkable, was all she'd say, and after braining an inquisitive goldfish with a rock, she left Godolphin. Alone, he said. We simply grow up. In Florence, at age fifty-four, I was a brash youth. Had I known the Duse was there, her poet chap might have found dangerous competition. Uh-huh. The only trouble is that now, nearing eighty, I keep discovering that damned war has made the world older than I. The world frowns now on youth in a vacuum. It insists youth be turned to, utilized, exploited. No time for pranks. No more vesus. Ah, well and to a catchy, rather syncopated fox-trot tune he sang. Once we could flirt and spoon, down by the summertime sea. Your aunt, Iphigenia, found it terribly odd to see us stealing a kiss there on the promenade. Oh, you weren't past seventeen. Parasol pretty for me. Ah, could we but return to that season of light with our puppy love soaring like a gay summer kite when it wasn't yet time to think of autumn or night down by the summertime sea? Here, Eigenvalue made his single interruption. They spoke in German? English? Did Mondaga know English then? forestalling a nervous outburst by stencil. I only think it's strange that he should remember an unremarkable conversation, let alone in that much detail, thirty-four years later, a conversation meaning nothing to Mundagen but everything to stencil. Stencil, silenced, puffed his pipe and watched the psychodontist, a quirk to one side of his mouth revealed now and again, enigmatic through the white fumes. Finally, Stencil called it serendipity. Not he. Do you understand? Of course you do. But you want to hear him say it. I understand only, Eigenvalue drawled, that your attitude toward V must have more sides to it than you're ready to admit. It's what the psychoanalysts used to call ambivalence. What we now call simply a heterodont configuration. Stencil made no answer. Eigenvalue shrugged and let him continue. In the evening, a roasted veal was set out on a long table in the dining hall. Guests fell upon it drunkenly, tearing away choice pieces of flesh with their hands, staining what clothes they wore with gravy and grease. Mondagen was feeling his usual reluctance to return to work. He padded along crimson carpeted passageways, mirrored, unpopulated, ill-lit, without echoes. He was, tonight, a bit upset and depressed without being able to say exactly why. Perhaps because he'd begun to detect the same desperation in Farpel's siege party as there'd been in Munich during Fasching, but without any clear reason for here, after all, was abundance, not depression, luxury, not a daily struggle for life, above all, possibly breasts and buttocks that could be pinched. Somehow he'd wandered by Heidwick's room. 
Her door was open. She sat before her vanity mirror, making up her eyes. Come in, she called. Don't stand there leering. Your little eyes look so antiquated. Herr Foppel has ordered all the ladies to dress and make up as they would have done in 1904. She giggled. I wasn't even born in 1904, so I really shouldn't be wearing anything. She sighed. But after all the trouble I'd gone to to pluck my eyebrows to look like Dietrich's, now I must draw them in again like great dark wings and point them at either end and so much mascara. She pouted. Pray no one breaks my heart, Court, for tears would ruin these old-fashioned eyes. Oh, you have a heart, then. Please, Court, I said don't make me cry. Come, you may help me arrange my hair. When he lifted the heavy pale locks from her nape, he saw two parallel rings of recently chafed skin running round the neck about two inches apart. If surprise was communicated through her hair by any movement his hands may have made, Hedvig gave no sign. Together they put up her hair in an elaborate curly bun, securing it with a black satin band. Round her neck, to cover each abrasion, she wound a thin string of little onyx beads, letting three more loops or so drop progressively looser down between her breasts. He bent to kiss one shoulder. No, she moaned then went berserk, picked up a flacon of cologne water, inverted it on his head, arose from her vanity, hitting Mondagan on the jaw with the shoulder he'd been trying to kiss. He, felled, lost consciousness for a fraction of a minute, woke to see her cake walking out the door, singing Auf dem Zippel Zappel Zeppelin, a tune popular at the turn of the century. He staggered to the corridor. She'd vanished. Feeling rather a sexual failure, Mondagin set out for his turret and oscillograph and the comforts of science, which are glacial and few. He got as far as a decorative grotto located in the very guts of the house. There, Weissmann, in full uniform, lunged at him from behind a stalagmite. Uppington, he screamed. Ah? inquired Mondagin, blinking. You're a cool one. Professional traders are always so cool. His mouth remaining open, Weissmann sniffed the air. Oh, my, don't we smell nice. His eyeglasses blazed. Mondaugen, still groggy and enveloped in a miasma of cologne, wanted only to sleep. He tried to push past the peaked lieutenant who barred his path with the butt end of a shambach. Whom have you been in contact with at Uppington? Uppington. It has to be. It's the nearest large town in the Union. You can't expect English operatives to give up the comforts of civilization. I don't know anyone in the Union. Careful how you answer, Mondagen. It finally came to him that Weissmann was talking about the spheric experiment. It can't transmit, he yelled. If you knew anything at all, you'd see that immediately. It's for receiving only, stupid. Weissmann favored him with a smile. You just convicted yourself. They send you instructions. I may not know electronics, but I can recognize the scrawlings of a bad cryptanalyst. If you can do any better, you're welcome, Mondaugen sighed. He told Weissmann about his whim, the code. You mean that? Abruptly, almost childlike. You let me see what you've received? You've obviously seen everything but it'll put us that much closer to a solution. Quite soon he had Weissmann laughing shyly. Oh, oh, I see. You're ingenious, amazing, yeah. Stupid of me, you see. I do apologize. Struck by an inspiration, Mondagen whispered, I'm monitoring their little broadcasts. Weissmann frowned. That's what I just said. Mondagen shrugged. The lieutenant lit a whale-oil lamp, and they set out for the turret. As they ascended a sloping hallway, the great villa was filled with a single deafening pulse of laughter. Mondaugen became numb. The lantern went smash behind him. He turned to see Weissmann standing among little blue flames and shiny fragments of glass. The strand wolf was all Weissmann could manage. 
In his room, Mondagin had brandy, but Weismann's face remained the color of cigar smoke. He wouldn't talk. He got drunk and presently fell asleep in a chair. Mondagin worked on the code into the early morning, getting, as usual, nowhere. He kept dozing off and being brought awake by brief chuckling sounds from the loudspeaker. They sounded to Mondagin half in dream, like that other chilling laugh, and made him reluctant to go back to sleep. But he continued to fitfully. Somewhere out in the house, though he may have dreamed that too, a chorus had begun singing a dies irae in plain song. It got so loud it woke Mondalgan. Irritated, he lurched to the door and went out to tell them to keep quiet. Once past the storage rooms, he found the adjoining corridors brilliantly lit. On the whitewashed floor he saw a trail of blood spatters still wet. Intrigued, he followed. The blood led him perhaps fifty yards through drapes and around corners to what may have been a human form lying covered with a piece of old canvas sail, blocking further passage. Beyond it, the floor of the corridor gleamed white and bloodless. Mondagan broke into a sprint, jumped neatly over whatever it was, and continued on at a jogging pace. Eventually, he found himself at the head of a portrait gallery he and Heidfik Vogelsang had once danced down. His head still reeled with her cologne. Halfway along, Illuminated by a nearby sconce, he saw Foppel, dressed in his old private soldier's uniform and standing on tiptoe to kiss one of the portraits. When he'd gone, Mondagan looked at the brass plate on the frame to verify his suspicion. It was, indeed, von Trotter. I loved the man, he'd said. He taught us not to fear. It's impossible to describe the sudden release the comfort, the luxury, when you knew you could safely forget all the rote lessons you'd had to learn about the value and dignity of human life. I had the same feeling once in the Real Gymnasium when they told us we wouldn't be responsible in the examination for all the historical dates we'd spent weeks memorizing. Till we've done it, we're taught that it's evil. Having done it, then's the struggle to admit to yourself that it's not really evil at all, that like forbidden sex, it's enjoyable. Shuffling sounds behind him. Mondagen turned. It was Godolphin. Evan, the old man whispered. I beg your pardon? It's I, son. Captain Hugh. Mondagen came closer, thinking possibly Godolphin's eyes were troubling him, but worse troubled him, and there was nothing remarkable about the eyes save tears. Good morning, Captain. You don't have to hide any more, son. She told me, I know. It's all right. You can be Evan again. Father's here. The old man gripped his arm above the elbow and smiled bravely. Son, it's time we went home. God, we've been so long away. Come. Trying to be gentle, Mundagan let the sea captain steer him along the corridor. Who told you? He said she. Godolphin had gone vague. The girl, your girl. What's her name? A minute passed before Mundagan remembered enough of Godolphin to ask, with a certain sense of shock, What has she done to you? Godolphin's little head nodded, brushed Mundagan's arm. I'm so tired. Mondagin stooped and picked up the old man, who seemed to weigh less than a child, and bore him along the white ramps between mirrors and past tapestries. Among scores of separate lives brought to ripeness by this siege, and hidden each behind its heavy door. Up through the enormous house to his own turret, Weissmann still snored in the chair. Mondagen laid the old man on the circular bed, covered him with a black satin comforter, and stood over him and sang, Dream tonight of peacock tails, diamond fields and spouter whales. Ills are many, blessings few, but dreams tonight will shelter you. Let the vampire's creaking wing hide the stars while banshees sing. 
Let the ghouls gorge all night long. Dreams will keep you safe and strong. Skeletons with poison teeth, risen from the world beneath. Ogre, Troll, and Luke Guru, bloody wraith who looks like you. Shadow on the window shade, harpies in a midnight raid, goblins seeking tender prey, dreams will chase them all away. Dreams are like a magic cloak, woven by the fairy folk, covering from top to toe, keeping you from winds and woe. And should the angel come this night to fetch your soul away from light, cross yourself and face the wall. Dreams will help you, not at all. Outside, the strand wolf screamed again. Mondagan pounded a bag of dirty laundry into a pillow, doused the light, and lay down, trembling on the rug to sleep. Three. But his own musical commentary on dreams had not included the obvious and perhaps for him indispensable that if dreams are only waking sensation first stored and later operated on, then the dreams of a voyeur can never be his own. They soon showed up, not too surprisingly, as an increasing inability to distinguish Godolphin from Foppel. It may or may not have been helped along by Vera Moroving, and some of it could have been dreamed. There, precisely, was the difficulty. He'd no idea, for instance, where this had come from. So much rot spoken about their inferior culture position and our Herrenschaft. But that was for the Kaiser and the businessmen at home. No one, not even our gay Lothario, as we called the general, believed it out here. They may have been as civilized as we. I'm not an anthropologist. You can't compare anyway. They were an agricultural, pastoral people. They loved their cattle as we perhaps loved toys from childhood. Under Leutwein's administration, the cattle were taken away and given to white settlers. Of course, the Herreras revolted, though the Bandelschwarz Hottentots actually started it because their chief, Abraham Christian, had been shot in Warmbad. No one is sure who fired first. It's an old dispute. Who knows? Who cares? The flint had been struck, and we were needed, and we came. Foppel, perhaps. Except that the shape of Mondagen's conspiracy with Vera Moroving was finally beginning to come clear to him. She apparently wanted Godolphin for reasons he could only guess at, though her desire seemed to arise out of a nostalgic sensuality whose appetites knew nothing at all of nerves or heat, but instead belonged entirely to the barren touchlessness of memory. She had obviously needed Mondalgan only to be called, he might assume cruelly, a long-ago son to weaken her prey. Not unreasonably, then, she would also have used Foppel, perhaps to replace the father, as she thought she'd replaced the son. Foppel, the siege party's demon, who was, in fact, coming more and more to define his guests assembled to prescribe their common dream. Possibly Mondalgan alone among them was escaping it because of his peculiar habits of observation. So, in a passage, memory, nightmare, yarn, maundering, anything, ostensibly his hosts, Mondalgan could at least note that, though the events were Foppel's, the humanity could easily have been Godolphin's. Again, one night, he heard the Dies Irae, or some organized foreign chant, approach to the verge of his buffer zone of empty rooms. Feeling invisible, he glided out to look and not be seen. His neighbor, an elderly merchant from Milan, had in recent days, it seemed, collapsed from a heart attack, lingered, died. The others, roisterers, had organized a wake. With ceremony, they wrapped his body in silk sheets stripped from his bed. But before the last brightness of dead flesh had been covered, Mondalgan saw in a quick sly look its decoration of furrows and poor young scar tissue cut down in its prime. Shambok, Makos, Donkey Whip, something long that could cut. 
They took the cadaver off to a ravine to toss it in. One stayed behind. He remains in your room, then, she began. By choice. He has no choice. You'll make him go. You'll have to make him go, Fräulein. Then bring me to him, almost importunate. Her eyes, rimmed in black after Farpel's 1904, needed something less hermetic than this empty corridor to frame them. Palazzo's facade, provincial square, esplanade in the winter, yet more human, perhaps only more humorous than, say, the Kalahari. It was her inability to come to rest anywhere inside plausible extremes, her nervous, endless motion like the counter-crepitating of the ball along its roulette spokes, seeking a random compartment but finally making, having made sense only as precisely the dynamic uncertainty she was. This that upset Mondagan enough to scowl quietly and say with a certain dignity, No, turn, leave her there and return to his spherics. They both knew he'd done nothing decisive. Having found the sad imitation of a strayed son, Godolphin wouldn't think of returning to his own room. One of them had taken the other in. The old officer slept, drowsed, talked. Because he'd found Mundaugan only after she'd well begun some program of indoctrination on him that Mundaugan would rather not guess at, there was no way to say for certain later whether Foppel himself might not have come in to tell tales of when he'd been a trooper eighteen years ago. Eighteen years ago, everyone was in better condition. He was shown how his upper arms and thighs had become flabby, and the roll of fat around his middle. His hair was beginning to fall out. He was developing breasts. Even they reminded him of when he first arrived in Africa. They'd all had their inoculations en route. For bubonic plague, the ship's medic jabbed you with a tremendous needle in the muscle by the left breast, and for a week or so it puffed up. In the way troops have when there's not much else to do, they amused themselves by unbuttoning the tops of their shirts and coyly exposing these new female acquisitions. Later, when it had got into deep winter, the sun bleached their hair white and browned their skins. The standing joke was, don't walk up on me unless you're in uniform. I might mistake you for a nigger. The mistake was made more than once. Around Vaterberg, especially, he remembered when they were chasing her arrows into the bush in the desert. There were a few unpopular soldiers. Reluctant? Humanitarian? Their bitching got so bad you found yourself hoping. How much of a mistake it was was open to question, that's all he meant. By him, bleeding hearts like that weren't much better than the natives. Most of the time, thank God, you were with your own kind, comrades who all felt the same way, who weren't going to give you any nonsense, no matter what you did. When a man wants to appear politically moral, he speaks of human brotherhood. In the field, you actually found it. You weren't ashamed. For the first time in twenty years of continuous education to guilt, a guilt that had never really had meaning, that the church and the secular entrenched had made out of whole cloth, after twenty years, simply not to be ashamed. Before you disemboweled, or whatever you did with her, to be able to take a Herrero girl before the eyes of your superior officer and stay potent, and talk with them before you killed them without the sheep's eye, the shuffling, the prickly heat of embarrassment. His efforts at the code, such as they were, didn't succeed in keeping back the nightfall of ambiguity that filled his room progressively as time, such as it was, went by. When Weissmann came in and asked if he could help, Mondalgan turned surly. Out, he snarled. But we were to collaborate. I know what your interest is, Mondalgan said mysteriously. I know what code you're after. It's part of my job. Putting on his sincere farm lad face, removing the eyeglasses and cleaning them mock distracted on his necktie. Tell her it won't. It didn't work. Mondalgan said. The lieutenant ground his teeth solicitously. I can't indulge your whims much longer, he tried to explain. Berlin is impatient. 
I'm not going to make excuses forever. I am working for you, Mundalgan screamed. Scheiße! But this woke up Godolphin, who began to sing splinters of sentimental ballads and to call for his Evan. Weissmann regarded the old man with wide eyes and only his two front teeth showing. My God, he said finally, tonelessly, about faced and left. But when Mondalgin found the first oscillograph roll missing, he was charitable enough to ask, Lost or taken? out loud to his inert equipment and a faraway old skipper, before putting the blame on Weissmann. He must have come in when I was asleep. Not even Mondalgin knew when that was. And was the role all he'd taken? Shaking Godolphin, Do you know who I am, where we are? And other elementary questions that we shouldn't ask, that only prove how afraid we are to a hypothetical anybody. Afraid he was, and as it turned out with good reason. For half an hour later, the old man still sat on the edge of the bed, making friends with Mondagan, whom he was seeing for the first time. With the Weimar Republic's bitter breed of humor, but none of his own, Mondagan stood at his stained-glass window and asked that evening's Veld, was I being that successful a voyeur? As his days at the siege party became less current and more numbered, though not by him, he was to wonder with exponential frequency who in fact had seen him, anyone at all. Being cowardly and thus a gourmet affair, Mondalgan prepared himself for an unprecedented, exquisite treat. This unglimpsed item on his menu of anxieties took the form of a very German question. If no one has seen me, then am I really here at all? And as a sort of savory, if I am not here, then where are all these dreams coming from, if dreams is what they are? He was given a lovely mare named Fire Lily. How he adored that animal. You couldn't keep her from prancing and posturing. She was a typical woman. How her deep sorrow flanks and hindquarters would flash in the sun. He was careful to have his bastard servant keep her always curried and clean. He believed the first time the general ever addressed him directly was to compliment him on Fire Lily. He rode her all over the territory, from the coastal desert to the Kalahari, from Varmbat to the Portuguese frontier, Fire Lily and he, and his good comrades, Schwach and Fleischer. They dashed madcap over sand, rock, bush, forded streams that could go from a trickle to a mile-wide flood in half an hour. Always, no matter which region it was, through those ever-dwindling herds of blacks, what were they chasing, what youthful dream? For it was hard to avoid a feeling of impracticality about their adventure. Idealism, fatedness, as if first the missionaries, then the merchants and miners, and lately the settlers and bourgeoisie had all had their chance at something and had failed, and now it was the army's turn. To go in and chase about that silly wedge of German earth two tropics away for no other reason, apparently, than to give the warrior class equal time with God, Mammon, Frere. Certainly not for the usual sodatesque reasons. Young as they were, they could see that. Next to nothing to plunder. And as for glory, what was there to hanging, clubbing, bayoneting something that did not resist? It had been a terribly unequal show from the start. Herreros were simply not the adversaries a young warrior expects. He felt cheated out of the army life the posters had shown. Only a pitiful minority of the niggers were even armed, and then only a fraction of those had rifles that worked, or ammunition. The army had Maxim and Krupp guns and the little howitzers. Often they never even saw the natives before they killed them, merely stood off on a copy and bombarded the village, then went in afterward to finish any they'd missed. His gums ached. He felt tired and possibly slept more than normal, whatever normal was. But this had modulated at some point into yellow skin, high thirst, flat purple spots on his legs, and his own breath sickened him. Godolphin, in one of his lucid moments, diagnosed this as scurvy, the cause being simply bad, in fact, hardly any, diet. 
He'd lost twenty pounds since the beginning of the siege. You want fresh vegetables, the sea dog informed him, fretting. There must be something in the larder. No, for God's sake, Mundalgan raved. Don't leave the room. Hyenas and jackals are padding up and down those little corridors. Try to lie quietly, Godolphin told him. I can handle myself. I won't be a moment. Mondagan lunged off the bed, but flaxid muscles betrayed him. Nimble Godolphin vanished. The door swung to. For the first time since hearing about the Treaty of Versailles in detail, Mondagan found himself crying. They'll drain his juices, he thought, caress his bones with their paw pads, gag on his fine white hair. Mondagan's own father had died not so many years ago, somehow involved in the Kiel Revolt. That the son should think of him at this point indicated perhaps that Godolphin hadn't been the only one in that room to be visited. As the partying rushed in phantasmagoria at and around their supposedly insulated turret into blur, there had grown increasingly more visible one unwavering projection on the wall of night. Evan Godolphin whom Mondagan had never seen save by the dubious fluorescence of nostalgia he didn't want, nostalgia forced on him by something he was coming to look on as a coalition. Presently heavy footsteps approached through the outer regions of his Fersuchstelle. Too heavy, he decided, to be Godolphin's returning. So craftily Mondagan wiped his gums once more on the bedsheets, and allowed himself to fall off the bed and roll back under an arras of satin comforter into that cool, dusty world of old burlesque jokes and so many unhappy go-accident-prone lovers in this real life. He made a little peephole in the coverlet and looked out. His view was directly into a high mirror that commanded, say, a third of the circular room. The knob turned, the door opened, and Weissmann, draped in an ankle-length white dress with ruffled neck, bodice, and sleeves circa 1904, tiptoed into the room, crossing between the mirror's frontiers and vanishing again near the spheric equipment. All at once, a dawn chorus burst from the loudspeaker, chaotic at first, but resolving eventually into a deep space madrigal for three or four voices, to which the intruder Weissmann, out of sight, added still another in falsetto, to a minor keyed Charleston. Now that the twilight's just beginning, world stop spinning. Cuckoo's in his clock with laryngitis, so he can't tell us what night tonight is. No one among the other dancers has any answers. Just you, I, the night, and a little black shambach. When Weissmann came back into the mirror, he was carrying another oscillograph roll. Mondaugen lay among dust babies, feeling too impotent to yell, Stop, thief! The transvestite lieutenant had parted his hair in the middle and larded his eyelashes with mascara. These, batting against his lenses, left dark, parallel streaks so that each eye looked out from its own prison window. As he passed the imprint on the coverlet of the scurvified body which had lately occupied it, Weissmann gave it, so Mondagen fancied, a coy, sidewise smile. Then he vanished. Not too long after that, Mondagen's retinue withdrew for a time from light. Or it is presumed they did. Either that, or under the bed is even stranger country than neurasthenic children have dreamt it to be. One could as well have been a stonemason. It dawned on you slowly, but the conclusion was irresistible. You were in no sense killing. The voluptuous feeling of safety, the delicious lassitude you went into the extermination with, was sooner or later replaced by a very curious, not emotion, because part of it was obviously a lack of what we commonly call feeling. Functional agreement would come closer to it. Operational Sympathy The first clear instance of it he could remember came one day during a trek from Varmbat to Keetmansoop. His outfit were moving consignments of Hottentot prisoners for some reason, which doubtless made sense to the upper echelons. It was 140 miles and took generally a week or ten days to do, and none of them liked the detail much. A lot of prisoners died en route, 
and that meant stopping the whole trek, finding the sergeant with the keys, who it seemed was always miles back under a Camildurn tree, dead drunk or well on the way, then riding back, unlocking the neck ring of the fellow who died, sometimes rearranging the line so the weight of the extra chain would be more evenly distributed. Not to make it easier on them, exactly, but so one wouldn't wear out any more blacks than one had to. It was a glorious day, December and hot, a bird somewhere gone mad with the season. Fire Lily under him seemed sexually aroused. She coveted and frolicked so about the line of march, covering five miles to the prisoner's one. From the side it always looked medieval, the way the chain hung down in bites between their neck rings, the way the weight pulled them constantly toward earth, the force only just overcome as long as they managed to keep their legs moving. Behind them came army ox carts, driven by loyal Rehoboth bastards. How many can understand the resemblance he saw? In his village church in the Palatinate was a mural of the Dance of Death, led by a rather sinuous, effeminate death in his black cloak, carrying his scythe and followed by all ranks of society from prince to peasant. Their own African progress was hardly so elegant. They could only boast a homogeneous string of suffering Negroes and a drunken sergeant in a wide-awake hat who carried a mauser. Yet that association which most of them shared was enough to give the unpopular chore an atmosphere of ceremony. The track hadn't been underway more than an hour before one of the blacks began to complain about his feet. They were bleeding, he said. His overseer brought Fire Lily close in and looked. So they were. Hardly would the blood soak into the sand than the prisoner behind would kick it invisible. Not long after that, the same prisoner complained that the sand was working its way into the cuts on his feet, and the pain was making it difficult for him to walk. No doubt this was also true. He was told either to be quiet or forfeit his share of water when they outspanned for the noon rest. The soldiers had learned on previous tracks that if one native was allowed to complain, the others soon enough took it up, and this for some reason slowed everyone. They wouldn't sing or chant. That, perhaps, could have been born. But the wailing, self-indulgent babel that would go up, God, it was awful. Silence, for practical reasons, was the rule and was enforced. But this Hottentot would not keep silent. He was only limping slightly. He didn't stumble. But he bitched more than the most malcontent of infantry. The young trooper edged Fire Lily toward him in her sensual strut and flicked him once or twice with a shambach. From the height of a man on horseback, a good rhinoceros shambach used properly, can quiet a nigger in less time and with less trouble than it takes to shoot him. But it had no effect on this one. Fleischer saw what was happening and brought his black gelding up from the other side. Together, the troopers shambacked the Hottentot on the buttocks and thighs, forcing him into a queer little dance. It took a certain talent to make a prisoner dance that way without slowing down the rest of the trek because of the way they were all chained together. They were doing quite well until, through some stupid misjudgment, Fleischer's Schambach caught in the chain, and he was pulled from his horse and under the feet of the prisoners. Their reflexes are fast, they're like animals. Before the other trooper had really taken it in, the fellow they'd been Schambaching leaped on Fleischer, trying to get his bite of chain around Fleischer's neck. And the rest of the line, realizing through some extra sense what had happened, anticipating murder, had come to a halt. Fleischer managed to roll away. The two of them got the key from the sergeant, unlocked and removed their hottentot from the trek, and brought him off to the side. After Fleischer, with the tip of his shambach, had had the obligatory sport with the black's genitals, they clubbed him to death with the butts of their rifles and tossed what was left behind a rock for the vultures and flies. But as they did this thing, and Fleischer said later that he'd felt something like it too, there came over him for the first time an odd sort of peace, perhaps like what the black was feeling as he gave up the ghost. Usually the most you felt was annoyance, the kind of annoyance you have for an insect that's buzzed around you for too long. You have to obliterate its life and the physical effort, the obviousness of the act, the knowledge that this is only one unit in a seemingly infinite series, that killing this one won't end it 
won't relieve you from having to kill more tomorrow and the day after and on and on. The futility of it irritates you, and so to each individual act you bring something of the savagery of military boredom, which, as any trooper knows, is mighty indeed. This time it wasn't like that. Things seemed all at once to fall into a pattern, a great cosmic fluttering in the blank bright sky and each grain of sand, each cactus spine, each feather of the circling vulture above them and invisible molecule of heated air seemed to shift imperceptibly so that this black and he, and he and every other black he would henceforth have to kill, slid into alignment, assumed a set symmetry, a dance-like poise. It finally meant something different, different from the recruiting poster, the mural in the church, and the natives already exterminated. Sleeping and lame, burned en masse in their pawn tucks, babies tossed in the air and caught on bayonets, girls approached with organ at the ready, their eyes filming over in anticipated pleasure, or possibly only an anticipated five more minutes of life, only to be shot through the head first and then ravished after, of course, being made aware at the last moment that this would happen to them. Different from the official language of Fanchata's orders and directives. Different from the sense of function and the delightful, powerless languor that are both part of following a military order that's filtered like spring rain down countless levels before reaching you. Different from colonial policy, international finagling, hope of advancement within the army or enrichment out of it. It had only to do with the destroyer and the destroyed and the act which united them. And it had never been that way before. Returning from the Waterberg with von Trotter and his staff, they came upon an old woman digging wild onions at the side of the road. A trooper named Konick jumped down off his horse and shot her dead, but before he pulled the trigger he put the muzzle against her forehead and said, I am going to kill you. She looked up and said, I thank you. Later, toward dusk, there was one Herrera girl, sixteen or seventeen years old, for the platoon, and Fire Lily's rider was last. After he'd had her, he must have hesitated a moment between sidearm and bayonet. She actually smiled then pointed to both and began to shift her hips lazily in the dust. He used both. When through some levitation he again found himself on top of the bed, Hedvig Vogelsang was just entering the room astride a male bundle who crawled on all fours. She wore only a pair of black tights and had let her long hair down. Good evening, poor Kurt. She rode the bundle as far as the bed and dismounted. You may go, Fire Lily. I call it Fire Lily, she smiled at Mondalgan, because of its sorrel skin. Mondalgan attempted a greeting, found himself too weak to talk. Hedvig was slithering out of the tights. I made up only my eyes, she told him in a decadent whisper. My lips can redden with your blood as we kiss. She began making love to him. He tried to respond, but the scurvy had weakened him. How long it went on, he didn't know. It seemed to go on for days. The light in the room kept changing. Hedvig seemed to be everywhere at once in this black satin circle the world had shrunk to. Either she was inexhaustible or Mondalgan had lost all sense of duration. They seemed wound into a cocoon of blonde hair and ubiquitous dry kisses. Once or twice she may have brought in a bondle girl to assist. Where is Godolphin? he cried. She has him. Oh, God. Sometimes impotent, sometimes aroused, despite his lassitude, Mondagan stayed neutral, neither enjoying her attentions nor worrying about her opinion of his virility. At length she grew frustrated. He knew what she was looking for. You hate me, her lip quivering unnaturally as a forced vibrato. But I have to recuperate. In through the window came Weissmann with his hair combed and bangs, wearing white silk lounging pajamas, rhinestone pumps and black eye holes and lips to steal another oscillograph roll. The loudspeaker blithered at him as if it were angry. Later, Foppel appeared in the door with Vera Moroving. 
held her hand and sang to a sprightly waltz melody. I know what you want, princess of coquettes. Deviations, fantasies, and secret amulets. Only try to go further than you've gone, if you never want to live to see another dawn. Seventeen is cruel, yet at forty-two, purgatory fires burn no livelier than you. So come away from him. Take my hand instead. Let the dead get to the task of burying their dead. Through that hidden door again, bravo, four o oh, four again. I'm a Deutsche Südwestafrikaner in love. Once mustered out, those who stayed either drifted west to work at mines like the Khan, or homesteaded their own land where the farming was good. He was restless. After doing what he'd been doing for three years, a man doesn't settle down, at least not too quickly, so he went to the coast. Just as its own loose sand was licked away by the cold tongue of a current from the Antarctic south, that coast began to devour time the moment you arrived. It offered life nothing. Its soil was arid. Salt-bearing winds, chilled by the great Bengala, swept in off the sea to blight anything that tried to grow. There was constant battle between the fog, which wanted to freeze your marrow, and the sun, which, once having burned off the fog, sought you. Over Svakopmund, the sun often seemed to fill the entire sky, so diffracted was it by the sea fog. A luminous gray tending to yellow that hurt the eyes. You learned soon enough to wear tinted glasses for the sky. If you stayed long enough, you came to feel it was almost an affront for humans to be living there at all. The sky was too large, the coastal settlements under it too mean. The harbor at Svakopmund was slowly, continuously filling with sand. Men were felled mysteriously by the afternoon's sun. Horses went mad and were lost in the tenacious ooze down along the beaches. It was a brute coast and survival for white and black less a matter of choice than anywhere else in the territory. He'd been deceived, that was his first thought. It wasn't to be like the army. Something had changed. The blacks mattered even less. You didn't recognize their being there in the same way you once had. Objectives were different, that may simply have been all. The harbor needed dredging. Railroads had to be built inland from the seaports, which couldn't thrive by themselves any more than the interior could survive without them. Having legitimized their presence in the territory, the colonists were now obliged to improve what they had taken. There were compensations, but they were not the luxuries army life had offered. As shocked Meister, you got a house to yourself and first look at girls who came in from the bush to surrender. Lindequist, who had succeeded von Trotta, had cancelled the extermination order, asking all the natives who'd fled to return, promising that no one would be hurt. It was cheaper than sending out search expeditions and rounding them up, because they were starving out in the bush. Promises of mercy included promises of food. After being fed, they were taken into custody and sent out to the mines, or the coast, or the Cameroons. Their lagers under military escort, arrived from the interior almost daily. Mornings, he'd go down to the staging area and assist in the sorting out. The Hottentots were mostly women. Among the few Herreros they got, the proportion was, of course, more nearly equal. After three years of ripe, southern indulgence, to come upon this ash plain impregnated with a killer sea may have needed a strength not really found in nature, sustained necessarily by illusion. Not even whales could skirt that strand with impunity. Walking along what served for an esplanade, you might see one of the rotting creatures beached, covered by feeding gulls, who with the coming of night would be relieved at the giant carrion by a pack of strand wolves. And in a matter of days there would be left only the portals of great jaws and a picked architectural web of bone mellowing eventually to false ivory in the sun and fog. The barren islets off Luderitzbucht were natural concentration camps. Walking among huddled forms in the evening, distributing blankets, food, and occasional kisses from the Shambach, you felt like the father colonial policy wanted you to be, 
when it spoke of Vaterliche Zuchtigung, fatherly chastisement, an inalienable right. Their bodies, so terribly thin and slick with cloud, lay drawn together to pool what marginal warmth was left to them. Here and there a torch of bound reeds soaked in whale oil hissed bravely in the fog. A swaddled silence would be over the island. Nights like that, if they complained or had to cry for some lesion or cramp, it was baffled by the thick mists, and all you heard was the tide slapping ever sideways along the strand, viscous, reverberating. Then seltzering back to sea, violently salt, leaving a white skin on the sand it hadn't taken. And only occasionally, above the mindless rhythm, from across the narrow strait over on the great African continent itself, a sound would arise to make the fog colder, the night darker, the Atlantic more menacing. If it were human, it could have been called laughter, but it was not human. It was a product of alien secretions, boiling over into blood already choked and heady, causing ganglia to twitch, the field of night vision to be grayed into shapes that threatened, putting an itch into every fiber, an unbalance, a general sensation of error that could only be nulled by those hideous paroxysms, those fat, spindle-shaped bursts of air up the pharynx, counter-irritating the top of the mouth cavity, filling the nostrils, easing the prickliness under the jaw and down the center line of the skull. It was the cry of the brown hyena called the strand wolf, who prowled the beach singly or with companions in search of shellfish, dead gulls, anything flesh and unmoving. And so, as you moved among them, you were forced to look at them as a collection, knowing from statistics that twelve to fifteen of them died per day, but eventually unable even to wonder which twelve to fifteen. In the dark they differed only in size, and that made it easier not to care, as you once had. But every time the strand wolf howled across the water, as perhaps you were stooping down to examine a prospective concubine missed in the first winnowing, it was only by suppressing memories of the three years just past that you kept from wondering if it was this particular girl the beast waited for. As a civilian schachtmeister drawing government pay, this was one among many luxuries he'd had to abandon, the luxury of being able to see them as individuals. This extended even to one's concubines. One had several, some purely for housework, others for pleasure— domesticity, too, having become a masked affair. They were the exclusive possession of no one save the high-ranking officers. Subalterns, enlisted men, and gangers like himself shared them out of a common pool housed in a barbed wire compound near the B.O.Q. It was problematical who among the females had the better time of it in the way of creature comfort. The courtesans who lived inside the barbed wire or the workers who were housed in a great thorn enclosure nearer the beach. They had to rely on primarily female labor, there simply being, for obvious reasons, a severe shortage of males. They found the distaff side useful for a number of functions. Women could be inspanned to the heavy-duty carts to pull loads of silt dredged from the floor of the harbor or to carry the rails for the road of iron being driven across the Namib toward Kikmon's Hoop. That destination, naturally enough, reminded him of the old days when he'd helped march blacks there. Often, under the hazed-out sun, he'd daydream, remembering water holes filled to the brim with black corpses, their ears, nostrils, and mouths bejeweled green, white, black, iridescent with flies and their offspring. Human pyres whose flames seemed to leap high as the Southern Cross. The frangibility of bone. The splitting open of body socks. The sudden heaviness of even a frail child. But here there could be none of that. They were organized, made to perform en masse. You'd have to supervise not a chained trek, but a long double line of women carrying rails with iron ties attached. If one woman fell... It meant only a fractional increase in the force required per carrier, not the confusion and paralysis resulting from a single failure in one of the old treks. Only once could he remember anything like that happening, and it may have been because the fog and cold the previous week had been worse than usual, 
so that their sockets and joints may have become inflamed. That day his own neck ached, and he had trouble turning it to see what had happened. But a sudden wail went up, and he saw that one of the women had stumbled and fallen, and brought the whole line down. His heart rose. The wind off the ocean turned balmy. Here was a fragment of the old past revealed as if by a parting in the fog. He went back to her, ascertained that the falling rail had broken her leg, dragged her out from under it without bothering to lift it, rolled her down the embankment, and left her to die. It did him good, he thought. It took him temporarily away from nostalgia, which on that coast was a kind of despondency. But if physical labor exhausted those who lived inside thorns, sexual labor could as easily fatigue those who lived inside steel. Some of the military had brought with them curious ideas. One sergeant, too far down the chain of command to raid a young boy, young boys being rare, did the best he could with pre-adolescent breastless girls whose heads he shaved and whom he kept naked except for shrunken army leggings. Another made his partners lie still like corpses. Any sexual responses, sudden breaths, or involuntary jerks were reprimanded with an elegant jeweled shambach he'd had designed for him in Berlin. So if the women thought about any of this at all, there couldn't have been much to choose between thorns and steel. Himself, he could have been happy in that new corporative life, could have made a career out of construction work, except for one of his concubines, a Herrero child named Sarah. She brought his discontent to a focus, perhaps even became one reason finally why he quit it all and headed inland to try to regain a little of the luxury and abundance that had vanished, he feared, with Fontrota. He found her first a mile out in the Atlantic on a breakwater they were building of sleek, dark rocks that the women carried out by hand, deep-sixed, and slowly, painfully stacked into a tentacle crawling along the sea. That day, gray sheets were tacked to the sky, and a black cloud remained all day at the western horizon. It was her eyes he saw first, whites reflecting something of the sea's slow turbulence, then her back, beaded with old shambok scars. He supposed it was simple lust that made him go over and motion to her to put down the rock she'd begun to lift, scribble, and give her a note for her compound supervisor. Give it to him, he warned her, or— And he made the shambok whistle in the salt wind. In earlier days you hadn't had to warn them, Somehow, because of that operational sympathy, they always delivered notes, even when they knew the note might well be a death warrant. She looked at the chit, then at him. Clouds moved across those eyes, whether reflected or transmitted, he'd never know. Rhine slapped at their feet, carrion birds wheeled in the sky. The breakwater stretched behind them back to land and safety, but it could take only a word— any, the most inconsequential, to implant in each of them the perverse notion that their own path lay the other way, on the invisible mole not yet built, as if the sea were pavement for them as for our Redeemer. Here was another like the woman pinned under the rail, another piece of those soldiering days. He knew he didn't want to share this girl. He was feeling again the pleasure of making a choice whose consequences even the most terrible, he could ignore. He asked her name. She answered Sarah, eyes never having left him. A squall, cold as Antarctica, came rushing across the water, drenched them, continued on toward the north, though it would die without ever seeing the Congo's mouth or the bite of Benin. She shivered. His hand, in apparent reflex, went to touch her, but she avoided it and stooped to pick up the rock. He tapped her lightly on the rear with his shambok, and the moment, whatever it had meant, was over. That night she didn't come. Next morning he caught her on the breakwater, made her kneel, placed his boot on her nape, and pushed her head under the sea until his sense of timing told him to let her up for air. He noticed then how long and snake-like her thighs were, how clearly the musculature of her hips stood under the skin, skin with a certain glow but finely striated because of her long fast in the bush. 
That day he'd shambok her on any least pretense. At dusk he wrote out another chit and handed it to her. You have an hour. She watched him. Nothing about her at all of the animal he'd seen in other nigger women. Only eyes giving back the red sun and the white stalks of fog that had already begun to rise off the water. He didn't eat supper. He waited alone in his house near the barbed wire compound, listening to the drunks selecting their mates for the night. He couldn't stay off his feet, and perhaps he'd caught a chill. The hour passed. She didn't come. He walked out without a coat into low clouds and made his way to her thorn compound. It was pitch black out. Wet gusts slapped his cheeks. He stumbled. Once at the enclosure, he took up a torch and went looking for her. Perhaps they thought he was mad. Perhaps he was. He didn't know how long he looked. He couldn't find her. They all looked alike. The next morning she appeared as usual. He chose two strong women, bent her back over a rock, and while they held her, he first shambocked, then took her. She lay in a cold rigor, and when it was over, he was astonished to find that at some point during it, the women had, like good-natured duenas, released her and gone about their morning's labor. And that night, long after he'd turned in, she came to his house and slid into the bed next to him. Woman's perversity. She was his. Yet how long could he have had her to himself? During the day he manacled her to the bed, and he continued to use the woman pool at night so he wouldn't arouse suspicion. Sarah might have cooked, cleaned, comforted, been the closest thing to a wife he'd ever had. But on that foggy, sweating, sterile coast there were no owners, nothing owned. Community may have been the only solution possible against such an assertion of the inanimate. Soon enough his neighbor, the pederast, had discovered her and become enchanted. He requested Sarah. This was answered by the lie that she'd come from the pool, and the pederast could wait his turn. But he could only get them a reprieve. The neighbor visited his house during the day, found her manacled and helpless, took her his own way, and then decided, like a thoughtful sergeant, to share this good fortune with his platoon. Between noon and supper time, as the fog's glare shifted in the sky, they took out an abnormal distribution of sexual preferences on her poor Sarah. His Sarah, only in a way that poisonous strand could never support. He came home to find her drooling, her eyes drained for good of all weather. Not thinking, probably not having taken it all in, he unlocked her shackles and it was as if, like a spring, she'd been storing the additive force that convivial platoon had expended in amusing themselves. For with an incredible strength she broke out of his embrace and fled, and that was how he saw her alive for the last time. The next day her body was washed up on the beach. She had perished in a sea they would perhaps never succeed in calming any part of. Jackals had eaten her breasts. It seemed then that something had at last been brought to consummation since his arrival centuries ago on the troop ship Habicht. That had only as obviousness and immediacy to do with the sergeant pederast's preference as to women, or that old bubonic plague injection. If it were parable, which he doubted, it probably went to illustrate the progress of appetite or evolution of indulgence, both in a direction he found unpleasant to contemplate. If a season like the Great Rebellion ever came to him again, he feared it could never be in that same personal, random array of picaresque acts he was to recall and celebrate in later years, at best furious and nostalgic. But rather with a logic that chilled the comfortable perversity of the heart, that substituted capability for character, deliberate scheme for political epiphany, so incomparably African. And for Sarah, the Shambach, the dances of death between Varmbat and Keetmansoop, the taut haunches of his fire lily, the black corpse impaled on a thorn tree in a river swollen with sudden rain, for these, the dearest canvases in his soul's gallery, 
it was to substitute the bleak, abstracted, and for him rather meaningless hanging on which he now turned his back, but which was to backdrop his retreat until he reached the other wall, the engineering design for a world he knew with numb leeriness nothing could now keep from becoming reality, a world whose full despair he, at the vantage of eighteen years later, couldn't even find adequate parables for, but a design whose first fumbling sketches he thought must have been done the year after Jakob Marengo died, on that terrible coast where the beach between Luderitzbucht and the cemetery was actually littered each morning with a score of identical female corpses. An agglomeration no more substantial-looking than seaweed against the unhealthy yellow sand, where the soul's passage was more a mass migration across that choppy fetch of Atlantic the wind never left alone, from an island of low cloud like an anchored prison ship to simple integration with the unimaginable mass of their continent, where the single line of track still edged toward a Keatmon's hoop that could in no conceivable iconology be any part of the kingdom of death. Where finally humanity was reduced out of a necessity which in his lunier moments he could almost believe was only Deutsch Sudwest Afrikas, actually he knew better, out of a confrontation the young of one's contemporaries, God help him, had yet to make. Humanity was reduced to a nervous, disquieted, forever inadequate but indissoluble popular front against deceptively unpolitical and apparently minor enemies, enemies that would be with him to the grave. A sun with no shape, a beach alien as the moon's Antarctic, Restless concubines in barbed wire, salt mists, alkaline earth, the Bengala current that would never cease bringing sand to raise the harbor floor, the inertia of rock, the frailty of flesh, the structural unreliability of thorns, the unheard whimper of a dying woman, the frightening but necessary cry of the strand wolf in the fog. 4. Court, why do you never kiss me any more? How long have I been sleeping, he wanted to know. Heavy blue drapes had at some point been drawn across the window. It's night. He grew aware of an absence in the room, located this eventually as an absence of background noise from the loudspeaker, and was off the bed and tottering toward his receivers before realizing he'd recovered enough to be walking at all. His mouth tasted vile, but his joints no longer ached, gums no longer felt as sore or spongy. The purple spots on his legs had gone. Hedvig giggled. They made you look like a hyena. The mirror had nothing encouraging to show him. He batted his eyes at himself, and the lashes of the left one promptly stuck together. Don't squint, darling. She had a toe pointed toward the ceiling and was adjusting a stocking. Mondagin leered at her crookedly and began troubleshooting his equipment. Behind him he heard someone enter the room, and Hedwig begin to moan. Chains tinkled in the heavy sick-room air. Something whistled and impacted with a loud report against what might have been flesh. A satin tore, silk hissed. French heels beat a tattoo against the parquetry. Had the scurvy changed him from voyeur to écouteur? Or was it deeper and part of a general change of heart? The trouble was a burned-out tube in the power amplifier. He replaced it with a spare and turned and saw that Hedvig had vanished. Mondagin stayed alone in the turret for a few dozen visitations from the Sphyrix, this being the only link remaining with the kind of time that continued to pass outside Fopples. He was awakened from a light sleep by the sound of explosions to the east. When he finally decided to climb out the stained-glass window to investigate, he found that everyone had rushed to the roof. A battle, a real one, was in progress across the ravine. Such was their elevation 
but they could see everything spread out in panorama, as if for their amusement. A small group of bundles huddled among some rocks, men, women, children, and a few starved-looking goats. Hedvig inched her way across the roof's shallow slope to Mondagen and held his hand. How exciting, she whispered, eyes huger than he'd ever seen them, blood crusted on her wrists and ankles. Declining sunlight stained the bodies of the bundles to a certain orange. Thin wisps of cirrus floated diaphanous in a late afternoon sky, but soon the sun had turned them blinding white. Surrounding the besieged bundles in a ragged noose were whites, closing, mostly volunteer except for a cadre of Union officers and non-coms. They exchanged occasional gunfire with the natives, who seemed to have only half a dozen rifles among them. Doubtless there were human voices down there, uttering cries of command, triumph, pain. But at this distance only the tiny pop-pop of gunshots could be heard. To one side was a singed area, streaked with the grey of pulverized rock and littered with bodies and parts of bodies which had once belonged to bundles. Bombs, Foppel commented. That's what woke us up. Someone had come up from below with wine and glasses and cigars. The accordionist had brought his instrument, but after a few bars was silenced. No one on the roof wanted to miss any sound of death that should reach them. They leaned toward the battle, cords of the neck drawn tense, eyes sleep-puffed, hair in disarray and dotted with dandruff, fingers with dirty nails clutching like talons the sun-reddened stems of their wine goblets, lips blackened with yesterday's wine, nicotine, blood, and drawn back from the tartared teeth so that the original hue only showed in cracks. Aging women shifted their legs frequently, makeup they'd not cleaned away, clinging in blotches to poor riddled cheeks. Over the horizon from the direction of the Union came two biplanes, flying low and lazy like birds wandered away from a flock. That's where the bombs came from, announced Foppel to his company. So excited now that he slopped wine on the roof, Mondaugan watched it flow in twin streams all the way to the eaves. It reminded him somehow of his first morning at Foppel's, and the two streaks of blood. When had he begun to call it blood in the courtyard? A kite lit lower down on the roof and began to peck at the wine. Soon it took wing again. When had he begun to call it blood? The planes looked as if they would come no nearer, only hang forever in the sky. The sun was going down. The clouds had been blown terribly thin and begun to glow red and seemed to ribbon the sky its entire length, filmy and splendid, as if it were they that held it all together. One of the bundles suddenly appeared to run amok, stood upright, waving a spear, and began to run toward the nearest part of the advancing cordon. The whites there bunched together and fired at him in a flurry of pops, echoed by the pop of corks on Foppel's roof. He had almost reached them before he fell. Now the planes could be heard, a snarling, intermittent sound. They swooped clumsy in a dive toward the Bondelschwarz position. The sun caught suddenly the three canisters dropped from each, turned them to six drops of orange fire. They seemed to take a century to fall, but soon... Two bracketing the rocks, two among the bundles, and two in the area where the corpses lay, there bloomed at last six explosions, sending earth, stone, and flesh cascading toward the nearly black sky with its scarlet overlay of cloud. Seconds later the loud coughing blasts overlapping reached the roof. How the watchers cheered! The cordon moved rapidly then through what was now a pall of thin smoke, killing the still active and wounded, sending bullets into corpses, into women and children, even into the one goat that had survived. Then, abruptly, the crescendo of cork pops ceased and night fell. And after a few minutes, someone lit a campfire out on the battlefield. The watchers on the roof retired inside for a night of more than usually riotous celebration. 
Had a new phase of the siege party begun with that dusk's intrusion from the present year, 1922? Or was the change internal and Mondaugans? A shift in the configuration of sights and sounds he was now filtering out, choosing not to notice? No way to tell, no one to say. Whatever it arose from, health returning or simple impatience with the hermetic, he was starting to feel those first tentative glandular pressures that one day develop into moral outrage. At least he was to experience a, for him, rare ach phenomenon, the discovery that his voyeurism had been determined purely by events seen, and not by any deliberate choice or pre-existing set of personal psychic needs. No one saw any more battles. From time to time a body of horse soldiers might be noted in the distance, tearing desperate across the plateau, raising a little dust. There would be explosions miles away in the direction of the Karas Mountains, and they heard a bundle one night lost in the dark scream the name of Abraham Morris as he stumbled and fell into a ravine. In the last weeks of Mondagan's stay, everyone remained in the house, getting only a few hours' sleep per twenty-four-hour period. Easily a third of their number were bedridden. Several, besides Foppel's bundles, had died. It had become an amusement to visit an invalid each night to feed him wine and arouse him sexually. Mondagan remained up in his turret, working diligently at his code, taking occasional breaks to stand out alone on the roof and wonder if he would ever escape a curse that seemed to have been put on him one fashing, to become surrounded by decadence no matter what exotic region north or south he wandered into. It couldn't be only Munich, he decided at some point, nor even the fact of economic depression. This was a soul depression which must surely infest Europe as it infested this house. One night he was awakened by a disheveled Weissmann who could scarcely stand still for excitement. Look, look, he cried, waving a sheet of paper under Mondaugan's slowly blinking eyes. Mondaugan read, D-I-G-E-W-O-E-L-D-T-I-M-S-T-E-A-L-A-L-E-N-S-W-T-A-S-N-D-E-U-R-F-U-A-L-R-L-I-K-S-T. So, he yawned, it's your code, I've broken it, see? I remove every third letter and obtain G-O-D-M-E-A-N-T-N-U-U-R-K. This rearranged spells Kurt Mundaugen. Well, then, Mundaugen snarled, and who the hell told you you could read my mail? The remainder of the message, Weissmann continued, now reads D-I-E-W-E-L-T-I-S-T-A-L-L-E-S-W-A-S-D-E-R-F-A-L-L-I-S-T. -E -E the world is all that the case is. Mondalgan said. I've heard that somewhere before. A smile began to spread. Weissmann, for shame. Resign your commission. You're in the wrong line of work. You'd make a fine engineer. You've been finagling. I swear, Weissmann protested, hurt. Later on, finding the turret oppressive, Mondalgan exited through the window and wandered the gables, corridors, and stairways of the villa till the moon was down. Early in the morning, with only the nacreous beginnings of a dawn visible out over the Kalahari, he came around a brick wall and entered a small hopyard. Hanging over the rows, each wrist attached to a different stringing wire, feet dangling over young hops already sick with downy mildew, was another bundle, perhaps Foppel's last. Below, dancing about the body and flicking its buttocks with a shambach, was old Godolphin. Vera Moroving stood by his side, and they appeared to have exchanged clothing. Godolphin, keeping time with the Shambach, launched quaveringly into a reprise of Down by the Summertime Sea. Mondagan this time withdrew, preferring at last neither to watch nor to listen. Instead, he returned to the turret and gathered up his logbooks, oscillograms, and a small knapsack of clothing and toilet articles. He sneaked downstairs and went out by a French window, located a long plank at the rear of the house, and dragged it to the ravine. Foppel and guests had been somehow alerted to his departure. They crowded the windows. Some sat out on the balconies and roof, 
some came to the veranda to watch. With a final grunt, Mondagan dropped the plank across a narrow part of the ravine. As he was working his way gingerly across, trying not to look down at the tiny stream two hundred feet below, the accordion began a slow, sad tango, as if piping him ashore. This soon modulated into a rousing valediction, which they all sang in chorus. Why are you leaving the party so early, just when it was getting good? Were the crowds and the laughter just a little too tame? Did the girl you had your eye on go and forfeit the game? Oh, tell me, where is their music any gayer than ours? And tell me where are wine and ladies in such ample supply? If you know a better party in the Southwest Protectorate, tell us and we'll drop on by. Right after this one, tell us and we'll drop on by. He reached the other side, adjusted the knapsack, and began to trudge toward a distant clump of trees. After a few hundred yards, he decided to look back after all. They still watched him, and their hush now was a part of the same that hung over all the scrubland. The morning's sun bleached their faces a fushing white he remembered seeing in another place. They gazed across the ravine, dehumanized and aloof, as if they were the last gods on earth. Two miles further on, at a fork in the road, he met a bundle riding on a donkey. The bundle had lost his right arm. All over, he said. Many bundles dead. Boss is dead. Van Vyck dead. My woman, Yonkers, dead. He let Mondagan ride behind him. At that point, Mondagan didn't know where they were going. As the sun climbed, he dozed on and off, his cheek against the bundle's scarred back. They seemed the only three animate objects on the yellow road which led, he knew, sooner or later to the Atlantic. The sunlight was immense, the plateau country wide, and Mondagan felt little and lost in the dun-colored waste. Soon as they trotted along, the bundle began to sing, in a small voice which was lost before it reached the nearest bush. The song was in Hottentot dialect, and Mondaugan couldn't understand it. Chapter 10 In Which Various Sets of Young People Get Together The One McClintic Sphere, whose horn man was soloing, stood by the empty piano, looking off at nothing in particular. He was half listening to the music, touching the keys of his alto now and again, as if by sympathetic magic to make that natural horn develop the idea differently, some way Sphere thought could be better, and half watching the customers at the tables. This was last set, and it had been a bad week for Sphere. Some of the colleges were let out, and the place had been crowded with these types who liked to talk to each other a lot. Every now and again, they'd invite him over to a table between sets and ask him what he thought about other altos. Some of them would go through the old northern liberal routine. Look at me, I'll sit with anybody. Either that, or they would say, Hey, fella, how about night train? Yes, buona, yes, sir, boss. This darky, old Uncle McClinic, he play you the finest night train you ever did here. And after the set, he gone take this old alto and shove it up your white Ivy League ass. The horn wanted to finish off. He'd been tired all week as Sphere. They took fours with the drummer, stated the main theme in unison, and left the stand. The bums stood outside like a receiving line. Spring had hit New York all warm and aphrodisiac. Sphere found his triumph in the lot, got in, and took off uptown. He needed to relax. Half an hour later, he was in Harlem in a friendly rooming and, in a sense, cat, house run by one Matilda Winthrop, who was little and wizened and looked like any elderly little lady you might see in the street, going along with gentle steps in the waning afternoon to look for spleens and greens at the market. She's up there, Matilda said with a smile for everybody, even musicians with a head full of righteous moss who were making money and drove sports cars. Sphere shadow boxed with her for a few minutes. She had better reflexes than he did. The girl was sitting on the bed, smoking and reading a western. Sphere tossed his coat on a chair. She moved over to make room for him, dog-eared a page, put the book on the floor. Soon he was telling her about the week, 
about the kids with money who used him for background music, and the musicians from other bigger groups also with money who were cautious and had mixed reactions, and the few who couldn't really afford dollar beers at the V-note, but did or wanted to understand, except that the space they might have occupied was already taken up by the rich kids and musicians. He told it all into the pillow, and she rubbed his back with amazingly gentle hands. Her name, she said, was Ruby, but he didn't believe that. Soon. Do you ever dig what I'm trying to say? he wondered. On the horn, I don't, she answered, honest enough. A girl doesn't understand. All she does is feel. I feel what you play like I feel what you need when you're inside me. Maybe they're the same thing. McClintock, I don't know. You're kind to me. What is it you want? Sorry, he said after a while. This is a good way to relax. Stay tonight? Sure. Slab and Esther, uncomfortable with each other, stood in front of an easel in his place looking at Cheese Danish number 35. The Cheese Danish was a recent obsession of Slab's. He had taken, some time ago, to painting in a frenzy these morning pastries in every conceivable style, light, and setting. The room was already littered with cubist, fauve, and surrealist cheese danishes. Monet spent his declining years at his home in Giverny, painting the water lilies in the garden pool, reasoned Slab. He painted all kinds of water lilies. He liked water lilies. These are my declining years. I like cheese danishes. They have kept me alive now for longer than I can remember. Why not? The subject of cheese danish number 35 occupied only a small area to the lower left of center where it was pictured impaled on one of the metal steps of a telephone pole. The landscape was an empty street, drastically foreshortened, the only living things in it a tree in the middle distance on which perched an ornate bird, busily textured with a great many squirrels, flourishes, and bright-colored patches. This, explained Slab in answer to her question, is my revolt against catatonic expressionism. The universal symbol, I have decided, will replace the cross in Western civilization. It is the partridge in the pear tree. You remember the old Christmas song, which is a linguistic joke? Perdrix, pear tree. The beauty is that it works like a machine, yet is animate. The partridge eats pears off the tree, and his droppings in turn nourish the tree, which grows higher and higher, every day lifting the partridge up and at the same time assuring him of a continuous supply of good. It is perpetual motion, except for one thing. He pointed out a gargoyle with sharp fangs near the top of the picture. The point of the largest fang lay on an imaginary line projected parallel to the axis of the tree and drawn through the head of the bird. It could as well have been a low-flying airplane or high-tension wire, Slab said, but some day that bird will be impaled on the gargoyle's teeth, just like the poor cheese Danish is already on the phone pole. Why can't he fly away? Esther said. He is too stupid. He used to know how to fly once, but he's forgotten. I detect allegory in all this, she said. No, said Slab. That is on the same intellectual level as doing the Times crossword puzzle on Sunday. Phony, unworthy of you. She'd wandered to the bed. No, he almost yelled. Slab! It's so bad. It's a physical pain here. She drew her fingers across her abdomen. I'm not getting any either, said Slab. I can't help it that show and make her cut you off. Aren't I your friend? No, said Slab. What can I do to show you? Go, said Slab, is what you can do, and let me sleep in my chaste army cot, alone. He crawled to the bed and lay face down. Soon Esther left, forgetting to close the door, not being the type to slam doors on being rejected. Rooney and Rachel sat at the bar of a neighborhood tavern on 2nd Avenue. Over in the corner, an Irishman and a Hungarian were yelling at each other over the bowling game. Where does she go at night? Rooney wondered. Paola is a strange girl, said Rachel. You learn after a while not to ask her questions she doesn't want to answer. 
maybe seeing Pig. No, Pig Bodine lives at the V-Note and the Rusty Spoon. He has a lech for Paola, a mile long, but he reminds her too much, I think, of Pappy Hod. The Navy has a certain way of endearing itself. She stays away from him, and it's killing him, and I, for one, am glad to see it. It's killing me, Winsome wanted to say. He didn't. Lately he'd been running for comfort to Rachel. He'd come in a way to depend on it. Her sanity and aloofness from the crew, her own self-sufficiency drew him. But he was no nearer to arranging any assignation with Paola. Perhaps he was afraid of Rachel's reaction. He was beginning to suspect she was not the sort who approved of pimping for one's roommate. He ordered another boilermaker. Rooney, you drink too much, she said. I worry about you. Nag, 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 he smiled. Two. Next evening, Profane was sitting in the guard room at Anthro Research Associates, feet propped on a gas stove, reading an avant-garde western called Existentialist Sheriff, which Pig Bodine had recommended. Across one of the laboratory spaces, features lit Frankenstein's monster-like by a nightlight, facing Profane, sat Shroud, synthetic human radiation output determined. Its skin was cellulose acetate butyrate, a plastic transparent not only to light but also to X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrons. Its skeleton had once been that of a living human. Now the bones were decontaminated and the long ones and spinal column hollowed inside to receive radiation dosimeters. Shroud was five feet nine inches tall, the fiftieth percentile of Air Force standards. The lungs... Sex organs, kidneys, thyroid, liver, spleen, and other internal organs were hollow and made of the same clear plastic as the body shell. These could be filled with aqueous solutions which absorbed the same amount of radiation as the tissue they represented. Anthro Research Associates was a subsidiary of Yoyodyne. It did research for the government on the effects of high altitude and spaceflight for the National Safety Council on automobile accidents, and for civil defense on radiation absorption, which was where Shroud came in. In the 18th century, it was often convenient to regard man as a clockwork automaton. In the 19th century, with Newtonian physics pretty well assimilated and a lot of work in thermodynamics going on, man was looked on more as a heat engine, about 40% efficient. Now, in the 20th century, with nuclear and subatomic physics a going thing, man had become something which absorbs X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrons. Such, at least, was Ole Bergamask's notion of progress. It was the subject of his welcome aboard lecture on Profane's first day of employment, at five in the afternoon as Profane was going on and Bergamask off. There were two eight-hour night shifts, Early and late, though Profane, whose time scale was skewed toward the past, preferred to call them late and early. And Profane, to date, had worked them both. Three times a night, he had to make the rounds of the lab areas, windows, and heavy equipment. If an all-night routine experiment was in progress, he'd have to take readings, and if they were out of tolerance, wake up the technician on duty, who'd usually be sleeping on a cot in one of the offices. At first there had been a certain interest in visiting the accident research area, which was jokingly referred to as the Chamber of Horrors. Here, weights were dropped on aged automobiles inside which would be sitting a mannequin. The study now underway had to do with first aid training and various versions of shock. Synthetic human object, casualty kinematics. Got to sit in the driver's death or back seat of the test cars, Profane still felt a certain kinship with shock, which was the first inanimate schlemiel he'd ever encountered. But in there, too, was a certain wariness, because the mannequin was still only a human object, plus a feeling of disdain as if shock had decided to sell out to humans, so that now what had been its inanimate own were taking revenge. Shock was a marvelous mannequin. It had the same build as shroud, but its flesh was molded of foam vinyl, its skin vinyl plastisol, its hair a wig, its eyes cosmetic plastic, its teeth, for which in fact eigenvalue had acted as subcontractor, the same kind of dentures worn today by 19% of the American population, most of them respectable. 
Inside were a blood reservoir in the thorax, a blood pump in the midsection, and a nickel-cadmium battery power supply in the abdomen. The control panel at the side of the chest had toggles and rheostat controls for venous and arterial bleeding, pulse rate, and even respiration rate when a sucking chest wound was involved. In the latter case, plastic lungs provided the necessary suction and bubbling. They were controlled by an air pump in the abdomen with the motor's cooling vent located in the crotch. An injury of the sexual organs could still be simulated by an attachable moulage, but then this blocked the cooling vent. Shock could not, therefore, have a sucking chest wound and mutilated sexual organs simultaneously. A new retrofit, however, eliminated this difficulty, which was felt to be a basic design deficiency. Shock was thus entirely lifelike in every way. It scared the hell out of Profane the first time he saw it lying half out the smashed windshield of an old Plymouth, fitted with moulages for depressed skull and jaw injuries and compound arm and leg fractures. But now he'd got used to it. The only thing at Anthro Research that still phased him a little was Shroud, whose face was a human skull that looked at you through a more or less abstracted, butyrate head. It was time to make another round. The building was empty except for Profane. No experiments tonight. On the way back to the guardroom, he stopped in front of Shroud. What's it like? he said. Better than you have it. Why? Why yourself? Me and Shock are what you and everybody will be some day. The skull seemed to be grinning at Profane. There are other ways besides fallout and road accidents. But those are most likely. If somebody else doesn't do it to you, you'll do it to yourselves. You don't even have a soul. How can you talk? Since when did you ever have one? What are you doing, getting religion? All I am is a dry run. They take readings off my dosimeters. Who is to say whether I'm here so the people can read the meters, or whether the radiation in me is because they have to measure? Which way does it go? It's one way, said Profane, all one way. Mazel tov. Maybe the hint of a smile. Somehow Profane had difficulty getting back in the plot of existentialist sheriff. After a while he got up and went over to Shroud. What do you mean, we'll be like you and Shock someday? You mean dead? Am I dead? If I am, then that's what I mean. If you aren't, then what are you? Nearly what you are. None of you have very far to go. I don't understand. So I see. But you're not alone. That's a comfort, isn't it? To hell with it. Profane went back to the guardroom and busied himself making coffee. Three. The next weekend there was a party at Raoul, Slab, and Melvin's. The whole sick crew was there. At one in the morning, Rooney and Pig started a fight. Son of a bitch, Rooney yelled. You keep your hands off her. His wife, Esther informed Slab. The crew had withdrawn to the walls, leaving Pig and Rooney most of the floor space. Both were drunk and sweating. They wrestled around, stumbling and inexpert, trying to fight like a Western movie. It is incredible how many amateur brawlers believe the movie saloon fight is the only acceptable model to follow. At last... Pig dropped Rooney with a fist to the abdomen. Rooney just lay there, eyes closed, trying to hold down his breathing because it hurt. Pig wandered out to the kitchen. The fight had been over a girl, but both of them knew her name was Paola, not Mafia. I don't hate the Jewish people, Mafia was explaining, only the things they do. She and Profane were alone in her apartment. Rooney was out drinking, perhaps seeing eigenvalue. It was the day after the fight. She didn't seem to care where her husband was. All at once, Profane got a marvelous idea. She wanted to keep Jews out. Maybe half a Jew could get in. She beat him to it. Her hand reached for his belt buckle and started to unfasten it. No, he said, having changed his mind. Needing a zipper to undo, her hand slid away, 
around her hips to the back of her skirt. Now look. I need a man, already half out of the skirt, fashioned for heroic love. I've wanted you ever since we met. Heroic love's ass, said Profane. You're married. Charisma was having nightmares in the next room. He started thumping around under the green blanket, flailing out at the elusive shadow of his own persecutor. Here, she said, lower half denuded, here on the rug. Profane got up and rooted around in the icebox for beer. Mafia lay on the floor, screaming at him. Hear yourself. He set a can of beer on her soft abdomen. She yelped, knocking it over. The beer made a soggy spot on the rug between them like a bundling board or Tristan's blade. Drink your beer and tell me about heroic love. She was making no move to get dressed. A woman wants to feel like a woman, breathing hard is all. She wants to be taken, penetrated, ravished. But more than that, she wants to enclose the man. With spider webs woven of yo-yo string, a net or trap, Profane could think of nothing but Rachel. Nothing heroic about a shlemiel, Profane told her. What was a hero? Randolph Scott, who could handle a six-gun, horse's reins, lariat. Master of the inanimate. But a schlemiel, and was hardly a man. Somebody who lies back and takes it from objects like any passive woman. Why, he wondered, does something like sex have to be so confused? Mafia, why do you have to have names for it? Here he was, arguing again, like with Fina in the bathtub. What are you, she snarled, a latent homosexual? You afraid of women? No, I'm not queer. How could you say? Sometimes women remind me of inanimate objects. Young Rachel, even. Half an M.G. Charisma came in, two beady eyes peering through burn holes in the blanket. He spotted Mafia, moved toward her. The green wool mound began to sing. It is something less than heaven to be quoted, Thesis 1.7. Every time I make an advance. If the world is all that the case is, that's a pretty discouraging basis on which to pursue any sort of romance. I've got a proposition for you, logical, positive, and brief, and at least it could serve as a kind of comic relief. Refrain. Let P equal me with my heart and command, let Q equal you with Tractatus in hand, and R could stand for a lifetime of love, filled with music to fondle and purr to. We'll define love as anything lovely you'd care to infer to. On the right, put that bright hypothetical case. On the left, our unclaffed parenthetical chase. And that horseshoe there in the middle could be lucky we've nothing to lose, if in these parentheses we just mind our little P's and Q's. If P... Mafia sang in reply. Thinks of me as a girl hard to make. Then Q wishes you would go jump in the lake, for R is a meaningless concept, having nothing to do with pleasure. I prefer the hard and tangible things I can measure. Man, you chase in the face of impossible odds. I'm, alas, in the class of unbossable broads. If you'll promise no more sticky phrases, half a mo while I kick off my shoes. There are birds, there are bees and to hell with all your P's and Q's. By the time Profane finished his beer, the blanket covered them both. Twenty days before the dog star moved into conjunction with the sun, the dog days began. The world started to run more and more afoul of the inanimate. Fifteen were killed in a train wreck near Oaxaca, Mexico, on 1 July. The next day, fifteen people died when an apartment house collapsed in Madrid. July 4th, a bus fell into a river near Karachi and thirty-one passengers drowned. Thirty-nine more were drowned two days later in a tropical storm in the central Philippines. Nine July, the Aegean Islands were hit by an earthquake and tidal waves which killed forty-three. Fourteen July, a Matz plane crashed after takeoff from McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, killing 45. An earthquake at Anjar, India, 21 July, killed 117.
From 22 to 24 July, floods rampaged in central and southern Iran, killing 300. 28 July, a bus ran off a ferry boat at Kuapio, Finland, and 15 were killed. Four petroleum tanks blew up near Dumas, Texas, 29 July, killing 19. 1 August, 17 died in a train wreck near Rio de Janeiro. Fifteen more died the 4th and 5th in floods in southwest Pennsylvania. 2,161 people died the same week in a typhoon, which hit Chekiang, Honan, and Hopei provinces. 7 August, six dynamite trucks blew up in Cali, Colombia, killing about 1,100. On the same day, there was a train wreck at Sheroff, Czechoslovakia, killing nine. The next day, 262 miners, trapped by fire, died in a coal mine under Marcinelle in Belgium. Ice avalanches on Mont Blanc swept 15 mountain climbers into the Kingdom of Death in the week 12 to 18 August. The same week, a gas explosion in Monticello, Utah, killed 15, and a typhoon through Japan and Okinawa killed 30. Twenty-nine more coal miners died of gas poisoning in a mine in Upper Silesia on 27 August. Also on the 27th, a Navy bomber crashed among houses in Sanford, Florida, and killed four. Next day, a gas explosion in Montreal killed seven, and flash floods in Turkey killed 138. These were the mass deaths. There were also the attendant maimed, malfunctioning, homeless, lorn. It happens every month in a succession of encounters between groups of living and a congruent world which simply doesn't care. Look in any yearly almanac under disasters, which is where the figures above come from. The business is transacted month after month after month. 4. McClintic Sphere had been reading fake books all afternoon. If you ever want to get depressed, he told Ruby, read through a fake book. I don't mean the music, I mean the words. The girl didn't answer. She'd been nervous the past couple of weeks. What is wrong, baby, he'd say, but she'd shrug it off. One night she told him it was her father who was bugging her. She missed him. Maybe he was sick. You've been seeing him? A little girl should do that. You don't know how lucky you are to have your father. He lives in another city, and she wouldn't say any more. Tonight he said, look, you need the fare? You go see him. That's what you ought to do. McClintock, she said, what business does a whore have going anywhere? A whore isn't human. You are. You are with me, Ruby. You know it. We aren't playing any games here, patting the bed. Whore lives in one place and stays there, like some little virgin girl in a fairy tale. She doesn't do any traveling unless she works the streets. You haven't been thinking about that. Maybe. She wouldn't look at him. Matilda likes you. You crazy? What else is there? Either the street or all cooped up. If I do go see him, I won't come back. Where does he live? South Africa? Maybe. Oh, Christ. Now, McClintock Sphere told himself, Nobody goes and falls in love with a prostitute, not unless he's fourteen or so and she's the first piece of tail he's ever had. But this Ruby, whatever she might be in bed, was a good friend outside it, too. He worried about her. It was, for a change, that good kind of worry, not, say, like Rooney Winsome's, which seemed to bug the man worse every time McClintock saw him. It had been going on now for at least a couple of weeks, McClintock, who'd never gone along all the way with the cool outlook that developed in the post-war years, didn't mind as much as some other musicians might have when Rooney got juiced and started talking about his personal problems. A few times, Rachel had been along with him, and McClintock knew Rachel was straight, and there wasn't any jazzing going on there, so Rooney must have genuinely had problems with this mafia woman. It was moving into deep summertime in Wavy York, the worst time of the year. Time for rumbles in the park and a lot of kids getting killed. 
Time for tempers to get frayed, marriages to break up, all homicidal and chaotic impulses frozen inside for the winter to thaw now and come to the surface and glitter out the pores of your face. McClintock was heading up for Lennox Mass for that jazz festival. He knew he couldn't stand it here. But what about Rooney? What he was getting at home, most likely, was edging him towards something. McClintock noticed that last night, between sets at the V-note. He'd seen the look before, a bass player he'd known in Fort Worth who never changed expression, who was always telling you, I have this problem with narcotics, who'd flipped one night and they took him away to the hospital at Lexington or someplace. McClintock would never know. But Rooney had the same look, too cool, too unemotional when he said, I have a problem with my woman. What was there inside for deep summer in Nueva York to melt? What would happen when it did? This word flip was weird. Every recording date of McClintock's, he'd got into the habit of talking electricity with the audio men and technicians in the studio. McClintock once couldn't have cared less about electricity. But now it seemed if that was helping him reach a bigger audience, some digging, some who would never dig, but all paying, and those royalties keeping the triumph in gas and McClintock in J-Press suits, then McClintock ought to be grateful to electricity, ought maybe to learn a little more about it. So he'd picked up some here and there, and one day last summer he got around to talking stochastic music and digital computers with one technician. Out of the conversation had come Set Reset, which was getting to be a signature for the group. He had found out from this sound man about a two-triode circuit called a flip-flop, which when it was turned on could be one of two ways, depending on which tube was conducting and which was cut off. Set or reset. Flip or flop. And that, the man said, can be yes or no or one or zero. And that is what you might call one of the basic units or specialized cells in a big electronic brain. Crazy, said McClintock, having lost him back there someplace. But one thing that did occur to him was if a computer's brain could go flip and flop, why so could a musician's? As long as you were flop, everything was cool. But where did the trigger pulse come from to make you flip? McClintock, no lyricist, had made up nonsense words to go along with set reset. He sang them to himself sometimes on the stand while the natural horn was soloing. Gwyn crossed the Jordan ecclesiastically. Flop, flip, once I was hip. Flip, flop, now you're on top. Set, reset, why are we beset? We're crazy and cool in the same molecule. What are you thinking about? said the girl, Ruby. Flipping, said McClintock. You'll never flip. Not me, McClintock said, a whole lot of people. After a while, he said, not really to her. Ruby, what happened after the war? That war, the world flipped would come forty-five, and they flopped. Here in Harlem, they flopped. Everything got cool, no love, no hate, no worries, no excitement. Every once in a while, though, somebody flips back, back to where he can love. Maybe that's it, the girl said after a while. Maybe you have to be crazy to love somebody. But you take a whole bunch of people flip at the same time, and you've got a war. Now, war is not loving, is it? Flip, flop, she said. Get the mop. You're just like a little kid. McClintock, she said. I am. I worry about you. I worry about my father. Maybe he's flipped. Why don't you go see him? The same argument again. Tonight they were in for a long spell of arguing. You are beautiful, Schoenmecker was saying. Shall am I? Perhaps not as you are, but as I see you. She sat up. It can't keep going the way it's been. Come back. No, Shale, my nerves can't take this. Come back. It's getting so I can't look at Rachel or Slab. Come back. At last she lay again beside him. 
pelvic bones, he said, touching there, should protrude more. That would be very sexy. I could do that for you. Please, Esther, I want to give. I want to do things for you. If I can bring out the beautiful girl inside you, the idea of Esther, as I have done already with your face. She became aware of a clock ticking on the table next to them. She lay stiff, ready to run to the street, naked if need be. Come, he said, half an hour in the next room. So simple, I can do it alone. Nothing but a local anesthetic. She began to cry. What would it be next, she said a few moments later. Larger breasts you'd want. Then my ears might be a shade too big for you. Shale, why can't it be just me? He rolled over, exasperated. How do you tell a woman, he asked the floor. What is loving if not... You don't love me? She was up, struggling clumsy into a brassiere. You've never said it, and if you did, you wouldn't mean it. You'll be back, he said, still watching the floor. I won't, through the light wool of her sweater. But of course she would be. After she left, there was only the ticking of the clock until Schoenmaker yawned, sudden and explosive, rolled over to confront the ceiling and begin swearing at it softly. While at Anthro Research, Profane listened with half an ear to the coffee percolating and carried on another imaginary conversation with Shroud. By now that had become a tradition. Remember, Profane, how it is on Route 14 South outside Elmira, New York? You walk on an overpass and look west and see the sun setting on a junk pile, acres of old cars piled up ten high in rusting tiers, a graveyard for cars. If I could die, that's what my graveyard would look like. I wish you would. Look at you masquerading like a human being. You ought to be junked, not burned or cremated. Of course, like a human being. Now remember, right after the war, the Nuremberg War Trials? Remember the photographs of Auschwitz? Thousands of Jewish corpses stacked up like those poor car bodies. Schlemiel, it's already started. Hitler did that. He was crazy. Hitler, Eichmann, Mengele. Fifteen years ago. Has it occurred to you there may be no more standards for crazy or sane now that it's started? What, for Christ's sake? While Slab lounged meticulous about his canvas, cheese Danish number 41, making quick little stabs with a fine old Kalinsky brush at the surface of the painting, two brown slugs, snails without shells, lay crosswise and copulating on a polygonal slab of marble, a translucent white bubble rising between them. No impasto here. Long paint, everything put there more than real could ever be. Weird illumination, shadows all wrong, surfaces of marble, slugs, and a half-eaten cheese danish in the upper right textured painstakingly fine, so that their slimy trails, converging straight and inevitable from bottom and side to the X of their union, did shine like moonlight. And Charisma Fu and Pig Bardeen came rollicking out of a grocery store up on the west side, yelling football signals and tossing a poor-looking eggplant about under the lights of Broadway. And Rachel and Rooney sat on a bench in Sheridan Square talking about Mafia and Paola. It was one in the morning. A wind had risen and something curious to it happened, as if everyone in the city simultaneously had become sick of news of any kind for thousands of newspaper pages blew through the small park on the way across town, blundered like pale bats against the trees, tangled themselves around the feet of Rooney and Rachel and of a bum sleeping across the way. Millions of unread and useless words had come to a kind of life in Sheridan Square, while the two on the bench wove cross-talk of their own, oblivious among them. And Stencil sat doer and undrunk in the rusty spoon, while Slab's friend, another catatonic expressionist, harangued him with the great betrayal told of the dance of death. While around them, something of the sort was in fact going on, for here was the whole sick 
crew, was it not, linked maybe by a spectral chain and rollicking along over some moor or other? Stencil thought of Mondaugan's story. The crew at Fopples saw here the same leprous pointillism of Aris Root, weak jaws and bloodshot eyes, tongues and backs of teeth stained purple by this morning's homemade wine, lipstick which it seemed could be peeled off intact, tossed to the earth to join a trail of similar jetsam. The disembodied smiles are pouts which might serve, perhaps, as spoor for the next generation's crew. God! Wa, said the catatonic expressionist. Melancholy, said Stencil. And Mafia Winsome, mateless, stood undressed before the mirror, contemplating herself and little else. And the cat yowled in the courtyard. And who knew where Paola was? In the past few days, Esther had become more and more impossible for Schoenmaker to get along with. He began to think about breaking it off again, only this time permanently. It isn't me you love, she kept saying. You want to change me into something I'm not. In return, he could only argue a kind of Platonism at her. Did she want him so shallow he should only love her body? It was her soul he loved. What was the matter with her? Didn't every girl want a man to love the soul, the true them? Sure they did. Well, what is the soul? It is the idea of the body, the abstraction behind the reality. What Esther really was, shown to the senses with certain imperfections there in the bone and tissue. Schoenmaker could bring out the true perfect Esther, which dwelled inside the imperfect one. Her soul would be there on the outside, radiant, unutterably beautiful. Who are you, she yelled back, to say what my soul looks like? You know what you're in love with? Yourself. Your own skill in plastic surgery is what. In answer to which, Schoenmaker rolled over and stared at the floor and wondered aloud if he would ever understand women. Eigenvalue, the soul dentist, had even given Schoenmaker counsel. Schoenmaker was not a colleague, but as if Stencil's notion of an inner circle were correct after all, things got around. Dudley fellow, he told himself, you've got no business with any of these people. But then he did. He gave cut rates on cleaning, drilling, and root canal jobs for members of the crew. Why? If they were all bums, but still providing society with valuable art and thought, why, that would be fine. If that were the case, then someday, possibly in the next rising period of history, when this decadence was past and the planets were being colonized and the world at peace, a dental historian would mention eigenvalue in a footnote as patron of the arts, discreet physician in the Neo-Jacobean school. But they produced nothing but talk, and at that not very good talk. A few, like Slab, actually did what they professed, turned out a tangible product. But again, what? Cheese danishes or this technique for the sake of technique, catatonic expressionism, or parodies on what someone else had already done. So much for art. What if thought? The crew had developed a kind of shorthand whereby they could set forth any visions that might come their way. Conversations at the spoon had become little more than proper nouns, literary allusions, critical or philosophical terms linked in certain ways. Depending on how you arranged the building box at your disposal, you were smart or stupid. Depending on how others reacted, they were in or out. The number of blocks, however, was finite. Mathematically, boy, he told himself, if nobody else original comes along, they're bound to run out of arrangements some day. What then? What indeed? This sort of arranging and rearranging was decadence but the exhaustion of all possible permutations and combinations was death. It scared eigenvalue sometimes. He would go in back and look at the set of dentures, teeth and metals and your. Five. McClintock, back for a weekend from Lennox, found August in Nueva York bad as he'd expected. 
buzzing close to sundown through Central Park in the Triumph, he saw all manner of symptoms, girls on the grass sweating all over in thin, vulnerable summer dresses, groups of boys prowling off on the horizon, twitchless sure, waiting for night, cops and solid citizens all nervous, maybe only in a business way, but the cops' business had to do with these boys and the coming of night. He'd come back to see Ruby. Faithful, he'd sent her postcards showing different views of Tanglewood and the Berkshires once a week, cards she never answered. But he'd called long distance once or twice, and she was still there close to home. For some reason, one night he dashed lengthwise across the state, a tiny state considering the triumph speed, the clinic and the bass player, nearly missed Cape Cod and driven into the sea. But sheer momentum carried them up that croissant of land and out to a settlement called Frenchtown, a resort. Out in front of a seafood place on the main and only drag, they found two more musicians playing mumbly peg with clam knives. They were en route to a party. Oh, yes, they cried in unison. One climbed in the Triumph's trunk, the other, who had a bottle, rum, 150 proof, and a pineapple, sat on the hood. At eighty miles per hour over roads which are ill-lit and near unusable by the end of the season, this happy hood ornament cut open the fruit with a clam knife and built rum and pineapple juices in paper cups, which McClintock's base handed him over the windscreen. At the party, McClintock's eye was taken by a little girl in dungarees who sat in the kitchen entertaining a progress of summer types. Give me back my eye, said McClintock. I haven't got your eye. Later. He was one of those who can be infected by the drunkenness of others. He was juiced five minutes after they climbed in the window to the party. Bass was outside in the tree with a girl. You got eyes for the kitchen, he called down waggish. McClintock went out and sat down under the tree. The two above him were singing. Have you heard, baby, did you know? There ain't no dope in Lennox. Fireflies surrounded McClintock, inquisitive. Somewhere you could hear waves crashing. The party inside was quiet, though the house was crowded. The girl appeared at a kitchen window. McClintock closed his eyes, rolled over, and pushed his face into the grass. Along came Harvey Fatso, a piano player. Eunice wants to know, he told McClintock, if possibly she could see you alone. Eunice was the girl in the kitchen. No, McClintock said. There was movement in the tree over him. You got a wife in New York? Harvey asked, sympathetic. Something like that. Not long after, along came Eunice. I have a bottle of gin, she coaxed him. You will have to do better, said McClintock. He hadn't brought any horn. He let them have their inevitable session inside. He couldn't ever see that kind of session. His own kind of session didn't belong here. Wasn't so frantic. Was, in fact, one of the only good results of the cool scene after the war. This easy knowledge on both ends of the instrument of what exactly is there, this quiet feeling together, like kissing a girl's ear. Mouth is one person's, ear is another, but both of you know. He stayed out under the tree. When the bass and his girl descended, McClintock got a soft stocking foot in the small of the back, which woke him up. Leaving, nearly dawn, Eunice, entirely plastered, scowled at him horribly, mouthing curses. Time was, McClintock wouldn't have thought twice. Wife in New York? Ha, ho. She was there when he reached Matilda's, but only just, packing a good-sized suitcase, quarter of an hour the wrong way, and he'd have missed. Ruby started bawling the minute he showed in the doorway. She threw a slip at him, which gave up halfway across the room and floated to the bare floor, peach-colored and sad. It passed through the slant rays of the sun almost down. They both watched it settle. Don't worry, she finally said. I made a bet with myself. Started unpacking the suitcase then, tears still falling promiscuous on her silk, rayon cotton, linen sheets. Stupid, McClintock yelled. God, that's stupid. He had to yell at something. It wasn't that he didn't believe in telepathic flashes. 
What is there to talk about, she said a little later, the suitcase like a ticking time bomb shoved back empty under the bed. When had it become a matter of having her or losing her? Charisma and Fu crashed into the room drunk and singing English vaudeville songs. With them was a St. Bernard they had found in the street drooling and sick. Evenings were hot this August. Oh, God, Profane said into the phone. The roaring boys are back. Through an open door on a bed there, an itinerant race driver named Murray Sable sweated and snored. The girl with him rolled away. On her back began half a dream dialogue. Down on the drive sat somebody atop a fifty-six Lincoln's hood singing to himself. Oh, man, I want some young blood. Drink it, gargle it, use it for a mouthwash. Hey, young blood, what's happening tonight? Werewolf season. August. Rachel kissed the mouthpiece on her end. How could you kiss an object? The dog staggered away into the kitchen and fell with a crash among two hundred or so of Charisma's empty beer bottles. Charisma sang on. I find one, Foo screamed from the kitchen. One bucket, hey. Fill it with beer, from Charisma, still a cockney. He looked pretty sick. Beer is the best thing for him, hair of the dog. Charisma began to laugh. Fu, after a moment, joined in bubbling, hysterical, a hundred geishas all set going at once. It's hot, Rachel said. It will be cool, Rachel. But their timing was off. His I want and her please collided somewhere underground in mid-circuit. Came out mostly noise. Neither spoke. The room was dark. Out the window across the Hudson, heat lightning walked sneaky Pete over Jersey. Soon Murray Sable stopped snoring. The girl fell quiet. Everything, a sudden hush for the moment, except the dog's beer sloshing into its bucket and an almost inaudible hiss. The air mattress Profane slept on had a slow leak. He reinflated it once a week with a bicycle pump Winsome kept in the closet. Have you been talking? he said. No. All right. But what goes on underground? Do we, I wonder, come out the same people at the other end? There are things under the city, she admitted. Alligators, daft priests, bums and subways. He thought of the night she'd called him at the Norfolk bus station. Who'd monitored then? Did she really want him back then? Or was it all maybe a troll's idea of fun? I have to sleep. I have the second shift. Call me at midnight. Of course. I mean, I broke the electric alarm clock here. Schlemiel, they hate you. They've declared war on me, said Profane. Wars begin in August. In the temperate zone in 20th century, we have this tradition. Not only seasonal Augusts, nor only public wars. Hung up. The phone now looked evil, as if it schemed in secret. Profane flopped on the air mattress. In the kitchen, the St. Bernard began to lap beer. Hey, he going to puke? The dog puked, loud and horrible. Winsome came charging in from a remote room. I broke your alarm clock, Profane said into the mattress. What, what, Winsome was saying. Next to Murray Sable, a girl voice began talking drowsy in no language known to a waking world. Where have you guys been? Winsome ran straight at the espresso machine, broke stride at the last moment, jumped on top of it, and sat manipulating the taps with his toes. He had a direct view into the kitchen. Oh, ha, ho, he said, sounding as if he'd been stabbed. Oh, me casa, su casa, you guys. Where is it you've been? Charisma, head hanging, shuffled around in a greenish pool of vomit. The St. Bernard was sleeping among the beer bottles. Where else, he said. Out rollicking, said Fu. The dog began to scream at humid nightmare shapes.
Back in August 1956, rollicking was the whole sick crew's favorite pastime, in or outdoor. One of the frequent forms it took was yo-yoing, though probably not inspired by Profane's peregrinations along the East Coast. The crew did undertake something similar on a city scale. Rule, you had to be genuinely drunk. Certain of the theater crowd inhabiting the spoon had had fantastic yo-yo records invalidated because it was discovered later they'd been sober all along. Quarter-deck drunkards, Pig called them scornfully. Rule, you had to wake up at least once on each transit. Otherwise, there'd only be a time gap, and that you could have spent on a bench in the subway station. Rule, it had to be a subway line running up and down town, because this is the way a yo-yo goes. In the early days of yo-yoing, certain false champions had admitted shamefaced to racking up scores on the 42nd Street shuttle, which was looked now on as something of a scandal in yo-yo circles. Slab was king. After a memorable party a year ago at Raoul, he and Melvin's, a night he and Esther broke up, He'd spent a weekend on the West Side Express, making sixty-nine complete cycles. At the end of it, starved, he stumbled out near Fulton Street on the way uptown again and ate a dozen cheese danishes, got sick and was taken in for vagrancy and puking in the street. Stencil thought it all nonsense. Get in there at rush hour, said Slab. There are nine million yo-yos in this town. Stencil took this advice one evening after five, came out with one rib to his umbrella, broken, and a vow never to do it again. Vertical corpses, eyes with no life, crowded loins, buttocks and hip points together. Little sound except for the racketing of the subway echoes in the tunnels. Violence, seeking exit. Some of them carried out two stops before their time and unable to go upstream get back in, all wordless. Was it the dance of death brought up to date? Trauma. Possibly only remembering his last shock underground, he headed for Rachel's, found her out to dinner with Profane. Profane? But Paola, whom he had been trying to avoid, pinned him between the black fireplace and a print of De Chirico Street. You ought to see this. Handing him a small packet of typewritten pages. Confessions, the title. Confessions of Fausto Maestro. I had to go back, she said. Stencil has stayed off Malta, as if she'd asked him to go. Read, she said, and see. His father died in Valletta. Is that all? Was that all? Did she really intend to go? Oh, God, did he? Phone rang mercifully. It was Slab who was holding a party over the weekend. Of course, she said. And Stencil echoed, of course, silent. Chapter 11 Confessions of Fausto Maestro V. It takes, unhappily, no more than a desk and writing supplies to turn any room into a confessional. This may have nothing to do with the acts we have committed or the humors we do go in and out of, it may be only the room, a cube having no persuasive powers of its own. The room simply is. To occupy it and find a metaphor there for memory is our own fault. Let me describe the room. The room measures seventeen by eleven and a half by seven feet. The walls are lath and plaster, and painted the same shade of grey, as were the decks of His Majesty's corvettes during the war. The room is oriented so that its diagonals fall north-northeast, south-southwest, and northwest-southeast. Thus any observer may see, from the window and balcony on the north-northwest side, a short side, the city, Valletta. One enters from the west-southwest by a door midway in a long wall of the room, Standing just inside the door, and turning clockwise, one sees a portable wood stove in the north-northeast corner. Surrounded by boxes, bowls, sacks containing food. The mattress, located halfway along the long east-northeast wall, a slop bucket in the southeast corner, 
a wash basin in the south-southwest corner, a window facing the dockyard, the door one has just entered, and finally, in the northwest corner, a small writing table and chair. The chair faces the west-southwest wall, so that the head must be turned 135 degrees to the rear in order to have a line of sight with the city. The walls are unadorned, the floor is carpetless. A dark gray stain is located on the ceiling directly over the stove. That is the room. To say the mattress was begged from the Navy BOQ here in Valletta shortly after the war, the stove and food supplied by care, or the table from a house now rubble and covered by earth, what have these to do with the room? The facts are history, and only men have histories. The facts call up emotional responses which no inert room has ever showed us. The room is in a building which had nine such rooms before the war. Now there are three. The building is on an escarpment above the dockyard. The room is stacked atop two others. The other two-thirds of the building were removed by the bombing sometime during the winter of 1942-43. to Fausto himself may be defined in only three ways. As a relationship, your father. As a given name, most important, as an occupant. Since shortly after you left an occupant of the room. Why? Why use the room as an introduction to an apologia? Because the room, though windowless and cold at night, is a hothouse. Because the room is the past, though it has no history of its own. Because, as the physical being there of a bed or horizontal plane determines what we call love, as a high place must exist before God's word can come to a flock and any sort of religion begin, so must there be a room sealed against the present before we can make any attempt to deal with the past. In the university, before the war, before I had married your poor mother, I felt, as do many young men, a sure wind of greatness flowing over my shoulders like an invisible cape. Marat, Nubietna, and I were to be the cadre for a grand school of Anglo-Maltese poetry, the generation of thirty-seven. The undergraduate certainty of success gives rise to anxieties, foremost being the autobiography or apologia pro vita sua the poet someday has to write. How, the reasoning goes, how can a man write his life unless he is virtually certain of the hour of his death? A harrowing question. Who knows what Herculean poetic feats might be left to him in perhaps the score of years between a premature apologia and death. Achievements so great as to cancel out the effect of the apologia itself, and if, on the other hand, nothing at all is accomplished in twenty or thirty stagnant years, how distasteful is anticlimax to the young. Time, of course, has showed the question up in all its young illogic. We can justify any apologia simply by calling life a successive rejection of personalities. No apologia is any more than a romance, half a fiction, in which all the successive identities taken on and rejected by the writer as a function of linear time are treated as separate characters. The writing itself even constitutes another rejection, another character added to the past. So we do sell our souls, paying them away to history in little installments. It isn't so much to pay for eyes clear enough to see past the fiction of continuity, the fiction of cause and effect, the fiction of a humanized history endowed with reason. Before 1938, then, came Fausto Maestro I, a young sovereign dithering between Caesar and God. Marat was going into politics. Nubietna would be an engineer. I was slated to be the priest. Thus, among us all major areas of human struggle would come under the scrutiny of the generation of thirty-seven. Maestral II arrived with you, child, and with the war. 
you were unplanned for and, in a way, resented. Though if Fausto I had ever had a serious vocation, Elena Zemsi, your mother, and you would never have come into his life at all. The plans of our movement were disturbed. We still wrote, but there was other work to do. Our poetic destiny was replaced by the discovery of an aristocracy deeper and older. We were builders. Fausto Maestro III was born on the day of the Thirteen Raids, generated out of Elena's death, out of a horrible encounter with one we only knew as the Bad Priest, an encounter I am only now attempting to put in English. The journal, for weeks after, has nothing but gibberish to describe that birth trauma. Fausta III is the closest any of the characters comes to non-humanity. Not inhumanity, which means bestiality. Beasts are still animate. Fausta III had taken on much of the non-humanity of the debris, crushed stone, broken masonry, destroyed churches and auberges of his city. His successor, Fausto IV, inherited a physically and spiritually broken world. No single event produced him. Fausto III had merely passed a certain level in his slow return to consciousness or humanity. That curve is still rising. Somehow there had accumulated a number of poems, at least one sonnet cycle the present Fausto is still happy with. Monographs on religion, language, history. Critical essays, Hopkins, T.S. Eliot, de Chirico's novel, Hebdomoros. Fausto IV was the man of letters and only survivor of the generation of 37, for Nubietna is building roads in America, and Marat is somewhere south of Mount Ruanzori, organizing riots among our linguistic brothers, the Bantu. We have now reached an interregnum. Stagnant, the only throne, a wooden chair in the northwest corner of this room. Hermetic, for who can hear the dockyard whistle, rivet guns, vehicles in the street when one is occupied with the past? Now memory is a traitor, gilding, altering. The word is, in sad fact, meaningless, based as it is on the false assumption that identity is single, soul continuous. A man has no more right to set forth any self-memory as truth than to say Marat is a sour-mouthed university cynic or Nubietna is a liberal and madman. Already, you see, the is, unconsciously, we've drifted into the past. You must now be subjected, dear Paola, to a barrage of undergraduate sentiment. The journals, I mean, of Fausto the First and Second. What other way can there be to regain him as we must? Here, for example. How wondrous is this St. Giles' fair called history? Her rhythms, pulse regular and sinusoidal. A freak show in caravan traveling over thousands of little hills. A serpent, hypnotic and undulant, bearing on her back like infinitesimal fleas, such hunchbacks, dwarves, prodigies, centaurs, poltergeists. Two-headed, three-eyed, hopelessly in love. Satyrs with the skin of werewolves, werewolves with the eyes of young girls, and perhaps even an old man with a navel of glass, through which can be seen goldfish nuzzling the coral country of his guts. The date is, of course, 3 September 1939. The mixing of metaphors, crowding of detail, rhetoric for its own sake, only a way of saying the balloon had gone up, illustrating again, and certainly not for the last time, the colorful whimsy of history. Could we have been so much in the midst of life, with such a sense of grand adventure about it all? Oh, God is here, you know, in the crimson carpets of Sulla each spring, in the blood-orange groves, in the sweet pods of my carob tree, the St. John's bread of this dear island. His fingers raked the ravines. His breath keeps the rain clouds from over us. His voice once guided the shipwrecked St. Paul to bless our Malta. And Marat wrote, Britain and Crown, we join thy swelling guard to drive the brute invader from our strand. For God his own shall rout the evil start 
and God light peace's lamps with his dear hand. God his own. That brings a smile. Shakespeare. Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot ruined us all. On Ash Wednesday of 42, for example, Nubietna wrote a satire on Eliot's poem. Because I do, because I do not hope, because I do not hope to survive injustice from the palace, death from the air, because I do, only do, I continue. We were most fond, I believe, of the hollow men, and we did like to use Elizabethan phrases even in our speech. There is a description, sometime in 1937, of a farewell celebration for Marat on the eve of his marriage. All of us drunk, arguing politics. It was in a café in Kingsway. Scusi, Strada Reale, then, before the Italians started bombing us. Nubietna had called our Constitution hypocritical camouflage for a slave state. Marat objected. Nubietna leapt up on the table, upsetting glasses, knocking the bottle to the floor, screaming, Go to, caitiff! It became the cant phrase for our set. Go to. The entry was written, I suppose, next morning, but even in the misery of a headache, the dehydrated Faust of the First was still able to talk of the pretty girls, the hot jazz band, the gallant conversation. The pre-war university years were probably as happy as he described, and the conversation as good. They must have argued everything under the sun, and in Malta then was a good deal of sun. But Fausto I was as bastardized as the others. In the midst of the bombing in 42, his successor commented, Our poets write of nothing now but the rain of bombs from what was once heaven. We builders practice as we must patience and strength, but... The curse of knowing English and its emotional nuances, with it a desperate, nervous hatred of this war and impatience for it to be over. I think our education in the English school and university alloyed what was pure in us. Younger we talked of love, fear, motherhood, speaking in Maltese as Elena and I do now. But what a language! Have it or today's builders advanced at all since the half-men who built the sanctuaries of Hajar Kim? We talk as animals might. Can I explain love? Tell her my love for her is the same and part of my love for the Beaufort's crews, the Spitfire pilots, our governor? That it is love which embraces this island, love for everything on it that moves? There are no words in Maltese for this nor finer shades, nor words for intellectual states of mind. She cannot read my poetry. I cannot translate it for her. Are we only animals, then? Still one with the troglodytes who lived here four hundred centuries before dear Christ's birth? We do live as they did in the bowels of the earth, copulate, spawn, die without uttering any but the grossest words, do any of us even understand the words of God, teachings of his church? Perhaps Maestro, Maltese, one with his people, was meant only to live at the threshold of consciousness, only exist as a hardly animate lump of flesh and automaton. But we are torn, our grand generation of thirty-seven, to be merely Maltese, endure almost mindless without sense of time, or to think, continuously, in English, to be too aware of war, of time, of all the greys and shadows of love. Perhaps British colonialism has produced a new sort of being, a dual man, aimed two ways at once, towards peace and simplicity on the one hand, towards an exhausted intellectual searching on the other. Perhaps Marat, Nubietna, and Maestral are the first of a new race. What monsters shall rise in our wake? These thoughts are from the darker side of my mind. Mo, brain. Not even a word for mind. We must use the hateful Italian, menti. What monsters? You, child, what sort of monster are you? Perhaps not at all, of course, what Fausto meant. He may have been talking of a spiritual heritage. Perhaps of Fausto the Third and Fourth, 
and the following. But the excerpt shows clearly a charming quality of youth, to begin with optimism, and once the inadequacy of optimism is borne in on him by an inevitably hostile world, to retreat into abstractions. Abstractions even in the midst of the bombing. For a year and a half Malta averaged ten raids per day. How he sustained that hermetic retreat God alone knows. There's no indication in the journals. Perhaps it too sprang from the anglicized half of Fausto II, for he wrote poetry. Even in the journals we get sudden shifts from reality to something less. I write this during a night raid down in the abandoned sewer. It is raining outside. The only light is from phosphorus flares above the city. A few candles in here. Bombs. Elena is beside me, holding the child who sleeps drooling against her shoulder. Packed close round us are other Maltese, English civil servants, a few Indian tradesmen. There's little talk. Children listen, all wide eyes, to bombs above in the streets. For them it is only an amusement. At first they cried on being wakened in the middle of the night, but they've grown used to it. Some even stand now near the entrance to our shelter, watching the flares and bombs, chattering, nudging, pointing. It will be a strange generation. What of our own? She sleeps. And then for no apparent reason this. Oh, Malta of the Knights of St. John, history's serpent is one. What matter where on her body we lie? Here, in this wretched tunnel, we are the knights and the jewers. We are Lille Adam and his arm and arm, and his maniple on a field of blue sea and gold sun. We are Monsieur Parisot, lonely in his wind-haunted grave high above the harbor, battling on the ramparts during the great siege, both. My grandmaster, both. Death and life, ermine and old cloth, noble and common, in feast and combat and mourning, we are Malta, one pure and a motley of races at once. No time has passed since we lived in caves, grappled with fish at the reedy shore, buried our dead with a song, with red ochre and pulled up our dolmens, temples and menhirs, and standing stones to the glory of some indeterminate god or gods, rose toward the light in undante of singing, lived our lives through circling centuries of rape, looting, invasion, still one, one in the dark ravines, one in this God-favored plot of sweet Mediterranean earth, one in whatever temple or sewer or catacombs darkness is ours, by fate or historical writhings, or still by the will of God. He must have written the latter part at home after the raid, but the shift is still there. Fausto II was a young man in retreat. It's seen not only in his fascination for the conceptual, even in the midst of that ongoing, vast, but somehow boring, destruction of an island, but also in his relationship with your mother. First mention of Elena Zemsi comes from Fausto I, shortly after Marat's marriage. Perhaps a breach having been made in the bachelorhood of the generation of thirty-seven, though from all indications the movement was anything but celibate, Fausto now felt safe enough to follow suit, and of course at the same time taking these fidgeting and inconclusive steps towards church celibacy. Oh, he was in love, no doubt but his own ideas on the matter always in a state of flux, never, I think, getting quite in line with the Maltese version. Church approved copulation for the purpose and glorification of motherhood. We already know, for example, how Fausto, in the worst part of the siege of 40 to 43, had arrived at a notion and practice of love wide, high, and deep as Malta itself. The dog days have ended. The maestral has ceased to blow. Soon the other wind, called Gregale, will bring the gentle rains to solemnize the sowing of our red wheat. Myself, what am I if not a wind, my very name a hissing of queer zephyrs through the carob trees? 
I stand in time between the two winds, my will no more than a puff of air. But air, too, are the clever, cynical arguments of Nubietna. His views on marriage, even Marat's marriage, blow by my poor flapping ears unnoticed. For Elena, tonight. Oh, Elena Zemtsi, small as the she-goat, sweet your milk and your love cry. Dark-eyed as the space between stars over Gaudish, where we have gazed so often in our childish summers. Tonight I will go to your little house in Vittoriosa, and before your black eyes break open this small part of a heart and offer in communion the St. John's bread I have cherished like a Eucharist these nineteen years. He did not propose marriage, but confessed his love. There was still, you see, the vague program, the vocation to priesthood he was never quite sure of. Elena hesitated. When young Fausto questioned, she became evasive. He promptly began to display symptoms of intense jealousy. Has she lost her faith? I've heard she has been out with Nubietna. Nubietna. Under his hands. Our oh, Lord, is there no recourse? Must I go out and find them together, follow through the old farce of challenge, combat, murder? How oh, he must be gloating. It was all planned. Must have been. Our discussions of marriage. He even told me one evening, hypothetically, of course, oh, yes, precisely how he would find a virgin some day and educate her to sin. Told me, knowing all the time that some day it would be Elena's Emcy. My friend... Comrade in arms, one third of our generation. I could never take her back. One touch from him and eighteen years of purity. Gone. Etc., etc. Nubietna, as Fausto must have known, even in the worst depths of suspicion, had nothing at all to do with her reluctance. Suspicion softened to a nostalgic brooding. Sunday there was rain, leaving me with memories. Rain seems to make them swell like bothersome flowers whose perfume is bittersweet. A night, I remember, we were children embracing in a garden above the harbor. The rustling of azaleas, smell of oranges, a black frock she wore that absorbed all the stars and moon, reflecting nothing back. As she had taken from me all my light, she has the carob softness of my heart. Ultimately, that quarrel took in a third party. In typically Maltese fashion, a priest, one Father Avalanche, came in as the intermediary. He appears infrequently in these journals, always faceless, serving more as foil to his opposite number, the bad priest, but he did finally persuade Elena to return to Fausto. She came to me today, out of smoke, rain, silence, wearing black, nearly invisible, sobbing plausibly enough in my too welcoming arms. She's to have a child. Nubietna's came my first thought. Of course it did, for all of half a second, fool. The father said mine. She had been to A for confession. God knows what passed there. This good priest cannot break the secrecy of the confessional, only let slip what the three of us know, that it is my child, so that we should be two souls united before God. So much for our plan. Marat and Nubietna will be disappointed. So much for their plan. We will return to this matter of vocation. From a distraught Elena then Fausto learned of his rival, the bad priest. No one knows his name or his parish. There is only superstitious rumor. Excommunicated confederates with the Dark One. He lives in an old villa past Slima, near the sea. Found E one night alone in the street. Perhaps he'd been out prowling for souls. A sinister figure, she said, but with the mouth of a Christ. The eyes were shadowed by a wide-brimmed hat. All she could see were soft cheeks, even teeth. Now, it was none of your mysterious corruption. Priests here are second only to mothers in order of prestige. A young girl is naturally enough deferent to and awed by the mere glimpse of any fluttering soutane in the street. 
Under subsequent questioning, it came out. It was near the church, our church, by a long, low wall in the street, after sunset, but still light. He asked if I was going to the church. I hadn't thought to go. Confessions were over. I don't know why I agreed to walk there with him. It was not a command, though I would have obeyed if it had been, but we went up the hill and into the church, up the side aisle to the confessional. Have you confessed? he asked. I looked at his eyes. I thought at first he was drunk, or married Bomohu. I was afraid. Come, then. We entered the confessional. At the time I thought, don't priests have the right? But I did tell him things I have never told Father Avalanche. I didn't know then who this priest was, you see. Now sin, for Elena Zemsi, had been heretofore as natural a function as breathing, eating, or gossiping. Under the agile instruction of the bad priest, however, it began to take on the shape of an evil spirit, alien, parasitic, attached like a black slug to her soul. How could she marry anyone? She was fit, said the bad priest, not for the world, but for the convent. Christ was her proper husband. No human male could coexist with the sin which fed on her girl soul. Only Christ was mighty enough, loving enough, forgiving enough. Had he not cured the lepers and exorcised malignant fevers? Only he could welcome disease, clasp it to his bosom, rub against it, kiss it. It had been his mission on earth, as now, a spiritual husband in heaven, to know sickness intimately, love it, cure it. This was parable, the bad priest told her, metaphor for spirit's cancer. But the Maltese mind, conditioned by its language, is unreceptive to such talk. All my Elena saw was the disease, the literal sickness. Afraid I or our children would reap its ravages. She stayed away from me and from Father A's confessional, stayed in her own house, searched her body each morning and examined her conscience each night for progressive symptoms of the metastasis she feared was in her. Another vocation, whose words were garbled and somehow sinister as Fausto's own had been. These, poor child, are the sad events surrounding your given name. It is a different name now that you've been carried off by the U.S. Navy, but beneath that accident you are still Maestro Zemsi, a terrible misalliance. May you survive it. I fear not so much a reappearance in you of Elena's mythical disease as a fracturing of personality such as your father has undergone. May you be only Paola, one girl, a single given heart, a whole mind at peace. That is a prayer, if you wish. Later, after the marriage, after your birth, well into the reign of Fausta II when the bombs were falling, the relationship with Elena must have come under some kind of moratorium, there being perhaps enough else to do. Fausto enlisted in the home defense. Elena had taken to nursing, feeding and keeping sheltered the bombed out, comforting the wounded, bandaging, burying. At this time, assuming his theory of the dual man to be so, Fausto II was becoming more Maltese and less British. German bombers over today, ME-109s. No more need to look. We have grown used to the sound. Five times. Concentrated, as luck would have it, on Takali. These grand chaps in their hurries and spitfires, what would we not do for them? Moving towards that island-wide sense of communion, and at the same time towards the lowest form of consciousness, his work at the Takali airfield was a sapper's drudgery, keeping the runways in condition for the British fighter planes, repairing the barracks, mess hall, and hangars. At first he was able to look on it all over his shoulder, as it were, in retreat. Not a night since Italy declared war have we known raidless. How was it in the years of peace? Somewhere, what, centuries ago, one could sleep a night through. That's all gone. Routed out by sirens at three in the morning. 
At 3.30, out to the airfield, past the Bofors and placements, the wardens, the firefighting crews. With death, its smell, slow after trickling of powdered plaster, stubborn smoke and flame, still fresh in the air. The RAF are magnificent, all magnificent. Ground artillery, the few merchant seamen who do get through, my own comrades in arms, I speak of them that way, our home defense, though little more than common laborers or military in the highest sense. Surely, if war has any nobility, it is in the rebuilding, not the destruction. A few portable searchlights there at a premium for us to see by. So with pick, shovel, and rake, we reshape our Maltese earth for those game little spitfires. But isn't it a way of glorifying God? Hard labor, surely but as if somewhere once without our knowledge we'd been condemned for a term to prison. With the next raid, all our filling and leveling is blasted away into pits and rubble piles, which must then be refilled and re-leveled, only to be destroyed again. Day and night it never eases off. I have let pass my nightly prayers on more than one occasion. I say them now on my feet on the job, often in rhythm to the shoveling. To kneel is a luxury these days. No sleep, little food, but no complaints. Are we not, Maltese, English, and the few Americans, one? There is, we are taught, a communion of saints in heaven, so perhaps on earth, also in this purgatory, a communion not of gods or heroes, merely men expiating sins they are unaware of, caught somehow all at once within the reaches of a sea uncrossable and guarded by instruments of death, here on our dear tiny prison plot, our Malta. Retreat, then, into religious abstraction. Retreat also into poetry, which somehow he found time to write down. Fausto IV has commented elsewhere on the poetry which came out of Malta's second great siege. Fausto II's had fallen into the same patterns. Certain images recurred, major among them Valletta of the Knights. Fausto IV was tempted to put this down to simple escape and leave it there. It was certainly wish fulfillment. Marat had a vision of La Valette patrolling the streets during blackout. Nubietna wrote a sonnet about a dogfight. Spitfire versus ME-109, taking a knight's duel for the sustained image. Retreat into a time when personal combat was more equal, when warfare could at least be gilded with an illusion of honor. But beyond this, could it not be a true absence of time? Fausto II even noticed this. Here, towards midnight, in a lull between raids, watching Elena and Paola sleep, I seem to have come inside time again. Midnight does mark the hairline between days, as was our Lord's design, but when the bombs fall, or at work, then it's as if time were suspended, as if we all labored and sheltered in timeless purgatory. Perhaps it comes only from living on an island. With another kind of nerves, possibly one has a dimension, a vector pointing sternly to some land's end or other, the tip of a peninsula. But here, with nowhere to go in space but into the sea, it can be only the barb and shaft of one's own arrogance that insists there is somewhere to go in time as well. Or in a more poignant vein. Spring has come. Perhaps there are sulla blossoms in the country. Here in the city is sun and more rain than is really necessary. It cannot matter, can it? Even I suspect the growth of our child has nothing to do with time. Her name, Wind, will be here again to soothe her face, which is always dirty. Is it a world anyone could have brought a child into? None of us has the right to ask that any more, Paola, only you. The other great image is of something I can only call slow apocalypse. Even the radical Nubietna whose tastes assuredly ran to apocalypse at full gallop, eventually created a world in which the truth had precedence over his engineer's politics. 
He was probably the best of our poets, first, at least, to come to a halt about face and toil back along his own retreat's path, back towards the real world the bombs were leaving us. The Ash Wednesday poem marked his lowest point. After that he gave up abstraction and a political rage, which he later admitted was all posturing, to be concerned increasingly with what was, not what ought to have been or what could be under the right form of government. We all came back eventually, Morat, in a way which in any other context would be labeled absurdly theatrical. He was working as mechanic out at Takali and had grown fond of several pilots. One by one they were shot from the sky. On the night the last one died, he went calmly into the officers' club, stole a bottle of wine, scarce then like everything else because no convoys were getting through, and got belligerently drunk. The next anyone knew, he was on the edge of town at one of the Beaufort's emplacements, being shown how to operate the guns. They taught him in time for the next raid. He divided his time after that between airfield and artillery, getting, I believe, two to three hours' sleep out of every twenty-four. He had an excellent record of kills, and his poetry began to show the same retreat from retreat. Fausto II's return was most violent of all. He dropped away from abstraction and into Fausto III, a non-humanity which was the most real state of affairs. Probably. One would rather not think so. But all shared this sensitivity to decadence, of a slow falling, as if the island were being hammered inch by inch into the sea. I remember, that other Fausto wrote, I remember a sad tango on the last night of the old world, a girl who peeped from between the palms at the Phoenicia Hotel, Maria Alma de mi Corazon, before the crucible and the slag heap, before the sudden craters and the cancerous blooming of displaced earth, before the carrion birds came sweeping from the sky, before that cicada, these locusts, this empty street. Oh, we were full of lyrical lines like at the Phoenicia Hotel. Free verse, why not? There was simply not the time to cast it into rhyme or meter, to take care with assonance and ambiguity. Poetry had to be as hasty and rough as eating, sleep, or sex, jury-rigged and not as graceful as it might have been. But it did the job, put the truth on record. Truth, I mean, in the sense of attainable accuracy. No metaphysics. Poetry is not communication with angels or with the subconscious. It is communication with the guts, genitals, and five portals of sense, nothing more. Now there is your grandmother, child, who also comes into this briefly, Carla Maestro. She died, as you know, last March, outliving my father by three years, an event which might have been enough to produce a new Fausto had it been in an earlier reign. Fausto II, for instance, was that sort of confused Maltese youth who finds island love and mother love impossible to separate. Had Fausto IV been more of a nationalist when Carla died, we might now have a Fausto V. Early in the war we get passages like this. Malta is a noun feminine and proper. Italians have indeed been attempting her defloration since the 8th of June. She lies on her back in the sea, sullen, an immemorial woman spread to the explosive orgasms of Mussolini bombs. But her soul hasn't been touched, cannot be. Her soul is the Maltese people who wait, only wait, down in her clefts and catacombs, alive and with a numb strength, filled with faith in God, his church. How can her flesh matter? It is vulnerable, a victim. But as the ark was to Noah, so is the inviolable womb of our Maltese rock to her children, something given us in return for being filial and constant, children also of God. Womb of rock, 
what subterranean confessions we wandered into. Carla must have told him at some point of the circumstances surrounding his birth. It had been near the time of the June disturbances in which old Maestral was involved. Precisely how never came clear, but deeply enough to alienate Carla both from him and from herself. Enough so that one night we both nearly took a doomed acrobat's way down the steps at the harbor end of Strada San Giovanni. I to limbo, she to a suicide's hell. What had kept her? The boy Fausto could only gather from listening in to her evening prayers that it was an Englishman, a mysterious being named Stencil. Did he feel trapped? Having escaped, lucky from one womb, now forced into the oubliette of another not so happily starred? Again, the classic response, retreat. Again, into his damnable communion. When Elena's mother died from a stray bomb dropped on Vittoriosa. Oh, we've become accustomed to these things. My own mother is alive and well. God willing, will continue so. But if she is to be taken from me, or me from her, I can le tread int, thy will be done. I refuse to dwell on death because I know well enough that a young man, even here, dotes along in an illusion of immortality. But perhaps more on this island because we become, after all, one another. Parts of a unity. Some die, others continue. If a hair falls or a fingernail is torn away, am I any less alive and determined? Seven raids today, so far. One plot of nearly a hundred Messerschmitts. They have leveled the churches, the knights' auberges, the old monuments. They have left us a Sodom. Nine raids yesterday. Work harder than I've known it. My body would grow, but there's little enough food. Few ships get through. Convoys are sunk. Some of my comrades have dropped out, weak from hunger. A miracle I was not the first to fall. Imagine, Maestral, the frail university poet, a laborer, a builder, and one who will survive. I must. It's the rock they come back to. Fausto the second managed to work himself into superstition. Don't touch them, these walls. They carry the explosions for miles. The rock hears everything and brings it to bone, up the fingers and arm, down through the bone cage and bone sticks, and out again through the bone webs. Its little passage through you is accident, merely in the nature of rock and bone, but it's as if you were given a reminder. The vibration is impossible to talk about. Felt, sound, buzzing, the teeth buzz. Pain, a numb prickling along the jawbone, stifling concussion at the eardrums. Over and over, mallet blows as long as the raid, raids as long as the day. You never get used to it. You'd think we'd all have gone mad by now. What keeps me standing erect and away from the walls? And silent. A brute clinging to awareness, nothing else. Pure Maltese. Perhaps it is meant to go on forever if forever still has any meaning. Stand free, maestro. The passage above comes towards the siege's end. The phrase, womb of rock, now had emphasis for Nubietna, Marat, and Fausto at the end, not the beginning. It is part of time's chiromancy to reduce those days to simple passage through a grammatical sequence. Nubietna wrote, Motes of rock's dust caught among corpses of carob trees. Atoms of iron swirl above the dead forge on that cormorant side of the moon. Marat wrote, We knew they were only puppets and the music from a gramophone. Knew the gathered silk would fade, ball fringe fray, plush contract the mange. Knew or suspected that children do grow up would begin to shuffle after the first hundred years of the performance, yawn toward afternoon, begin to see the peeling paint on Judy's cheek, detect implausibility in the palsied stick and self-deception in the villain's laugh. But, dear Christ, 
Whose slim jeweled hand was it flicked from the wings so unexpected holding the lighted wax taper to send up all our poor but precious tinder in flame of terrible colors? Who was she who gently laughed, Good night, among the hoarse screaming of aged children? From the quick to the inanimate, the great movement of the siege poetry, as went Fausta the Second's already dual soul. All the while, only in the process of learning life's single lesson, that there is more accident to it than a man can ever admit to in a lifetime and stay sane. Seeing his mother after a period of months away. Time has touched her. I found myself wondering, did she know that in this infant she brought forth to whom she gave the name for a happy, ironic, was a soul which would become torn and unhappy? Does any mother anticipate the future, acknowledge when the time comes that a son is now a man and must leave her to make whatever peace he can alone on a treacherous earth? No, it's the same Maltese timelessness. They don't feel the fingers of years, jittering age, fallibility, blindness into face, heart, and eyes. A son is a son, fixed always in the red and wrinkled image as they first see it. There are always elephants to be made drunk. This last from an old folk tale. The king wants a palace made of elephant tusks. The boy had inherited physical strength from his father, a military hero, but it was for the mother to teach the son cunning, make friends with them, feed them wine, kill them, steal their ivory. The boy is successful, of course, but no mention of a sea voyage. There must have been, Fausto explains, millennia ago, a land bridge. They called Africa the land of the axe. There were elephants south of Mount Ruanzori. Since then, the sea has steadily crept in. German bombs may finish it. Decadence. Decadence. What is it? Only a clear movement toward death, or preferably non-humanity. As Fausto the second and the third, like their island, became more inanimate, they moved closer to the time when, like any dead leaf or fragment of metal, they'd be finally subject to the laws of physics. All the time pretending, it was a great struggle between the laws of man and the laws of God. Is it only because Malta is a matriarchal island that Fausto felt so strongly that connection between mother rule and decadence? Mothers are closer than anyone to accident, they are most painfully conscious of the fertilized egg, as Mary knew the moment of conception. But the zygote has no soul, is matter. Further along these lines he would not go, but their babies always seem to come by happenstance, a random conjunction of events. Mothers close ranks and perpetrate a fictional mystery about motherhood. It's only a way of compensating for an inability to live with the truth, truth being that they do not understand what is going on inside them, that it is a mechanical and alien growth which at some point acquires a soul. They are possessed. Or the same forces which dictate the bomb's trajectory, the deaths of stars, the wind and the water spout, have focused somewhere inside the pelvic frontiers without their consent, to generate one more mighty accident. It frightens them to death. It would frighten anyone. So it moves us on toward the question of Fausto's understanding with God. Apparently his problem was never as simple as God versus Caesar, especially Caesar inanimate. The one we see in old medals and statues, the force we read of in history texts, Caesar, for one thing, was animate once and had his own difficulties with a world of things as well as a degenerate crew of gods. It would be easier, since drama arises out of conflict, to call it simply human law versus divine, all within the arena in quarantine that had been Fausto's home. I mean his soul, and I also mean the island, but this isn't drama, only an apologia for the day of the Thirteen Raids. Even what happened then had no clear lines drawn. I know of machines that are more complex than people. 
if this is apostasy, hakikun. To have humanism, we must first be convinced of our humanity. As we move further into decadence, this becomes more difficult. More and more alien from himself, Fausto II began to detect signs of lovely inanimateness in the world around him. Now the winter's Gregale brings in bombers from the north. As Euroclodon, it brought in St. Paul. Blessings, curses. But is the wind any part of us? Has it anything at all to do with us? Somewhere, perhaps behind a hill, some shelter, farmers are sowing wheat for a June harvest. Bombing is concentrated around Valletta, the three cities, the harbor. Pastoral life has become enormously attractive. But there are strays. One killed Elena's mother. We cannot expect more of the bombs than of the wind. We should not expect. If I am not to become married by Mohu, I can only go on as sapper, as gravedigger. I must refuse to think of any other condition, past or future. Better to say, this has always been, we've always lived in purgatory, and our term here is at best indefinite. Apparently he took at this time to shambling about in the streets during raids. Hours away from Takali when he should have been sleeping, not out of any bravery or for any reason connected with his job, nor at first for very long. Pile of brick, grave-shaped, green beret lying nearby. Royal commandos? Star shells from the Beauforts over Marsimusheta. Red light, long shadows from behind the shop at the corner which move in the unsteady light about a hidden pivot point. Impossible to tell shadows of what. Early sun still low on the sea. Blinding, long, blinding track. White road in from the sun to point of view. Sound of Messerschmitts. Invisible. Sound which grows louder. Spitfires scramble aloft, high angle of climb. Small, black in such bright sun. Coarse toward sun. Dirty marks appear on the sky, orange, brown, yellow, color of excrement, black. Sun turns the edges gold, and the edges trail like jellyfish toward the horizon. Marks spread, new ones bloom in the centers of old. Air up there is often so still, other times a wind up high must streak them into nothing in seconds. Wind, machines, dirty smoke. Sometimes the sun. When there's rain, nothing can be seen, but the wind sweeps in and down and everything can be heard. For a matter of months, little more than impressions. And was it not Valletta? During the raids, everything civilian and with a soul was underground. Others were too busy to observe. The city was left to itself, except for stragglers like Fausto, who felt nothing more than an unvoiced affinity, and were enough like the city not to change the truth of the impressions by the act of receiving them. A city uninhabited is different, different from what a normal observer straggling in the dark, the occasional dark, would see. It is a universal sin among the false animate or unimaginative to refuse to let well enough alone their compulsion to gather together, their pathological fear of loneliness extends on past the threshold of sleep, so that when they turn the corner, as we all must, as we all have done and do, some more often than others, to find ourselves on the street. You know the street I mean, child, the street of the twentieth century, at whose far end or turning, we hope, is some sense of home or safety. But no guarantees. A street we are put at the wrong end of for reasons best known to the agents who put us there, if there are agents, but a street we must walk. It is the acid test, to populate or not to populate. Ghosts, monsters, criminals, deviates represent melodrama and weakness. The only horror about them is the dreamer's own horror of isolation. But the desert, 
or a row of false shop fronts, a slag pile, a forge where the fires are banked, these in the street and the dreamer, only an inconsequential shadow himself in the landscape, partaking of the soullessness of these other masses and shadows. This is twentieth-century nightmare. It was not hostility, Paola, this leaving you and Elena alone during the raids. Nor was it the usual selfish irresponsibility of youth. His youth, Marat's, Nubietna's, the youth of a generation, both in a literary and in a literal sense, had vanished abruptly with the first bomb of 8 June 1940. The old Chinese artificers and their successors, Schulze and Nobel, had devised a filter far more potent than they knew. One dose, and the generation were immune for life, immune to the fear of death, hunger, hard labor, immune to the trivial seductions which pull a man away from a wife and child and the need to care, immune to everything but what happened to Fausto one afternoon during the seventh of thirteen raids. In a lucid moment during his fugue, Fausto wrote, How beautiful is blackout in Valletta! Before tonight's plot comes in from the north, night fills the street like a black fluid, flows along the gutters, its current tugging at your ankles, as if the city were underwater and Atlantis under the night sea. Is it night only that wraps Valletta, or is it a human emotion, an air of expectancy? Not the expectancy of dreams, where our awaited is unclear and unnameable. Valletta knows well enough what she waits for. There is no tension or malaise to this silence. It's cool, secure. The silence of boredom or well-accustomed ritual. A gang of artillerymen in the next street make hastily for their emplacement. But their vulgar song fades away, leaving one embarrassed voice which finally runs out in mid-word. Thank God you're safe, Elena, in our other subterranean home. You and the child. If old Saturno Octina and his wife have now moved permanently to the old sewer, then there is care for Paola when you must go out to do your work. How many other families have cared for her? All our babies have had only one father, the war, one mother, Malta, her women. Bad lookout for the family and for mother rule. Clans and matriarchy are incompatible with this communion war has brought to Malta. I go from you, love, not because I must. We men are not a race of freebooters or jurors. Not when our argosies are prey and food to the evil fish of metal whose lair is a German U-boat. There is no more world but the island, and it's only a day to any sea's verge. There is no leaving you, Elena, not in truth. But in dream, there are two worlds, the street and under the street. One is the kingdom of death and one of life. And how can a poet live without exploring the other kingdom, even if only as a kind of tourist? A poet feeds on dream. If no convoys come, what else is there to feed on? Poor Fausto. The vulgar song was sung to a march called Colonel Bogey. Hitler has only one left ball. Goering has two, but they are small. Himmler has something similar, but Goebbels has no balls at all. Proving, perhaps, that virility on Malta did not depend on mobility. They were all, as Foster was first to admit, laborers, not adventurers. Malta and her inhabitants stood like an immovable rock in the river of fortune, now at war's flood. The same motives which cause us to populate a dream street also cause us to apply to a rock human qualities like invincibility, tenacity, perseverance, etc. More than metaphor, it is delusion. But on the strength of this delusion, Malta survived. Manhood on Malta thus became increasingly defined in terms of rockhood. This had its dangers for Fausto. 
Living as he does much of the time in a world of metaphor, the poet is always acutely conscious that metaphor has no value apart from its function, that it is a device, an artifice, so that while others may look on the laws of physics as legislation and God as a human form with beard measured in light years and nebulae for sandals, Fausto's kind are alone with the task of living in a universe of things which simply are, and cloaking that innate mindlessness with comfortable and pious metaphor so that the practical half of humanity may continue in the great lie, confident that their machines, dwellings, streets, and weather share the same human motives, personal traits, and fits of contrariness as they. Poets have been at this for centuries, it is the only useful purpose they do serve in society, and if every poet were to vanish tomorrow, society would live no longer than the quick memories and dead books of their poetry. It is the role of the poet, this twentieth century, to lie. Maybe Etna wrote, If I told the truth, you would not believe me. If I said, No fellow soul drops death from the air, no conscious plot drove us underground, you would laugh as if I had twitched the wax mouth of my tragic mask into a smile, a smile to you, to me, the truth behind the catenary, locus of the transcendental. Y equals A over 2 times the quantity E to the X over A power plus E to the minus X over A power. Fausto ran across the engineer poet one afternoon in the street. Nibietna had been drunk, and now that it was wearing off, was returning to the scene of his bat. An unscrupulous merchant named Tifkira had a hoard of wine. It was Sunday and raining. Weather had been foul, raids fewer. The two young men met next to the ruin of a small church. The one confessional had been sheared in two, but which half was left, priests or parishioners? Fausta could not tell. Sun behind the rain clouds appeared as a patch of luminous gray, a dozen times its normal size, halfway down from the zenith, almost brilliant enough to cast shadows. But falling from behind Nubietna so that the engineer's features were indistinct. He wore khakis stained with grease and a blue fatigue cap. Large drops of rain fell on the two. Nubietna indicated the church with his head. Have you been, priest? To mass? No. They hadn't met for a month, but no need to bring each other up to date. Come on, we'll get drunk. How are Elena and your kid? Well? Marat is pregnant again. Don't you miss the bachelor life? They were walking down a narrow, cobbled street made slick by the rain. To either side were rubble heaps, a few standing walls or porch steps. Streaks of stone dust... Matt against the shiny cobblestones, interrupted at random the pavement's patterning. The sun had almost achieved reality. Their attenuated shadows strung out behind. Rain still fell. Or, having married when you did, Nubietna went on, perhaps you equate singleness with peace. Peace, said Fausto, quaint word. They skipped around and over stray chunks of masonry. Silvana, Nubietna sang, in your red petticoat, come back, come back. You may keep my heart, but bring back my money. You should get married, Fausto said mournful. It's not fair otherwise. Poetry and engineering have nothing to do with domesticity. We haven't, Fausto remembered, had a good argument for months. In here. They went down a flight of steps which led under a building still reasonably intact. Clouds of powdered plaster rose as they descended. Sirens began. Inside the room, Tifkira lay on a table asleep. Two girls played cards listlessly in a corner. Nibietna vanished for a moment behind the bar, reappearing with a small bottle of wine. A bomb fell in the next street, rattling the beams of the ceiling, starting an oil lamp hung there to swinging. I ought to be asleep, Foster said. I work tonight. 
Remorse of an uxorious half-man, Nubietna snarled, pouring wine. The girls looked up. It's the uniform, he confided, which was so ridiculous that Fausto had to laugh. Soon they had moved to the girls' table. Talk was irregular, there being an artillery emplacement almost directly above them. The girls were professional and tried for a while to proposition Fausto and Nubietna. No use, Nubietna said. I've never had to pay for mine, and this one is married and a priest. Three laughed. Fausto, getting drunk, was not amused. That is long gone, he said quietly. Once a priest, always a priest, Nubietna retorted. Come, bless this wine. Consecrate it. It's Sunday, and you haven't been to Mass. Overhead, the Beauforts began an intermittent and deafening hack. Two explosions every second. The four concentrated on drinking wine. Another bomb fell. Bracketed, Nubietna shouted above the anti-aircraft barrage, a word which no longer meant anything in Valletta. Tivkira woke up. Stealing my wine, the owner cried. He stumbled to the wall and leaned his forehead against it. Thoroughly, he began to scratch his hairy stomach and back under their singlet. You might give me a drink. It isn't consecrated. Maestral, the apostate, is at fault. Now God and I have an agreement, Fausta began, as if to correct a misapprehension. He will forget about my not answering his call if I cease to question. Simply survive, you see. When did that come to him? In what street? At what point in these months of impressions? Perhaps he'd thought it up on the spot. He was drunk. So tired it had only taken four glasses of wine. How? one of the girls asked seriously. How can there be faith if you don't ask questions? The priest said it's right for us to ask questions. Nibietna looked at his friend's face, saw no answer forthcoming, so turned and patted the girl's shoulder. That's the hell of it, love. Drink your wine. No, screamed Tifkira, propped against the other wall, watching them. You'll waste it all. The gun began its racket again. Waste, Nubietna laughed above the noise. Don't talk of waste, you idiot. Belligerent, he started across the room. Fausto put his head down on the table to rest for a moment. The girls resumed their card game, using his back for a table. Nubietna had taken the owner by the shoulders. They began a lengthy denunciation of Tivkira, punctuating it with shakes which sent the fat torso into cyclic shudders. Above, the all-clear sounded. Soon after, there was noise at the door. Nibietna opened and in rollicked the artillery crew, dirty, exhausted, and in search of one. Fausto awoke and jumped to his feet, saluting, scattering the cards in a shower of hearts and spades. Away, away, shouted Nibietna. Tivkira, giving up his dream of a great wine hoard, slumped down to a sitting position against the wall and closed his eyes. We must get Maestral to work. Go to, caitiff, Fausto cried, saluted again and fell over backwards. With much giggling and unsteadiness, Nubietna and one of the girls helped him to his feet. It was apparently Nubietna's intention to bring Fausto to Tarkali on foot, Usual method was to hitch a ride from a lorry, to sober him up. As they reached the darkening street, the sirens began again. Members of the Beaufort's crew, each holding a glass of wine, came clattering up the steps and collided with them. Nubietna, irritated, abruptly ducked out from under Fausto's arm and came up with a fist to the stomach of the nearest artilleryman. A brawl developed. Bombs were falling over by the Grand Harbor. The explosions began to approach slow and steady, like the footsteps of a child's ogre. Fausto lay on the ground, feeling no particular desire to come to the aid of his friend, who was outnumbered and being worked over thoroughly. They finally dropped Nubietna and headed toward the Bofors. Not so far overhead, an ME-109, pinned by searchlights, suddenly broke out of the cloud cover and swooped in. Orange tracers followed. Get the bugger, someone at the gun emplacement screamed. The Bofors opened up. Fausto looked on with mild interest. Shadows of the gun crew, lit from above by the exploding projectiles and scatter from the searchlights, flickered in and out of the night. In one flash, Fausto saw the red glow of Tifkira's wine in a glass held to an ammo handler's lips and slowly diminishing. 
somewhere over the harbor, anti-aircraft shells caught up with the Messerschmitt. Its fuel tanks ignited in a great yellow flowering, and down it went, slow as a balloon. The black smoke of its passage billowing through the searchlight beams, which lingered a moment at the point of intercept before going on to other business. Nubietna hung over him, haggard, one eye beginning to swell. Away, away, he croaked. Fausto got to his feet reluctant, and off they went. There is no indication in the journal of how they did it, but the two reached Takali just as the all-clear sounded. They went perhaps a mile on foot. Presumably they dove for cover whenever the bombing got too close. Finally they clambered on the back of a passing lorry. It was hardly heroic, Fausto wrote. We were both drunk, but I've not been able to get it out of my mind that we were given a dispensation that night that God had suspended the laws of chance by which we should rightly have been killed. Somehow the street, the kingdom of death, was friendly. Perhaps it was because I observed our agreement and did not bless the wine. Post hoc. And only part of the overall relationship. This is what I meant about Fausta's simplicity. He did nothing so complex as drift away from God or reject his church. Losing faith is a complicated business and takes time. There are no epiphanies, no moments of truth. It takes much thought and concentration in the later phases, which themselves come about through an accumulation of small accidents, examples of general injustice, misfortune falling upon the godly, prayers of one's own unanswered. Fausto and his generation simply hadn't the time for this leisurely, intellectual hanky-panky. They'd got out of the habit, had lost a certain sense of themselves, had come further from the university at peace and closer to the beleaguered city than any were ready to admit. Were more Maltese, that is, than English. All else in his life having gone underground, having acquired a trajectory in which the sirens figured as only one parameter, Fausto realized that the old covenants, the old agreements with God, would have to change too. For at least a working relevancy to God, therefore, Fausto did exactly what he'd been doing for a home, food, and marital love. He jury-rigged, made do. But the English part of him was still there, keeping up the journal. The child, you, grew healthier, more active. By forty-two, you had fallen in with a roistering crew of children whose chief amusement was a game called RAF. Between raids, a dozen or so of you would go out in the streets, spread your arms like aeroplanes, and run screaming and buzzing in and out of the ruined walls, rubble heaps, and holes of the city. The stronger and taller boys were, of course, spitfires. Others, unpopular boys, girls, and younger children, went to make up the planes of the enemy. You were usually, I believe, an Italian dirigible. The most buoyant balloon girl in the stretch of sewer we occupied that season, harassed, chased, Dodging the rocks and sticks tossed your way, you managed each time with the Italian agility your role demanded to escape subjugation. But always, having outwitted your opponents, you would finally do your patriotic duty by surrendering, and only when you were ready. Your mother and Fausto were away from you most of the time, nurse and sapper. You were left to the two extremes of our underground society, the old for whom the distinction between sudden and gradual affliction hardly existed, and the young, your true own, who unconsciously were creating a discreet world, a prototype of the world Faust of the Third, already outdated, would inherit. Did the two forces neutralize and leave you on the lonely promontory between two worlds? Can you still look both ways, child? If so, you stand at an enviable vantage. You're still that four-year-old belligerent with history and defilade. The present Fausto can look nowhere but back on the separate stages of his own history. No continuity, no logic. History, Nibietna wrote, is a step function. 
Was Fausto believing too much? Was the communion all sham to compensate for some failure as a father and husband? By peacetime standards, a failure he certainly was. The normal pre-war course would have been a slow growing into love for Elena and Paola as the young man, thrown into marriage and fatherhood prematurely, learned to take on the burden which is every man's portion in the adult world. But the siege created different burdens, and it was impossible to say whose world was more real, the children's or the parents'. For all their dirt, noise, and roughnecking, the kids of Malta served a poetic function. The RAF game was only one metaphor they devised to veil the world that was. For whose benefit? The adults were at work. The old did not care. The kids themselves were all in the secret. It must have been for lack of anything better, until their muscles and brains developed to where they could take on part of the workload in the ruin their island was becoming. It was biding time. It was poetry in a vacuum. Paola, my child, Elena's child, but most of all Malta's, you were one of them. These children knew what was happening, knew that bombs killed. But what's a human, after all? No different from a church, obelisk, statue. Only one thing matters. It's the bomb that wins. Their view of death was non-human. One wonders if our grown-up attitudes, hopelessly tangled as they were with love, social forms, and metaphysics, worked any better. Certainly, there was more common sense about the children's way. The children got about Valletta by their private routes, mostly underground. Fausto II records their separate world superimposed on a blasted city. Ragged tribes scattered about Chagri at Muija, indulging now and again in internecine skirmishes. Reconnaissance and foraging parties were always there, always at the edges of the field of vision. The tide must be turning. Only one raid today, that in the early morning. We slept last night in the sewer near Achtina and his wife. Little Paola went off soon after the all-clear to explore the dockyard country with Marat's boy and some others. Even the weather seemed to signal a kind of intermission. Last night's rain had laid the plaster and stone dust, cleaned the leaves of trees, and caused a merry waterfall to enter our quarters, not ten steps from the mattress of clean laundry. Accordingly, we made our ablutions in this well-disposed rivulet, retiring soon thereafter to the domicile of Mrs. Octina, where we broke our fast on a hearty porridge the good woman had but recently devised against just such a contingency. What abundant graciousness and dignity have been our lot since this siege began. Above in the street the sun was shining. We ascended to the street, Elena took my hand, and once on level ground did not let it go. We began to walk. Her face, fresh from sleep, was so pure in that sun. Malta's old son, Elena's young face. It seemed I had only now met her for the first time, or that children again, we'd strayed into the same orange grove, walked into a breathing of azaleas unaware. She began to talk, adolescent girl talk, Maltese. How brave the soldiers and sailors looked. You mean how sober, I commented. She laughed, mock annoyed. How amusing was a lone flush toilet located in the upper right-hand room of an English club building whose side wall had been blown away. Feeling young, I became angry and political at this toilet. What fine democracy in war, I ranted. Before, they locked us out of their grand clubs. Anglo-Maltese intercourse was a farce. Pro bono, ha-ha. Keep the natives in their place. But now even the most sacrosanct room of that temple is open to the public gaze. So we nearly roistered along the sunlit street, rain having brought a kind of spring. On days like that we felt Valletta had recalled her own pastoral history, as if vineyards would suddenly bloom along the sea bastions, olive and pomegranate trees spring up from the pale wounds of Kingsway. The harbor sparkled, 
We waved, spoke, or smiled to every passerby. Elena's hair caught the sun in its viscous net. Sun freckles danced along her cheeks. How we came to that garden or park, I can never tell. All morning we walked by the sea. Fishing boats were out. A few wives gossiped among the seaweed and chunks of yellow bastion the bombs had left on the strand. They mended nets, watched the sea, shouted at their children. There were children everywhere in Valletta today, swinging down from the trees, jumping off the ruined ends of jetties into the sea, heard but not seen in the empty shells of bombed-out houses. They sang, chanted, chaffed, or merely screeched. Weren't they really our own voices, caught for years in any house and only now come to embarrass us at our passing by? We found a café. There was wine from the last convoy, rare vintage. Wine and a poor chicken we heard the proprietor killing in the other room. We sat, drank the wine, watched the harbor. Birds were heading out into the Mediterranean. High barometer. Perhaps they had a portal of sense for the Germans, too. Hair blew in her eyes. For the first time in a year we could talk. I'd given her some lessons in English conversation before thirty-nine. Today she wanted to continue them. Who knew, she said, when there would be another chance. Serious child. How I loved her. In the early afternoon the proprietor came out to sit with us, one hand still sticky with blood and a few feathers caught there. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, sir, Elena greeted him. Gleeful. The old man cackled. English, he said. Yes, I knew the moment I saw you. English tourists. It became our private joke, while she kept touching me under the table. Mischievous Elena, the owner, continued a foolish discourse about the English. Wind off the harbor was cool, and the water, which for some reason I only remembered as yellow, green, or brown, now was blue, a carnival blue, and stippled with white caps. Jolly harbor. Half a dozen children came running round the corner, boys in singlets, brown arms, two little girls in shifts, tagging behind, but ours was not one. They went by without seeing us, running downhill towards the harbor. From somewhere a cloud had appeared. A solid-looking puff hung stock still between the sun's invisible trolleys. Sun was on collision course. Elena and I rose at last and wandered down the street. Soon from an alley burst another crowd of children, twenty yards ahead of us, cutting across in front, angling up the street to disappear single file into the basement of what had been a house. Sunlight came to us broken by walls, window frames, roof beams, skeletal. Our street was pocked by thousands of little holes like the harbor in noon's unbroken sun. We stumbled, unsprightly, each using the other now and again for balance. Forenoon for sea, afternoon for the city. Poor, shattered city. Tilted toward Marse Muscheto. No stone shell, roofless, wallless, windowless, could hide from the sun which threw all their shadows uphill and out to sea. Children, it seemed, dogged our footsteps. We'd hear them behind a broken wall, or only a whispering of bare feet and the small wind of a passage. And they'd call now and again somewhere over in the next street. Name indistinct for the wind off the harbor. Sun inched downhill closer to the cloud that blocked its way. Fausto, were they calling? Elena? And was our child one of their own, or off on some private tracing of steps? We did trace our own about the city's grid, aimless, in fugue, a fugue of love or memory or some abstract sentiment which always comes after the fact and had nothing to do that afternoon with the quality of the light or the pressure of five fingers on my arm, which awoke my five senses and more. Sad is a foolish word. Light is not sad, or should not be. Afraid even to look behind at our shadows, 
lest they move differently, slip away into the gutter or one of the earth's cracks, we combed Valletta till late afternoon, as if it were something finite we sought. Until at length, late afternoon, we arrived at a tiny park in the heart of the city. At one end, a band pavilion creaked in the wind, its roof supported miraculously by only a few upright beams. The structure sagged, and birds of some sort had abandoned their nests all round the edge, all but one whose head was visible, looking out at God knew what, unfrightened at our approach. It looked stuffed. It was there we awoke, there the children closed in on us. Had it been hare and hounds all day? Had all residual music gone with the quick birds, or was there a waltz we'd only now dreamed? We stood in sawdust and wood chips from an unlucky tree. Azalea bushes waited for us across from the pavilion, but the wind was the wrong way. From the future, driving all scent back to its past. Above, tall palms leaned over us, false solicitous, casting blade shadows. Cold. And then the sun met its cloud, and other clouds we'd not noticed at all began, it seemed, to move in radially towards the sun cloud, as if winds were blowing today from all thirty-two points of the rose at once to meet at the center in a great wind spout, to bear up the fire balloon like an offering, set alight the undershorings of heaven. Blade shadows disappeared. All light and shadow were passing into a great acid green. The fire balloon continued its creep downhill. Leaves of all trees in the park began to scrape at one another like the legs of locusts. Music enough. She shivered, held to me for a moment, then abruptly seated herself on the littered grass. I sat beside her. We must have been a queer-looking pair, shoulders hunched for the wind, facing the pavilion silent, as if waiting for a performance to begin. In the trees at the edges of eyes, we saw children. White flashes, which could have been faces, are only the other sides of leaves, signaling storm. Sky was clouding. The green light deepened, drowning the island of Malta and the island of Fausto and Elena hopelessly deeper in its oniric chill. Oh, God! It was the same stupidity to be gone through again— the sudden fall in the barometer which we did not expect, the bad faith of dreams that send surprise skirmish parties across a frontier which ought to be stable, the terror at the unfamiliar stair-step in the dark on what we thought was a level street. We traced nostalgic steps indeed this afternoon. Where had they brought us? To a park we'd never find again. We had been using, it seemed, nothing but Valletta to fill up the hollows of ourselves. Stone and metal cannot nourish. We sat, hungry-eyed, listening to the nervous leaves. What could there be to feed on? Only one another. I am cold. In Maltese, and she did not move closer. There could be no more question of English today. I wanted to ask, Elena, what do we wait for? For the weather to break, the trees or dead buildings to speak to us? I asked, what is wrong? She shook her head, let her eyes wander between the ground and the creaking pavilion. The more I studied her face, dark hair blowing, foreshortened eyes, freckles fading into the general green of that afternoon, the more anxious I became. I wanted to protest, but there was no one to protest to. Perhaps I wanted to cry, but the salt harbor we had left to gulls and fishing boats had not taken it in as we had the city. Were there in her the same memories of azaleas, or any sense that this city was a mockery, a promise always unfulfilled? Did we share anything? The deeper we all sank into twilight, the less I knew. I did, so I argued, love this woman, 
with all there was in me to expedite or make secure any love. But here it was love in a growing dark, giving out with no clear knowledge of how much was being lost, how much would ever be returned. Was she even seeing the same pavilion, hearing the same children at the frontiers of our park? Was she here, in fact, or like Paola, dear God, not even our child, but Valletta's, out alone, vibrating like a shadow in some street where the light is too clear, the horizon too sharp to be anything but a street created out of sickness for the past, for the Malta that was but can never be again. Palm leaves are braided together, shredding one another to green fibers of light, tree limbs scraped. Leaves of the carob, dry as leather, throbbed and shook. As if there were a gathering behind the trees, a gathering in the sky. The quiverings about us, mounting, panicked, grew louder than the children or ghosts of children. Afraid to look, we could stare only at the pavilion, though God knew what might appear there. Her nails, broken from burying the dead, had been digging into the bare part of my arm where the shirt was rolled up. Pressure and pain increased. Our heads lolled slowly like the heads of puppets toward a meeting of eyes. In the dusk, her eyes had grown huge and filmed. I tried to look at the whites as we look at the margins of a page, trying to avoid what was written in iris black. Was it only night gathering outside? Something nightlike had found its way here, distilled and pre-shaped in eyes that only this morning had reflected sun, whitecaps, real children. My own nails fastened in reply, and we became twinned, symmetric, sharing pain, perhaps all we could ever share. Her face began to go distorted, half with the strength it took to hurt me, half with what I was doing to her. The pain mounted. Palms and carob trees went mad. Her irises rolled towards the sky. Miss Yerna Lienti, Fis Smolir Jitkades Ismek. She was praying. In retreat, having reached a threshold, slipped back to what was most sure. Raids, the death of a parent, the daily handling of corpses had not been able to do it. It took a park, a siege of children, trees astir, night coming in. Helena, her eyes returned to me. I love you, moving on the grass. Love you, Fausto. Pain, nostalgia, want mixed in her eyes, so it seemed. But how could I know? With the same positive comfort in knowing the sun grows colder, the Hajjar Kim ruins progress towards dust, as do we, as does my little Hillman Minx, which was sent to a garage for old age in 1939 and is now disintegrating quietly under tons of garage rubble. How could I infer? The only ghost of an excuse being to reason by analogy that the nerves chafed and stabbed by my fingernails were the same as my own, that her pain was mine, and by extension that of the jittering leaves all round us. Looking past her eyes, I saw all white leaves. They had turned their pale sides out, and the clouds were storm clouds after all. The children, I heard her say, we have lost them. Lost them, or they had lost us. Oh, she breathed, oh, look, Releasing me as I released her, and we both stood and watched the gulls filling half the visible sky, gulls that were all in our island now catching the sunlight, coming in all together because of a storm somewhere out at sea, terribly silent, drifting slow up and down and inexorably landward, a thousand drops of fire. There had been nothing. Whether children, maddened leaves, or dream meteorology were or were not real, there are no epiphanies on Malta this season, no moments of truth. We had used our dead fingernails only to swage quick flesh, to gouge or destroy, not to probe the wards of either soul.
I will limit the inevitable annotating to this request. Observe the predominance of human attributes applied to the inanimate. The entire day, if it was a single day, rather than the projection of a mood lasting perhaps longer, reads like a resurgence of humanity in the automaton, health in the decadent. The passage is important not so much for this apparent contradiction as for the children, who were quite real, whatever their function in Fausto's iconology. They seemed to be the only ones conscious at the time that history had not been suspended after all, that troops were relocated, spitfires delivered, convoys lying too off St. Elmo. This was, to be sure, in 1943, at the turn of the tide when bombers based here had begun to return part of the war to Italy, and when the quality of anti-submarine warfare in the Mediterranean had developed to where we could see more than Dr. Johnson's three meals ahead. But earlier, after the kids had recovered from the first shock, we adults looked on them with a kind of superstitious leeriness, as if they were recording angels keeping the rolls of quick, dead malingering. Noting what Governor Dobby wore, what churches had been destroyed, what was the volume of turnover at the hospitals? They also knew about the bad priest. There is a certain fondness for the Manichaean common to all children. Here, the combination of a siege, a Roman Catholic upbringing, and an unconscious identification of one's own mother with the Virgin all sent simple dualism into strange patterns indeed. Preached to... They might be about some abstract struggle between good and evil, but even the dogfights were too high above them to be real. They'd brought the Spitfires and M.E.s down to earth with their RAF game, but it was only simple metaphor, as noted. The Germans, to be sure, were pure evil and the Allies pure good. The children weren't alone in that feeling. But if their idea of the struggle could be described graphically, it would not be as two equal-sized vectors head-to-head. -head their heads making an X of unknown quantity, rather as a point, dimensionless, good, surrounded by any number of radial arrows, vectors of evil, pointing inward. Good, that is, at bay. The virgin assailed, the winged mother protective, the woman passive, Malta in siege. A wheel, this diagram, fortune's wheel, Spin as it might, the basic arrangement was constant. Stroboscopic effects could change the apparent number of spokes. Direction could change, but the hub still held the spokes in place, and the meeting place of the spokes still defined the hub. The old cyclic idea of history had taught only the rim to which princes and serfs alike were lashed. That wheel was oriented vertical. One rose and fell. But the children's wheel was dead level, its own rim only that of the sea's horizon. So sensuous, so visual a race are we Maltese. Thus they assigned the bad priest no opposite number, neither Dobby nor Archbishop Gonzi nor Father Avalanche. The bad priest was ubiquitous as night, and the children, to sustain their observations, had to be at least as mobile. It wasn't an organized affair. These recording angels never wrote anything down. It was more, if you will, a group awareness. They merely watched, passive. You'd see them like sentinels at the top of a rubble pile any sunset, or peering round the corner of the street, squatting on the steps, loping in pairs, arms flung round each other's shoulders across a vacant lot going apparently nowhere. But always... Somewhere in their line of sight would be the flicker of a soutane, or a shadow darker than the rest. What was there about this priest to put him outside, a radius along with leather-winged Lucifer, Hitler, Mussolini? Only part, I think, of what makes us suspect the wolf in the dog, the traitor in the ally. There was little wishful thinking about those children. Priests, like mothers, were to be venerated. But look at Italy, look at the sky. Here had been betrayal and hypocrisy. Why not even among the priests? Once the sky had been our most constant and safe friend, 
a medium or plasma for the sun, a sun which the government is now trying to exploit for reasons of tourism. But formerly, in the days of Fausto I, the watchful eye of God in the sky, his clear cheek. Since 3 September 1939, there had appeared pustules, blemishes, and marks of pestilence. Messerschmitts. God's face had gone sick and his eye begun to wander. Close, wink, insisted the rampant atheist New Vietna. But such is the devotion of the people and the sure strength of the church that the betrayal was not looked on as God's, rather as the sky's. Knavery of the skin which could harbor such germs and thus turn so against its divine owner. The children, being poets in a vacuum, adept at metaphor, had no trouble in transferring a similar infection to any of God's representatives, the priests. Not all priests, but one, parishless, an alien. Slimo was like another country, and having already a bad reputation was fit vehicle for their skepticism. Reports of him were confused. Fausto would hear, through the children or Father Avalanche, that the bad priest was converting by the shores of Marsa Musheta, or had been active in Chagri at Mawija. Sinister uncertainty surrounded the priest. Elena showed no concern, did not feel that she herself had encountered any evil that day in the street was not worried about Paola coming under any evil influence, though the bad priest had been known to gather about him a small knot of children in the street and give them sermons. He taught no consistent philosophy that anyone could piece together from the fragments borne back to us by the children. The girls he advised to become nuns, avoid the sensual extremes, pleasure of intercourse, pain of childbirth. The boys, he told to find strength in and be like the rock of their island. He returned, curiously like the generation of thirty-seven, often to the rock, preaching that the object of male existence was to be like a crystal, beautiful and soulless. God is soulless, speculated Father Avalanche. Having created souls, he himself has none so that to be like God we must allow to be eroded the soul in ourselves. Seek mineral symmetry, for here is eternal life, the immortality of rock. Plausible, but apostasy. The children were not, of course, having any, knowing full well that if every girl became a sister there would be no more Maltese, and that rock, however fine as an object of contemplation, does no work, labors not, and thus displeases God, who is favorably disposed towards human labor. So they stayed passive, letting him talk, hanging like shadows at his heels, keeping a watchful eye. Surveillance in various forms continued for three years, with an apparent abating of the siege, begun perhaps the day of Fausto and Elena's walk, the stalking only intensified because there was more time for it. Intensified, too, beginning, one suspects, the same day, was a friction between Fausto and Elena. The same unceasing, wearying friction of the leaves in the park that afternoon. The smaller arguments were centered unhappily around you, Paola. As if the pair had both rediscovered a parental duty. With more time on their hands, they belatedly took up providing for their child moral guidance, mother love, comfort in moments of fear. Both were inept at it, and each time their energies inevitably turned away from the child and on one another. During such times, the child would more often than not slip away quietly to trail the bad priest. Until one evening, Elena told the rest of her meeting with the bad priest. The argument itself isn't recorded in any detail, only our words became more and more agitated, higher in pitch, more bitter, until finally she cried, Oh, the child, I should have done what he told me. Then, realizing what she'd said, silence. She moved away. I caught her. Told you. I shook her until she spoke. I would have killed her, I think. The bad priest, finally, told me not to have the child, told me he knew of a way. I would have, 
but I met Father Avalanche by accident. And as she had begun to pray in the park, had then apparently let the old habits reassert themselves by accident. I would never be telling you this had you been brought up under any illusion you were wanted, but having been abandoned so early to a common underworld, questions of want or possession never occurred to you. So at least I assume. Not, I hope, falsely. The day after Elena's revelation, the Luftwaffe came in thirteen times. Elena was killed early in the morning, the ambulance in which she was riding having apparently suffered a direct hit. Word got to me at Takali in the afternoon during a lull. I don't remember the messenger's face. I do remember sliding the shovel into a pile of dirt and walking away. And then a blank space. The next I knew, I was in the street, in a part of the city I did not recognize. The all-clear had sounded, so I must have walked through a raid. I stood at the top of a slope of debris. I heard cries, hostile shouting. Children. A hundred yards away, they swarmed among the ruins, closing in on a broken structure I recognized as the cellar of a house. Curious, I lurched down the slope after them. For some reason, I felt like a spy. Circling the ruin, I went up another small bank to the roof. There were holes I could look through. The children inside were clustered round a figure in black, a bad priest, wedged under a fallen beam, face, what could be seen, impassive. Is he dead? one asked. Others were picking already at the black rags. Speak to us, Father, they called, mocking. What is your sermon for today? Funny hat, giggled the little girl. She reached out and tugged off the hat. A long coil of white hair came loose and fell into the plaster dust. One beam of sunlight cut across the space, and the dust now turned it white. It's a lady, said the girl. Ladies can't be priests, replied a boy scornfully. They began to examine the hair. Soon he had pulled out an ivory comb and handed it to the little girl. She smiled. Other girls gathered round her to look at the prize. It's not real hair, the boy announced. See, he removed the long white wig from the priest's head. That's Jesus, cried a tall boy. Tattooed on the bare scalp was a two-color crucifixion. It was to be only the first of many surprises. Two children had been busy at the victim's feet, unlacing the shoes. Shoes were a welcome windfall in Malta at this time. Please, the priest said suddenly. He's alive. She's alive, stupid. Please what, father? Sister. May sisters dress up as priests, sister? Please lift this beam, said the sister priest. Look, look came cries at the woman's feet. They held up one of the black shoes. It was high-topped and impossible to wear. The cavity of the shoe was the exact imprint of a woman's high-heeled slipper. I could now see one of the slippers, dull gold, protruding from under the black robes. Girls whispered excitedly about how pretty the slippers were. One began to undo the buckles. If you can't lift the beam, the woman said, with perhaps a hint of panic. Please get help. Ah, from the other end. Up came one of the slippers and a foot, an artificial foot, the two sliding out as a unit, lug and slot. She comes apart. The woman did not seem to notice. Perhaps she could no longer feel. But when they brought the feet to her head to show her, I saw two tears grow and slipped from the outside corners of her eyes. She remained quiet while the children removed her robes and the shirt, and the gold cufflinks in the shape of a claw, and the black trousers which fit close to her skin. One of the boys had stolen a commando's bayonet. There were rust spots. They had to use it twice to get the trousers off. The nude body was surprisingly young, the skin healthy-looking, Somehow we'd all thought of the bad priest as an older person. At her navel was a star sapphire. 
The boy with the knife picked at the stone. It would not come away. He dug in with the point of the bayonet, working for a few minutes before he was able to bring out the sapphire. Blood had begun to well in its place. Other children crowded round her head. One pried her jaws apart while another removed a set of false teeth. She did not struggle, only closed her eyes and waited. But she could not even keep them closed, for the children peeled back one eyelid to reveal a glass eye with the iris in the shape of a clock. This, too, they removed. I wondered if the disassembly of the bad priest might not go on and on into evening. Surely her arms and breasts could be detached, the skin of her legs be peeled away to reveal some intricate understructure of silver openwork. Perhaps the trunk itself contained other wonders. Intestines of party-colored silk, gay balloon lungs, a rococo heart. But the sirens started up then. The children dispersed, bearing away their newfound treasures, and the abdominal wound made by the bayonet was doing its work. I lay prone under a hostile sky, looking down for moments more at what the children had left. Suffering Christ foreshortened on the bare skull, one eye and one socket staring up at me, a dark hole for the mouth, stumps at the bottoms of the legs, and the blood which had formed a black sash across the waist, flowing down both sides from the navel. I went down into the cellar to kneel by her. Are you alive? At the first bomb bursts, she moaned. I will pray for you. Night was coming in. She began to cry, tearless, half-nasal, more a curious succession of drawn-out wails originating far back in the mouth cavity. All through the raid, she cried. I gave her what I remembered of the sacrament of extreme unction. I could not hear her confession. Her teeth were gone, and she must have been past speech. But in those cries, so unlike human or even animal sound that they might have been only the wind blowing past any dead reed, I detected a sincere hatred for all her sins, which must have been countless. A profound sorrow at having hurt God by sinning, a fear of losing him, which was worse than the fear of death. The interior darkness was lit by flares over Valletta, incendiary bombs in the dockyard. Often both our voices were drowned in the explosions or the chattering of the ground artillery. I did not hear only what I wanted to hear in these sounds that issued unceasing from the poor woman. I have been over it, Paola, and over it. I have since attacked myself more scathingly than any of your doubts could. You will say I had forgotten my understanding with God in administering a sacrament only a priest can give, that after losing Elena I'd regressed to the priesthood I would have joined had I not married her. At the time, I only knew that a dying human must be prepared. I had no oil to anoint her organs of sense, so mutilated now, and so used her own blood, dipping it from the navel as from a chalice. Her lips were cold, though I saw and handled many corpses in the course of the siege. To this day, I cannot live with that cold. Often, when I fall asleep at my desk, the blood supply to an arm is cut off. I wake and touch it, and am no further from nightmare, or it is night's cold. Objects cold, nothing human, nothing of me about it at all. Now, touching her lips, my fingers recoiled, and I returned from wherever I'd been. The all-clear sounded. She cried once or twice more and fell silent. I knelt by her and began to pray for myself. For her, I'd done all I could. How long did I pray? No way of knowing. But soon... The cold of the wind, shared now with what had been a quick body, began to chill me. Kneeling grew uncomfortable. Only saints and lunatics can remain devoted for extended periods of time. I did feel for a pulse or heartbeat. None. I arose, limped about the cellar aimlessly, 
and finally emerged into Valletta without looking back. I returned to Tarkali on foot. My shovel was still where I had left it. Of Fausto the Third's return to life, little can be said. It happened. What inner resources were there to give it nourishment are still unknown to the present Fausto. This is a confession, and in that return from the rock was nothing to confess. There are no records of Fausto the Third, except for indecipherable entries, and sketches of an azalea blossom, a carob tree. There remain two unanswered questions. If he had truly broken his covenant with God in administering the sacrament, why did he survive the raid? And why did he not stop the children, or lift the beam? In answer to the first, one can only suggest that he was now Fausto III, with no further need for God. The second has caused his successor to write this confession. Fausto Maestral is guilty of murder, a sin of omission, if you will. He will answer to no tribunal but God, and God, at this moment, is far away. May he be closer to you. Valletta, 27 August, 1956 Stencil, let the last thin scribbled sheet flutter to bare linoleum. Had his coincidence the accident to shatter the surface of this stagnant pool and send all the mosquitoes of hope zinging away to the exterior night. Had it happened? An Englishman, a mysterious being named Stencil. Valletta, as if Paola's silence since, God, eight months, had she by her refusal to tell him anything been all this time forcing him closer to the day when he'd have to admit Valletta as a possibility? Why? Stencil would have liked to go on believing that Daff and V had been separate for his father. This he still could choose to do, couldn't he, and continue on in calm weather. He could go to Malta and possibly end it. He had stayed off Malta. He was afraid of ending it. But damn it all, staying here would end it too. Funking out, finding V, he didn't know which he was most afraid of, V or sleep or whether they were two versions of the same thing. Was there nothing for it but Valletta? Chapter 12 In Which Things Are Not So Amusing V. 1 The party had begun late with a corps of only a dozen sick. Evening was hot and not likely to get any cooler. They all sweated. The loft itself was part of an old warehouse and not a legal residence. Buildings in this area of the city had been condemned years ago. Someday there would be cranes, dump trucks, payloaders, bulldozers to come and level the neighborhood, but in the meantime nobody, city or landlords, saw any objection in turning a minor profit. There hung, therefore, about Raoul's slab and Melvin's pad, a climate of impermanence, as if the sand sculptures, unfinished canvases, thousands of paperback books suspended in tiers of cement blocks and warped planks, even the great marble toilet stolen from a mansion in the East Seventies, since replaced by a glass and aluminum apartment building, were all part of the set to an experimental play, which its cabal of faceless angels could cause to be struck at any moment without having to give their reasons. People would arrive, come the late hours. Raoul's slab and Melvin's refrigerator was already half-filled with a ruby construction of wine bottles. Gallon of vino paisano, slightly above center, left, off-balancing two twenty-five-cent bottles of Gallo Grenache Rosé, and one of Chilean Riesling, lower right, and so on. The icebox door was left open so people could admire, could dig. Why not? Accidental art had great vogue that year. Winsome wasn't there when the party began and didn't show up at all that night, nor any night after that, 
He'd had another fight with Mafia in the afternoon over playing tapes of McClintic Spheres' group in the parlor while she was trying to create in the bedroom. If you ever tried to create, she yelled, instead of live off what other people create, you'd understand. Who creates, Winsome said. Your editor, publisher, without them, girl, you would be nowhere. Anywhere you are, old sweet, is nowhere. Winsome gave it up and left her to scream at Fang. He had to step over three sleeping bodies on the way out. Which one was Pig Bodine? They were all covered by blankets. Like the old pea and nutshell dodge. Did it make any difference? She'd have company. He headed downtown and after a while had wandered by the V-note. Inside were stacked tables and the bartender watching a ball game on TV. Two fat Siamese kittens played on the piano, one outside chasing up and down the keyboard, one inside clawing at the strings. It didn't sound like much. Rune? Man, I need a change of luck, no racial slur intended. Get a divorce. McClintic appeared in a foul mood. Rune, let's go to Lennox. I can't last the weekend. Don't tell me any woman trouble. I got enough for both of us. Why not? Out to the boondocks, green hills, well people. Come on. There is a little girl I have to get out of this town before she flips from the heat or whatever it is. It took them a while. They drank beer till sunset and then headed up to Winsome's where they swapped the Triumph for a black Buick. It looks like a staff car for the Mafia, said McClintic. Whoops. Ha ha, replied Winsome. They continued uptown along the nighttime Hudson, veering finally right into Harlem. And there began working their way into Matilda Winthrop's bar by bar. Not long after, they were arguing like undergraduates over who was the most juiced, gathering hostile stares which had less to do with color than with an inherent quality of conservatism which neighborhood bars possess, and bars where how much you can drink is a test of manhood do not. They arrived at Matilda's well past midnight. The old lady, hearing Winsome's rebel accent, talked only to McClintock. Ruby came downstairs, and McClintock introduced them. Crash! Shrieks! Deep-chested laughter from topside! Matilda ran out of the room, screaming. Sylvia, Ruby's friend, is busy tonight, McClintock said. Winsome was charming. You young folks, just take it easy, he said. Old Uncle Rooney will drive you anywhere you want. Won't look in the rearview mirror. Won't be anything but the kindly old chauffeur he is. Which cheered McClintock up, there being a certain strained politeness in the way Ruby held his arm. Winsome could see how McClintock was daft to get out in the country. More noise from upstairs, louder this time. McClintock, Matilda yelled. I must go play bouncer, he told Rooney, back in five. Which left only Rooney and Ruby in the parlor. I know a girl I can take along, said he. I suppose her name is Rachel Owlglass, who lives on 112th. Ruby fiddled with the catches on her overnight bag. Your wife wouldn't like that too much. Why don't McClintock and I just go up in the triumph? You shouldn't go to that trouble. My wife, angry all at once, is a fucking fascist. I think you should know that. But if you brought along, all I want to do is go now somewhere out of town, away from New York, away to where things you expect to happen do happen. Didn't they ever used to? You're still young enough. It's still that way for kids, isn't it? I'm not that young, she whispered. Please, Rooney, be easy. Girl, if it isn't Lennox, it will be someplace. Further east, Walden Pond, uh, uh. No. No, that's Public Beach now, where slobs from Boston who'd be at Revere Beach, except for too many other slobs like themselves, already there crowding them out. These slobs sit on the rocks around Walden Pond, belching, drinking beer they've cleverly smuggled in past the guards, checking the young stuff, hating their wives, their evil-smelling kids who urinate in the water on the sly. Where? Where in Massachusetts? Where in the country? Stay home. No, if only to see how bad Lennox is. Baby, baby, she sang soft, absent. Have you heard? Did you know? 
There ain't no dope in Lennox. How did you do it? Burnt cork, she told him, like a minstrel show. No, he started across the room away from her. You didn't use anything, didn't have to, no makeup. Mafia, you know, thinks you're German. I thought you were Puerto Rican before Rachel told me. Is that what you are, something we can look at and see whatever we want? Protective coloration? I have read books, said Paola. And listen, Rooney, nobody knows what a Maltese is. The Maltese think they're a pure race, and the Europeans think they're Semitic, Hamitic, cross-bred with North Africans, Turks, and God knows what all. But for McClintock, for anybody else around here, I am a Negro girl named Ruby, he snorted. And don't tell them him, please, man. I'll never tell Paola. Then McClintock was back. You two wait till I find a friend. Rach, beamed McClintock. Good show. Paola looked upset. I think us four out in the country. His words were for Paola. He was drunk. He was messing it up. We could make it. It would be a fresh thing. Clean. A beginning. Maybe I should drive, McClintock said. It would give him something to concentrate on till things got easier out of the city. And Rooney looked drunk. More than that, maybe. You drive, Winsome agreed, weary. God let her be there. All the way down to 112th, and McClintock gunned it. He wondered what he'd do if she wasn't there. She wasn't there. The door was open, noteless. She usually left some word. She usually locked doors. Winsome went inside. Two or three lights were on. Nobody was there. Only her slip tossed awry on the bed. He picked it up, black and slippery. Slippery slip, he thought, and kissed it by the left breast. The phone rang. He let it ring. Finally, Where is Esther? She sounded out of breath. You wear nice lingerie, Winsome said. Thank you. She hasn't come in? Beware of girls with black underwear. Rooney, not now. She has really gone and got her ass in a sling. Could you look and see if there's a note? Come with me to Lenox, Massachusetts. Patient sigh. There's no note. No nothing. Would you look anyway? I'm in the subway. Come with me to Lenox, Rooney sang. It's August in Nueva York, Ciudad. You've told so many good men nicks. Please don't put me down with a dark sea, you dad. Chorus. Begin tempo. Come out where the wind is cool and the streets are colonial lanes. Though the ghosts of a million Puritans pace in our phony old brains, I still get an erection when I hear the reed section of the Boston Pops. Come and leave this Bohemia. Life's really dreamy away from the J.D.'s and Cops. Lennox is grand. Are you digging me, Rachel? Broadening A's by the width of an H will be something we've never tried. Up in the country of Alden and Walden, country to grow sentimental and bald in, with you by my side, how can it go wrong? Hey, Rachel, snap, snap, on one and three, you coming along? She'd hung up halfway through. Winsome sat by the phone, holding the slip. Just sat. Two. Esther had indeed got her ass in a sling, her emotional ass anyway. Rachel had found her earlier that afternoon crying down in the laundry room. What? Rachel said. Esther only bawled louder. Girl, gently, tell Rach. Get off my back. So they chased each other around the washers and centrifuges and in and out of the flapping sheets, rag rugs and brassieres of the drying room. Look, I want to help you is all. Esther had got tangled in a sheet. Rachel stood helpless in the dark laundry room, yelling at her. Washing machine in the next room ran all at once amuck. A cascade of soapy water came funneling through the doorway, bearing down on them. Rachel, with a foul expression, kicked off her capizios, hiked her skirt up, and headed for a mop. She hadn't been swabbing five minutes when Pig Bodine stuck his head around the door. You are doing that wrong. Where did you ever learn to handle a swab? 
Here, she said. You want a swab? I got your swab. She ran at him, spinning the mop. Pig retreated. What's wrong with Esther? I rapped into her on the way down. Rachel wished she knew. By the time she'd dried the floor and run up the fire escape and in the window to their apartment, Esther was, of course, gone. Slab, Rachel figured. Slab was on the phone after half a ring. I'll let you know if she shows. But Slab, what, said Slab. What? Oh, well. She hung up. Pig was sitting in the transom. Automatically, she turned on the radio for him. Little Willie John came on singing Fever. What's wrong with Esther, she said, for something to say. I asked you that, said Pig. I bet she's knocked up. You would. Rachel had a headache. She headed for the bathroom to meditate. Fever was touching them all. Pig. Evil-minded Pig inferred right for once. Esther showed up at slabs looking like any traditional mill hand, seamstress or shop girl done wrong. Dull hair, puffy face looking heavier already in the breasts and abdomen. Five minutes, and she had slab railing. He stood before Cheese Danish number 56, a cockeyed specimen covering an entire wall, dwarfing him in his shadowy clothes as he waved arms, tossed his forelock. Don't tell me Schoenmaker won't give you a dime. I know that already. You want to put a small bet on this? I say it'll come out with a big hook nose. That shut her up. Kindly slab was of the shock treatment school. Look, he grabbed a pencil. It is no time of year to go to Cuba. Hotter than Nueva York, no doubt, off-season. But for all his fascist tendencies, Batista has one golden virtue— Abortion, he maintains, is legal, which means you get an M.D. who knows what he's about, not some fumbling amateur. It's clean, it's safe, it's legal. Above all, it's cheap. It's murder. You've turned R.C. Good show. For some reason, it always becomes fashionable during a decadence. You know what I am, she whispered. We'll leave that go. I wish I did. He stopped a minute because he felt himself going sentimental. He finagled around with figures on a scrap of vellum. For three hundred, he said, we can get you there and back, including meals if you feel like eating. We? Oui. The whole sick crew. You can do it inside a week, down to Havana and back. You'll be yo-yo champion. No. So they talked metaphysics while the afternoon waned. Neither felt he was defending or trying to prove anything important. It was like playing one-up at a party or Botticelli. They quoted to each other from Liguorian tracts, Galen, Aristotle, David Reisman, T.S. Eliot. How can you say there's a soul there? How can you tell when the soul enters the flesh or whether you even have a soul? It's murdering your own child is what it is. Child smiled. A complex protein molecule is all. I guess on the rare occasions you bathe, you wouldn't mind using Nazi soap made from one of those six million Jews. All right, he was mad. Show me the difference. After that, it ceased being logical and phony and became emotional and phony. They were like a drunk with dry heaves, having brought up and expelled all manner of old words which had always somehow sat wrong. They then proceeded to fill the loft with futile yelling, trying to heave up their own living tissue, organs which had no business anywhere but where they were. As the sun went down, she broke out of a point-by-point -point condemnation of Slab's moral code to assault Cheese Danish number 56, charging at it with windmilling nails. Go ahead, Slab said. It will help the texture. He was on the phone. Winsome's not home. He jittered the receiver, dialed information. Where can I get three hundred bills, he said. No, the banks are closed. I am against usury. He quoted to the phone operator from Ezra Pound's cantos. How come, he wondered, all you phone operators talk through your nose? Laughter. Fine, we'll try it sometime. Esther yelped, having just broken a fingernail. Slab hung up. It fights back, he said. 
Baby, we need three hundred. Somebody must have it. He decided to call all his friends who had savings accounts. A minute later, this list was exhausted, and he was no closer to financing Esther's trip south. Esther was tramping around looking for a bandage. She finally had to settle for a wad of toilet paper and a rubber band. I'll think of something, he said. Stick by slab, babe. Who is a humanitarian? They both knew she would. To whom else? She was the sticking sort. So Slab sat thinking, and Esther waved the paper ball at the end of her finger to a private tune, maybe an old love song. Though neither would admit it, they also waited for Raoul and Melvin and the crew to arrive for the party, while all the time the colors in the wall-size painting were shifting, reflecting new wavelengths to compensate for the wasting sun. Rachel, out looking for Esther, didn't arrive at the party till late. Coming up the seven flights to the loft, she passed at each landing like frontier guards, nuzzling couples, hopelessly drunken boys, brooding types who read out of and scrawled cryptic notes in paper books stolen from Raoul, Slab, and Melvin's library, all of whom informed her how she had missed all the fun. What this fun was, she found out before she'd fairly wedged her way into the kitchen, where all the good people were. Melvin was holding forth on his guitar in an improvised folk song about how humanitarian a cove his roommate Slab was, crediting him with being A, a neo-wobbly and reincarnation of Joe Hill, B, the world's leading pacifist, C, a rebel with taproots in the American tradition, D, in militant opposition to fascism, private capital, the Republican administration, and Westbrook Pegler. While Melvin sang, Raoul provided Rachel with a kind of marginal gloss on the sources of Melvin's present adulation. It seemed earlier Slab had waited till the room was jammed to capacity, then mounted the marble toilet and called for silence. Esther here is pregnant, he announced, and needs three hundred bucks to go to Cuba and have an abortion. Cheering, warm-hearted, grinning ear to ear, juiced, the whole sick crew dug deep into their pockets and the wellsprings of a common humanity to come up with loose change, worn bills, and a few subway tokens, all of which Slab collected in an old pith helmet with Greek letters on it, left over from somebody's fraternity weekend years ago. Surprisingly, it came to two hundred ninety-five dollars and some change. Slab, with a flourish, produced a ten he'd borrowed fifteen minutes before his speech from Fergus Mixolydian, who had just received a Ford Foundation grant and was having more than wistful thoughts about Buenos Aires, from which there is no extradition. If Esther objected verbally to the proceedings, no record of it exists, there being too much noise in the room, for one thing. After the collection, Slab handed her the pith helmet, and she was helped up on the toilet, where she made a brief but moving acceptance speech. Amid the ensuing applause, Slab roared, "'Off to Idlewild, or something,' and they were both lifted bodily and carried out of the loft and down the stairs. The only gauche note to the evening was struck by one of their bearers, an undergraduate and recent arrival on the sick scene, who suggested they could save all the trouble of a trip to Cuba and use the money for another party if they induced a miscarriage by dropping Esther down the stairwell. He was quickly silenced. "'Dear God,' said Rachel. "'She had never seen so many red faces.' the linoleum wet with so much spilled alcohol, vomit, wine. I need a car, she told Raoul. Wheels, Raoul screamed. Four wheels for Rach. But the crew's generosity had been exhausted. Nobody listened. Maybe from her lack of enthusiasm, they deduced she was about to roar off to Idlewild and try to stop Esther. They weren't having any. It was only at that point, early in the morning, that Rachel thought of profane. He would be off shift now. Dear Profane, an adjective which hung unvoiced in the party's chivalry, hung in her most secret cortex to bloom, she helpless against it, only far enough to surround her four feet ten inches with an envelope of peace. Knowing all the time, Profane, too, was wheelless. So, she said. All it was was no wheels on Profane, the boy a born pedestrian, under his own power which was also power over her. Then what was she doing, declaring herself a dependent, as if here were the heart's authentic income tax form, 
tortuous enough, mucked up with enough polysyllabic words to take her all of twenty-two years to figure out. At least that long, for surely it was complicated being a duty you could rightfully avoid with none of Fancy's feds ever to worry about tracking you down on it. But. That but. If you did take the trouble, even any first step, it meant stacking income against output, and who knew what embarrassments, exposés of self that might drag you into. Strange the places these things can happen in. Stranger that they ever do happen. She headed for the phone. It was in use, but she could wait. 3. Profane arrived at Winsome's to find Mafia wearing only the inflatable brassiere and playing a game of her own invention called Musical Blankets with three bows who were new to Profane. The record being stopped at random was Hank Snow singing, It Don't Hurt Anymore. Profane went to the icebox and got beer, was thinking of calling Paola when the phone rang. Idlewild, he said. Maybe we can borrow Rooney's car, the Buick, only I can't drive. I can, Rachel said. Stand by. Profane, with a rueful look back at the buoyant mafia and her friends, moseyed down the fire stairs to the garage. No Buick. Only McClintock's fierce triumph, locked, keys gone. Profane sat on the triumph's hood, surrounded by his inanimate buddies from Detroit. Rachel was there in fifteen minutes. No car, he said. We're screwed. Oh, dear. She told him why they had to get to Idlewild. I don't see why you're so excited. She wants to get her uterus scraped. Let her. What Rachel should have said then was, You careless son of a bitch, slugged him and sought transportation elsewhere. But having come to him with a certain fondness, perhaps only satisfied with this new, maybe temporary, definition of peace, she tried to reason. I don't know if it's murder or not, she said, nor care. How close is close? I'm against it because of what it does to the abortionee. Ask the girl who's had one. For a second, Profane thought she was talking about herself. There came this impulse to get away. She was acting weird tonight. Because Esther is weak. Esther is a victim. She will come out of the ether hating men, believing they're all liars, and still knowing she'll take what she can get, whether he's careful or not. She'll get to where she can take on anybody, neighborhood racketeers, college boys, arty types, daft and delinquent, because it's something she can't get along without. Don't, Rachel, Esther, why? Are you in love with her? You sweated so much. I am. Close your mouth, she told him. What is your name, Pig Bodine? You know what I'm saying. How many times have you told me about under the street and on the street and in the subway? Bam. Chop fallen. Sure, but... I mean, I love Esther like you love the dispossessed, the wayward. What else can I feel? For somebody whose guilt's such an aphrodisiac for... Up to now, she's been selective. But when she's felt it, feeling always has this own breed of half-assed love for slab and the pig Schoenmaker, going for these exhausted, ulcerous, lonely rejects. Slab and you were kicking a tire horizontal once. Okay, quiet. It is myself, what I could slide back into, maybe a girl victim underneath this red mop. She had one little hand pushed up from under into her hair and was slowly lifting the thick mane of it while Profane watched and began to grow erect. Part of me that I can see in her. Just as it is Profane the depression kit, that lump that wasn't aborted, that became an awareness on the floor of one old Hooverville shack in 32. It's him you see in every no-name drifter, mooch, squares, tenant, him you love. What was she talking about? Profane had all night to rehearse, but he never expected this. He hung his head and kicked inanimate tires, knowing they'd take revenge when he was looking for it least. He was afraid now to say anything. She held her hair up, eyes gone all rainy, came off the fender she'd been leaning back on and stood spraddle-legged, hips poised in a bow his direction. Slab and I rotated our ninety degrees because we were incompatible. The crew lost all glamour for me. I grew up. I don't know what happened. But he will never leave it, though his eyes are open and he sees as much as I do. I didn't want to be sucked in, was all, but then you... 
Thus, the maverick daughter of Stuyvesant Owlglass, perched like any pin-up beauty, ready at the slightest pressure surge in the bloodlines, endocrine imbalance, quickening of nerves at the love-breeding zones, to pivot into some covenant with profane the schlemiel. Her breasts seemed to expand toward him, but he stood fast, unwilling to retreat from pleasure, unwilling to convict himself of love for bombs himself. Her, unwilling to see her, proved inanimate as the rest. Why that last? Only a general desire to find somebody for once on the right or real side of the TV screen. What made her hold any promise of being any more human? You ask too many questions, he told himself. Stop asking, take, give, whatever she wants to call it. Whether the bulge is in your skivvies or your brain, do something. She doesn't know, you don't know. Only that the nipples which came to make a warm diamond with his navel and the padded cusp of his rib cage, the girl's ass one hand moved to automatic, the recently fluffed hairs tickling his nostrils had nothing for once at all to do with this black garage or the car shadows which did accidentally include the two of them. Rachel now only wanted to hold him, to feel the top of his beer belly flattening her braless breasts, already evolving schemes to make him lose weight, exercise more. McClintock came in and found them like that, holding together until now and again one or the other lost balance and made tiny staggers to compensate. Underground garage for a dancing floor. So they dance all over the cities. Rachel grasped everything outside as Paola climbed from the Buick. The two girls confronted, smiled, passed. Their histories would go different from here on, said the shy twin looks they swapped. All McClintock said was, Rooney is asleep on your bed. Somebody ought to look after him. Profane? Profane, she laughed while the Buick growled to her touch. Dear, we've got so many of them to take care of now. 4. Winsome came awake from a dream of defenestration, wondering why he hadn't thought of it before. From Rachel's bedroom window it was seven stories to a courtyard used for mean purposes only. Drunks, evacuation, a dump for old beer cans and mop dust, the pleasures of nighttime cats. How his cadaver could glorify that. He moved to the window, opened, straddled, listened. Girls being tailed somewhere along Broadway, giggling. Musician out of work, practicing trombone. Rock and roll across the way. Little teenage goddess, don't tell me no. Into the park tonight, we're going to go. Let me be your teenage Romeo. Dedicated to the duck's ass heads and bursting straight skirts of the street that gave cops ulcers and the youth board gainful employment. Why not go down there? Heat rises. On the areaway's jagged floor, there'd be no August. Listen, friends, Winsome said. There is a word for all our crew, and it is sick. Some of us cannot keep our flies zipped. Others remain faithful to one mate till menopause, or the grand climacteric steps in. But Randy or monogamous, on one side of the night or the other, on or off the street, there is no one of us you can point to and call well. Fergus Mixolydian, the Irish-Armenian Jew, takes money from a foundation named after a man who spent millions trying to prove thirteen rabbis rule the world. Fergus sees nothing wrong there. Esther Harvitz pays to get the body she was born with altered and then falls deeply in love with the man who mutilated her. Esther sees nothing wrong either. Raoul, the television writer, can produce drama devious enough to slip by any sponsor's roadblock and still tell the staring fans what's wrong with them and what they're watching, but he's happy with westerns and detective stories. Slab, the painter, whose eyes are open, has technical skill and, if you will, soul but is committed to cheese danishes. Melvin, the folk singer, has no talent. Ironically, he does more social commenting than the rest of the crew put together. He accomplishes nothing. Mafia Winsome is smart enough to create a world, but too stupid not to live in it. Finding the real world never jibing with her fancy, she spends all kinds of energy, sexual, emotional, trying to make it conform, never succeeding. 
And on it goes. Anybody who continues to live in a subculture so demonstrably sick has no right to call himself well. The only well thing to do is what I am going to do now, namely, jump out this window. So speaking, Winsome straightened his tie and prepared to defenestrate. I say, said Pig Bodine, who had been out in the kitchen listening, don't you know life is the most precious possession you have? I have heard that one before, said Winsome, and jumped. He had forgotten about the fire escape three feet below the window. By the time he'd picked himself up and swung a leg over, Pig was out the window. Pig grabbed Winsome's belt just as he went over the second time. Now look, said Pig. A drunk, urinating below in the courtyard, glanced up and started yelling for everybody to come watch the suicide. Lights came on, windows opened, and pretty soon Pig and Winsome had an audience. Winsome hung jackknifed, looking placidly down at the drunk and calling him obscene names. How about letting go? Winsome said after a while. Aren't your arms getting tired? Pig admitted they were. Did I ever tell you, Pig said, the story about the coke sacker, the cork soaker, and the sock tucker? Winsome started to laugh, and with a mighty heave, Pig brought him back over the low rail of the fire escape. No fair, said Winsome, who had knocked the wind out of Pig. He tore away and went running down the steps. Pig, sounding like an espresso machine with faulty valves, joined the pursuit a second later. He caught Winsome two stories down, standing on the rail, holding his nose. This time he slung Winsome over a shoulder and started grimly up the fire escape. Winsome slithered away and ran down another floor. Ah, good, he said, still four stories high enough. The rock and roll enthusiast across the court had turned his radio up. Elvis Presley singing Don't Be Cruel gave them background music. Pig could hear cop sirens arriving out in front. So they chased each other up, down and around the fire escapes. After a while, they got dizzy and started to giggle. The audience cheered them on. So little happens in New York. Police came charging into the areaway with nets, spotlights, ladders. Finally, Pig had chased Winsome down to the first landing, half a story above the ground. By this time, the cops had spread out a net. You still want to jump, Pig said. Yes, said Winsome. Go ahead, said Pig. Winsome went down in a swan dive, trying to land on his head. The net, of course, was there. He bounced once and lay all flabby while they wrapped him in a straitjacket and carted him off to Bellevue. Pig, suddenly realizing that he had been AWOL for eight months today and that cop may be defined as civilian shore patrolman, turned and raced fleetly up the fire escape for Rachel's window, leaving the solid citizens to turn their lights off and go back to Elvis Presley. Once inside, he reckoned he could put on an old dress of Esther's and a babushka and talk in falsetto should the cops decide to come up and inquire. They were so stupid they'd never know the difference. Five. At Idlewild was a fat three-year-old who waited to bounce over the tarmac to a waiting plane, Miami, Havana, San Juan, looking blasé and heavy-lidded over the dandruffed shoulder of her father's black suit, at the clack of relatives assembled to see her off. Cucarachita, they cried. Adios, adios. For such wee hours the airport was mobbed. After having Esther paged, Rachel went weaving in and out of the crowd in a random search pattern for her strayed roommate. At last she joined Profane at the rail. Some guardian angels we are. I checked on Pan American and all of them, Profane said. The big ones... They were full up days ago. This Anglo Airlines here is the only one going out this morning. Loudspeaker announced the flight. DC-3 waited across the strip, dilapidated and hardly gleaming under the lights. The gate opened. Waiting passengers began to move. The Puerto Rican baby's friends had come armed with maracas, claves, timbales. They all moved in like a bodyguard to escort her out to the plane. A few cops tried to break it up. Somebody started to sing. Pretty soon, everybody was singing. There she is, Rachel yelled. Esther came scooting around from behind a row of lockers with slab-running interference. Eyes and mouth bawling, overnight case leaking a trail of cologne which would dry quickly on the pavement. She charged in among the Puerto Ricans. Rachel, running after her, 
sidestepped a cop only to run head-on into Slab. Oof, said Slab. What the hell's the idea, Lout? He had hold of one arm. Let her go, Slab said. She wants to. You've slammed her around, yelled Rachel. You trying to total her? It didn't work with me, so you had to pick on somebody as weak as you are? Why couldn't you confine your mistakes to paint and canvas? One way or another, the whole sick crew was giving the cops a busy night. Whistles started blowing. The area between the rail and the DC-3 was swelling into a small-scale riot. Why not? It was August, and the cops do not like Puerto Ricans. The multi-metronome clatter from Cucarachita's rhythm section turned angry like a swarm of locusts turning for the approach on some rich field. Slab began shouting unkind reminiscences of the days he and Rachel had been horizontal. Profane, meanwhile, was trying to keep from being clobbered. He'd lost Esther, who was naturally using the riot for a screen. Somebody started blinking all the lights in that part of Idlewild, which made things even worse. He finally broke clear of a small knot of well-wishers and spotted Esther running across the airstrip. She'd lost one shoe. He was about to go after her when a body fell across his path. He tripped, went down, opened his eyes to a pair of girls' legs he knew. Benito, the sad pout sexy as ever. God, what else? She was going back to San Juan. Of the months between the gangbang and now, she'd say nothing. Fina, Fina, don't go. Like photographs in your wallet, what good is an old love, however ill-defined, down in San Juan? Angel and Geronimo are here, she looked around vaguely. They want me to go, she told him on her way again. He followed, haranguing. He'd forgotten about Esther. Cucarachita and father came running past. Profane and Fina passed Esther's shoe, lying on its side with a broken heel. Finally, Fina turned, dry-eyed. Remember the night in the bathtub? Spat, spun, dashed off for the plane. Your ass, he said. They would have got you sooner or later, but stood there anyway, still as any object. I did it, he said after a while. It was me. Schlemiel's being, as he believed, passive. He could not remember ever having admitted anything like this. Oh, man. Plus letting Esther get away. Plus having Rachel now for a dependent. Plus whatever would happen with Paola. For a boy not getting any, he had more woman problems than anybody he knew. He started back for Rachel. The riot was breaking up. Behind him, propellers spun. The plane taxied, slewed, became airborne, was gone. He didn't turn to watch it. Six. Patrolman Yonesh and Officer Tenike, disdaining the elevator, marched in perfect unison up two flights of palatial stairway down the hall toward Winsome's apartment. A few tabloid reporters who had taken the elevator intercepted them halfway there. Noise from Winsome's apartment could be heard down on Riverside Drive. Never know what Bellevue is going to turn up, said Yonesh. He and his sidekick were faithful viewers of the TV program Dragnet. They'd cultivated deadpan expressions, unsyncopated speech rhythms, monotone voices. One was tall and skinny. The other was short and fat. They walked in step. Talk to a doctor there, said Ten Eyck. Young fellow named Gottchalk. Winsome had a lot to say. We'll see, Al. Before the door, Yonesh and Ten Eyck waited politely for the one cameraman in the group to check his flash attachment. A girl was heard to shriek happily inside. Oh, boy, oh, boy, said a reporter. The cops knocked. Come in, come in, called many juiced voices. It's the police, ma'am. I hate fuzz, somebody snarled. Ten Eyck kicked in the door, which had been open. Bodies inside fell back to provide the cameraman a line of sight to Mafia, Charisma, Foo, and friends playing musical blankets. Zap! went the camera. Too bad, the photographer said. We can't print that one. Ten Eyck shouldered his way over to Mafia. All right, ma'am. Would you like to play? Hysterical. The cop smiled tolerantly. We've talked to your husband. We'd better go, said the other cop. Yes, Al is right, ma'am. 
flash attachment lit up the room from time to time like a spell of heat lightning. Tanike flapped a warrant. All you folks are under arrest, he said. To Yonish, call the lieutenant, Steve. What charge? People started yelling. Tanike's timing was good. He waited a few heartbeats. Disturbing the peace will do, he said. Maybe the only peace undisturbed that night was McClintock's and Paola's. A little triumph forged along up the Hudson, their own wind was cool, taking away whatever of Nueva York had clogged the ears, nostrils, mouths. She talked to him straight, and McClintock kept cool. While she told him about who she was, about Stencil and Fausto, even a homesick travelogue of Malta, there came to McClintock something it was time he got around to seeing that the only way clear of the cool, crazy flip-flop was obviously slow, frustrating, and hard work. Love with your mouth shut, help without breaking your ass or publicizing it. Keep cool, but care. He might have known if he'd used any common sense. It didn't come as a revelation, only something he'd as soon not have admitted. Sure, he said later, as they headed into the Berkshires. Paola, did you know I have been blowing a silly line all this time? Mr. Flab, the original is me. Lazy and taking for granted some wonder drug someplace to cure that town, to cure me. Now there isn't, and never will be. Nobody is going to step down from heaven and square away Rooney and his woman, or Alabama, or South Africa, or us and Russia. There's no magic words. Not even I love you is magic enough. Can you see Eisenhower telling Melenkoff or Khrushchev that? Ho, ho. Keep cool, but care, he said. Somebody had run over a skunk a ways back. The smell had followed them for miles. If my mother was alive, I would have her make a sampler with that on it. You know, don't you, she began, that I have to... Go back home, sure. But the week's not over yet. Be easy, girl. I can't. Can I ever? We'll stay away from musicians, was all he said. Did he know of anything she could be, ever? Flop, flip, he sang to the trees of Massachusetts. Once I was hip. Chapter 13, in which the yo-yo string is revealed as a state of mind. V. 1. The passage to Malta took place in late September over an Atlantic whose sky never showed a sun. The ship was Susanna Squaducci, which had figured once before in Profane's long-interrupted guardianship of Paola. He came back to the ship that morning in the fog, knowing that Fortune's yo-yo had also returned to some reference point, not unwilling, not anticipating, not anything, merely prepared to float— acquire a set and drift wherever fortune willed, if fortune could will. A few of the crew had come to give profane payola and stencil bon voyage, those who weren't in jail out of the country or in the hospital. Rachel had stayed away. It was a weekday she had a job. Profane supposed so. He was here by accident. While weeks back, off on the fringes of the field of two Rachel and Profane had set up, Stencil roamed the city, exerting pull, seeing about tickets, passports, visas, inoculations for Paola and him. Profane felt that at last he'd come to dead center in Nueva York, had found his girl, his vocation as watchman against the night, and straight man for Shroud, his home in a three-girl apartment with one gone to Cuba, one about to go to Malta, and one his own remaining. He'd forgotten about the inanimate world and any law of retribution, forgotten that the field of two, the twin envelope of peace, had come to birth only a few minutes after he'd been kicking tires, which for a schlemiel is pure wising off. It didn't take them long. Only a few nights later, Profane sacked in at four, figuring to get in a good eight hours of Z's before he had to get up and go to work. When his eyes finally did come open, he knew from the quality of light in the room and the state of his bladder that he'd overslept. Rachel's electric clock whined merrily beside him, hands pointing to one-thirty. Rachel was off somewhere. He turned on the light, saw that the alarm was set for midnight, 
The button on the back switched on. Malfunction. You little bastard. He picked the clock up and heaved it across the room. On hitting the bathroom door, the alarm went off, a loud and arrogant bzzz. Well, he got his feet in the wrong shoes, cut himself shaving. The token he had wouldn't fit into the turnstile. Subway took off about ten seconds ahead of him. When he arrived downtown, it was not much south of three, and Anthro Research Associates was in an uproar. Bergamask met him at the door, livid. Guess what? the boss yelled. It seemed an all-night routine test was on. Around 1.15, one of the larger heaps of electronic gear had run amok. Half the circuitry fused. Alarm bells went off. The sprinkler system and a couple of CO2 cylinders kicked in, all of which the attendant technician had slept through peacefully. Technicians, Bergamask snorted, are not paid to wake up. This is why we have night watchmen. Shroud sat over against the wall, hooting quietly. Soon as it had all come through to profane, he shrugged. It's stupid, but it's something I say all the time. A bad habit. So, anyway, I'm sorry. Getting no response, turned and shuffled off. They'd send him severance pay, he reckoned, in the mail, unless they intended to make him cover the cost of the damaged gear. Shroud called after him. Bon voyage. What is that supposed to mean? We'll see. So long, old buddy. Keep cool. Keep cool, but care. It's a watchword profane for your side of the morning. There, I've told you too much as it is. I'll bet under that cynical butyrate hide is a slob, a sentimentalist. There's nothing under here. Who are we kidding? The last words he ever had was Shroud. Back at 112th Street, he woke up Rachel. Back to pounding the pavements, lad. She was trying to be cheerful. He gave her that much, but was mad with himself for going flabby enough to forget his schlemiel birthright, she being all he had to take it out on. Fine for you, he said. You've been solvent all your life. Solvent enough to keep us going till me and space-time employment find something good for you. Really good. Fina had tried to shove him along the same path. Had it been her that night at Idlewild? Or only another shroud, another guilty conscience bugging him over a bion rhythm? Maybe I don't want to get a job. Maybe I'd rather be a bum. Remember? I'm the one that loves bums. She edged over to make room for him, having now those inevitable second thoughts. I don't want to talk about loving anything, she told the wall. It's always dangerous. You have to con each other a little profane. Why don't we go to sleep? No, he couldn't let it go. Let me warn you, is all, that I don't love anything, not even you. Whenever I say that, and I will, it will be a lie. Even what I'm saying now is half a play for sympathy. She made believe she was snoring. All right, you know I am a schlemiel. You talk two-way. Rachel O, are you that stupid? All a schlemiel can do is take. From the pigeons in the park, from a girl picked up on any street, bad and good. A schlemiel like me takes and gives nothing back. Can't there be a time for that later? she asked meekly. Can't it wait on tears sometime, a lover's crisis? Not now, dear profane. Only sleep. No. He leaned over her. Babe, I am not showing you anything of me, anything hidden. I can say what I've said and be safe because it's no secret. It's there for anybody to see. It's got nothing to do with me. All schlemiels are like that. She turned to him, moving her legs apart. Hush. Can't you see? Growing excited, though it was now the last thing he wanted. That whenever I... Any schlemiel lets a girl think there is a past or a secret dream that can't be talked about. Why, Rachel, that's a con job, is all it is. As if Shroud were prompting him. There's nothing inside, only the scungile shell. Dear girl, saying it as phony as he knew how, schlemiels know this and use it, because they know most girls need mystery, something romantic there because a girl knows her man would be only a bore if she found out everything there was to know. 
I know what you're thinking now. The poor boy, why does he put himself down like that? And I'm using this love that you still, poor stoop, think is too way to come like this between your legs, like this, and take, never thinking how you feel, caring about whether you come only so I can think of myself as good enough to make you come. So he talked all the way through till both had done, and he rolled on his back to feel traditionally sad. You have to grow up she finally said. That's all. My own unlucky boy. Didn't you ever think maybe ours is an act, too? We're older than you. We lived inside you once, the fifth rib closest to the heart. We learned all about it then. After that, it had to become our game to nourish a heart you all believe is hollow, though we know different. Now you all live inside us for nine months, and whenever you decide to come back after that, he was snoring for real. Dear, how pompous I'm getting. Good night. And she fell asleep to have cheerful, brightly colored, explicit dreams about sexual intercourse. Next day, rolling out of bed to get dressed, she continued, I'll see what we've got. Stand by, I'll call you. Which, of course, kept him from going back to sleep. He stumbled around the apartment for a while, swearing at things. Subway, he said, like the hunchback of Notre Dame, yelling sanctuary. After a day of yo-yoing, he came up to the street at nightfall, sat in a neighborhood bar, and got juiced. Rachel met him at home. Home? Smiling and playing the game. How would you like to be a salesman? Electric shavers for French poodles. Nothing inanimate, he managed to say. Slave girls, maybe. She followed him to the bedroom and took off his shoes when he passed out on the bed, even tucked him in. Next day, hungover, he yo-yoed on the Staten Island Ferry, watching juveniles in love neck, grab, miss, connect. Day after that, he got up before her and journeyed down to the Fulton Fish Market to watch the early morning activity. Pig Bodine tagged along. I got a fish, said Pig. I would like to give payola here, here, which Profane resented. They moseyed by Wall Street and watched the boards of a few brokers. They walked uptown as far as Central Park. This took them till mid-afternoon. They dug a traffic light for an hour. They went into a bar and watched a soap opera on TV. They came rollicking in late. Rachel was gone. Out came Paola, though, sleepy-eyed, benight-gowned. Pig began to shuffle furrows in the rug. Oh, seeing Pig. You can put coffee on, she yawned. I'm going back to bed. Right, Pig muttered. Right you are. And glaring at the small of her back, followed zombie-like to the bedroom and closed the door behind them. Soon Profane, making coffee, heard screams. What? He looked into the bedroom. Pig had managed to get a top payola and seemed linked to her pillow by a long string of drool which glittered in the fluorescent light from the kitchen. Help? Profane puzzled. Rape? Get this pig off of me, Paola yelled. Pig, hey, get off. I want to get laid, protested Pig. Off, said Profane. Up thine, snarled Pig with turpentine. Nope. So saying, Profane grabbed the big collar on Pig's jumper and pulled. You are strangling me, hey, said Pig after a while. True, said Profane, but I saved your life once, remember? Which was the case. Back in the scaffold days, Pig had long announced to anybody in Ship's company who'd listen his refusal ever to don a contraceptive unless it was a French tickler. This device being your common rubber, ornamented in bas-relief, often with a figurehead on the end, to stimulate female nerve ends not stimulated by the usual means. From Kingston, Jamaica, last cruise, Pig had brought back fifty Jumbo the Elephant and fifty Mickey Mouse French ticklers. The night finally came when Pig ran out, his last having been expended in the memorable battle with his one-time colleague, Knoop, Lieutenant J.G., a week before on the scaffold's bridge. Pig and his friend Hiroshima, the electronics technician, had a going thing on the beach with radio tubes. ETs on a destroyer like the scaffold keep their own inventory of electronic components. Hiroshima could therefore finagle 
which as soon as he'd found a discreet outlet in downtown Norfolk, he proceeded to do. Every so often Hiroshima would heist a few tubes, and Pig would stow them in an AWOL bag and run them ashore. One night Knoop had OOD watch. All an OOD usually does is stand on the quarterdeck and salute people going on and off. He is also a sort of monitor, making sure that everybody leaves with their neckerchief straight, fly-zipped, and wearing their own uniform. Also that nobody is swiping anything from the ship or bringing anything on board they shouldn't. Lately, old Knoop had been getting hawk-eyed. How he served the drunken yeoman— who had two grooves worn bare in the hair of his leg from adhesive-taping pints of various booze under one bell-bottom by way of providing the crew with something tastier than torpedo juice, had almost made it the two steps from quarterdeck to ship's office when Knoop, like a Siamese boxer, fetched him an agile kick in the calf. And there stood Howie, with Shenley reserve and blood running over his best liberty shoes. Knoop, of course, crowed in triumph. He'd also caught Profane trying to take over five pounds of hamburger swiped from the galley. Profane escaped legal action by splitting the loot with Knoop, who was having marital difficulties and had somehow come up with the notion that two and a half pounds of hamburger might serve as a peace offering. So only a few nights after that, Pig was understandably nervous, trying simultaneously to salute, produce ID and liberty cards, and keep one eye on Knoop and another on the tube-laden AWOL bag. "'Request permission to go ashore, sir, hey?' said Pig. "'Permission granted. What is in the AWOL bag?' "'In the AWOL bag?' "'That one, yes. What is in it?' Pig pondered. "'Change of skivvies?' suggested Knoop. "'Douche kit? Magazine to read? Dirty laundry for Mom to wash?' Now that you mention it, Mr. Knoop. Radio tubes also? What? Open the bag. I would like, I think, said Pig, maybe to just dash in ship's office there for a minute to read the naval regulations, sir, and see if maybe what you are ordering me to do might not be a little, how would you say it, illegal. Grinning horribly, Knoop made a sudden leap in the air and came down square on the AWOL bag, which went crunch, tinkle in a sickening way. Aha, said Knoop. Pig came up for captain's mast a week later and got restricted. Hiroshima was never mentioned. Normally larceny of this sort is rewarded with a court-martial, the brig, a dishonorable discharge, all of which strengthen morale. It seemed, however, that the scaffold's old man, one C. Osric Lick, commander, had gathered round him an inner circle of enlisted men, all of whom you could call habitual offenders. This troop included Babyface Phalange, the machinist mate striker, who periodically would put on a babushka and let the members of the A-gang line up in the compartment to pinch his cheek, Lazar, the deck ape who wrote foul sayings on the Confederate monument downtown and was usually brought back off liberty in a straitjacket. Tiladu, his friend, who, one time avoiding a work detail, had gone to hide in a refrigerator, decided he liked it and lived there for two weeks on raw eggs and frozen hamburger until the master-at-arms and a posse dragged him away. And Groomsman, the quartermaster, whose second home was sick bay, being as how he was constantly infested by a breed of crabs which unhappily only thrived on the chief corpsman's super-formula crab killer. The captain, having seen this element of the crew at every mast, came to look on them fondly as his boys. He pulled strings and indulged in all manner of extra-legal procedure to keep them in the Navy and on board the scaffold. Pig, being a charter member of the captain's, so to speak, own men, got off with no liberty for a month. Time soon hung heavy, so it was, of course, toward the crab-ridden groomsman that Pig gravitated. Groomsman was the agent in Pig's near-fatal involvement with the airline stewardesses Hanky and Panky, who, along with half a dozen more of their kind, shared a large pad out near Virginia Beach. The night after Pig's restriction ended, Groomsman took him out there after stopping by a state liquor store for booze. Well, it was Panky Pig went for, Hanky being Groomsman's girl. Pig, after all, had a code. 
He never did find out their real names, though did it make any difference? They were virtually interchangeable, both unnatural blondes, both between twenty-one and twenty-seven, between five feet two inches and five feet seven inches, weights in proportion, clear complexions, no eyeglasses or contact lenses. They read the same magazines, shared the same toothpaste, soap, and deodorant, swapped civilian clothes when off duty. One night Pig did, in fact, end up in bed with Hanky. Next morning he pretended to have been drunk out of his mind. Groomsman was apologized too easily enough, having it turned out hit the sack with Panky under the same misapprehension. Things cruised along all idyllic. Spring and summer brought hordes to the beach and shore patrolmen now and again to shea Hanky Panky to quell riots and stay for coffee. It came out under incessant questioning by groomsmen that there was something Panky did during the act of love which turned Pig, as Pig put it, on. What this was, nobody ever found out. Pig, not normally reticent in these matters, now acted like a mystic after a vision, unable, maybe unwilling, to put in words this ineffable or supernal talent of Panky's. Whatever it was, it drew Pig out to Virginia Beach all his liberty in a few duty nights. One duty night, scaffold-bound, he wandered down to C&O compartment after the movie to find the quartermaster swinging from the overhead, whooping like an ape. After shave lotion, groomsman yelled down to Pig, is the only thing that gets to the little bastards. Pig winced. They get drunk on it and fall asleep. He descended to tell Pig about his crabs, having lately developed the theory that they held barn dances among the forest of his pubic hair on Saturday nights. Enough, said Pig. What about our club? This was the prisoners at large and restricted men's club, formed recently for the purpose of hatching plots against Knoop, who was also Groomsman's division officer. One thing, Groomsman said, that Knoop cannot stand is water. He can't swim, he owns three umbrellas. They discussed ways of exposing Knoop to water, short of throwing him over the side. A few hours after lights out, Lazar and Tiladu joined the plot after a blackjack game, payday stakes, in the mess hall. Both had been losers— as were all the captain's men. They had a fifth of old stag conned from how he served. Saturday, Knoop had the duty. At sundown, the Navy has this tradition called evening colors, which around the convoy escort piers in Norfolk is impressive. Looking at it from any destroyer's bridge, you would see all motion, a foot and vehicular stop. Everyone come to attention, turn and salute the American flags going down on dozens of fantails. Knoop had the first dog watch, 4 to 6 p.m., as O.O.D. Groomsman was to pass the word, Now on deck, attention to colors. The destroyer tender USS Mammoth Cave, alongside which the scaffold and its division were moored, had recently acquired a trumpet player from shore duty in Washington, D.C., so tonight there was even a bugle to play retreat. Meanwhile, Pig was lying on top of the pilot house, a pile of curious objects beside him. Tiladu was down at the water tap after the pilot house, filling up rubbers, among them Pig's French ticklers, and passing them to Lazar, who was putting them next to Pig. Now on deck, said Groomsman. From over the way came the first note of taps. A few tin cans down the line, jumping the gun, started lowering their own flags. Out on the bridge came Knoop to supervise. Attention to colors! Splat went a rubber two inches from Knoop's foot. Uh-oh, said Pig. Get him while he's still saluting, Lazar whispered frantic. The second rubber landed on Knoop's hat intact. From out of the corner of one eye, Pig saw that great nightly immobility, dyed orange by the sun, gripped the entire C.E. Piers area. The bugle knew what he was doing and played taps clear and strong. The third rubber missed completely going over the side. Pig had the shakes. I can't hit him, he kept saying. Lazar, exasperated, had picked up two and fled. Traitor, Pig snarled and threw one after him. Aha, said Lazar from down among the three-inch mounts and lobbed one back at Pig. Bugle blew a riff. Carry on, said Groomsman. Knoop brought his right hand smartly to his side and with his left removed the water-filled rubber from his hat. 
He started calmly up the ladder on the pilot house after Pig. The first person he saw was Tiladu, crouching by the water tap, still filling rubbers. Down on the torpedo deck, Pig and Lazar were having a water fight, chasing each other among the grey tubes now highlighted vermilion by the sunset. Arming himself with the stockpile Pig had abandoned, Knoop joined the struggle. They ended up drenched, exhausted, and swearing mutual fealty. Groomsmen even named Knoop to honorary membership in the PAL and Restricted Men's Club. The reconciliation came as a surprise to Pig, who'd expected to get the book thrown at him. He felt let down and saw no other way to improve his outlook but to get laid. Unfortunately, he was now afflicted by contraceptivelessness. He tried to borrow a few. It was that horrible and cheerless time just before payday when everybody is out of everything, money, cigarettes, soap, and especially rubbers, much less French ticklers. God, moaned Pig, what do I do? To his rescue came Hiroshima, E.T. 3. Didn't anybody ever tell you, said this worthy, about the biological effects of RF energy? What? said Pig. Stand in front of the radar antenna, said Hiroshima, while it is radiating, and what it will do is it will make you temporarily sterile. Indeed, said Pig. Indeed. Hiroshima showed him a book which said so. I am scared of heights, said Pig. It is the only way out, Hiroshima told him. What you do is you climb up the mast, and I will go light off the old SPA-4 Abel. Already tottering, Pig made his way topside and prepared to climb the mast. Howie Sert had come along and solicitously offered a shot of something murky in an unlabeled bottle. On the way up, Pig passed Profane swinging like a bird in a bosun's chair hooked to the spar. Profane was painting the mast. dum de dum de dum sang Profane. Good afternoon, Pig. My old buddy, thought Pig. His are probably the last words I will ever hear. Hiroshima appeared below. Yo, pig, he yelled. Pig made the mistake of looking down. Hiroshima gave him the thumb and index finger in a circle sign. Pig felt like vomiting. What are you doing in this neck of the woods, Profane said. Oh, just out for a stroll, said Pig. I see you are painting the mast there. Right, said Profane. Deck gray. They examined at length the subject of the scaffold's color scheme, as well as the long-standing jurisdictional dispute which had profane a decade painting the mast when it was really the radar gang's responsibility. Hiroshima and Sird, impatient, started yelling. Well, said Pig, goodbye, old buddy. Be careful walking around on that platform, profane said. I robbed some more hamburger out of the galley and stowed it up there. I figure on sneaking it off over the O-1 deck. Pig, nodding, creaked slowly up the ladder. At the top, he latched his nose over the platform like Kilroy and cased the situation. There was Profane's hamburger, all right. Pig started to climb on the platform when his ultra-sensitive nose detected something. He lifted it off the deck. How remarkable! said Pig out loud. It smells like hamburger frying. He looked a little closer at Profane's cash. Guess what, he said, and started backing quickly down the ladder. When he got level with Profane, he yelled over, Buddy, you just saved my life. You got a piece of line? What are you going to do, said Profane, tossing him a piece of line. Hang yourself? Pig made a noose on one end and headed up the ladder again. After a couple three tries, he managed to snare the hamburger, pulled it over, dragged off his white hat, and dumped the hamburger in it, being careful all the time to stay as much as he could out of any line of sight with the radar antenna. Down at Profane again, he showed him the hamburger. Amazing, Profane said. How did you do it? Someday, Pig said, I will have to tell you about the biological effects of RF energy. And so saying inverted the white hat in the direction of Hiroshima and how he served, showering them both with cooked hamburger. Anything you want, Pig said then. Just ask, buddy. I have a code and I don't forget. Okay. 
Profane said a few years later, standing by Paola's bed in an apartment on Nueva York's 112th Street and twisting Pig's collar a little, I'm collecting that one now. A code is a code, Pig choked. Off he got and fled sadly. When he was gone, Paola reached out for Profane, drew him down and in against her. No, said Profane. I'm always saying no, but no. You have been gone so long, so long since our bus ride. Who says I'm back? Rachel? She held his head, nothing but maternal. There is her, yes, but... She waited. Anyway, I say it is nasty, but I'm not looking for any dependents, is all. You have them, she whispered. No, he thought. She's out of her head. Not me. Not a schlemiel. Then why did you make Pig go away? He thought about that one for a few weeks. Two. All things gathered to farewell. One afternoon close to the time Profane was to embark for Malta, he happened to be down around Houston Street, his old neighborhood. It was cooler, fall. Dark came earlier, and little kids out playing stoop ball were about to call it a day. For no special reason, Profane decided to look in on his parents. Around two corners and up the stairs, past apartments of Basiliska, the cop whose wife left garbage in the hallway, past Miss Angevine, who was in business in a small way, past the Venusbergs, whose fat daughter had always tried to lure young Profane into the bathroom, past Maxix of the Drunk and Flake the Sculptor and his girl, and old Mindicasta, who kept orphan mice and was a practicing witch. Past his past, though who knew it? Not profane. Standing before his old door, he knocked, though knowing from the sound of it, like we can tell from the buzz and the phone receiver whether or not she's home, that inside was empty. So soon, of course, he tried the knob, having come this far. They never locked doors. On the other side of this one, he wandered automatic into the kitchen to check the table. A ham, a turkey, a roast beef, fruit, grapes, oranges, a pineapple, plums, plate of knishes, bowl of almonds and Brazil nuts, string of garlic tossed like a rich lady's necklace across fresh bunches of fennel, rosemary, tarragon, a brace of bacali, dead eyes directed at a huge provolone, a pale yellow parmesan, and God knew how many fish cousins, gefilte, in an ice bucket. No, his mother wasn't telepathic. She wasn't expecting profane. Wasn't expecting her husband, Gino. Rain, poverty, anything. Only that she had this compulsion to feed. Profane was sure that the world would be worse off without mothers like that in it. He stayed in the kitchen an hour while night came along, wandering through this field of inanimate food, making bits and pieces of it animate, his own. Soon it was dark, and the baked outsides of meats, the skins of fruits only highlighted all shiny by light from the apartment across the courtyard. Rain started falling. He left. They would know he'd been by. Profane whose nights were now free, decided he could afford to frequent the rusty spoon and the forked yew without serious compromise. Ben, Rachel yelled, this is putting me down. Since the night he was fired from Anthro Research Associates, it seemed he'd been trying every way he knew to put her down. Why won't you let me get you a job? It is September. College kids are fleeing the city. The labor market was never better. Call it a vacation, said Profane. But how do you swing a vacation from two dependents? Before anyone knew it, there was Profane, full-fledged crew member. Under the tutelage of charisma and foo, he learned how to use proper nouns, how not to get too drunk, keep a straight face, use marijuana. Rachel, running in a week later, I smoked pot. Get out of here. What? You are turning into a phony, said Rachel. You're not interested in what it's like. I have smoked pot. It is a stupid business, like masturbation. If you get kicks that way, fine, but not around me. It was only once, only for the experience. Once, I will say it, is all. That crew does not live, it experiences. It does not create, it talks about people who do. Varez, 
Ionesco, de Kooning, Wittgenstein. I could puke. It satirizes itself and doesn't mean it. Time magazine takes it seriously and does mean it. It's fun. And you are becoming less of a man. He was still high, too high to argue. Off he rollicked in train with charisma and foo. Rachel locked herself in the bathroom with a portable radio and bawled for a while. Somebody was singing the old standard about how you always hurt the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. Indeed, thought Rachel, but does Benny even love me? I love him, I think. There's no reason why I should. She kept crying. So near one in the morning she was at the spoon with her hair hanging straight, dressed in black, no makeup except for mascara and sad raccoon rings round her eyes, looking like all those other women and girls, camp followers. Benny, she said, I'm sorry. And later, you don't have to try not to hurt me. Only come home, with me, to bed. And much later at her apartment, facing the wall, you don't even have to be a man. Only pretend to love me. None of which made Profane feel any better, but it didn't stop him going to the spoon. One night at the Forked U, he and Stencil got juiced. Stencil is leaving the country, Stencil said. He apparently wanted to talk. I wish I was leaving the country. Young Stencil, old Machiavel. Soon he had Profane talking about his women problems. I don't know what Paola wants. You know her better. Do you know what she wants? An embarrassing question for Stencil. He dodged. Aren't you two... How shall one say? No, Profane said. No, no. But Stencil was there again next evening. Truth of it is, he admitted, Stencil can't handle her, but you can. Don't talk, said Profane. Drink. Hours later they were both out of their heads. You wouldn't consider coming along with them, Stencil wondered. I've been there once. Why should I want to go back? But didn't Valletta somehow get to you? Make you feel anything? I went down to the gut and got drunk like everybody else. I was too drunk to feel anything. Which eased Stencil. He was scared to death of Valletta. He'd feel better with profane anybody else along on this jaunt. A, to take care of Paola. B, so he wouldn't be alone. Shame, said his conscience. Old Sidney went in there with the cards stacked against him, alone. And look what he got, thought Stencil, a little wry, a little shaky. On the offensive, where do you belong, profane? Wherever I am. Deracinated, which of them is not? Which of this crew couldn't pick up tomorrow and go off to Malta, go off to the moon? Ask them why, and they'll answer why not. I could not care less about Valletta. But hadn't there been something, after all, about the bombed-out buildings, buff-colored rubble, excitement of Kingsway? What had Paola called the island? A cradle of life. I have always wanted to be buried at sea, said Profane. Had Stencil seen the coupling in that associative train, he would have gathered heart of grace, surely. But Paola and he had never spoken of Profane, who, after all, was profane. Until now. They decided to rollick off to a party on Jefferson Street. Next day was Saturday. Early morning found Stencil rushing around to his contacts, informing them all of a third tentative passage. The third passage, meanwhile, was horribly hungover. His girl was having more than second thoughts. Why do you go to the spoon, Benny? Why not? She edged up on one elbow. That's the first time you've said that. You break your cherry on something every day. Without thinking. What about love? When are you going to end your virgin status there, Ben? In reply, Profane fell out of bed, crawled to the bathroom, and hung over the toilet, thinking about barfing. Rachel clasped hands in front of one breast like a concert soprano. My man. Profane decided instead to make noises at himself in the mirror. She came up behind him, hair all down and straggly for the night, and set her cheek against his back, as Paola had on the Newport News ferry last winter. Profane inspected his teeth. Get off my back, 
he said, still holding on. So, only smoked pot once, and already he's hooked. Is that your monkey talking? It's me talking. Off. She moved away. How off is off, Ben? Things were quiet then. Soft, penitent. If I am hooked on anything, it's you, Rachel O. Watching her shifty in the mirror. On women, she said. On what you think love is. Take, take. Not on me. He started brushing his teeth fiercely. In the mirror, as she watched, there bloomed a great flower of leprous-colored foam out of his mouth and down both sides of his chin. You want to go, she yelled. Go, then. He said something, but around the toothbrush and through the foam, neither could understand the words. You are scared of love, and all that means is somebody else, she said. As long as you don't have to give anything, be held to anything, sure, you can talk about love. Anything you have to talk about isn't real. It's only a way of putting yourself up. And anybody who tries to get through to you, me, down. Profane made gurgling noises in the sink, drinking out of the tap, flushing out his mouth. Look, coming up for air. What did I tell you? Didn't I warn you? People can change. Couldn't you make the effort? She was damned as she'd cry. I don't change. Schlemiel's don't change. Oh, that makes me sick. Can't you stop feeling sorry for yourself? You've taken your own flabby, clumsy soul and amplified it into a universal principle. What about you and that M.G.? What does that have to do with any... You know what I always thought. That you were an accessory. That you, flesh, you'd fall apart sooner than the car. That the car would go on, in a junkyard even, it would look like it always had and it would have to be a thousand years before that thing could rust so you wouldn't recognize it. But old Rachel, she'd be long gone. A part, a cheesy part like a radio, heater, windshield wiper blade. She looked upset. He pushed it. I only started to think about being a schlemiel, about a world of things that had to be watched out for, after I saw you alone with the M.G., I didn't even stop to think it might be perverted what I was watching. All I was was scared. Showing how much you know about girls. He started scratching his head, sending wide flakes of dandruff showering about the bathroom. Slab was my first. None of those tweed jock straps at Schlotz hours got any more than bare hand. Don't you know, poor Ben, that a young girl has to take out her virginity on something? A pet parakeet, a car? though most of the time on herself? No, he said, his hair all in clumps, fingernails gone yellow with dead scalp. There's more. Don't try to get out of it that way. You're not a schlemiel. You're nobody special. Everybody is some kind of a schlemiel. Only come out of that scungile shell and you'd see. He stood, pear-shaped, bags under the eyes, all forlorn. What do you want? How much are you out to get? Isn't this, he waved at her, an inanimate schmuck, enough? It can't be. Not for me, nor Paola. Where does she? Anywhere you go, there'll always be a woman for Benny. Let it be a comfort, always a hole to let yourself come in without fear of losing any of that precious schlemielhood. She stomped around the room. All right, we're all hookers. Our price is fixed and single for everything. Straight French round the world. Can you pay it, honey? Bare brain, bare heart? If you think me and Paola, you and anybody, until that thing doesn't work anymore, a whole line of them, some better than me, but all just as stupid. We can all be conned because we've all got one of these, touching her crotch, and when it talks, we listen. She was on the bed. Come on, baby, she said, too close to crying. This one's for free, for love. Climb on. Good stuff, no charge. Absurdly, he thought of Hiroshima, the electronics technician, reciting a mnemonic guide for resistor color coding. Bad boys rape our young girls behind victory garden walls, or but Violet gives willingly. Good stuff, no charge. Could any of their resistances be measured in ohms? Someday, please God, there would be an all-electronic woman. Maybe her name would be Violet. 
Any problems with her, you could look it up in the maintenance manual. Module concept, fingers weight, heart's temperature, mouth's size out of tolerance. Remove and replace was all. He climbed on anyway. That night at the Spoon, things were louder than usual, despite Mafia's being in stir and a few of the crew out on bail and their best behavior. Saturday night toward the end of the dog days, after all. Near closing time, Stencil approached Profane, who'd been drinking all night, but for some reason was still sober. Stencil heard you and Rachel are having difficulties. Don't start. Paola told him. Rachel told her, fine, buy me a beer. Paola loves you, Profane. You think that impresses me? What is your act, Ace? Young Stencil sighed. Along came a bartender's rinky-dink, yelling, Time, gentlemen, please. Anything properly English like that went over well with the whole sick crew. Time for what? Stencil mused. More words, more beer. Another party, another girl. In short, no time for anything of importance. Profane. Stencil has a problem. A woman. Indeed, said Profane. That's unusual. I never heard of anything like that before. Come. Walk. I can't help you. Be an heir. It's all he needs. Outside, walking up Hudson Street. Stencil doesn't want to go to Malta. He is, quite simply, afraid. Since 1945, you see, he's been on a private manhunt. Or woman hunt, no one is sure. Why? said Profane. Why not? said Stencil. His giving you any clear reason would mean he'd already found her. Why does one decide to pick up one girl in a bar over another? If one knew why, she would never be a problem. Why do wars start? If one knew why, there would be eternal peace. So in this search, the motive is part of the quarry. Stencil's father mentioned her in his journals. This was near the turn of the century. Stencil became curious in 1945. Was it boredom? Was it that old Sidney had never said anything of use to his son? Or was it something buried in the sun that needed a mystery, any sense of pursuit to keep active a borderline metabolism? Perhaps he feeds on mystery. But he stayed off Malta. He had pieces of thread, clues, Young Stencil has been in all her cities, chased her down till faulty memories or vanished buildings defeated him. All her cities but Valletta. His father died in Valletta. He tried to tell himself meeting V and dying were separate and unconnected for Sydney. Not so, because all along the first thread from a young crude Matahari act in Egypt, as always in no one's employ but her own, while Fashoda tossed sparks in search of a fuse, until 1913, when she knew she'd done all she could and so took time out for love. All that while, something monstrous had been building. Not the war, nor the socialist tide which brought us Soviet Russia. Those were symptoms, that's all. They'd turned into 14th Street and were walking east. More bums came roving by the closer they got to 3rd Avenue. Some nights, 14th Street can be the widest street with the tallest wind in the earth. Not even as if she were any cause, any agent. She was only there. But being there was enough, even as a symptom. Of course, Stencil could have chosen the war or Russia to investigate, but he doesn't have that much time. He is a hunter. You are expecting to find this chick in Malta, Profane said. Or how your father died, or something? What? How does Stencil know? Stencil yelled. How does he know what he'll do once he finds her? Does he want to find her? They're all stupid questions. He must go to Malta, preferably with somebody along. You. That again. He's afraid. Because if she went there to wait out one war, a war she'd not started, but whose etiology was also her own, a war which came least as a surprise to her. Then perhaps, too, she was there during the first, there to meet old Sydney at its end. Paris for love, Malta for war. If so, then now, of all times. You think there'll be a war? Perhaps. 
You've been reading the newspapers. Profane's newspaper reading was, in fact, confined to glancing at the front page of the New York Times. If there was no banner headline on that paper, then the world was in good enough shape. The Middle East, cradle of civilization, may yet be its grave. If he must go to Malta, it can't be only with Paola. He can't trust her. He needs someone to occupy her, to serve his buffer zone, if you will. That could be anybody. You said the crew was at home anywhere. Why not Raoul, Slab, Melvin? It's you she loves. Why not you? Why not? You are not of the crew, Profane. You have stayed out of that machine all August. No. No, it was Rachel. You stayed out of it. And a sly smile. Profane looked away. So they went up Third Avenue, drowned in the street's great wind, all flapping in Irish pennants. Stencil yarned, told Profane of a whorehouse in Nice with mirrors on the ceiling where he thought once he'd found his V. Told of his mystical experience before a plastered death cast of Chopin's hand in the Cell de Museo in Mallorca. There was no difference, he caroled, causing two strolling bums to laugh along with him. That was all. Chopin had a plaster hand. Profane shrugged. The bums tagged along. She stole an airplane, an old spad, the kind young Godolphin crashed in. God, what a flight it must have been. From Le Havre, over the Bay of Biscay, to somewhere in the back country of Spain. The officer on duty only remembered a fierce, what did he call her, Hussar, who came rushing by in a red field cape, glaring out of a glass eye in the shape of a clock, as if I'd been fixed by the evil eye of time itself. Disguise is one of her attributes. In Mallorca, she spent at least a year as an old fisherman who evenings would smoke dried seaweed in a pipe and tell the children stories of gun-running in the Red Sea. Rambo, suggested one of the bums. Did she know Rambo as a child? Drift up country at age three or four, through that district and its trees festooned gray and scarlet with crucified English corpses? Act as lucky mascot to the modists? Live in Cairo and take Sir Alistair Wren for a lover when she came of age? Who knows? Stencil would rather depend on the imperfect vision of humans for his history. Somehow government reports, bar graphs, mass movements are too treacherous. Stencil, Profane announced, you are juiced. True. Autumn coming on was cold enough to have sobered Profane, but Stencil appeared drunk on something else. V in Spain. V on Crete. V crippled in Corfu, a partisan in Asia Minor. Giving tango lessons in Rotterdam, she had commanded the rain to stop. It had. Dressed in tights, adorned with two Chinese dragons, she handed swords, balloons, and colored handkerchiefs to Ugo Medicevole, a minor magician, for one lustless summer in the Roman Campania. And, learning quickly, found time to perform a certain magic of her own. For one morning, Medicevole was found out in a field, discussing the shadows of clouds with his sheep. His hair had become white, his mental age roughly five. V had fled. It went on like this all the way up into the seventies, this progress of four. Stencil caught up in a compulsive yarning, the others listening with interest. It wasn't that Third Avenue was any kind of drunk's confessional. Did Stencil, like his father, suffer some private leeriness about Valletta, foresee some submersion against his will in a history too old for him? or at least of a different order from what he'd known? Probably not. Only that he was on the verge of a major farewell. If it hadn't been profane and the two bombs, it would have been somebody. Cop, barkeep, girl. Stencil, that way, had left pieces of himself, and V, all over the Western world. V, by this time, was a remarkably scattered concept. 
Stencil's going to Malta like a nervous groom to matrimony. It is a marriage of convenience arranged by fortune, father and mother to everyone. Perhaps fortune even cares about the success of these things, wants one to look after it in its old age, which struck profane as outright foolish. Somehow they had wandered over by Park Avenue. The two bums, sensing unfamiliar territory, veered away toward the west and the park. Toward what assignation? Stencil said, Should one bring a peace offering? What? Box of candy? Flowers? Ha, ha. Stencil knows just the thing, said Stencil. They were before Eigenvalue's office building. Intention or accident? Stay here in the street, Stencil said. He won't be but a minute. And vanished into the lobby of the building. Simultaneously, a prowl car appeared a few blocks uptown, turned and headed downtown on Park Avenue. Profane started walking. Car passed him and didn't stop. Profane got to the corner and turned west. By the time he'd walked all around the block, Stencil was at a top-floor window, yelling down, Come on up. You have to help. I have to... You are out of your head, impatient. Come up, before the police get back. Profane stood outside for a minute, counting floors. Nine. Shrugged, went inside the lobby and took the self-service elevator up. Can you pick a lock? Stencil asked. Profane laughed. Fine. You will have to go in a window, then. Stencil rummaged in the broom closet and came up with a length of line. Me, said Profane. They started up to the roof. This is important, Stencil was pleading. Suppose you were enemies with someone, but had to see him, her. Wouldn't you try to make it as painless as you could? They reached a point on the roof directly above Eigenvalue's office. Profane looked down into the street. You, with exaggerated gestures, are going to put me over that wall with no fire escape there, to open that window, right? Stencil nodded. So, back to the bosun's chair for profane. Though this time no pig to save, no goodwill to cash in on, there'd be no reward from Stencil because there's no honor among second or ninth story men, because Stencil was more a bum than he. They looped the line round profane's middle, he being so shapeless, it was difficult to locate any center of gravity. Stencil gave the line a few turns around a TV antenna. Profane climbed over the edge, and they began to lower away. How is it? Stencil said after a while. Except for those three cops down there who are looking at me, sort of fishy. The line jerked. Ha ha, said Profane. Made you look. Not that his mood tonight was suicidal. But with the inanimate line, antenna, building, and street nine floors below, what common sense could he have? The center of gravity calculation, it turned out, was way off. As Profane inched down toward Eigenvalue's window, his body's attitude slowly tilted from nearly vertical to face down and parallel with the street. Hanging thus in the air, it occurred to him to practice an Australian crawl. Dear God, muttered Stencil. He tugged at the line, impatient. Soon profane, a dim figure looking like a quadruply amputated octopus, stopped flailing around. Then he hung still in the air, pondering. Hey, he called after a while. Stencil said what? Pull me back up, hurry. Wheezing, feeling his middle age acutely, Stencil began hauling in line. It took him ten minutes. Profane appeared and hung his nose over the edge of the roof. What's wrong? You forgot to tell me what it was I was supposed to do when I got in the window. Stencil only looked at him. Oh. Oh, you mean I open the door for you. And you lock it when you go out, they recited together. Profane flipped a salute. Carry on. Stencil began lowering again. Down at the window, Profane called up. Stencil, hey. The window won't open. Stencil took a few half hitches round the antenna. Break it, he gritted. All at once, another police car, sirens screaming, lights flashing round and round, came tearing down Park. 
Stencil ducked behind the roof's low wall. The car kept going. Stencil waited till it was way downtown, out of earshot. And a minute or so more. Then arose cautiously and looked after Profane. Profane was horizontal again. He'd covered his head with his suede jacket and showed no signs of moving. "'What are you doing?' said Stencil. "'Hiding,' said Profane. "'How about a little torque?' Stencil turned the rope. Profane's head slowly began to rotate away from the building. When he came around to where he was facing straight out like a gargoyle, Profane kicked in the window, a crash horrible and deafening in that night. "'Now the other way.' He got the window open, climbed inside, and unlocked for Stencil. Wasting no time, Stencil proceeded through a train of rooms to the museum, forced open the case, slipped that set of false teeth wrought from all precious metals into a coat pocket. From another room he heard more glass breaking. What the hell? Profane looked around. One pane broken is crude, he explained, because that looks like a burglary. So I am breaking a few more, is all, so it won't be too suspicious. Back on the street, scot-free, they followed the bum's way into Central Park. It was two in the morning. In the wilds of that skinny rectangle, they found a rock near a stream. Stencil sat down and produced the teeth. The booty, he announced. It's yours. What do I need with more teeth? Especially these more dead than the half-alive hardware in his mouth now. Decent of you, Profane, helping Stencil like that. Yeah, Profane agreed. Part of a moon was out. The teeth, lying on the sloping rock, beamed at their reflection in the water. All manner of life moved in the dying shrubbery around them. Is your name Neil? inquired a male voice. Yes. I saw your note. In the men's room of the Port Authority Terminal, third stall in the... Oh, thought Profane. That had cop written all over it. With the picture of your sexual organ. Actual size. There is one thing, said Neil, that I like better than having homosexual intercourse, and that is knocking the shit out of a wise cop. There was then a soft clobbering sound, followed by the plainclothesman's crash into the underbrush. "'What day is it?' somebody asked. "'Say, what day is it?' Out there something had happened, probably atmospheric, but the moon shone brighter. The number of objects and shadows in the park seemed to multiply, warm white, warm black. A band of juvenile delinquents marched by singing. "'Look at the moon,' one of them called." A used contraceptive came floating along the stream. A girl, built like a garbage truck driver and holding in one hand a sodden brazier which trailed behind her, trudged after the rubber head down. Somewhere else a traveling clock chimed seven. It is Tuesday, said an old man's voice, half asleep. It was Saturday. But about the night park... Near deserted and cold was somehow a sense of population and warmth and high noon. The stream made a curious half-cracking, half-ringing sound, like the glass of a chandelier in a wintry drawing-room when all the heat is turned off suddenly and forever. The moon shivered, impossibly bright. "'How quiet,' said Stencil. "'Quiet? It's like the shuttle at 5 p.m. "'No.' Nothing at all is happening in here. So what year is it? It is 1913, said Stencil. Why not, said Profane. Chapter 14 V in Love V1 The clock inside the Garde du Nord read 1117, Paris time minus five minutes. Belgian railway time plus four minutes, Mid-Europe time, minus fifty-six minutes. To Melanie, who had forgotten her traveling clock, who had forgotten everything, the hands might have stood anywhere. She hurried through the station behind an Algerian-looking facteur who carried her one embroidered bag lightly on his shoulder, who smiled and joked with customs officials being driven slowly to frenzy by a beseeching mob of English tourists. 
By the cover of Le Soleil, the Orleanist morning paper, it was 24 July 1913. Louis-Philippe Robert Duc d'Orléans was the current pretender. Certain quarters of Paris raved under the heat of Sirius, were touched by its halo of plague, which is nine light years from rim to center. Among the upper rooms of a new middle-class home in the 17th arrondissement, Black Mass was held every Sunday. Mélanie Lermaudy was driven away down the Rue Lafayette in a noisy auto-taxi. She sat in the exact center of the seat, while behind her the three massive arcades and seven allegorical statues of the gar slowly receded into a lowering pre-autumn sky. Her eyes were dead, her nose French. The strength there and about the chin and lips made her resemble the classical rendering of liberty— in all, the face was quite beautiful, except for the eyes, which were the color of freezing rain. Melanie was fifteen. Had fled from school in Belgium as soon as she received the letter from her mother with fifteen hundred francs and the announcement that her support would continue, though all papa's possessions had been attached by the court. The mother had gone off to tour Austria-Hungary. She did not expect to see Melanie in the foreseeable future. Melanie's head ached, but she didn't care, or did, but not where she was, here present as a face and a ballerina's figure on the bouncing back seat of a taxi. The driver's neck was soft, white. Wisps of white hair straggled from under the blue stocking cap. On reaching the intersection with the boulevard Haussmann, the car turned right up Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. To her left, rose the dome of the opéra, and tiny Apollo with his golden lyre. Papa, she screamed. The driver winced, tapped the brake reflexively. I am not your father, he muttered. Up into the heights of Montmartre, aimed for the most diseased part of the sky. Would it rain? The clouds hung like leprous tissue. Under that light, the color of her hair reduced to neutral browns, buffs. Let down, the hair reached halfway over her buttocks, but she wore it high with two large curls covering her ears, tickling the sides of her neck. Papa had a strong, bald skull and a brave mustache. Evening, she would come softly into the room, the mysterious place walled in silk where he and her mother slept. And while Madeleine combed the hair of Maman in the other room, Mélanie lay on the wide bed beside him while he touched her in many places— and she squirmed and fought not to make a sound. It was their game. One night there had been heat lightning outside, and a small night bird had lit on the windowsill and watched them. How long ago it seemed. Late summer, like today. This had been at Serchaud, their estate in Normandy, once the ancestral home of a family whose blood had long since turned to a pale ichor, and vaporized away into the frosty skies over Amiens. The house, which dated from the reign of Henri IV, was large but unimpressive, like most architecture of the period. She had always wanted to slide down the great mansard roof, begin at the top and skid down the first gentle slope. Her skirt would fly above her hips, her black stockinged legs would writhe mat against a wilderness of chimneys under the Norman sunlight. High over the elms and the hidden carp pools, up where Maman could only be a tiny blotch under a parasol gazing at her. She imagined the sensation often, the feeling of roof tiles rapidly sliding beneath the hard curve of her rump, the wind trapped under her blouse teasing the new breasts, and then the break— where the lower, steeper slope of the roof began, the point of no return, where the friction against her body would lessen and she would accelerate, flip over to twist the skirt, perhaps rip it off, be done with it, see it flutter away like a dark kite, to let the dove-tailed tiles tense her nipple points to an angry red, see a pigeon clinging to the eaves just before flight, taste the long hair caught against her teeth and tongue, cry out. The taxi stopped in front of a cabaret in the Rue Germain-Pilon, near Boulevard Clichy. Mélanie 
paid the fare and was handed her bag from the top of the cab. She felt something which might be the beginning of the rain against her cheek. The cab drove away. She stood before Le Neuf in an empty street, the flowered bag without gaiety under the clouds. You believed us, after all, Monsieur Etag stood half-stooping, holding the handle of the traveling bag. Come, fetiche, inside. There's news. On the small stage, which faced a dining room filled only with stacked tables and chairs and lit by uncertain August daylight, came the confrontation with Satin. Mademoiselle Jarretier, using her stage name. It was short and heavily built. The hair stuck out in tufts from each side of his head. He wore tights and a dress shirt, and directed his eyes parallel to a line connecting her hip points. The skirt was two years old. She was growing. She felt embarrassed. I have nowhere to stay, she murmured. Here, announced Itag. There's a back room. Here, until we move. Move? She gazed at the raving flesh of tropical blossoms decorating her bag. We have the Théâtre de Vincent Castor, cried Satin. He spun, leaped, landed atop a small stepladder. Itag grew excited, describing l'enlèvement des vierges chinoises, rape of the Chinese virgins. It was to be Satin's finest ballet, the greatest music of Vladimir Portsepitz, everything formidable. Rehearsals began tomorrow. She'd saved the day. They would have waited until the last minute because it could only be Mélanie, la jarretière, to play Su Feng, the virgin who is tortured to death, defending her purity against the invading Mongolians. She had wandered away to the edge of stage right. Itag stood in the center, gesturing, declaiming, while enigmatic on the stepladder, stage left, perched Satin, humming a music hall song. A remarkable innovation would be the use of automata to play Su Feng's handmaidens. A German engineer is building them, said Itag. They're lovely creatures. One will even unfasten your robes. Another will play a zither, although the music itself comes from the pit. But they move so gracefully, not like machines at all. Was she listening? Of course, part of her. She stood awkwardly on one leg, reached down and scratched her calf hot under its black stocking. Satin watched hungrily. She felt the twin curls moving restless against her neck. What was he saying? Automata. She gazed up at the sky through one of the room's side windows. God, would it ever rain? Her room was hot and airless. A sprawl in one corner was an artist's lay figure without a head. Old theater posters were scattered on the floor and bed tacked to the wall. She thought once she heard thunder rumbling from outside. Rehearsals will be here, Itag told her. Two weeks before the performance, we move into the Théâtre de Vincent Castor to get the feel of the boards. He used much theater talk. Not long ago, he'd been a bartender near Place Pigalle. Alone, she lay on the bed, wishing she could pray for rain. She was glad she couldn't see the sky. Perhaps certain of its tentacles already touched the roof of the cabaret. Someone rattled the door. She had thought to lock it. It was Satin, she knew. Soon she heard the Russian and Itag leave together by the back door. She may not have slept. Her eyes opened to the same dim ceiling. A mirror hung on the ceiling directly over the bed. She hadn't noticed it before. Deliberately, she moved her legs, leaving her arms limp at her sides till the hem of the blue skirt had worked high above the tops of the stockings and lay gazing at the black and tender white. Papa had said, How pretty your legs are, the legs of a dancer. She could not wait for the rain. She rose in a near frenzy, removed blouse, skirt, and undergarments, and moved swiftly to the door, wearing only the black stockings and white buck tennis shoes. 
Somewhere on the way, she managed to let down her hair. In the next room, she found the costumes for L'Enlèvement des Vierges Chinoises. She felt her hair heavy and almost viscous along the length of her back and tickling the tops of her buttocks as she knelt beside the large box and searched for the costume of Su Feng. Back in the hot room, she quickly removed shoes and stockings, keeping her eyes closed tight until she had fastened her hair in back with the spangled amber comb. She was not pretty unless she wore something. The sight of her nude body repelled her, until she had drawn on the blonde silk tights, embroidered up each leg with a long, slender dragon, stepped into the slippers with the cut steel buckles and intricate straps which writhed up halfway to her knees. Nothing to restrain her breasts, she wrapped the underskirt tightly around her hips. It fastened with thirty hooks and eyes from waist to thigh top, leaving a fur-trimmed slit so that she could dance. And finally, the kimono translucent and dyed rainbow-like with sunbursts and concentric rings of cerise, amethyst, gold, and jungly green. She lay back once more, hair spread above her on the pillowless mattress, breath taken by her own beauty. If Papa could see her! The lay figure in the corner was light and carried easily to the bed. She raised her knees high and, interested, saw her calves in the mirror, crisscross over the small of its plaster back, felt the coolness of the figure's flanks against the nude-colored silk high on her thighs, hugged it tight. The neck top, jagged and flaking off, came to her breasts. She pointed her toes, began to dance horizontal, thinking of how her handmaidens would be. Tonight there would be a magic lantern show. Itag sat outside Luganda, drinking absinthe and water. The stuff was supposed to be aphrodisiac, but it affected Itag the opposite. He watched a negro girl, one of the dancers, adjusting her stocking. He thought of Franks and Sontimes. There weren't many. The scheme might succeed. Port Sepitz had a name among the avant-garde in French music. Opinion in the city was violently divided. Once the composer had been loudly insulted in the street by one of the most venerable of the post-romantics. Certainly the man's personal life wasn't one to endear many prospective patrons either. Itag suspected him of smoking hashish, and there was the black mass. The poor child, Satan was saying. The table in front of him was nearly covered with empty wine glasses, the Russian moved them from time to time, blocking out the choreography to L'Enlèvement. Satin drank wine like a Frenchman, Itag thought, never outright falling down drunk, but growing more unstable, more nervous as his chorus of hollow glass dancers grew. Does she know where her father's gone? Satin wondered aloud, looking off into the street. The night was windless, hot darker than Itag could ever remember it. Behind them, the small orchestra began to play a tango. The negro girl arose and went inside. To the south, the lights along the Champs-Élysées picked out the underbelly of a nauseous yellow cloud. With the father deserted, said Itag, she's free. The mother doesn't care. The Russian looked up sudden. A glass fell over on his table. Or nearly free. Fled to the jungles, I understand, Satin said. A waiter brought more wine. A gift? What had he ever given before? Have you seen the child's furs, her silks, the way she watches her own body? Heard the noblesse in the way she speaks? He gave her all that. Or was he giving it all to himself by way of her? Itag... She certainly could be the most giving. No. No. It is merely being reflected. The girl functions as a mirror. You, that waiter, the chiffonier in the next empty street she turns into, whoever happens to be standing in front of the mirror in the place of that wretched man, you will see the reflection of a ghost. Monsieur Itag, 
Your late readings may have convinced you. I said ghost, Itag answered softly. Its name is not Le Maudit, or Le Maudit is only one of its names. That ghost fills the walls of this café and the streets of this district. Perhaps every one of the world's arrondissement breathes its substance. Cast in the image of what? Not God. Whatever potent spirit can mesmerize the gift of irreversible flight into a grown man and the gift of self-arousal into the eyes of a young girl, his name is unknown. Or if known, then he is Yahweh, and we are all Jews, for no one will ever speak it. Which was strong talk for Monsieur Itag. He read La Libre Parole, had stood among the crowds to spit at Captain Dreyfus. The woman stood at their table, not waiting for them to rise, merely standing and looking as if she'd never waited for anything. "'Will you join us?' said Satin eagerly. Itag looked far to the south at the hanging yellow cloud, which hadn't changed its shape. She owned a dress shop in the Rue du Quatre Septembre, wore tonight a Poiret-inspired evening dress of crepe georgette, the color of a negro's head, beaded all over, covered with a cerise tunic which was drawn in under her breasts, en pier style. A harem veil covered the lower part of her face and fastened behind to a tiny hat riotous with the plumage of equatorial birds. Fan with amber stick, ostrich feathers, silk tassel, Sand-colored stockings clocked exquisitely on the calf. Two brilliant-studded tortoiseshell pins through her hair. Silver mesh bag, high-buttoned kid shoes with patent leather at the toe and French heel. Who knew her soul? Itag wondered, glancing sideways at the Russian. It was her clothes, her accessories, which determined her, fixed her among the mobs of tourist ladies and putain that filled the street. Our prima ballerina has arrived today, said Itag. He was always nervous around patrons. As bartender, he'd seen no need to be diplomatic. Mélanie Le Maudit, his patroness smiled. When shall I meet her? Any time, Satin muttered, shifting glasses, keeping his eyes on the table. Was there objection from the mother? she asked. The mother did not care. The girl herself, he suspected, did not care. The father's flight had affected her in some curious way. Last year, she'd been eager to learn, inventive, creative. Satin would have his hands full this year, and they would end up screaming at each other. No, the girl wouldn't scream. The woman sat, lost in watching the night which enveloped them like a velvet teaser curtain. Itag, for all his time in Montmartre, had never seen behind it to the bare wall of the night. But had this one? He scrutinized her, looking for some such betrayal. He'd observed the face some dozen times. It had always gone through conventional grimaces, smiles, expressions of what passed for emotion. The German could build another, Itag thought, and no one could tell them apart. The tango still played, or perhaps a different one. He hadn't been listening a new dance and popular. The head and body had to be kept erect. The steps had to be precise, sweeping, graceful. It wasn't like the waltz. In that dance was room for an indiscreet billow of crinolines, a naughty word whispered through mustaches into an ear all ready to blush. But here, no words, no deviating, simply the wide spiral turning about the dancing floor, gradually narrowing tighter, until there was no motion except for the steps which led nowhere. A dance for automata. The curtain hung in total stillness. If Itag could have found its pulleys or linkage, he might make it stir, might penetrate to the wall of the night's theater. Feeling suddenly alone in the wheeling mechanical darkness of La Ville Lumière, he wanted to cry. Strike! Strike the set of night and let us all see. The woman had been watching him, expressionless, poised like one of her own mannequins. 
blank eyes, something to hang a poire dress on. Portsepit, drunk and singing, approached their table. The song was in Latin. He'd just composed it for a black mass to be held tonight at his home in Les Batignolles. The woman wanted to come. Etag saw this immediately. A film seemed to drop from her eyes. He sat forlorn, feeling as if that most feared enemy of sleep had entered silently on a busy night, the one person whom you must come face to face with some day, who asks you, in the earshot of your oldest customers, to mix a cocktail whose name you have never heard. They left Satin shuffling empty wine glasses, looking as if tonight, in some tenantless street, he would murder. Melanie dreamed. The lay figure hung half off the bed, its arms stretched out, crucified, one stump touching her breast. It was the sort of dream in which possibly the eyes are open, or the last vision of the room is so reproduced in memory that all details are perfect and the dreamer is unclear whether he is asleep or awake. The German stood over the bed watching her. He was papa, but also a German. You must turn over, he repeated insistently. She was too embarrassed to ask why. Her eyes, which somehow she was able to see as if she were disembodied and floating above the bed, perhaps somewhere behind the quicksilver of the mirror, her eyes were slanted oriental. Long lashes spangled on the upper lids with tiny fragments of gold leaf. She glanced sideways at the lay figure. It had grown ahead, she thought. The face was turned away. To reach between your shoulder blades, said the German. What does he look for there, she wondered. Between my thighs, she whispered, moving on the bed. The silk there was dotted with the same gold, like sequins. He placed his hand under her shoulder, turned her. The skirt twisted on her thighs. She saw their two inner edges blonde and set off by the muskrat skin on the slit of the skirt. The Melanie in the mirror watched sure fingers move to the center of her back, search, find a small key, which he began to wind. I got you in time, he breathed. You would have stopped had I not. The face of the lay figure had been turned toward her all the time. There was no face. She woke up, not screaming, but moaning as if sexually aroused. Itag was bored. This black mass had attracted the usual compliment of nervous and blasé. Portsepitz's music was striking as usual, highly dissonant. Lately, he had been experimenting with African polyrhythms. Afterward... Jeffo, the writer, sat by a window discoursing on how for some reason the young girl, adolescent or younger, had again become the mode in erotic fiction. Jeffo had two or three chins, sat erect, and spoke pedantically, though he had only a tog for an audience. A tog didn't really want to talk with Jeffo. He wanted to watch the woman who had come with them. She sat now in a side pew with one of the acolytes, a little sculptress from Vaugirard. The woman's hand, gloveless and decorated only with a ring, stroked the girl's temple as they spoke. From the ring there sprouted a slender female arm fashioned in silver. The hand was cupped and held the lady's cigarette. As Itag watched, she lit another, black paper, gold crest. A small pile of stubs lay scattered beneath her shoes. Jeffard had been describing the plot of his latest novel. The heroine was one Doucette, thirteen, and struggled within by passions she could not name. A child, and yet a woman, Jeffard said, and a quality of something eternal about her. I even confess to a certain leaning of my own that way. La Jartière the old satyr. Jaffaud at length moved away. It was nearly morning. Etag's head ached. He needed sleep, needed a woman. The lady still smoked her black cigarettes. The little sculptress lay, legs curled up on the seat, head pillowed against her companion's breasts. The black hair, 
seemed to float like a drowned corpse's hair against the cerise tunic. The entire room and the bodies inside it, some twisted, some coupled, some awake, the scattered hosts, the black furniture, were all bathed in an exhausted yellow light filtered through rain clouds which refused to burst. The lady was absorbed in burning tiny holes with the tip of her cigarette through the skirt of the young girl. Nitag watched as the pattern grew. She was writing Ma Fetiche in black-rimmed holes. The sculptress wore no lingerie, so that when the lady finished, the words would be spelled out by the young sheen of the girl's thighs. Defenseless? Nitag wondered briefly. Two. The next day, the same clouds were over the city, but it did not rain. Melanie had awakened in the Su Feng costume, excited as soon as her eyes recognized the image in the mirror, knowing it hadn't rained. Port Sapitz showed up early with a guitar. He sat on the stage and sang sentimental Russian ballads about willow trees, students getting drunk and going off on sleigh rides, the body of his love floating belly up in the dawn. A dozen young gathered round the samovar to read novels aloud. Where had youth gone? Port Sapitz, nostalgic, snuffled over his guitar. Melanie, looking newly scrubbed and wearing the dress she'd arrived in, stood behind him, hands over his eyes, and caroled harmony. Itag found them that way. In the yellow light, framed by the stage, they seemed like a picture he'd seen somewhere once. Or perhaps it was only the melancholy notes of the guitar, the subdued looks of precarious joy on their faces, two young people conditionally at peace in the dog days. He went into the bar and began chipping away at a large block of ice, put the chips into an empty champagne bottle, and filled the bottle with water. By noon the dancers had arrived, most of the girls seemingly deep in a love affair with Isadora Duncan. They moved over the stage like languid moths, gauzy tunics fluttering limp. Natog guessed half the men were homosexual, and the other half dressed that way. Foppish. He sat at the bar and watched as Satin began the blocking. Which one is she? The woman again. In Montmartre, 1913, people materialized. Over there, with Port Sapitz. She hurried over to be introduced. Vulgar, thought Itag, and then amended it at once to uncontrollable. Perhaps? A little. La Jarretiere stood there, only gazing. Portapitz looked upset, as if they'd had an argument. Poor, young, pursued, fatherless. What would Jeffo make of her? A wanton, in body if he could, in the pages of a manuscript, most certainly, Writers had no moral sense. Portsapis sat at the piano playing Adoration of the Sun. It was a tango with cross rhythms. Satin had devised some near impossible movements to go with it. It cannot be danced, screamed a young man leaping from the stage to land belligerent in front of Satin. Melanie had hurried off to change to her Soufeng costume. Lacing on her slippers, she looked up and saw the woman leaning in the doorway. You are not real. I... Hands resting dead on her thighs. Do you know what a fetish is? Something of a woman which gives pleasure but is not a woman. A shoe, a locket, un jartier. You are the same, not real, but an object of pleasure. Melanie could not speak. What are you like unclothed? A chaos of flesh. But as Su Fang, lit by hydrogen, oxygen, a cylinder of lime, moving doll-like in the confines of your costume, you will drive Paris mad. Women and men alike. The eyes would not respond, not with fear, desire, anticipation. Only the Melanie in the mirror could make them do that. The woman had moved to the foot of the bed, ring hand resting on the lay figure. Melanie darted past her, continued on toes and in twirls to the wings, 
appeared on stage improvising to Port Sapitz's lackadaisical attack on the piano. Outside, thunder could be heard, punctuating the music at random. It was never going to rain. The Russian influence in Port Sapitz's music was usually traced to his mother, who'd been a milliner in St. Petersburg. Port Sapitz now, between his hashish dreams, his furious attacks on the grand piano out in Les Batignolles, fraternized with a strange collection of Russian expatriates led by a certain Kolsky, a huge and homicidal tailor. They were all engaged in clandestine political activity. They spoke volubly and at length of Bakunin, Marx, Ulyanov. Kolsky entered as the sun fell, hidden by yellow clouds. He drew Port Sapitz into an argument. The dancers dispersed. The stage emptied until only Melanie and the woman remained. Satin produced his guitar. Port Sapitz sat on the piano, and they sang revolutionary songs. Port Sapitz, grinned the tailor. You'll be surprised one day at what we will do. Nothing surprises me, answered Port Sapitz. If history were cyclical, we'd now be in a decadence, would we not? And your projected revolution only another symptom of it. A decadence is a falling away, said Kolsky. We rise. A decadence, Itag put in, is a falling away from what is human, and the further we fall, the less human we become. Because we are less human, we foist off the humanity we have lost on inanimate objects and abstract theories. The girl and the woman had moved away from the stage as one overhead light. They could hardly be seen. No sound came from up there. Itag finished the last of the ice water. Your beliefs are non-human, he said. You talk of people as if they were point clusters or curves on a graph. So they are, mused Kolsky, dreamy-eyed. I, Setin, Portsapitz, may fall by the wayside. No matter. The socialist awareness grows. The tide is irresistible and irreversible. It is a bleak world we live in, Monsieur Etag. Atoms collide, brain cells fatigue, economies collapse, and others rise to succeed them, all in accord with the basic rhythms of history. Perhaps she is a woman. Women are a mystery to me, but her ways are at least measurable. Rhythm, snorted Etag, as if you listened to the jitterings and squeaks of a metaphysical bedspring. The tailor laughed, delighted like a great fierce child. Acoustics of the room gave his mirthfulness a sepulchral ring. The stage was empty. Come, said Port Sapitz, to Luganda. Satin, on a table, danced absently to himself. Outside they passed the woman, holding Melanie by the arm. They were headed toward the metro station. Neither spoke. Itag stopped at a kiosk to buy a copy of La Patrie, the closest one could get to an anti-Semitic newspaper in the evening. Soon they had vanished down the boulevard Clichy. As they descended the moving stairs, the woman said, You are afraid. The girl didn't answer. She still wore the costume, covered now with a dolman wrap, which looked expensive and was, and which the woman approved of. She bought them first-class tickets. Closeted in the suddenly materialized train, the woman asked, Do you only lie passive, then, like an object? Of course you do. It is what you are. Une fétiche. She pronounced the silent ease as if she were singing. Air in the metro was close, the same as outside. Melanie studied the tail of the dragon on her calf. After some time had passed, the train climbed to ground level. Melanie may have noticed they were crossing the river. To her left, she saw the Eiffel Tower quite near. They were crossing the Pont de Passy. At the first stop on the left bank, the woman arose. She'd not left off clutching Melanie's arm. Out on the street, they began to walk, bearing southwest into the district of Grenelle. A landscape of factories, chemical works, iron foundries. They were alone in the street. Melanie wondered if the woman indeed lived among factories. They walked for what seemed a mile, arrived finally at a loft building in which only the third floor was occupied by a manufacturer of belts. They climbed narrow stairs, flight after flight. The woman lived on the top floor. Melanie, though a dancer and strong-legged, 
now showed signs of exhaustion. When they arrived at the woman's rooms, the girl lay down without invitation on a large poof in the center of the room. The place was decorated African and Oriental, black pieces of primitive sculpture, lamp in the shape of a dragon, silks, Chinese red. The bed was a great four-poster. Melanie's wrap had fallen away. Her legs, blonde and bedragoned, lay unmoving, half on the poof, half on the oriental rug. The woman sat down beside the girl, resting her hand lightly on Melanie's shoulder, and began to talk. If we've not already guessed, the woman is, again, the Lady V, of Stencil's mad time search. No one knew her name in Paris. Not only was she V, however, but also V in love. Herbert Stencil was willing to let the key to his conspiracy have a few of the human passions. Lesbianism, we are prone to think in this Freudian period of history, stems from self-love projected onto some other human object. If a girl gets to feeling narcissist, she will also sooner or later come upon the idea that women, the class she belongs to, are not so bad either. Such may have been the case with Melanie, though who could say? Perhaps the spell of incest at Sershaud was an indication that her preferences merely lay outside the usual exogamous heterosexual pattern which prevailed in 1913. But as for V, V in love, the hidden motives, if there were any, remained a mystery to all observers. Everyone connected with the production knew what was going on, but because intelligence of the affair remained inside a circle inclined towards sadism, sacrilege, endogamy, and homosexuality anyway, there was little concern, and the two were let alone, like young lovers. Melanie showed up faithfully at all rehearsals, and as long as the woman wasn't enticing her away from the production, which apparently she had no intention of doing, being a patroness, Itag, for one, couldn't have cared less. One day the girl arrived at Le Neuf, accompanied by the woman and wearing schoolboy's clothing, tight black trousers, a white shirt, a short black jacket. Moreover, her head, all her thick buttock-length hair, had been shorn. She was nearly bald, and but for the dancer's body no clothes could conceal. She might have been a young lad playing hooky. There was, fortunately, a long black wig in the costume box. Satin greeted the idea with enthusiasm. Su Feng would appear in the first act with hair, in the second without, having been tortured anyway by Mongolians. It would shock the audience whose tastes he felt were jaded. At every rehearsal, the woman sat at her rear table watching, silent. All her attention was concentrated on the girl. Itag tried at first to engage her in conversation, but failed and went back to La Vie Heureuse, Le Rire, Le Charivari. When the company moved to the Théâtre de Vincent Castor, she followed like a faithful lover. Mélanie continued dressing transvestite for the street. Speculation among the company was that a peculiar inversion had taken place. Since an affair of this sort generally involves one dominant and one submissive, and it was clear which one was which, the woman should have appeared in the clothing of an aggressive male. Port Sapitz, to the amusement of all, produced at Luganda one evening a chart of the possible combinations the two could be practicing. It came out to sixty-four different sets of roles, using the subheadings dressed as social role, sexual role. They could both, for example, be dressed as males, both have dominant social roles and strive for dominance sexually. They could be dressed different sexed and both be entirely passive, the game then being to trick the other into making an aggressive move, or any of sixty-two other combinations. Perhaps, Satin suggested, there were also inanimate mechanical aids. This, it was agreed, would confuse the picture. At one point, someone suggested that the woman might actually be a transvestite to begin with, which made things even more amusing. But what actually was going on at the loft in Grenelle? Each mind at Luganda and among the troupe at the Théâtre Vincent Castor had conjured up a different scene. Machines of exquisite torture, bizarre costuming, grotesque movements of muscle under flesh. How disappointed they all would have been. Had they seen the skirt of the little sculptress acolyte from Vaugirard, 
heard the pet name the woman had for Melanie, or read as had a tog in the new science of the mind, they would have known that certain fetishes never have to be touched or handled at all, only seen for there to be complete fulfillment. As for Melanie, her lover had provided her with mirrors, dozens of them, mirrors with handles, with ornate frames, full-length and pocket mirrors came to adorn the loft wherever one turned to look. V, at the age of thirty-three, Stencil's calculation, had found love at last in her peregrinations through, let us be honest, a world if not created, then at least described to its fullest by Karl Baedeker of Leipzig. This is a curious country, populated only by a breed called terrorists. Its landscape is one of inanimate monuments and buildings, near inanimate barmen, taxi drivers, bellhops, guides, there to do any bidding, to various degrees of efficiency, on receipt of the recommended bakshish, pourboire, mancha, tip. More than this, it is two-dimensional, as is the street, as are the pages and maps of those little red handbooks. As long as the cooks, travelers' clubs, and banks are open, the distribution of time section followed scrupulously, the plumbing at the hotel in order. No hotel, writes Karl Baedeker, can be recommended as first class that is not satisfactory in its sanitary arrangements, which should include an abundant flush of water and a supply of proper toilette paper. The tourist may wander anywhere in this coordinate system without fear. War never becomes more serious than a scuffle with a pickpocket, one of the huge army who are quick to recognize the stranger and skillful in taking advantage of his ignorance. Depression and prosperity are reflected only in the rate of exchange. Politics are, of course, never discussed with the native population. Tourism, thus, is supranational, like the Catholic Church, and perhaps the most absolute communion we know on earth. For be its members American, German, Italian, whatever, the Tour Eiffel, Pyramids, and Campanile all evoke identical responses from them. Their Bible is clearly written and does not admit of private interpretation. They share the same landscapes, suffer the same inconveniences, live by the same pellucid time scale. They are the street's own. The Lady V, one of them for so long now, suddenly found herself excommunicated, bounced unceremoniously into the null time of human love without having recognized the exact moment as any but when Melanie entered a side door to Le Neuf on Port Sapitz's arm and time, for a while, ceased. Stencil's dossier has it on the authority of Portsepitz himself, to whom V told much of their affair. He repeated none of it then, neither at Luganda nor anywhere else, only to Stencil, years later. Perhaps he felt guilty about his chart of permutations and combinations, but to this extent at least he acted like a gentleman. His description of them is a well-composed and ageless still life of love at one of its many extremes. V on the poof, watching Melanie on the bed, Melanie watching herself in the mirror, the mirror image perhaps contemplating V from time to time. No movement, but a minimum friction. And yet one solution to a most ancient paradox of love, simultaneous sovereignty, yet a fusing together. Dominance and submissiveness didn't apply. The pattern of three was symbiotic and mutual. V needed her fetish, Melanie a mirror, temporary peace, another to watch her have pleasure. For such is the self-love of the young that a social aspect enters in. An adolescent girl whose existence is so visual observes in a mirror her double. The double becomes a voyeur. Frustration at not being able to fragment herself into an audience of enough only adds to her sexual excitement. She needs, it seems, a real voyeur to complete the illusion that her reflections are, in fact, this audience. With the addition of this other, multiplied also perhaps by mirrors, comes consummation, for the other is also her own double. She is like a woman who dresses only to be looked at and talked about by other women. Their jealousy, whispered remarks, reluctant admiration are her own. They are she. 
As for V, she recognized, perhaps aware of her own progression toward inanimateness, the fetish of Merani and the fetish of herself to be one. As all inanimate objects to one victimized by them are alike. It was a variation on the porpentine theme, the Tristan and Isult theme. Indeed, according to some, the single melody, banal and exasperating of all romanticism since the Middle Ages. The act of love and the act of death are one. Dead at last, they would be one with the inanimate universe and with each other. Love play until then thus becomes an impersonation of the inanimate, a transvestism not between sexes, but between quick and dead, human and fetish. The clothing each wore was incidental. The hair shorn from Melanie's head was incidental, only an obscure bit of private symbolism for the Lady V. Perhaps, if she were, in fact, Victoria Wren, having to do with her time in the novitiate. If she were Victoria Wren, even Stencil couldn't remain all unstirred by the ironic failure her life was moving toward, too rapidly by that pre-war August ever to be reversed. The Florentine spring, the young entrepreneurs with all spring's hope and her virtue, with her girl's faith that fortune, if only her skill, her timing held true, could be brought under control, that Victoria was being gradually replaced by V something entirely different, for which the young century had as yet no name. We all get involved to an extent in the politics of slow dying, but poor Victoria had become intimate also with the things in the back room. If V suspected her fetishism at all to be part of any conspiracy leveled against the animate world, any sudden establishment here of a colony of the kingdom of death, then this might justify the opinion held in the rusty spoon that Stencil was seeking in her his own identity. But such was her rapture at Melanie's having sought and found her own identity in her and in the mirror's soulless gleam that she continued unaware, off-balanced by love, forgetting even that although the distribution of time here on poof, bed, and mirrors had been abandoned, their love was, in its way, only another version of tourism. For as tourists bring into the world, as it has evolved, part of another, and eventually create a parallel society of their own in every city, so the kingdom of death is served by fetish constructions like these, which represent a kind of infiltration. What would have been her reaction had she known? Again, an ambiguity. It would have meant ultimately V's death, in a sudden establishment here of the inanimate kingdom, despite all efforts to prevent it. The smallest realization, at any step, Cairo, Florence, Paris, that she fitted into a larger scheme, leading eventually to her personal destruction, and she might have shied off, come to establish eventually so many controls over herself that she became to Freudian, behaviorist, man of religion, no matter, a purely determined organism, an automaton constructed only quaintly of human flesh. Or, by contrast, might have reacted against the above, which we have come to call Puritan, by journeying even deeper into a fetish country until she became entirely, and in reality, not merely as a love game with any Melanie, an inanimate object of desire. Stencil even departed from his usual plottings to daydream a vision of her now at age seventy-six, skin radiant with the bloom of some new plastic, both eyes glass but now containing photoelectric cells connected by silver electrodes to optic nerves of purest copper wire and leading to a brain exquisitely wrought as a diode matrix could ever be. Solenoid relays would be her ganglia, Servo actuators move her flawless nylon limbs. Hydraulic fluid be sent by a platinum heart pump through butyrate veins and arteries. Perhaps, Stencil on occasion could have as vile a mind as any of the crew, even a complex system of pressure transducers located in a marvelous vagina of polyethylene. The variable arms of their Wheatstone bridges all leading to a single silver cable 
which fed pleasure voltages direct to the correct register of the digital machine in her skull. And whenever she smiled or grinned in ecstasy, there would gleam her crowning feature, eigenvalues precious dentures. Why did she tell so much to Port Sapitz? She was afraid, she said, that it wouldn't last, that Melanie might leave her. Glittering world of the stage, fame, foul minds, darling of a male audience, the woe of many a lover. Port Sapitz gave her what comfort he could. He was under no delusions about love as anything but transitory. He left all such dreaming to his compatriot, Satin, who was an idiot anyway. Sad-eyed, he commiserated with her. What else should he have done? Pass moral judgment? Love is love. It shows up in strange displacements. This poor woman was racked by it. Stencil, however, only shrugged. Let her be a lesbian. Let her turn to a fetish. Let her die. She was a beast of venery, and he had no tears for her. The night of the performance arrived. What happened then was available to Stencil in police records, and still told, perhaps, by old people around the butte. Even as the pit orchestra tuned up, there was loud argument in the audience. Somehow the performance had taken on a political cast. Orientalism, at this period showing up all over Paris in fashions, music, theatre, had been connected along with Russia to an international movement seeking to overthrow Western civilization. Only six years before, a newspaper had been able to sponsor an auto race from Peking to Paris and enlist the willing assistance of all the countries between. The political situation these days was somewhat darker. Hence, the turmoil which erupted that night in the Théâtre Vincent Castor. Before the first act was barely underway, there came catcalls and uncouth gestures from the anti portsepitz faction. Friends, already calling themselves Portsepikists, sought to suppress them. Also present in the audience was a third force who merely wanted quiet enough to enjoy the performance, and naturally enough tried to silence, prevent, or mediate all disputes. A three-way wrangle developed. By intermission, it had degenerated into near chaos. Itag and Satin screamed at each other in the wings, neither able to hear the other for the noise out in the audience. Portsepitz sat by himself in a corner drinking coffee, expressionless. A young ballerina returning from the dressing room stopped to talk. Can you hear the music? Not too well, she admitted. Dommage. How does La Jartière feel? Mélanie knew the dance by heart. She had perfect rhythm. She inspired the whole troupe. The dancer was ecstatic in her praise. Another Isadora Duncan. Port Sapitz shrugged, made a moo. If I ever have money again, more to himself than to her, I'll hire an orchestra and dance company for my own amusement and have them perform L'Enlèvement, only to see what the work is like. Perhaps I will catcall, too. They laughed sadly with one another, and the girl passed on. The second act was even noisier. Only toward the end were the attentions of the few serious onlookers taken entirely by La Jartière. As the orchestra... Sweating and nervous, moved, baton-driven into the last portion, Sacrifice of the Virgin, a powerful, slow-building seven-minute crescendo which seemed at its end to have explored the furthest possible reaches of dissonance, tonal color, and, as Le Figaro's critic put it the next morning, orchestral barbarity. Light seemed all at once to be reborn behind Melanie's rainy eyes, and she became again the Norman dervish Port Sapitz remembered. He moved closer to the stage, watching her with a kind of love. An apocryphal story relates that he vowed at that moment never to touch drugs again, never to attend another black mass. Two of the male dancers, whom Itag had never left off calling mongolized fairies, produced a long pole pointed wickedly at one end. The music, near triple forte, could be heard now above the roaring of the audience. Gendarmes had moved in at the rear entrances and were trying ineffectually to restore order. Satin, next to Portsepitz, one hand on the composer's shoulder, 
leaned forward, shaking. It was a tricky bit of choreography, Satin's own. He'd got the idea from reading an account of an Indian massacre in America. While two of the other Mongolians held her, struggling and head-shaven, Su Feng was impaled at the crotch on the point of the pole and slowly raised by the entire male part of the company, while the females lamented below. Suddenly, one of the automaton handmaidens seemed to run amok, tossing itself about the stage. Satin moaned, gritted his teeth. Damn the German, he said. It will distract. The conception depended on Su Feng continuing her dance while impaled, all movement restricted to one point in space, an elevated point, a focus, a climax. The pole was now erect, the music four bars from the end. A terrible hush fell over the audience. Gendarmes and combatants all turned as if magnetized to watch the stage. La Jartière's movements became more spastic, agonized. The expression on the normally dead face was one which would disturb for years the dreams of those in the front rows. Portsepitz's music was now almost deafening. All tonal location had been lost. Notes screamed out simultaneous and random like fragments of a bomb. Winds, strings, brass, and percussion were indistinguishable as blood ran down the pole. The impaled girl went limp. The last chord blasted out, filled the theater, echoed, hung, subsided. Someone cut all the stage lights. Someone else ran to close the curtain. It never opened. Melanie was supposed to have worn a protective metal device, a species of chastity belt, into which the point of the pole fit. She had left it off. A physician in the audience had been summoned at once by a tog as soon as he saw the blood. Shirt torn, one eye blackened, the doctor knelt over the girl and pronounced her dead. Of the woman, her lover, nothing further was seen. Some versions tell of her gone hysterical backstage, having to be detached forcibly from Melanie's corpse, of her screaming vendetta at Satin and Utag for plotting to kill the girl. The coroner's verdict, charitably, was death by accident. Perhaps Melanie, exhausted by love, excited as at any premiere, had forgotten. Adorned with so many combs, bracelets, sequins, she might have become confused in this fetish world and neglected to add to herself the one inanimate object that would have saved her. Etag thought it was suicide. Satin refused to talk about it. Portsepitz suspended judgment. But they lived with it for many years. Rumor had it that a week or so later the Lady V ran off with one Scaraccio, a mad irredentist. At least they both disappeared from Paris at the same time. From Paris, and as far as anyone on the Butte could say, from the face of the earth. Chapter 15 Saha V. 1 Sunday morning around nine, the rollicking boys arrived at Rachel's after their night of burglary and lounging in the park. Neither had slept. On the wall was a sign. I am heading for the Whitney. Kish mine took is profane. Many, many tackle a farson, said Stencil. Ho hum, said Profane, preparing to sack out on the floor. In came Paola with a babushka over her head and a brown paper bag which clinked in her arms. Eigenvalue got robbed last night, she said. It made the front page of the Times. They all attacked the brown bag at once, coming up with the Times in sections and four quarts of beer. How about that, Profane said, scrutinizing the front page. Police are expecting to make an arrest any time now. Daring early morning burglary. Paola, said Stencil behind him. Profane flinched. Paola, holding the church key, turned to gaze past Profane's left ear at what glittered in Stencil's hand. She kept quiet, eyes motionless. Three are in it, now. At last she looked back at Profane. You coming to Malta, Ben? No. But weak. Why, he said. Malta never showed me anything. Anywhere you care to go in the med, there is a straight street, a gut. 
Benny, if the cops... Who are the cops to me? Stencil's got the teeth. He was terrified. It had only now occurred to him that he'd broken the law. Stencil, buddy, what do you say to one of us going back there with a toothache and figuring out a way? He tapered off. Stencil kept quiet. Was all that rigmarole with the rope just a way to get me to come along? What's so special about me? Nobody said anything. Paola looked about ready to burst from her tracks, bawling and looking to be held by profane. All of a sudden, there was noise in the hallway. Somebody began banging on the door. Police, a voice said. Stencil, jamming the teeth into one pocket, dashed away for the fire escape. Now what the hell, Profane said. By the time Paola did open up, Stencil was long gone. The same Ten Ike who had broken up the orgy at Mafia stood there with one arm slung under a sodden, Rooney winsome. Is this here Rachel Owlglass at home? he said. Explained he'd found Rooney drunk on the stoop of St. Patrick's Cathedral, fly open, face her eye, scaring little kids and offending the solid citizens. Here was all he wanted to come, Ten Eyck almost pleaded. He wouldn't go home. They released him from Bellevue last night. Rachel will be back soon, said Paola gravely. We'll take him till then. I got his feet, Profane said. They hauled Rooney into Rachel's room and dumped him on the bed. Thank you, officer. Cool as any old movie's international jewel thief, Profane wished he had a mustache. Ten Eyck left. Deadpan. Benito, things are falling apart. The sooner I get home... Good luck. Why won't you come? We're not in love. No. No debts outstanding either way, not even an old romance to flare up again. Shook her head. Real tears now. Why, then? Because we left Teflon's place in Norfolk. No, no. Poor Ben. They all called him poor, but to save his feelings never explained, let it stand as an endearment. You are only eighteen, he said, and have this crush on me. You will see by the time you get to be my age. She interrupted him by rushing at him as you would rush at a tackling dummy, surrounding him, beginning to soak the suede jacket with all those overdue tears. He thumped her back, bewildered. So it was, of course, then that Rachel walked in. Being a girl who recovered fast, first thing she said was, Oh, so this is what happens behind my back. While I was at church praying for you, Profane, and the children. He had the common sense to go along with her. Believe me, it was all perfectly innocent. Rachel shrugged, meaning the two-line act was over. She'd had a few seconds to think. You didn't go to St. Patrick's, did you? You should have. Waggling a thumb at what was now snoring in the next room. Dig. And we know who it was Rachel spent the rest of the day with and the night holding his head, tucking him in, touching the beard stubble and dirt on his face, watching him sleep and the frown lines there relax slowly. After a while, Profane went off to the spoon. Once there, he announced to the crew that he was going to Malta. Of course, they held a going-away party. Profane ended up with two adoring camp followers working him over, eyes shining with a kind of love. You got the idea they were like prisoners in stir, vicariously happy to see any of their number reach the outside again. Profane saw no street ahead but the gut, thought that it would have to go some to be worse than East Main. But there was also the Seas Highway, but that was a different kind entirely. 2. Stencil, Profane, and Pig Bodine made a flying visit to Washington, D.C. one weekend, the world adventurer to expedite their coming passage, the Schlemiel to spend a last liberty, pig to help him. They chose for pied a a flop house in Chinatown, and Stencil nipped over to the State Department to see what he could see. I don't believe any of it, said Pig. Stencil is a fake. Stand by, was all Profane said. I suppose we ought to go out and get drunk, Pig said. So they did. Either Profane was growing old and losing his capacity, or it was the worst drunk he had ever thrown. There were blank spaces, which are always, of course, frightening. As near as Profane could remember afterward, they had headed first for the National Gallery, Pig having decided they ought to have company. Sure enough, 
In front of Dolly's Last Supper they found two government girls. I'm Flip, said the blonde, and this is Flop. Pig groaned, momentarily nostalgic for Hanky and Panky. Fine, he said. That is Benny, and I am, here, here, Pig. Obviously, said Flop. But the girl-boy ratio in Washington has been estimated as high as eight to one. She grabbed Pig's arm, looking around the room as if those other spectral sisters were lurking somewhere among the statuary. Their place was near P Street, and they had amassed every Pat Boone record in existence. Before Pig had even set down the large paper bag containing the fruits of their afternoon sortie among the booze outlets of the nation's capital, legal and otherwise, twenty-five watts of that worthy singing Bebop Balula burst on them unaware. After this overture, the weekend proceeded in flashes, Pig going to sleep halfway up the Washington Monument and falling half a flight into a considerate troop of Boy Scouts, the four of them in Flip's Mercury, riding round and round DuPont Circle at three in the morning and being joined eventually by six Negroes in an Oldsmobile who wanted to race. The two cars, then proceeding to an apartment on New York Avenue, occupied only by one inanimate audio system, fifty jazz enthusiasts, and God knows how many bottles of circulating and communal wine. Being awakened, wrapped with Flip in a Hudson Bay blanket on the steps of a Masonic temple somewhere in northwest Washington by an insurance executive named Iago Saperstein, who wanted them to come to another party. Where is Pig? Profane wondered. He stole my mercury, and he and Flop are on the way to Miami, said Flip. Oh, to get married. It's a hobby of mine, continued Iago Saperstein, to find young people like this who would be interesting to bring along to a party. Benny is a schlemiel, said Flip. Schlemiels are very interesting, said Iago. The party was out near the Maryland line. In attendance, Profane found an escapee from Devil's Island, who was en route to Vassar under the alias of Maynard Basilisk, to teach beekeeping. An inventor celebrating his 72nd rejection by the U.S. Patent Office, this time on a coin-operated whorehouse for bus and railway stations, which he was explaining with blueprints and gestures to a small group of Tyro semiophiles, collectors of labels on French cheese boxes, kidnapped by Iago from their annual convention. A gentle, lady plant pathologist, originally from the Isle of Man, who had the distinction of being the only Manx monoglot in the world, and consequently spoke to no one. An unemployed musicologist named Petard, who had dedicated his life to finding the lost Vivaldi Kazoo concerto, first brought to his attention by one Squasimodio, formerly a civil servant under Mussolini, and now lying drunk under the piano who had heard not only of its theft from a monastery by certain fascist music lovers, but also about twenty bars from the slow movement, which Petard would from time to time wander round the party blowing on a plastic kazoo. And other interesting people. Profane, who only wanted to sleep, talked to none of them. He woke up in Iago's bathtub around dawn to the gigglings of a blonde clad only in an enlisted man's white hat, who was pouring bourbon on Profane out of a gallon coffee pot. Profane was about to open his mouth and try to put it in the way of the descending stream when who should come in but Pig Bodine. "'Give me back my white hat,' said Pig. "'I thought you were in Florida,' said Profane. "'Ha, ha,' said the blonde. "'You will have to catch me.' And away they went, satyr and nymph. The next profane knew they were all back in Flip and Flop's apartment, his head in Flip's lap, and Pat Boone on the turntable. You have the same initials, Flop cooed from across the room. Pat Boone, Pig Bodine. Profane arose, stumbled to the kitchen, and vomited in the sink. Out, screamed Flip. Indeed, said Profane. At the bottom of the stairs were two bicycles which the girls rode to work to save bus fare. Profane grabbed one and carried it down the stoop to the street. A mess, fly unzipped, crew cut matted down both sides of his head, beard let go for two days, hold skivvy shirt pushed by his beer belly through a few open buttons on his shirt. 
he pedaled away wobbly for the flop house. He hadn't gone two blocks when there were yells behind him. It was Pig on the other bike, chasing him with flop on the handlebars. Far behind was Flip on foot. Uh-oh, said Profane. He fiddled with the gears and promptly dropped into low. Thief, yelled Pig, laughing his obscene laugh. Thief! A prowl car materialized out of nowhere and moved in to intercept Profane. Profane finally got the bike in high and whizzed round a corner. Thus they chased about the city in falls cold, in a Sunday street deserted except for them. The cops and Pig finally caught up. It's all right, officer, said Pig. He's a friend. I won't press charges. Fine, said the cop. I will. They were hauled down to the precinct and put in the drunk tank. Pig fell asleep, and two of the occupants of the tank set to work removing his shoes. Profane was too tired to interrupt. Hey, said a cheerful wino from across the room. You want to play hits and cuts? Under the blue stamp on a pack of camels is either an H or a C, followed by a number. You take turns guessing which it is. If you guess wrong, the other gets to hit with the fist or cut with the edge of the hand, you across the bicep, for the number of times indicated by the number. The wino's hands looked like small boulders. I don't smoke, said Profane. Oh, said the wino. What about rock, scissors, and paper? Just about then, a detail of shore patrolmen and civilian police entered, dragging a bosun's mate about seven feet tall who had run amok under the impression he was King Kong, the well-known ape. Aye, he screamed, me, King Kong, don't screw with me. There, there, an SP said. King Kong doesn't talk, he growls. So the bosun's mate growled and made a leap for an old electric fan overhead. Round and round he went, uttering ape yells and pounding his chest. SPs and cops milled around down below, bewildered, some of the braver making grabs for his feet. Now what? said one cop. This was answered by the fan, which gave way, dumping the bosun's mate in their midst. They jumped on and managed to secure him with three or four guard belts. A cop brought in a small dolly from the garage next door, loaded the bosun's mate on, and rolled him off. Hey, said one of the SPs, look at there in the drunk tank. That is Pig Bodine that's wanted down in Norfolk for desertion. Pig opened an eye at them. Oh, well, he said, closed the eye and went back to sleep. The cops came around to tell Profane he could go. So long, Pig, said Profane. Give Paola six for me, Pig grunted, shoeless, half asleep. Back at the flop house, Stencil had a poker game going, which was about to break up because of the next shift coming on. Just as well, Stencil said, they've about cleaned Stencil out. You're soft, Profane said. You let them win on purpose. No, Stencil said. Money will be needed for the trip. It's set? All set. Somehow, it seemed to Profane things never should have come this far. Three. Now there was a private going-away party, just Profane and Rachel, about two weeks later. After the passport photos and the booster shots and the rest, Tensel acted like his valet, removing all official roadblocks by some magic of his own. Eigenvalue kept cool. Stencil even went to see him, perhaps as a test of the guts he'd need to confront whatever of V was still on Malta. They discussed the concept of property and agreed that a true owner need not have physical possession. If the sole dentist knew, as Stencil was nearly sure he did, then owner, eigenvalue, defined, was eigenvalue. Stencil defined, the. It was a complete failure of communication. They parted friends. Sunday night, Profane spent in Rachel's room with one sentimental magnum of champagne. Rooney slept in Esther's room. For two weeks he'd done little else but sleep. Later, Profane lay with his head in her lap, her long hair falling over to cover him and keep him warm. It being September, the landlord was still reluctant about heat. They were both naked. Profane rested his ear near her labia majora as if it were a mouth there which could speak to him. 
Rachel was absently listening to the champagne bottle. Listen, she whispered, holding the mouth of the bottle near his free ear. He heard carbon dioxide coming out of solution, magnified in a false-bottomed echo chamber. It's a happy sound. Yes. What percentage was there in telling her what it really sounded like? At Anthro Research Associates, there'd been radiation counters, and radiation enough to make the place sound like a locust season gone mad. Next day they sailed. Fulbright types crowded them at the rail of the Susanna Squaducci. Coils of crepe, showers of confetti, and a band, all rented, made things look festive. Ciao, the crew called. Ciao. Sa, said Paola. Sa, echoed Profane. Chapter 16 Valletta V1 Now, there was a sun shower over Valletta, and even a rainbow. Howie Sird, the drunken yeoman, lay on his stomach under Mount 52, head propped on arms, staring at a British landing craft that chugged its way through the rainy harbor. Fat Clyde from Shy, who was six feet one inch, 142 pounds, came from Winnetka and had been christened Harvey, stood by the lifeline, spitting dreamily down into the dry dock. Fat Clyde, bellowed Howie. No said Fat Clyde, whatever it is. He must have been upset. Nobody ever says things like that to a yeoman. I'm going over tonight, Howie said gently, and I need a raincoat because it is raining out, as you may have noticed. Fat Clyde took a white hat out of his back pocket and tugged it down over his head like a cloche. I also got liberty, he said. Bitch box came on. Now turn in all paint and paintbrushes to the paint locker, it said. About that time, said Howie. He crawled out from under the gun mount and squatted on the O-1 deck. The rain came down and ran into his ears and down his neck, and he watched the sun smearing the sky red over Valletta. What is wrong, hey, Fat Clyde? Oh, said Fat Clyde, and spat over the side. His eyes followed the white drop of spit all the way down. Howie gave up after about five minutes of silence. He went around the starboard side and down the ladder to bother Tiger Youngblood, the spud coxswain, who sat at the bottom of the ladder right outside the galley slicing cucumbers. Fat Clyde yawned. It rained in his mouth, but he didn't seem to notice. He had a problem. Being an ectomorph, he was inclined to brood. He was a gunner's mate third, and normally it would be none of his business except that his rack was directly over Pappy Hodd's, and since arrival in Valletta, Malta, Pappy had commenced talking to himself. Not loud. Not loud enough to be heard by anyone but Fat Clyde. Now, scuttlebutt being what it is, and sailors being under frequently sentimental and swinish exteriors, sentimental swine, Clyde knew well enough what it was about being in Malta that upset Pappy hard. Pappy hadn't been eating anything. Normally a liberty hound, he hadn't even been over yet because it was usually Fat Clyde who Pappy went out and got drunk with. This was lousing up Fat Clyde's liberty. Lazar, the deck ape, who had been trying the radar gang now for two weeks, came out with a broom and started sweeping water into the drain on the port side. I don't know why I should be doing this, he bitched conversationally. I don't have the duty. You should have stayed down in first division, Fat Clyde ventured, glum. Lazar began sweeping water at Fat Clyde, who jumped out of the way and continued on down the starboard ladder to the spud coxswain. Give me a cucumber, hey, Tiger? You want a cucumber, said Tiger, who was chopping up onions. Here, I got a cucumber for you. His eyes were watering so bad he looked like a sullen boy, which is what he was. Slice it and put it on a plate, said Fat Clyde, and maybe I will... Here... From the galley porthole, Pappy Hod was hanging out, waving a crescent of watermelon. He spat a seat at Tiger. That's the old Pappy Hod, thought Claude, and he is wearing dress blues and a neckerchief. Get your ass in gear, Claude, said Pappy Hod. Liberty call any minute now. 
So, of course, Clyde was off like a streak for the forecastle and back inside of five minutes, squared away as he ever got for liberty. Eight hundred thirty-two days, Tiger Youngblood snarled as Pappy and Clyde headed for the quarterdeck. And I'll never make it. The scaffold, resting on keel blocks, was propped up on each side by a dozen wood beams a foot square, which extended from the sides of the ship to the sides of the dry dock. From above, the scaffold must have looked like a great squid with wood-colored tentacles. Pappy and Clyde crossed the long brow and stood in the rain for a moment, looking at the ship. The sonar dome was shrouded in a secret tarpaulin. At the top of the mast flew the biggest American flag Captain Lick had been able to find. It would not be lowered come evening colors, and come true nightfall, portable spotlights would be turned on and focused on it. This was for the benefit of any Egyptian bomber pilots who might be coming in, scaffold being the only American ship in Valletta at the moment. On the starboard side rose a school or seminary with a clock tower, growing out of a bastion high as the surface search radar antenna. I and dry, said Clyde. They say the Limeys are going to kidnap us, said Pappy, and leave our ass high and dry till this is over. It may take longer than that anyway. Give me a cigarette. There's the generator and the screw. And the barnacles. Pappy Hod was disgusted. They will probably want to sandblast long as she's in the yards, even though there's a yard period in Philly coming up as soon as we get back. They'll find something for us to do, Fat Clyde. They made their way through the dockyard. Around them straggled most of the scaffold's liberty section in files and bunches. Submarines, too, were under wraps, perhaps for secrecy, perhaps for the rain. The quitting time whistle blew, and Pappy and Clyde were caught all at once in a torrent of yard birds, disgorged from earth, vessels, and pissoirs, all heading for the gate. Yard birds are the same all over, Pappy said. He and Clyde took their time. The dock workers fled by, jostling them, ragged, gray. By the time Pappy and Clyde reached the stone gateway, they'd all gone. Waiting for them were only two old nuns who sat to either side of the gate, holding little straw collection baskets in their laps and black umbrellas over their heads. Bottoms of the baskets were barely covered with sixpences and a shilling or two. Clyde came up with a crown. Pappy, who hadn't been over to exchange any currency, dropped a dollar in the other basket. The nuns smiled briefly and resumed their vigil. What was that? Pappy smiled to nobody. Admission charge? Towered over by ruins, they walked up a hill, around a great curve in the road, and through a tunnel. At the other end of the tunnel was a bus stop. Thruppence into Valletta, as far as the Phoenicia Hotel. When the bus arrived, they got on with a few straggling yard birds and many scaffold sailors, who sat in the back and sang. Pappy, Fat Clyde began, I know it's no business of mine, but... Driver, came a yell from in back. Hey, driver, stop the bus. I gotta take a leak. Pappy slumped lower in his seat, tilted the white hat down over his eyes. Tealadu, he muttered. That will be Tealadu. Driver, said Tealadu of the A-gang. If you don't stop the bus, I will have to piss out the window. Despite himself, Pappy turned around to watch. A number of snipes were endeavoring to pull Tealadu away from the window. The driver drove on grimly. The yard birds weren't talking, but watched closely. Scaffold sailors were singing, Let's all go down and piss on the forest stall till the damn thing floats away, which went to the tune of the old grey mare and had started at Gitmo Bay in the winter of fifty-five. Once he has got an idea in his head, said Pappy, he won't let go. So if they don't let him piss out the window, he will probably... Look, look, said Fat Clyde. A yellow river of urine was advancing up the center aisle. Tiladu was just zipping up. A fun-loving goodwill ambassador, somebody remarked, is all Tiladu is. As the river crept forward, sailors and yard birds hurriedly covered it with the leaves of a few morning newspapers left lying on the seats. Tiladu's comrades applauded. Pappy, 
Fat Claude said. You intending to go out and get juiced tonight? I was thinking about it, said Pappy. That's what I was afraid of. Look, I know I'm out of line. He was interrupted by a burst of merriment from the back of the bus. Tiladu's friend Lazar, whom Fat Clyde had last seen sweeping water off the O-1 deck, had succeeded now in setting fire to the newspapers on the floor of the bus. Smoke billowed up and with a most horrible smell. Yardbirds began to mutter among themselves. I should have saved some, crowed Tiladu, to put it out with. Oh, God, said Pappy. A couple, three of Tiladu's fellow snipes were stomping around trying to put out the fire. The bus driver was cursing audibly. They pulled up to the Phoenicia Hotel at last, smoke still leaking from the windows. Night had fallen. Raucous with song, the men of the scaffold boat descended on Valletta. Clyde and Pappy were the last to get out. They apologized to the driver. Palm leaves in front of the hotel chattered in the wind. It seemed Pappy was hanging back. Why don't we go to a movie, Clyde said, a little desperate. Pappy wasn't listening. They walked under an arch and into Kingsway. Tomorrow is Halloween, said Pappy, and they better put those idiots in a straitjacket. They never made one to hold old Lazar. Hot damn, it's crowded in here. Kingsway seethed. There was this sense of containment, like a sound stage. As an indication of the military build-up in Malta since the beginning of the Suez Crisis, there overflowed into the street a choppy sea of green commando berets laced with the white and blue of naval uniforms. The Ark Royal was in, and corvettes and troop carriers to take the Marines to Egypt to occupy and hold. Now, I was on an A.K.A. during the war, observed Pappy, as they elbowed their way along Kingsway. And just before D-Day, it was like this. Oh, they was getting drunk in Yoko, too, back during Korea, said Clyde, defensive. Not like that was, or like this, either. The Limeys have a way of getting drunk just before they have to go off and fight. Not like we get drunk. All we do is puke or break furniture. But the Limeys show imagination. Listen. All it was was an English ruddy-faced jarhead and his Maltese girl standing in the entrance to a men's clothing store and looking at silk scarves, but they were singing People Will Say We're In Love from Oklahoma. Overhead, bombers screamed away toward Egypt. On some street corners, trinket stalls were set up and doing a peak trade in good luck charms and Maltese lace. Lace, said Fat Clyde. What is it about lace? to make you think about a girl. Even if you don't have a girl, it's better somehow if you... He trailed off. Fat Clyde didn't try to keep the subject alive. From a Phillips radio store to their left, news broadcasts were going full blast. Little tense knots of civilians stood around just listening. Nearby, at a newspaper kiosk, red scare headlines proclaimed, British intend to move into Suez. Parliament, said the newscaster, after an emergency session, issued a resolution late this afternoon calling for the engagement of airborne troops in the Suez crisis. The paratroopers, based on Cyprus and Malta, are on one-hour alert. Oh, boy, oh, boy, said Fat Clyde wearily. High and dry, said Pappy Hod, and the only ship in the Sixth Fleet getting liberty. All the others were off in the eastern Mediterranean, evacuating American nationals from the Egyptian mainland. Abruptly, Pappy cut round a corner to the left. He'd gone about ten steps down the hill when he noticed Fat Clyde wasn't there. "'Where are you going?' Fat Clyde yelled from the corner. "'The gut,' said Pappy. "'Where else?' "'Oh,' Clyde came stumbling downhill. "'I figured maybe we could wander around the main drag a little.' Pappy grinned, reached out, and patted Clyde's beer belly. Easy there, Mother Clyde, he said. Old Hot is doing all right. I'm just trying to be helpful, Clyde thought, but... Yes, he agreed. I am pregnant with a baby elephant. You want to see its trunk? Pappy guffawed, and they roistered away down the hill. 
There is nothing like old jokes. It's a kind of stability about them, familiar ground. Straight Street, the gut, was crowded as Kingsway, but more poorly lit. First familiar face they saw was Lehman, the red-headed water king, who came reeling out the swinging doors of a pub called the Four Aces, minus a white hat. Lehman was a bad drunk, so Pappy and Clyde ducked down behind a potted palm in front to watch. Sure enough, Lehman started searching in the gutter, bent over at a ninety-degree angle. Rocks, whispered Clyde. He always looks for rocks. The Water King found a rock and prepared to heave it through the front window of the Four Aces. The U.S. Cavalry, in the form of one Turner, the ship's barber, arrived also by way of the swinging doors and grabbed Lehman's arm. The two fell to the street and began wrestling around in the dust. A passing band of British Marines looked at them curiously for a moment, then went by, laughing a little embarrassed. See, said Pappy, getting philosophical, richest country in the world, and we never learned how to throw a goodbye drunk like the Limeys. But it's not goodbye for us, said Clyde. Who knows? There's revolutions in Hungary and Poland, fighting in Egypt. Pause. And Jane Mansfield is getting married. She can't. She can't. She said she'd wait for me. They entered the Four Aces. It was early yet, and no one but a few low-tolerance drunks like Lehman were causing any commotion. They sat at a table. Guinness Stout, said Pappy, and the words fell on Clyde like a nostalgic sandbag. He wanted to say, Pappy, it is not the old days, and why didn't you stay on board the scaffold boat? Because a boring liberty is better for me than one that hurts, and this hurts more all the time. The barmaid who brought their drinks was new. At least Clyde didn't remember her from last cruise but one across the room jitterbugging with one of Pappy's strikers she'd been around. And though Paola's bar had been the metro, further on down the street, this girl, Elisa, knew through the barmaid's grapevine that Pappy had married one of her own. If only Clyde could keep him away from the metropole. If only Elisa didn't spot them. But the music stopped. She saw them headed over. Clyde concentrated on his beer. Pappy smiled at Elisa. "'How's your wife?' she asked, of course. "'I hope she's well.' Elisa, bless her heart, dropped it. "'You want to dance? Nobody broke your record yet. Twenty-two straight.' Nimble Pappy was on his feet. "'Let's set a new one.' "'Good,' thought Clyde. "'Good. After a while, who should come over but Lieutenant J.G. Johnny Contango?' the scaffold's damage control assistant in civvies. When we going to get the screw fixed, Johnny? Johnny, because this officer had been a white hat sent to OCS, and having been then faced with the usual two alternatives, to persecute those of his former estate, or to keep fraternizing and to hell with the wardroom, had chosen the latter. He had gone possibly overboard on this, at least running afoul of the book at every turn, stealing a motorcycle in Barcelona, inciting an impromptu mass midnight swim at Fleet Landing in the Piraeus. Somehow, maybe because of Captain Lick's fondness for incorrigibles, he'd escaped court-martial. "'I am feeling more and more guilty about the screw,' said Johnny Contango. "'I have just slipped off from a stuffy do over at the British Officers' Club. You know what the big joke is?' Let's have another drink, old boy, before we have to go to war with each other. I don't get it, said Fat Clyde. We voted in the Security Council with Russia and against England and France on this Suez business. Pappy says the Limeys are going to kidnap us. I don't know. What about the screw? Drink your beer, Fat Clyde. Johnny Contango felt guilty about the mangled ship's propeller, not so much in a world political way. It was personal guilt, which Fat Clyde suspected upset him more than he showed. He'd been OOD. The mid-watch old scaffold boat had hit whatever it was. Submerged rack, oil drum, going through the Straits of Messina. 
Radar gang had been too busy keeping tabs on a fleet of night fishing boats who'd chosen the same route to notice the object, if it had protruded above the surface at all. Set and drift and pure accident had brought them here to get a screw fixed. God knew what the med had brought into Johnny Contango's path. The report had called it hostile marine life, and there'd been much raillery since about the mysterious screw-chewing fish, but Johnny still felt it was his fault. The Navy would rather blame something alive, preferably human and with a service number, than pure accident. Fish? Mermaid? Scylla? Charybdis? What? Who knew how many female monsters this med harbored? Wag. Ping Gase, I'll bet, Johnny said without looking around. Yep, all over his blues. The owner had materialized and stood now truculent over Pingase, steward's mate, striker, hollering, S.P., S.P., with no results. Pingase sat on the floor, afflicted with the dry heaves. Poor Pingase, Johnny said. He's an early one. Out on the floor, Pappy was up to about a dozen and showed no signs of stopping. We ought to get him into a cab, Fat Clyde said. Where is Babyface? Phalange, the snipe, and Pingase's buddy. Pingase now lay sprawled among the legs of a table and had begun talking to himself in Filipino. A bartender approached with something dark in a glass that fizzed. Babyface Phalange, wearing as was his wont a babushka, joined the group around Pingase. A number of British sailors looked on with interest. Here, you drink it, the bartender said. Pingais lifted his head and moved it mouth open toward the bartender's hand. Bartender got the message and jerked his hand away. Pingais's shiny teeth closed on the air with a loud snap. Johnny Contango knelt by the steward. Andale, man, he said gently, raising Pingais's head. Pingais bit him on the arm. Let go, just as quiet. It's a Hathaway shirt. I don't want no cabron puking on it. Phalange, Pingase screamed, drawing out the A's. You hear that? said Babyface. That's all he has to say on the quarter deck, and my ass has had it. Johnny took Pingase under the arms. Fat Clyde, more nervous, lifted his feet. They bore him to the street, found a cab, and got him off in it. Back to the great gray mother, said Johnny. Come on. You want to try the Union Jack? I should keep an eye on Pappy, you know. I know, but he'll be busy dancing. As long as he doesn't get to the Metro, said Fat Clyde. They strolled down half a block to the Union Jack. Inside, Antoine Zippo, captain of the second division ahead, and Nasty Chubb, the baker, who periodically used salt in place of sugar in the early morning's pies to discourage thieves, had taken over not only the bandstand and back, but also a trumpet and guitar, respectively, and were now making Route 66 respectfully. Sort of quiet, said Johnny Contango. But this was premature, because sly young Sam Monaro, the corpsman striker, was even now sneaking alum into Antoine's beer, which sat uneyed by Antoine on the piano. As peas will be busy tonight, said Johnny. How come Pappy came over at all? I never had that happen to me that way, Clyde said a little brusque. Sorry. I was thinking today in the rain how it was I could light a king-sized cigarette without getting it wet. Oh, I think he should have stayed on board, said Claude. But all we can do is keep an eye out that window. Right ho, said Johnny Contango, slurping beer. A scream from the street. That's tonight's, said Johnny, or one of tonight's. Bad street. Back during the beginning of all this in July, the gut ran one killing a night. Average. God knows what it is now. In came two commandos looking around for somewhere to sit. They picked Clyde and Johnny's table. David and Morris, their names were, and heading off for Egypt tomorrow. We shall be there, said Morris, to wave hello when you people come steaming in. If ever, said Johnny. World's going to hell, said David. They'd been drinking heavily, but held it well. 
Don't expect to hear from us till the election is over, said Johnny. Ah, is that it, then? Why America is sitting on its ass, brooded Johnny, is the same reason our ship is sitting on its ass. Cross currents, seismic movements, unknown things in the night. But you can't help thinking it's somebody's fault. The jolly, jolly balloon, said Morris, going up. Did you hear a bloke got murdered just as we came in? David leaned forward, melodramatic. More blokes than that will get murdered in Egypt, said Morris, and don't I wish they would truss up a few MPs now in those jumping rigs and shoots. Send them out the door. They're the ones who want it, not us. But my brother is on Cyprus, and I shall never live it down if he gets there first. The commandos outdrank them two for one. Johnny, never having talked to anyone who might be dead inside a week, was curious in a macabre way. Clyde, who had, only felt unhappy. The group on the stand had moved from Route 66 to Every Day I Have the Blues. Antoine Zippo, who had wrecked one jugular vein last year with a shore-based Navy band in Norfolk and was now trying for two, took a break, shook the spit out of his horn and reached for the beer on the piano. He looked hot and sweaty, as a suicidal workhorse trumpet should. Alum, however, being what it is, the predictable occurred. Ach, said Antoine Zippo, slamming the beer down on the piano. He looked around, belligerent. His lip had just been attacked. Sam the werewolf, said Antoine, is the only some bitch here who could get Alum. He couldn't talk too well. There goes Pappy, said Clyde, grabbing for his hat. Antoine Zippo leaped like a puma from the stand, landing feet first on Sam Monaro's table. David turned to Morris. I wish the Yanks would save their energy for Nasser. Still, said Morris, it would be good practice. I heartily agree, pip-pip David in a toff's voice. Shall we, old man? Bung-ho! The two commandos waded into the growing melee about Sam. Clyde and Johnny were the only two heading for the door. Everybody else wanted to get in on the fight. It took them five minutes to reach the street. Behind them they heard glass breaking and chairs being knocked over. Pappy Hod was nowhere in sight. Clyde hung his head. I suppose we ought to go to the Metro. They took their time, neither savoring the night's work ahead. Pappy was a loud and merciless drunk. He demanded that his keepers sympathize, and of course they always did, so much that it was always worse for them. They passed an alley. Facing them on the blank wall in chalk was a Kilroy, thus. Reader's note. The illustration is a classic Kilroy peering over a wall. End of note. Flanked by two of the most common British sentiments in time of crisis. What, no petrol? And... End call-up. No petrol indeed, said Johnny Contango. They're blowing up oil refineries all over the Middle East. Nasser, it seems, having gone on the radio, urging a sort of economic jihad. Kilroy was possibly the only objective onlooker in Valletta that night. Common legend had it he'd been born in the U.S. right before the war on a fence or latrine wall. Later he showed up everywhere the American armies moved, farmhouses in France, pillboxes in North Africa, bulkheads of troop ships in the Pacific. Somehow he'd acquired the reputation of a schlemiel or sad sack. The foolish nose hanging over the wall was vulnerable to all manner of indignities, fist, shrapnel, machete, hinting perhaps at a precarious virility, a flirting with castration, though ideas like this are inevitable in a latrine-oriented as well as Freudian psychology. But it was all deception. Kilroy, by 1940, was already bald, middle-aged, his true origins forgotten. He was able to ingratiate himself with a human world, keeping schlemiel silence about what he'd been as a curly-haired youth. It was a masterful disguise, a metaphor. For Kilroy had sprung into life in truth as part of a band-pass filter, thus... Reader's Note This Kilroy resembles the drawing of an electrical circuit. End of note. Inanimate, but Grandmaster of Valletta tonight. 
The Bobsy twins, said Claude. Running around the corner in a jog trot came Dahoud, who discouraged little ploy from taking a brody, and Leroy Tongue, the midget storekeeper, both of them with nightsticks and SP armbands. It looked like a vaudeville act, Dahoud being one and a half times as high as Leroy. Clyde had a general idea of their technique for keeping the peace. Leroy would hop up on Dahoud's shoulders piggyback and rain pacification about the heads and shoulders of boisterous blue jackets, while Dahoud exerted his calming influence down below. Look, yelled Dahoud, approaching. We can do it running. Leroy slowed down and cut in behind his running mate. Hup, 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 said Dahoud. Yo. Sure enough, neither of them breaking stride up hopped Leroy, clinging to Dahoud's big collar to ride his shoulders like a jockey. Get up there, hoss, Leroy screamed, and away they dashed for the Union Jack. A small detachment of Marines all in step came marching out of a side street. One farm lad, blonde and candid-faced, counted cadence unintelligibly. Passing Clyde and Johnny, he broke off for a moment to ask, "'What's all that noise we hear?' "'Fight,' said Johnny. "'Union Jack.' "'Right, ho.' Back in formation, the boy ordered a column left, and his charges set course dutifully for the Union Jack. "'We're missing all the fun,' whined Clyde. There is Pappy. They entered the Metro. Pappy sat at a table with a barmaid who looked like Paola, but fatter and older. It was pitiful to watch. He was doing his Chicago bit. They waited till it was over. The barmaid, indignant, arose and waddled off. Pappy used the handkerchief to swab off his face, which was sweating. Twenty-five dances, he said as they approached. I broke my own record. There is a nice fight on at the Union Jack, suggested Claude. Wouldn't you like to go to it, Pappy? Or how about that whorehouse, the chief off the hank that we met in Barcelona told us about, said Johnny. Why don't we try to find it? Pappy shook his head. You guys ought to know this was the only place I wanted to come. So they begin, these vigils. Having put up their token resistance, Claude and Johnny straddled chairs to either side of Pappy and settled down to drinking as much as Pappy but staying soberer. The Metro looked like a nobleman's pied-à-terre applied to mean purposes. The dancing floor and bar lay up a wide, curving flight of marble steps lined with statues in niches, statues of knights, ladies, and Turks. Such was a quality of suspended animation about them that you felt, come the owl hours, the departure of the last sailor and the extinguishment of the last electric light, these statues must unfreeze, step down from their pedestals and ascend stately to the dance floor, bringing with them their own light, the sea's phosphorescence, there to form sets and dance till sunup, utterly silent, no music, their stone feet only just kissing the wood planks. Along the sides of the room were great stone urns with palms and poinciannas. On the red-carpeted dais sat a small, hot jazz band, violin, trombone, saxophone, trumpet, guitar, piano, drums. It was a plump, middle-aged lady playing the violin. At the moment they were playing C'est Magnifique, tailgate fashion, while a commando, six and a half feet tall, jitterbugged with two barmaids at once, and three or four friends stood around, clapping hands, cheering them on. It was not so much a matter of Dick Powell, the American singing Marine, caroling Sally and Sue, don't be blue, more a taking on of traditional attitudes which one suspects must be latent in all English germplasm, another loony chromosome along with afternoon tea and respect for the crown. Where the Yanks saw novelty and an excuse for musical comedy, the English saw history, and Sally and Sue were only incidental. Early tomorrow deckhands would come out in the bleaching glare of the pier's lights and single up all lines for some of these green berets. The night before, then, was for sentiment, larking in shadows with jolly barmaids, another pint and another smoke in this manufactured farewell hall, this enlisted men's version of that great ball the Saturday night before Waterloo. One way you could tell which ones were going tomorrow, they left without looking back. Pappy, 
got drunk, stinking drunk, and drew his two keepers into a personal past neither wanted to investigate. They endured a step-by-step -step account of the brief marriage, the presents he'd given her, the places they'd gone, the cooking, the kindnesses. Toward the end, half of it was noise, maundering. But they didn't ask for clarity, didn't ask anything, not so much from booze-tangled tongues as from a stuffiness by induction in the nasal cavities. So susceptible were Fat Clyde and Johnny Contango. But it was Cinderella liberty in Malta, and though the drunk's clock slows down, it doesn't stop. Come on, said Clyde finally, floundering afoot. It is about that time. Pappy smiled sadly and fell out of his chair. We'll go get a taxi, said John. Carry him home in a taxi. Jeez, it's late. They were the last Americans in the metro. The English were quietly absorbed in saying goodbye to at least this part of Valletta. With the departure of the scaffold boatsmen, all things had grown more matter-of-fact. Clyde and Johnny draped Pappy around them and got him down the stairs past the knight's reproachful eyes and into the street. Taxi, hey! Clyde screamed. No taxis, said Johnny Contango. All gone. God, how big the stars are. Clyde wanted to argue. You just let me take him, he said. You're an officer. You can stay out all night. Who said I was an officer? I'm a white hat. Your brother, Pappy's brother. Brother's keeper. Taxi, taxi, taxi. Limey's brother. Everybody's brother. Who says I'm an officer? Congress. Officer and gentleman by act of Congress. Congress won't even go into the Suez to help the Limeys. They're wrong about that. They're wrong about me. Paola, Pappy moaned and pitched forward. They grabbed him. His white hat was long gone. His head hung and hair had fallen over his eyes. Pappy is going bald, said Clyde. I never noticed. You never do till you're drunk. They made their way slow and unsteady down the gut, yelling occasionally for a taxi. None came. The street had a silent look, but was not so. Not so far away, on the hill ascending to Kingsway, they heard sharp little explosions and the voice of a great crowd around the next corner. "'What is it?' said Johnny. "'Revolution?' "'Better than that. It was a free-for-all among two hundred royal commandos and maybe thirty scaffold sailors.' Clyde and Johnny dragged Pappy round the corner and into the fringes of it. "'Uh-oh,' said Johnny. The noise woke Pappy, who called for his wife. A few dangling belts were in evidence, but no broken beer bottles or bosun's knives, or none anybody could see. Or not yet. Dahoud stood against a wall facing twenty commandos. By his left bicep, another Kilroy looked on with nothing to say but what no Americans. Leroy Tong must have been off underfoot somewhere, clubbing at shins with his nightstick. Something red and sputtering came arcing through the air, landed by Johnny Contango's foot, and blew up. Firecrackers, said Johnny, landing three feet away. Clyde had also fled, and Pappy, unsupported, fell to the street. Let's get him out of here, said Johnny. But they found their way blocked by Marines who'd come up from behind. Hey, Billy Eckstein, yelled the commandos in front of Dahoud. Billy Eckstein, sing us a song. A volley of firecrackers went off somewhere to the right. Most of the fist-fighting was still concentrated in the center of the mob, only shoving, elbowing, and curiosity at the edges. Dahoud removed his hat, drew himself up, and began to sing, I only have eyes for you. Commandos were struck dumb. Somewhere down the street a police whistle blew. Glass broke in the middle of the crowd. It sent human waves back, concentric. A couple three marines staggered back and fell over Pappy, who was still on the ground. Johnny and Clyde moved in to rescue him. A few sailors moved in to help the fallen marines. Unobtrusive as possible, Clyde and Johnny lifted their charge by an arm each, and Sneaky peated away. Behind them, the marines and sailors began scuffling with one another. "'Cops!' somebody yelled. Half a dozen cherry bombs went off. Dahoud finished his song. A number of commandos applauded. Now sing, I apologize. 
You mean that? The hood scratched his head. That if I told a lie, if I made you cry, forgive me? Hurrah, Billy Eckstein, they cried. Oh, no, man, Dahoud said. I don't apologize to nobody. Commandos squared off. Dahoud surveyed the situation, then abruptly lifted a gigantic arm straight up. All right there, troopers. Get in ranks now. Square away. For some reason, they shuffled into a kind of formation. Yeah, Dahoud grinned. Right, face. So they did. All right, men, let's go. Down came the arm, and away they marched. In step. Kilroy looked on, deadpan. From nowhere, Leroy Tongue emerged to bring up the rear. Clyde, Johnny, and Poppy Hod struggled free of the brawl, dodged round a corner, and began the struggle up the hill to Kingsway. Halfway along, Dahoud's detachment passed them, Dahoud counting cadence, singing it like a blues. For all anyone knew, he was marching them back to the troop carriers. A taxi pulled up next to the three. Follow that platoon, Johnny said, and they piled in. The cab had a skylight, so of course before it reached Kingsway, three heads had appeared through the roof. As they crawled behind the commandos, they sang, Who's the little rodent that's getting more than me? F-U-C-K-E-Y-Y-O-U-S-E. A legacy from Pig Bodine, who'd watched this particular kid's program religiously on the mess hall TV every night in port, had furnished black clip-on ears to all the mess cooks at his own expense and composed on the show's theme song an obscene parody of which this variation in spelling was the most palatable part. Commandos in the rear ranks asked Johnny to teach them the words. He did, receiving in exchange a fifth of Irish whiskey when its owner insisted he could not possibly finish it before they got underway next morning. To this day the bottle has remained in Johnny Contango's possession, unopened. No one knows what he's keeping it for. This weird procession crept along Kingsway until intercepted by a British cattle car or a lorry. The commandos climbed on, thanked everyone for a jolly evening, and snarled away forever. Dahoud and Leroy climbed wearily into the cab. Billy Eckstein, Dahoud grinned. Jeez. We got to go back, Leroy said. The driver made a U-turn, and they circled back to the scene of the free-for-all. No more than fifteen minutes had passed, but the street was deserted. Quiet. No more firecrackers. Shouts. Nothing. I'll be damned, said Dahoud. You'd think it never happened, said Leroy. Dockyard, Clyde instructed the driver, yawning. Dry dock, too. American tin can with the teeth marks of a screw-chewing fish. All the way out to the dockyard, Pappy snored. Liberty had been expired an hour when they arrived. The two SPs bounded past the rows of latrines and across the gangplank. Clyde and Johnny, with Pappy in the middle, lagged. Now, none of that was worth it, Johnny said bitterly. Two figures, fat and slim, stood by the latrine wall. Come on, Clyde urged Pappy. A few more steps. Nasty Chob came running by, wearing an English sailor hat with HMS Salon printed on the band. The shadow figures detached themselves from the latrine wall and approached. Pappy tripped. Robert? she said. Not a question. Hello, Pappy, said the other. Who's that? said Clyde. Johnny stopped dead, and Clyde's momentum carried Pappy round to face her directly. I'll be dipped in mess hall coffee, said Johnny. Poor Robert. But she said it gently, and was smiling, and had either Johnny or Clyde been less drunk, they would have bawled like children. Pappy waggled his arms. Go ahead, he told them. I can stand. I'll be along. From over on the quarterdeck, Nasty Chob was heard arguing with the O.O.D. What you mean, go away, yelled Nasty. Your hat says H.M.S. Salon, Chob. So? So what can I say? You're on the wrong ship. Profane, said Pappy. You came back. I thought you would. 
I didn't, Profane said. But she did. He went off to wait, leaned against a latrine wall out of earshot looking at the scaffold. Hello, Paola, said Pappy. Sa. It means both. You. You. At the same time, he motioned her to talk. Tomorrow, she said, you'll be hung over and probably will think this didn't happen, that the Metro's booze sends visions as well as a big head, but I'm real. I'm here, and if they restrict you, I can put in a chit. Or send you off to Egypt or anywhere else. It should make no difference. Because I will be back in Norfolk before you, and be there on the pier like any other wife. But wait till then to kiss or even touch you. If I can get off, I'll be gone. Let it be this way, Robert. How tired her face looked in the white scatter from the brow lights. It will be better and more the way it should have been. You sailed a week after I left you. So a week is all we've lost. All that's gone on since then is only a sea story. I will sit home in Norfolk faithful and spin. Spin a yarn for your coming home present. I love you, was all he could find to say. He'd been saying it every night to a steel bulkhead and the earthwide sea on the other side. White hands flickered up behind her face. Here, in case you think tomorrow it was a dream. Her hair fell loose. She handed him an ivory comb. Five crucified limeys, five Kilroys, stared briefly at Valletta's sky till he pocketed it. Don't lose it in a poker game. I've had it a long time. He nodded. We ought to be back early December. You get your goodnight kiss then. She smiled, withdrew, turned, was gone. Pappy ambled on past the latrine without looking back. The American flag, skewered by spotlights, fluttered limp high over them all. Pappy began his walk to the quarterdeck, across the long brow, hoping he'd be soberer when he reached the other end. Two. Of their dash across the continent in a stolen Renault, Profane's one-night sojourn in a jail near Genoa when the police mistook him for an American gangster. The drunk they all threw, which began in Liguria and lasted well past Naples. The dropped transmission at the outskirts of that city and the week they spent waiting its repair in a ruined villa on Ischia, inhabited by friends of Stencil. A monk, long defrocked, named Fenice, who spent his time breeding giant scorpions in marble cages once used by the Roman blood, to punish their young boy and girl concubines, and the poet Cinaglosa, who had the misfortune to be both homosexual and epileptic, wandering listlessly in an unseasonable heat among vistas of marble fractured by earthquake, pines blasted by lightning, sea wrinkled by a dying mistral, of their arrival in Sicily and the difficulty with local bandits on a mountain road, from which Stencil extricated them by telling foul Sicilian jokes and giving them whiskey. Of the day-long trip from Syracuse to Valletta on the La Ferla steamer Star of Malta, during which Stencil lost one hundred dollars and a pair of cufflinks at stud poker to a mild-faced clergyman who called himself Robin Pettypoint, and of Paola's steadfast silence through it all, there was little for any of them to remember. Malta alone drew them a clenched fist around a yo-yo string. They came into Valletta, cold, yawning, in the rain. They rode to Maestral's room, neither anticipating nor remembering, outwardly at least apathetic and low-keyed as the rain. Maestral greeted them calmly. Paola would stay with him. Stencil and Profane had planned to doss at the Phoenicia Hotel, but at two and eight per day... The agile Robin Pettypoint had had his effect. They settled for a lodging house near the harbor. What now? said Profane, tossing his ditty bag in a corner. Stencil thought a long time. I like 
Profane continued, living off of your money. But you and Paola conned me into coming here. First things first, said Stencil. Lorraine had stopped. He was nervous. Si maestro. Si maestro. Si maestro he did, but only next day and after a morning-long argument with the whiskey bottle, which the bottle lost. He walked to the room in the ruined building through a brilliant gray afternoon. Light seemed to cling to his shoulders like fine rain. His knees shook. But it wasn't hard to talk to Maestro. Stencil has seen your confession to Paola. Then you know, Maestro said. I only made it into this world through the good offices of one Stencil. Stencil hung his head. It may have been his father. Making us brothers. There was wine, which helped. Stencil yarned far into the night, but with a voice always threatening to break, as if now at last he were pleading for his life. Maestro kept a decorous silence, waiting patiently whenever Stencil faltered. Stencil sketched the entire history of V that night, and strengthened a long suspicion. That it did add up only to the recurrence of an initial and a few dead objects. At one point in Mondagan's story, Ah, Maestro said, the glass eye. And you, Stencil mopped his forehead, you listen like a priest. I have wondered, smiling. At the end of it, But Paola showed you my apologia. Who is the priest? We have heard one another's confessions. Not Stencil's, Stencil insisted. Hers. Maestro shrugged. Why have you come? She is dead. He must know. I could never find that cellar again. If I could, it must be rebuilt now. Your confirmation would lie deep. Too deep already, Stencil whispered. Stencil's long over his head, you know. I was lost, but not apt to have visions. Oh, real enough. You always look inside first, don't you, to find what's missing, what gap a vision could possibly fill. I was all gap then, and there was too wide a field to choose from. Yet you'd just come from— I did think of Elena, yes. Latins warp everything to the sexual anyway. Death becomes an adulterer or rival. Need arises to see one rival at least done in. But I was bastardized enough, you see, before that, too much so to feel hatred or triumph watching. Only pity. Is that what you mean? At least in what Stencil read? Read into... How can he... More uh, passiveness. The characteristic stillness, perhaps, of the rock. Inertia. I'd come back... No, in. Come in to the rock as far as I would. Stencil brightened after a while and changed course. A token. Comb, shoe, glass eye. The children. I wasn't watching the children. I was watching your V. What I did see of the children. I recognized none of the faces, no. They may have died before the war ended or emigrated after it. Try Australia. Try the pawnbrokers and curio shops. But as for placing a notice in the agony column, anyone participating in the disassembly of a priest, please. Next day, and for days after, he investigated the inventories of curio merchants, pawnbrokers, ragmen. He returned one morning to find Paola brewing tea on the ring for Profane, who lay bundled up in bed. Fever, she said. Too much booze, too much everything back in New York. He hasn't been eating much since we arrived. God knows where he does eat, what the water there is like. I'll recover, Profane croaked. Tough shit, Stencil. He says you're down on him. Oh, God, said Stencil. The next day brought momentary encouragement to Stencil. A shop owner named Kassar did know of an eye such as Stencil described. The girl lived in Valletta. Her husband was an auto mechanic at the garage which cared for Kassar's Morris. He had tried every device he knew to purchase the eye, but the foolish girl would not part with it. 
a keepsake, she said. She lived in a tenement. Stucco walls, a row of balconies on the top floor. Light that afternoon produced a burn between whites and blacks, fuzzy edges, blurrings. White was too white, black too black. Stencil's eyes hurt. Colors were nearly absent, leaning either to white or black. I threw it into the sea. Hands on hips, defiant. He smiled uncertainly. Where had Sidney's charm fled? Under the same sea, back to its owner. Light angling through the window fell across a bowl of fruit, oranges, limes, bleaching them and throwing the bowl's interior to black shadow. Something was wrong with the light. Stencil felt tired, unable to pursue it further. Not just now, wanting only to leave. He left. Profane sat in a worn, flowered robe of Fausto Maestral's, looking ghastly, chewing on the stump of an old cigar. He glared at Stencil. Stencil ignored him, threw himself on the bed, and slept soundly for twelve hours. He awoke at four in the morning and walked through a sea phosphorescence to Maestral's. Dawn leaked in, turning the illumination conventional. Along a mudway and up twenty steps, a light burned. Maestro was asleep at his table. Don't haunt me, Stencil, he mumbled, still dreamy and belligerent. Stencil is passing on the discomfort of being haunted, Stencil shivered. They huddled over tea and chipped cups. She cannot be dead, Stencil said. One feels her in the city, he cried. In the city. In the light. It has to do with the light. If the soul, Maestro ventured, is light, is it a presence? Damn the word. Stencil's father, had he possessed imagination, might have used it. Stencil's eyebrows puckered as if he would cry. He weaved irritably in his seat, blinked, fumbled for his pipe. He left it at the lodging house. Maestral tapped across a pack of players, lighting up. Maestral, Stencil expresses himself like an idiot. But your search fascinates me. Did you know he's devised a prayer, walking about this city to be set in rhythm to his footsteps? Fortune may Stencil be steady enough not to fasten on one of these poor ruins at his own random or at any least hint from Maestro. Let him not roam out all Gothic some night with lantern and shovel to exhume an hallucination and be found by the authorities mud-streaked and mad and tossing meaningless clay about. Come, come, muttered Maestro. I feel uncomfortable enough being in this position. Stencil drew in his breath too loudly. No, I am not beginning to requisition. That is long done. Beginning then, Maestro took up the study of Stencil more closely, though suspending judgment. He'd aged enough to know the written apologia would only be a first step in exorcising the sense of sin that had hung with him since forty-three. But this V was surely more than a sense of sin. Mounting crisis in the Suez, Hungary and Poland hardly touched them. Maestro, leery like any Maltese of the balloon's least bobbing, was grateful for something else, Stencil, to take his mind off the headlines. But Stencil himself, who seemed more unaware each day under questioning of what was happening in the rest of the world, reinforced Maestro's growing theory that V was an obsession after all, and that such an obsession is a hothouse, constant temperature, windless, too crowded with party-colored sports, unnatural blooms. Stencil, returning to the lodging house, walked into a loud argument between Paola and Profane. So go, he was yelling. Something crashed against the door. Don't try to make up my mind for me, she yelled back. Stencil opened the door warily, peered around, and was hit in the face with a pillow. Shades were drawn, and Stencil saw only blurred figures. Profane still ducking out of the way, Paola's arm in follow-through. What the hell? Profane, crouching like a toad, flapped a newspaper at him. My old ship is in. All Stencil could see were the whites of his eyes. Paola was crying. Ah! Stencil dived for the bed. 
Profane had been sleeping on the floor. Let them use that, thought spiteful stencil, snuffled and drifted off to sleep. At length it occurred to him to talk with the old priest, Father Avalanche, who, according to Maestral, had been here since 1919. The moment he entered the church, he knew he'd lost again. The old priest knelt at the communion rail, white hair above a black cassock. Too old. Later in the priest's house. God lets some of us wait in queer backwaters, said Father Avalanche. Do you know how long it's been since I have shriven a murderer? At the time of the Gallus Tower murder last year, I had hopes. He maundered thus, taking stencil by an unwilling hand and began to charge aimless about thickets of memory. Stencil tried to point them toward the June disturbances. Oh, I was only a young lad then, full of myth. The nights, you know. One cannot come to Valletta without knowing about the nights. I still believe, chuckling, as I believed then, that they roam the streets after sunset, somewhere. And I had only served as padre in the actual fighting, long enough to have illusions left about avalanche as crusading night. But then, to compare the Malta that was in 1919 to their Malta, you'd have to talk, I suppose, to my predecessor here, Father Faring. He went to America, though the poor old man, wherever he is, must be dead by now. Politely as he could, Stencil took leave of the old priest, plunged into the sunlight, and began to walk. There was too much adrenaline, contracting the smooth muscle, deepening his breathing, quickening his pulse. Stencil must walk, he said to the street. Walk. Foolish Stencil. He was out of condition. He returned to his pied-à-terre long after midnight, hardly able to stand. The room was empty. Clinches it, he muttered. If it were the same fairing... Even if it were not, could it matter? A phrase, it often happened when he was exhausted, kept cycling round and round preconsciously, just under the threshold of lip and tongue movement. Events seemed to be ordered into an ominous logic. It repeated itself automatically, and Stencil improved on it each time, placing emphasis on different words. Events seem, seem to be ordered ominous logic, pronouncing them differently, changing the tone of voice from sepulchral to jaunty, round and round and round. Events seemed to be ordered into an ominous logic. He found paper and pencil and began to write the sentence in varying hands and typefaces. Profane lurched in on him thus. Pale is back with her husband, said Profane, and collapsed on the bed. She'll go back to the States. Someone, Stencil muttered, is out of it then. Profane ground and pulled blankets around him. Look here, said Stencil. Now you're sick. He crossed to Profane, felt his forehead. High fever. Stencil must get a doctor. What the hell were you doing out at this hour anyway? No. Profane flopped over, fished under the bed in his ditty bag. APCs, I'll sweat it out. Neither spoke for a while, but Stencil was too distraught to hold anything in. Profane, he said. Tell Paola's father. I'm only along for the ride. Stencil began to pace, laughed. Stencil doesn't think he believes him any longer. Profane rolled over laboriously and blinked at him. These is a country of coincidence ruled by a ministry of myth, whose emissaries haunt this century's streets. Port Zapitz, Mondaugen, Stencil Pear, this Maestral, Stencil Fies. Could any of them create a coincidence? Only Providence creates. If the coincidences are real, then Stencil has never encountered history at all, but something far more appalling. Stencil came on Father Faring's name once, apparently by accident. Today he came on it again, by what only could have been design. I wonder, said Profane, if that was the same Father Faring. Stencil froze, the booze jittering in his glass. 
while profane Dreamy went on to tell of his nights with the alligator patrol, and how he'd hunted one pinto beast through Faring's parish, cornered and killed it in a chamber lit by some frightening radiance. Carefully, Stencil finished the whiskey, cleaned out the glass with a handkerchief, set the glass on the table. He put on his overcoat. You going out for a doctor? Profane said into the pillow. Of sorts, Stencil said. An hour later, he was at Maestral's. Don't wake her, Maestral said. Poor child, I've never seen her cry. Nor have you seen Stencil cry, said Stencil, but you may. Ex-priest. He has a soul possessed by the devil sleeping in his bed. Profane? In an attempt at good humor. We must get to Father A. He's a frustrated exorcist, always complaining about the lack of excitement. Aren't you a frustrated exorcist? Maestral frowned. That's another Maestro. She possesses him, Stencil whispered. V. You are as sick. Please. Maestral opened the window and stepped out on the balcony. Valletta, by nightlight, looked totally uninhabited. No, Maestral said. You wouldn't get what you wanted. What, if it were your world, would be necessary? One would have to exorcise the city, the island, every ship's crew on that Mediterranean, the continents, the world, or the western part, as an afterthought. We are Western men. Stencil shrank at the cold air moving in through the window. I'm not a priest. Don't try appealing to someone you've only known in a written confession. We do not walk ganged, Stencil, all our separate selves, like Siamese quintuplets or more. God knows how many Stencils have chased V about the world. Faring, Stencil croaked, in whose parish Stencil was shot, preceded your father Avalanche. I could have told you. Told you the name. But saw no advantage in making things worse. Stencil's eyes narrowed. Maestral turned, caught him looking cagey. Yes, yes, thirteen of us rule the world in secret. Stencil went out of his way to bring Profane here. He should have been more careful. He wasn't. Is it really his own extermination he's after? Maestro turned, smiling to him, gestured behind his back at the ramparts of Valletta. Ask her, he whispered. Ask the rock. Three. Two days later, Maestral arrived at the lodging house to find Profane lying dead drunk and slaunchwise on the bed. Afternoon sun illuminated a swathe of face in which every hair of a week's growth showed up separate and distinct. Profane's mouth was open. He was snoring and drooling and apparently enjoying himself. Maestral gave Profane's forehead the back of his hand. Fine, the fever had broken. But where was Stencil? No sooner asked than Maestral saw the note. A cubist moth alit forever on the gross heap of Profane's beer belly. A shipfitter named Aquilina has intelligence of one Madame Viola, an iromancer and hypnotist who passed through Valletta in 1944. The glass eye went with her. Hassan's girl lied. V used it for an hypnotic aid. Her destination? Stockholm as is Stencil's. It will do for the frayed end of another clue. Dispose as you will of profane. Stencil has no further need for any of you. Saha. Maestral looked around for booze. Profane had finished everything in the house. Swine. Profane woke. Whoa. Maestral read him the note. Profane rolled out of bed and crawled to the window. What day is it? After a while, Pale has gone too? Last night. Leaving me. Well, how do you dispose of me? Lend you a fiver to begin with. Lend, roared Profane. You ought to know better. 
I'll be back, said Maestro. That night, Profane shaved, bathed, donned suede jacket, Levi's, and big cowboy hat, and went a-roving down Kingsway, looking for amusement. He found it in the form of one Brenda Wigglesworth, an American wasp who attended Beaver College and owned, she said, seventy-two pairs of Bermuda shorts, half of which she had brought over to Europe back around June at the beginning of a grand tour, which had then held high promise. High she had remained all the way across the Atlantic, high as the boat deck and mostly on slow gin fizzes. The various lifeboats of this most underelict passage east were shared by a purser, summer job, from the academic flatlands of Jersey, who gave her an orange and black toy tiger, a pregnancy scare, hers only, and a promise to meet her in Amsterdam, somewhere behind the five flies. He'd not come. She came to herself, or at least to the inviolable Puritan she'd show up as come marriage, and the good life, someday soon now, in a bar's parking lot near a canal filled with a hundred black bicycles, her junkyard, her own locust season. Skeletons, carapaces, no matter. Her inside, too, was her outside, and on she went, streak blonde, far from frail Brenda, along the Rhine, up and down the soft slopes of the wine districts, into the Tyrol, and out into Tuscany, all in a rented Morris, whose fuel pump clicked random and loud in times of stress, as did her camera, as did her heart. The Volato was the end of another season, and all her friends were long sailed back to the States. She was nearly out of money. Profane couldn't help her. She found him fascinating. So, over slow gin fizzes for her, which took tiny sweet bites out of Maestral's five-pound note, and beer for Benny, they talked of how it was they had come this far, and where they would go after Valletta, and it seemed there were Beaver and the street for them separately to return to, and both agreed this was nowhere— but some of us do go nowhere and can con ourselves into believing it to be somewhere. It is a kind of talent, and objections to it are rare, but even at that, captious. That night between them, they established at least that the world was screwed up. English marines, commandos and sailors who came by going nowhere also, helped them believe it. Profane saw no scaffold sailors, and decided that since some of them must be clean living enough to stay away from the gut, the scaffold too had left. It made him sadder, as if all his homes were temporary, and even they inanimate, still wandering as he. For motion is relative, and hadn't he now really stood there still on the sea like a schlemiel redeemer, while that enormous malingering city and its one livable inner space, and one unconnable therefore high-value girl, had all slid away from him over a great horizon's curve comprising, from this vantage, at once, at least one century's worth of wavelets. Don't be sad. Brenda, we're all sad. Benny, we are, she laughed, raucous, having a low tolerance for slow gin. They went back to his place, and she must have left him sometime during the night, in the dark. Profane was a heavy sleeper. He awoke alone in bed to the sound of forenoon traffic. Maestral sat on the table, observing a plaid knee sock, the kind worn with Bermuda shorts, which was draped over the electric lamp, hanging from the center of the ceiling. "'I have brought wine,' said Maestral. "'Good enough.' They went out to a café for breakfast about two. "'I have no intention of supporting you indefinitely,' Maestro said. "'I should get a job. "'Any road work in Malta?' "'They are building a great intersection, an underground tunnel at Port de Bombe. "'They also need men to plant trees along the roads. "'Road work and sewer work is all I know.' Sewers? There's a new pumping station going up at Marsa. They hire aliens? Possibly. Possibly, then. That evening, Brenda wore paisley shorts and black socks. I write poetry, she announced. They were at her place, a modest hotel near the Great Lift. 
Oh, said Profane. I am the twentieth century, she read. Profane rolled away and stared at the pattern in the rug. I am the ragtime and the tango, sans serif, clean geometry. I am the virgin's hair whip and the cunningly detailed shackles of decadent passion. I am every lonely railway station in every capital of Europe. I am the street, the fanciless buildings of government, the café d'Anson, the clockwork figure, the jazz saxophone, the tourist lady's hairpiece, the fairy's rubber breasts, the traveling clock which always tells the wrong time and chimes in different keys. I am the dead palm tree, the negro's dancing pumps, the dried fountain after tourist season. I am all the appurtenances of night. That sounds about right, said Profane. I don't know. She made a paper airplane out of the poem and sailed it across the room on strata of her own exhaled smoke. It's a phony college girl poem. Things I've read for courses. Does it sound right? Yes. You've done so much more, boys do. What? You've had all these fabulous experiences. I wish mine would show me something. Why? The experience. The experience. Haven't you learned? Profane didn't have to think long. No, he said. Offhand, I'd say I haven't learned a goddamn thing. They were quiet for a while. She said, Let's take a walk. Later, out in the street near the sea steps, she inexplicably took his hand and began to run. The buildings in this part of Valletta, eleven years after war's end, had not been rebuilt. The street, however, was level and clear. Hand in hand with Brenda, whom he'd met yesterday, Profane ran down the street. Presently, sudden and in silence, all illumination in Valletta, house light and street light, was extinguished. Profane and Brenda continued to run through the abruptly absolute night, momentum alone carrying them toward the edge of Malta and the Mediterranean beyond.